<laughs> Where's even the book? Do you even have a book? Yes, yeah, there. Where? It's in the middle. Yeah. Next to the internet. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start reading it yet. Uh, no, sure not. But we're live. Um. <laughs> oh, this is so funny. <laughs> you gonna share it? I'm trying to go on to it. Nice. Oh, too good. Oh, someone's on with us. Who? Amanda Aguilar. Oh. Nice. Hey. <laughs> What's up from Amanda? What is this about? Oh, Shim material. Oh, Shim. Oh, yes. We're going to read uh, Siddhartha's, I mean, Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. What's it about? It's just to have fun to celebrate hitting a thousand subscribers there yet. Yeah. Oh, you will soon. We're going to be there real soon. God willing. Yo, Shim. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to read the whole book. <laughs> We're going to read it from beginning to end. I have not read it yet. It's going to be my first time. Yep. Thank you. And it's it's 80, it's 80 pages, like 81 pages. Um, I'm a bit dyslexic, so it may take us a bit. I don't know, it'll take us like two hours to read, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, Shim, it's a great book. It's it's very readable and very understandable from what I've heard. I haven't read it yet, but it was like a very popular work. It's not like some obscure work of academia or philosophy, so it's going to be cool. And uh, I think <laughs> I want to play a game with you guys. <laughs> I want to I wanna take a shot for every new. <laughs> yeah, this is exciting. Thank you. We're going to take a shot for every subscriber we get up until a thousand. <laughs> so if you're, if you want to join me for the drinking, if you're not pregnant, if you're not operating heavy machinery, and um, if you're not driving, then please <laughs> feel free to join me to drink responsibly. And we're going to have a shot for every new subscriber. Oh yeah. Welcome Alyssa. <laughs> yeah, it's a great book. I had great stuff. And uh, it's a real classic in the field. It's like really, I was trying to think of modern novels there are. Can you guys hear me well, by the way, Shimon and uh, Alyssa and Amanda? Can you guys? I was trying to think about what good novels were kind of in that field of mysticism, but popular um, and uh, good. Shimon hears me nicely. Um, and this one, like just, came to mind as like the most obvious choice. So um, that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> it's so silly, but it's good to be silly. Thank God. It's good to be silly. And also like everyone's at home now stuck. Uh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, you can, you can make your own version <laughs> of the game. I'm Shimon. Shimon, should I say L'chaim with you? Do you have a L'chaim there? Do you have a, do you have a charged glass? <laughs> um, Alyssa, by the way, you can probably type as behalf of me if I make you a, uh, a moderator. Or something like that. Who, who is uh, Shalom? Who is Shalom? Yes. It's what? Instagram, what about Instagram? <laughs> um, you know what, actually, can you just log into the into the manager side from the back end and, and say hi from there, from Seekers? Oh, wait, wait, pouring in. Um, 
we have 981 you need to take a shot oh we have 981 <laughs> all right <laughs> you heard it guys every new subscriber is going to be a shot we're going to make it a chaim oh there's a shot class here <laughs> uh l'chaim baruch atah adina yalehinim l'chom shakra amen all right Whew. loosen up the nerves here first time going i'm so nervous I'm actually not it's pretty chill um Hey, hey, Adam from sunny London. Hey, Shalom. Shalom Weiss. Oh, yeah, we just chatted on Instagram. Nice to have you here. It's going to be, it's going to be a, <laughs> we have some Spanish in the chat. I don't speak Spanish, so you guys are welcome to talk about it yourselves. We have five people online. Um, salute. That's how we say cheers. So should we start reading? What do you guys say? No, we should wait. When should we wait till? Uh, yeah, let's just let's just sort of kick around, sure. and we'll chat and ship, and then uh, we will get started with the actual read. I did. Wh whoever just joined in just now, they should know that I am dyslexic. So uh, I hope you made yourself comfortable and brought some popcorn, like I told you, because it's gonna be like a slow, nice read. We're not gonna like rush through it. We're gonna read. We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna discuss it. If you guys have questions, pop up in the group chat. Please do. Please ask questions. Um, and also, just, like, share this with friends who want to get in on some good book action. This is a really great book. So, yeah, tell people that we're live. Tell people that we're going to start reading real soon. And we're going to have a blast together. And if we hit a 1,000 subscribers, I'm going to, as I said, take a shot for every subscriber. I'm pretty sloshed by the end. <laughs> but responsibly, of course, because we're responsible adults. Um, and... Maybe we'll do a merch giveaway. I have some Seekers of Unity <laughs> t-shirts, but maybe for like the thousandth subscriber or something. Oh yes, on the chromatically organized bookshelf. It is, it's a work of art, thank you. <laughs> it's always have, better to have things sorted by color than by subject because subject is so flexible and ambiguous, but colors are on an absolute spectrum. <laughs> Actually where colors belong. There's no ambiguity. There's no flexibility. <laughs> Shimon, uh, where are you right now? Shimon, can you tell us where you're uh, where you're joining in from? Seeing everything as a work of art is a cognitive bias. I believe is objectively positive. Is a cognitive. It's a cognitive bias to see everything as a work of art. Um, but objectively, it's like a positive bias to have. Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. That it's not like there's no actual art out there. Art is subjective, and it's like a bias to see it as art. But we can choose to see it as art. Cheers to seeing gold as art for sure. Mm, Mendy, hey Mendy, what's up? Is this Mendy Ullman? Mendy, you? <laughs> Yeah, it's so cool to have you guys here. Bendy, for those that don't know, is a, a childhood friend. We were, like, since we were little pups. So, <laughs> sweet to <have> here. <laughs> nice. Um, nice. I think Menachem will be here soon as well. <laughs> this is a very cute kind of reunion. I mean, I don't get to see you, but you guys get to see me. 1 a.m. You're calling in at 1 a.m.? I am so touched, Bendy. Honestly, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I kind of try to choose a time that would be good for both like people here in Israel. I'm in Jerusalem at the moment, for those that don't know. Uh, and for people in the States, like a lot of uh, my friends and subscribers are from. And I didn't take into consideration that people might be calling in from Sydney, like my own family. <laughs> so uh, respect for showing up at 1 a.m. I respect that. Thank you. <laughs> and I really do hope, Mendy, I hope you join me. I have a shot class because we're going to take a shot for every new subscriber that comes in and says hi. <laughs> there aren't that many left to go, so <laughs> we'd be good. Hey, Miriam! <laughs> this is so much fun! This is so much fun to see all you guys here. We got Miriam with us. We got Mendy with us. We got Shalom with us. We got Fernanda. We got people from all over the world. This is really cool. This is so much fun. Ah, okay. L'chaim Mendy. L'chaim, L'chaim. 
Drink responsibly, guys. Don't be drinking like wild hooligans. <laughs> Miriam, I know there's still tequila left. So um, you're welcome to have Lechaim with us. We're going to have Lechaim for every new subscriber that comes in up until 1,000. And then when we hit 1,000, this is not supposed to be a drinking. This is supposed to be a reading session. This is supposed to be serious. And I think we're disconnected. <laughs> Yikes. Um, this is supposed to be serious and introspective and contemplative and meditative. And we have C. Sarah 8 from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, welcome from Cape Town. I don't know who C. Sarah is, you can tell us, but I just taught a course in um, Cape Town. So I'm guessing you may be one of the people that were in that course. We did a Kabbalah course. Whoever's been following the channel knows that we just did uh, some very fun, deep historical dive into some really cool historical moments with the Cape Town community that I taught at five years ago. It was really cool to reconnect over Zoom. Oh yeah, for all class, awesome. So nice to have you. I don't think I even posted on the group that we were gonna do this, so. Should I, should I share it on the Kabbalah group? This isn't really Kabbalah related. I feel like it's not really a part of that group. I mean, every of course, like everyone's welcome to come, but I'm not gonna spam the group. Welcome to like share it on the group if you want to. <laughs> Um, let's see, we have nine people with us. In Jewish law, 10 people are a minyan, a quorum. Quorum is a word that you never use in any other context. Oh, and we have 10 people, uh, besides for counting 10 people in a very specific context. It's one of those weird words that we barely use anywhere else, like uh, woman of valor. No one else, is, no one, like, no one uses the word valor or valorous outside of translating a specific Hebrew phrase, but... Anyways, we have 10 people. Um, I feel like that's a nice number. Why don't we begin to read? So um, I think like I have to mention legally that I don't own rights to the book. I should probably put the description. We should probably put that in before this goes posted. And in the description, there is a link to a um, like HTML, like a PDF of the text. So if you don't have a text at home, feel free to grab a text and you can join us. Give me one second. Um, yeah, so uh, let's go all the way up. Um, so just getting some lighting right here. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so in the description of this video, there is a link to the text. If someone in the chat tells me that they found the link, then that means the link is there. Uh, otherwise, I can go and fix that. Pretty sure, I'm almost 100% sure that the link is there. Um, find the link. We're going to begin reading until people get settled in, get comfortable, find a comfortable place to sit and get their popcorn out. I'm just going to read the... Um, oh, that's <laughs> I'm just going to read the, the blurb from the back of the book. And this is what the back here says. This classic novel of self-discovery has inspired generations of seekers. I, by the way, okay, I have to tell you guys straight up, I have not read this book before. I know that's like crazy because this is like a must read in the world of mysticism. I'm sure Shimon has read this book and all of you guys have already read it. I'm behind, I'm playing catch up here. Um, and. I also have not like looked at any reviews. I didn't read the Wikipedia page. I didn't go on Goodreads, although like we have a big following there on Goodreads. <laughs> um, we, because I wanted to come to this with like a fresh perspective and not be biased from anyone else's reading and just be able to read it straight here with you guys and get like a, a genuine firsthand reaction. It was so hard for me because anyone who knows me knows that I spend like more time reading reviews uh, like of of works or like watching trailers of movies before I read or watch anything because I'm like very picky with what I devote my time to, and I had to I had to like use iron will to not go and read the Wikipedia page and find out about this book. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna read it together for the first time, and <laughs> I'm honestly very excited to read it. I've heard, I've, like I've heard from friends really great things about the book, and I'm really excited to read this. So let's read the blurb of the book. This classic novel of self-discovery has inspired generations of seekers with parallels to the enlightenment of the Buddha. Hesse's Sartha is the story of a young Brahmin's quest for the ultimate reality. 
His quest takes him to streams of indulgent sensuality, hmm. to the rigors of asceticism and self-denial. At last, he learns that wisdom cannot be taught. It must, be, it must come from one's own experience and inner struggle. Steeped in the tenets of both psychoanalysis and Eastern mysticism, Siddhartha presents a strikingly original view of man and culture and the arduous process of self-discovery that leads to reconciliation, harmony, and peace. That sounds like a very sweet plot line to set out and explore. I have read some of other of Herman Hesse's works, or at least partially. I read a bit of Damien and Glass Bead Game, and um, he has another book called Goldman and Narcissus, or Narcissus, which I haven't read yet, but I want to read. And it sounds like he's exploring similar themes amongst his various works. And authors, I mean, tend to do that. Authors are using novels as a, as a form to explore their own ideas and, and make sense of them and, and really carve them out. Um, and it makes sense that through an author's career, they would go through this. So it will be interesting to see what ideas here are similar to his previous works um, and what ideas are novel. What do you guys say? Should we, should we start reading? Yeah? Shimon, what do you say? Shimon, can we get the go ahead? Um, and who's going to, I need someone to tell me when we get new subscribers so I can stop and have a drink. So who's going to, someone has to take that responsibility. A, this book opens with a note. Um, I'm not sure if the PDF or version that I shared with you guys has the same note, but I'll read it anyways. <sighs> uh, while I believe that some things must be taught, other lessons are only appreciated and understood when we experience life through our own subjective realities. Yeah, um, that's a super... Hmm? That's a super good point. Um, there are like definitely a lot of ideas that we can learn and we can absorb externally from books and from teachers and from all sorts of media and film. But, oh, thank you, uh, Fernanda, for sharing. Fernanda, <laughs> I'm dyslexic. I should let you guys know. It's going to be a while. I'm going to mispronounce people. But there are, yeah, real lessons only come through experience. I agree with you, Sean, that... Only when we actually go through ourselves does the idea really resonate. So in some sense, that makes the uh, very, you know, object of reading a null and pointless one. Because if you can't acquire ideas except through experiencing them, then why read ideas at all? So that's an interesting point. But in some sense, in reading, you can experience someone else's experience. If the author does a good enough job to allow yourself to feel into that experience. What do you think about that, Sean, about actually experiencing a text, not just reading a text? Well, let's see if we can experience the text. Maybe the, the um, drinking game as we go will help us experience the text. Since the first English translation of Siddhartha in 1951, entire generations of students in the English-speaking world and many others who appreciate philosophy expressed in literature have read Hess's story of a man who from his earliest youth quests variously for nirvana, full understanding and development on, of the self, and the peace of a perfect being. That was a real run on sentence there. Um, but a couple of the things that come out here is that it's philosophy expressed in literature, which is a common genre of philosophy. I mean, someone like Jean-Paul Sartre put a lot of his work into, into uh, Nietzsche, uh, thus spoke Zarathustra as a work of literature, great philosophy is done in literature. Uh, Adam says that even things that are taught only that are taught are only realized subjectively. Yeah, I think uh, even things that are taught are only realized subjectively. Um, interesting. Hmm. You're gonna have to elaborate on that. I wonder what it would mean to to realize something objectively if we're all just subjects. Anyhow, so it's a story of a young man who's looking for nirvana. Um, which is translated here by whoever wrote this note as full understanding and development of his self. Um, I'm not going to, by the way, critique and correct the old gendered um, pronouns of this text. So I apologize, but I'm just going to read he and he, as he and she. And obviously if this text would have been written more lately, we would have updated the text. Um, Shalom says that the beauty of disclosure is a sort of an anomaly. We trust that we knew, but through discourse, we realize something new we could not realize without the same information. Yeah. 
Sean, I see you're a fan of discourse, of, of taking ideas which we're already familiar with. And then by opening them up, we can find new perspectives and new ways of internalizing. Let's continue reading. Um, and feel free to continue to engage in the comments. Um, I'm going to try to answer questions and try be participating with you guys. Um, Stanley Applebaum's new translation of this poetic beloved novel will engage new generations of this timeless tale. Thank, thank you very much, Stanley Applebaum, for translating this from the German. We are indebted to you. The title character, Siddhartha, has the same personal name as, his, as the historical Buddha, Siddhartha uh, Gautama. As a young man, after spending three years with a band of wandering ascetics, Siddhartha encounters the Buddha, his older contemporary. The youth perceives the greatness of the... Is this... Should there be a spoiler alert on this page? I don't want to know that he met the Buddha already. That's like... That's too much. Wow. Um, but I started reading it, so we'll, we'll just continue. The young, uh, the youth perceives the, this, this is, I feel like, I feel like I should not have read this page. The youth perceives the greatness of the Buddha's thought and in his way of living, though he cannot, he cannot accept the teacher's philosophy as a guide for his own life. Leaving the Buddha and his multitude of monk followers, the young man sets, uh, sets out to seek truth, wisdom, and the way to perfect the being on his own. Without following any doctrine or prescribed technique, during the course of his life, a variety of experiences live to the full, shape his perceptions. Um, by the way, who here has a text um, up on their screen or in hand with me? I'd like to know who's joining me. That would be really cool. And you guys may not have the same introduction, but when we get to the main body of the text, it will be the same text I'm guessing. Um, Adam wants to question the idea that everything all at once can be taught without personal experience. Um, yeah. That everything all at once can be told without personal experience. Yeah, it seems like no real learning can happen without personal experience. Like even even like the tiniest thing in some sense needs to be. There's like in in um in, we talk about hair, which is to hear, and dare hair, which is like to hear, but it's like to really hear, like to hear your kishkas, we would say. Um, and that may be the difference between like just learning something and experiencing something. When you learn something, like you hear it, it's like sure it came into your ears and you can process it and repeat it. But to dare hair is like to actually really feel it in your gut. Um, okay, the meaning of, oh, he sets out to, Siddhartha reflects its, his, its author's thoughts, Hess's thoughts, and beliefs about the oneness of all elements of the universe. We're a fan of that. And the meaning of time, cool. The nature of self, nice. And the significance of human beings' uh, loving attachment to others. Oh, that's a very interesting question that we're going to explore here. I'm looking forward to exploring that because on the one hand, love is like a very high view that's held up in mysticism, but attachment is really not particularly in Buddhism. So loving attachment, that's going to be an interesting little knot to cut into. And I'm looking forward to hearing Mr. Herman Hesse's thoughts on that. Yeah, some things need to be learned and some things need to be realized. The difference between learning and realizing is interesting. And often it's the things that we learn a while ago that after a long time can like finally settle in. And we also live in like a day and age when there's like so much like information out there. We live in a real information overload. And the the um, sort of the balance between how much, is, how much is heard and how much is really absorbed may, there may be like a, a counter like an inverse proportion of things being um, heard versus things being absorbed just because of like the amount of information. You can imagine in earlier times when people had scarce access to text, to thinkers, to thoughts, that like only very once in a while would they come across a new idea and they could like take the time to absorb that. And in today's day and age, we have like a million things being, I mean, we're all listening to podcasts all day long. And, and um, yeah, so the, the, the capacity to slow down and take information slowly and even restrict the amount of intake of ideas or how to internalize them. Hey, Shira. Good to have you join us here. Shira, you're just in time because we're about to start reading the introduction from the author. I take that back. It says introduction, uh, the author, because it's introduction about the author. So we're going to learn a bit about uh, Herman Hesse, about him as a person. And I love introductions. I love secondary texts. I love the more introduction, the better. So I'm really excited for this part of the text. And... Here we go. Hermann Hesse 
was born in 1877. Shout out to everyone in 1877. Woo, woo. In Cal Callow, in C-A-L-W. Uh, in the Black Forest region of Southwest Germany. Um, was a center of missionary publishing to which his father, a North German, do you have, <laughs> write, in the, write in the chat. <laughs> um, his, to which his father, a North German, had been posited after becoming ill while a missionary in India. A Christian missionary, I'm guessing, not a Buddhist missionary. In Kalu, if anyone knows how to pronounce this word, C-A-L-W, uh, we got another subscriber. You know what that means? That means we have to take a solemn moment of introspection and stop and say cheers to ourselves and to you guys. L'chaim, cheers, salut. This book is just going to get more as we go. I can see it already happening. In Kalu, the author's father married the daughter of his superior, a prominent linguist. She herself had been born in India while her father was a missionary there. Interesting. Thus, young Herman grew up in, that's a sweet little name, Herman. <laughs> Can you imagine him as a little kid, Herman? Thus, young Herman grew up in an atmosphere that was unusually cultured and cosmopolitan for a small town. That's how he got so woke because his parents were linguists and missionaries um, look to Esoterica. Thank you for joining us. Um, so that's where Herman grew up. If anyone here has parents, by the way, that were on some sort of religious mission, um, I can resonate with that. Um, in the cut, we weren't in India, but my parents were sent to Australia uh, in a form of religious uh, emissaries or missionaries, technically. So I can, me and Herman, we're like really bonding up here. Uh, whoever here grew up on while their parents were religious missionaries, <laughs> say, say what up in, there you go, Shalom knows, <laughs> cool. Um, next paragraph. But it was also an atmosphere of piety and duty, not just cultured cosmopolitanism, there was piety and duty, like all good North, North Germans. Whoever really knows the history of, this book is gonna take us 10 hours at this pace, I'm just saying. Uh, North Germany, historically, before the, uh, 1800s, there was a group of Christianistics known as the German Pietists, who were a very important, influential um, group of mystics, people like Ottinger. Um, they were quite influential, actually, on German idealism, people like Hegel, um, Schelling, Schleiermacher, Fichte. Um, so I'm curious to know what the influence of the atmosphere, the religious atmosphere, which they mention now of piety and duty, uh, of the German pietists, because it was an actual very important intellectual movement of German pietism up in the north. Interesting. Okay, the boy was expected to become a minister. They wanted him to be a priest. Although extremely bright, however, and gifted at writing and drawing, Hermann was surprisingly rebellious and difficult. My man. His school record was not brilliant, and finally, at the age of 15, he ran away from his seminary. Oh, we got a rebel on our hands here. A breakdown ensued, the beginning of a lifelong series of visitations to sanatoria, spas, and psychiatrists. Hmm. So maybe there was some mental instability, or maybe they thought that he was mentally unstable because he wasn't following their prescribed policy. Interesting. Formal schooling, and with it, a career in the clergy was eventually called off because he spent too long in the loony bin and in sanatoria and spas best way to call it spas and sanatoria so he's cancelled from going into the clergy um, and he goes on to educate himself on his own time he's an autodidact shout out to all the autodidacts represent what what but so successfully that he became one of the best read germans uh of old he became one of the best read of all german writers and was able to publish a famous reading list of best books for people aspiring to culture. So he went off and he wrote a, a reading list for his German fellows. Whoever here is an autodidact, say what up in the chat. I 
I, I, I consider myself an autodidact. I mean, at least in the topic of philosophical mysticism. After uncongenial work in a church clock factory, a church clock factory, they were making, it was a factory making church clocks. Interesting. He, he concentrated on learning the book seller's trade. Oh, it's a good nerd. He just wanted to work in a bookstore. Look at this dude, which he had looked into earlier. After four years with a book dealer in the tradition rich university town of Tübingen, Tübingen is an important city in Germany, an autodidact. Good question, Shira. An autodidact is a self taught person. Diadache in Latin means teaching, um, like didactics is, is teaching, um, and auto is self, like. Um, automatic or automobile um so autodidact is someone who's self-taught so yeah I, autodidacts are very cool because they're not so confined and constrained by you know all of the learnings they got from teachers or from institutions they're like kind of more free thinking typically yeah it's cool i like autodidacts tubingen is a you know talking about non-autodidact autodidactation a university town tubingen which is still a yeah there's definitely a, a nice mix of no one's like purely autodidact you grew up in like a ice in, like in um what's it called like um isolation like um solitary confinement like you we all learn from one another but i guess someone who like technically if someone wasn't institutionalized institutionalized uh, educationally then they're they're considered an autodidact um, so he went to Tübingen University town until today. It was a university town for hundreds of years. A period in which he began writing seriously. He wasn't joking around anymore. He was getting serious. He joined another firm in Basel, and from then on to, um, and from then on, usually resided in Switzerland. Although he did not change his citizenship until 1984. That's a long time. In 1899, the year of the move to Basel, which is in Switzerland. His first book was published, which is Romantische Lieder, which is Romantic Songs, a book of verse. Hesse continued to write his life, becoming one of the most prolific and respected German poets of the century. His poems, this, this introduction is like, it's like two or three, it's like two pages. So I think it's going to be well worth it. And I, I love introductions. And we're in no rush, right? We can, we can go for hours. <sighs> Uh, better get comfy. His poems were to appeal to a number of major song composers. Three of Richard Strauss's famous four last songs are to text of Hesse. I am going to show uncultured I am and tell you guys publicly live on the internet that I don't know who Richard Strauss is and I've never heard any of his songs. If anyone has any good Richard Strauss playlists, <laughs> hit us up. <laughs> Waiting for like the, the bass to drop. Although eventually... He was also to write many, many volumes worth of short stories, travel accounts, essays, book reviews, translations, introductions to new editions of classics, articles for periodicals, and a vast correspondence. His first novel, the important Peter Kamenizing of 1903, was a breakthrough for Hess in several ways. It began his association with the great Berlin publisher, Samuel Fischer, and brought him enough money and fame to live off his writings from then on. Giving up book selling and this financial stability allowed him to marry. Well done. Mazel tov. His first, his first wife, older than he, was to present him with three sons. Present him with three sons. Here, yes, sir, are your three sons. What a strange... Anyhow. Um, unfortunately, she was neurotically reclusive. Okay, whoever wrote this introduction loves psychoanalyzing people of the past. And like characterizing them. So she was a psycho. She was neurotically reclusive. And he was compelled to divorce her. Sorry, yeah. In 1923. That's a sad part. From 1904 to 1912, they lived near Lake Constance. Farm life was one of the several dreams that went sour on Hess when put into practice. Farm, farm life is a beautiful dream. And don't let this pessimistic author of the narrative, torn you away from farm life. I recommend everyone move away from the city and head farm. <sighs> Another dream that failed to stand up to reality was Hess's quest in 1911 for some spruce in India. 
a country where both of his parents had lived and whose literature, religion, and philosophers were dear to him. Good. India has some epic philosophers. The streamer he sailed on touched at ports in Ceylon. The Hess suffered from the heat from dysentery. Poor German dude. I think my internet might be... Oh, we're back. Poor German dude was not... North Germany is very cold, and it's very far from the equator. And the poor guy rocked up in India, and he was schwitzing, and he could not take the heat, <laughs> literally. He was also... He was always only a few months and never... He was away only a few months and never set foot in what we call India. English language reference books that speak of a stay in India, carelessly mistranslating the German word Indien, which can also be an overall term covering um, hither India, farther India, which is Southeast Asia. Aha, uh -huh. so he right, went to some form of India, but that ain't India. Hess, maybe he wanted people to think that he went to India like some sort of, to, to make his stories more legit. Hess himself referred to his destination variously as Indian or uh, Malay. I guess that would be Malaysia today. On his return, he expressed the point, claiming that colonial rule had denatured the territory. Um, he seems to have been more comfortable with Chinese merchants he met than with the largely impoverished Hindu and Muslim population. That's the thing. So Hesse, this German uh, cultured intellectual who was supposed to become a priest and then away from his, from his priest study, heads to India with some sort of romantic idea of finding just philosophers on the street and Indian literature and he doesn't quite find that. And then he blames it on the colonial um, denaturing of the territory. Where This is interesting. Give me one second. I just need to turn on the air here. It's a bit warm. I'll be back in a second. It's so hot. Okay, we're back. It's uh, kind of warm in here. Um, it's warm like it was warm in India for Hess. We're like, we're, I told you guys, we're not just reading the book, we're experiencing the book. <laughs> From 1912 to 1919, Hess in Bern, uh, B-E-R-N-E. Unable to serve in the First World War because of his bad eyesight, he worked for organizations that supplied reading material to German prisoners of war. Sounds like fun. Although, pardon me, although not a militant pacifist, a militant pacifist, interesting. He had pacifistic leanings and thus became associated with like-minded French author Raymond Roland, to whom, to whom he would later de dedicate part one of Siddhartha. Hess had been writing excellent novels and stories all his life, but his real blossoming only came after the war. In 1919, he published pseudonymously, which means under his name, fooling all but very canny readers, the novel some critics believed to be his best, Demian. Wow, I read a lot of Demian, and I didn't think it was his best. Okay, I mean, different folks, different strokes. Um, actually written in 1917, always concerned with the problem of children and young people, and later encouraged by his psychoanalytical sessions with Karl Duff Jung. From Demian on, he became a recognized mentor of German intellectual and avant-garde youth. During the same year, 19, he wrote some major short stories, began writing Siddhartha, not published until 1922, and moved to the and moved to the Ticino, Ticino, the Italian speaking part of Switzerland. That sounds like a fun place to move to. From 1919 to 1931, in the village of Monta Montaginalo, near Lugiano. Okay, let me tell you something about it because I mean, those that are going to stay around and settle in. I'm like kind of dyslexic. I've never been like officially diagnosed, particularly with new words that I've never seen before. It takes me some time to read them. So thanks for your patience. I appreciate it. It was there that he wrote his weirdest and most experimental novel, Der Steppenwolf, which is one of his popular novels. 1927. Shout out in the chat if anyone here has read Steppenwolf. I have not. <laughs> in 1931, a wealthy patron built a new isolated house for Hess in the same village and gave him free use of it for his lifetime. Good patronage. Respect. 
Their writers do need quiet little isolated places in woods to write from. Shout out, Miriam. <laughs> there is there the writer lived happily with his third wife, married in 1931. Um, Hess's unsuccessful second marriage in 1924 had been extremely brief. He happily tended an extensive garden, received visitors from friends and admirers, and continued his writing career. In the early years of the Nazi Reich, Hess spoke out against Swiss intolerance towards the numerous German immigrants seeking refuge in his adopted country. Good man. Even during the Second World War, however, he still tilled, he, sorry, he still tried to get his new books published in Germany, and he gave hospitality to German writers who stayed at home. Okay. The great product of those years was his little novel, um, Der Glasspieler, the glass bead, the glass bead game, aka uh, Magister Ludi, which I've read a bit of. Uh, a difficult and strange read. Uh, published in Zurich in 1943, the composition had taken him 11 years, though some critics prefer Demian, Siddhartha, Der Steppenwolf, or his 1930 novel Narcissus and Goldman, which we mentioned. There is no doubt that Der das Gl the Glass Bead Game is Hesse's most ambitious work in construction, imagination, and style, the one with the most breadth, depth, and scope. That's a subjective kind of statement. Like, don't be like pushing that on us as readers. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit short tempered with whoever wrote this introduction and I apologize to, um, to no name. I apologize to whoever you are. <sighs> uh, and it was largely on the basis of that novel that Hess was awarded the Nobel uh, Prize, the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1946. His, his friend Thomas Mann the laureate in 1929 had already been canvassing him for some years. Has anybody read any Thomas Mann? Any of my fans out there read Thomas Mann? Uh, he wrote The Magic Mountain. Maybe we'll read some Thomas Mann together. Um, there, the, the Glass Speed Game was the last major work active to the end, though suffering through leukemia or poor dude. Um, Hess died from cerebral hemorrhage in 1962. Baruch Dynamis. The novel. Part one of Siddhartha. Okay, here's the question, guys. Should we read this introduction to the novel? Um, or should we just cut to the novel itself? Read the introduction? Okay. My fans say read the introduction. We have a live audience here, by the way. <laughs> That's what I'm talking to. Part one of Siddhartha was written in... So this is now introduction to the novel. Part one of Siddhartha was written in the fall and winter of 1919. Then, after the amazingly productive year, Hess experienced a lengthy fit of depression and was unable to continue for a year and a half. He was finally finished the book in the spring of 1922, and it was published by um, Samuel Fisher, Berlin, later that year. Um, various segments of Part 1 had already been published in several magazines and newspapers. Part 1 was originally dedicated to Romain Roland, Part 2 to William Gundard, a cousin of Hess, on his mother's side, an expert on Japan whose visits clarify the author's thoughts about the two. Sneak peek, we're gonna talk about Japan. In 1950, reprinting, Hess dropped these dedications, substituting one to his third wife, Ninon Dolbin. I'm sure his friends were not happy that they were dropped from the dedications, but say la vie. In German editions, the novel, sometimes called a novella, carries the subtitle, uh, an Indian literary work. Though it can mean a work about India, the connotation, a work originating in India is strong. This connotation is constant with the book style, which simulates that of old pious legend. Hess's style, although generally lucid and classical, avoiding syntactic or other extremes, was nevertheless very malleable and could change drastically to suit varied narrative situations. For Siddhartha, he chose a highly well reminiscent of ancient scriptures, particularly the sermons attributed to the Buddha, um, which were, availed, which were avail available to him in an excellent German translation. With their parallelisms of simple clauses and their incantatory repetitions, he uses a number of archaic words, unusual forms, and rather secondary meanings of everyday words. 
This style is imitated in the present tradition, uh, not by using archaisms, but by retaining the repetitions, um, avoiding contrasts, using dignified choice words, and very occasionally the syntax where German does not very, where the, where the German does this very conspicuously. Um, I'm actually glad we're reading the introduction because I told some people that we'd start at seven Dake, and I feel like um, we're actually 45 minutes in, which is cool. And I feel like, um, like on the app, I can probably start with the text itself. So that works just great. And we have now people joining to watch us, which is nice. Um, please, by the way, engage in the comment section here. I'll be reading comments um, as they come and ask questions about the book, you know, share your thoughts, reflections. You'll we'll probably have more thoughts once we get into the book itself. So no brush. Hesse's relationship to India through his family had already been mentioned as his journey in Southeast Asia. Siddhartha was the most important product of that relationship, but far from the only one. In 1930, for example, Hesse published the volume Us Indian, which consisted chiefly of an account of his trip, but also included, among other items, the short story Robert Agihon about a young missionary in India who, bark who barks at becoming part of the colonial establishment and who loses his calling when no longer convinced that the religion he came to impose was necessarily superior to that of a local population. That's an interesting little novel. Although uh, another journey to the East, although this time very unrealistic and much more of a fantasy, even than Siddhartha, is the basis of Hesse's important uh, novella in 1931, The Journey to the Orient, translated also as Journey to the East. And significantly, one of the previous um, incarnations of the hero of the glass speed game takes place in ancient India. Oh, there's a footnote here. I love footnotes. Um, this was a footnote about earlier when we were talking about the different parts of the book. It says, although the novel is formally divided into two parts, it actually falls naturally into three parts of four chapters each. Ingenious critic laboriously attempted. This guy, he's like so... <laughs> the way he uses his language to make his point very subtly clear without even saying it. One ingenious critic laboriously attempted to equate the four chapters of part one with the four great truths of Buddhism and the eight chapters of chapter two with Buddhist's eightfold path. That's an interesting structural uh, analysis. In, back to the main text, finish with the footnote. In Siddhartha, the historical situation is very specific. The 60 or so years of the hero's life can be dated to around 540 to 480 BC, before the Common Era. On the basis of the traditional dates for the Buddha, which is roughly 560 to 480. This was a period of great intellectual and spiritual upheaval. The older Vedic religion or Brahmanism, Hinduism, which at least as far as written records show, was based on strict ritual observance in the worship of old Indo-European deities, Observances requiring the participation of the Brahmins, the highest costly, uh, the highest priestly caste, was coming to an end. The new Vedic writings of the time were the Upanishads, which reinterpreted the religion philosophically and mystically, preaching the oneness of the universe. Brahman, Brahmanism uh, was slowly developing into Hinduism, which, it's funny, these terms are kind of used in weird ways, but... So over here, Brahmanism is seen as earlier, develops in, into Hinduism, which was still polytheistic, but largely characterized by almost exclusive devotion to a single supreme god chosen from among a small number. The most popular gods now proved to be the gods of the common people who had played only a, a minor role in the Vedas. Uh, Shiva and Vishnu, Vishnu being worshipped in various forms of his incarnations, especially Rama and Krishna, otherwise known as Ramakrishna. Oh, we have some comments here. Um, Shalom says, not sure if relevant, but your words cause a thought to pop into my head. Yay. The real uh, trinity is the unity of the three quintessential humans, the believer, the non-believer, and the one who isn't sure. Huh. The trinity of the theist, the atheist, and the agnostic. Interesting thought. Uh, Edward Dratha says, I first read this book while living in a Buddhist monastery as I was trying to possibly become a monk. I left, and my decision was partly inspired by this book. Yo, that is so cool, Edward. Um, I would love to hear more about that and how you, the book affected you in your own spiritual, personal journey. Thank you for sharing that with us. Another contemporary 
Um, other, another contemporary result of the fundamental questioning of the established religion at this time was a number of sects or heresies, particularly Buddhism, um, which, looked on earth with, which looked on earthly life as mere suffering and whose adherents sought release from the eternal round of reincarnation that was, universally believe, that was universally believed in at the time. Whereas the Hindu hoped that good works in this life would lead to a loftier and more comfortable position in their next next existence, the Buddhist saw no the Buddhist so the Buddhist saw the Buddhist saw no good in living at all, and saw total extinction nirvana. It's literally what nirvana means to be blown out, to be extinct. The historical Buddha um, Siddhartha Gautama of the Sakya clan preached the four great truths. Number one, you have your pen and paper? All existence is suffering. Number two, suffering is caused by desires. Number three, to stop suffering, one must cease to desire. Number four, this is achieved by the Eightfold Path, available at bookstores near you. That path consisted of, oh, this is the Eightfold Path, consists of uh, correct opinions, correct thought, correct speech, correct actions, correct way of living, correct effort, correct attention, correct concentration. You get all those eight right, and you, my friend, can buy your one-way ticket into Nirvana. That's right. There's a footnote here. It's hard to say why Hess gave his hero the same name as the Buddha's. The Buddha is never called by that name in, the, in this book. It's a source of confusion at first for anyone familiar with Buddhism. I'm glad we're clarifying this confusion before we, we all get confused here. And Hess expected some familiarity because he uses a number of Buddhist terms and concepts without further explanation. The similarity of names certainly confused the, the writer of the short articles on Hess in a prominent encyclopedia. One edition after another was transmit, was, has transmitted the notion that the novel is about the early life of the Buddha. Brackets in parentheses, it's rather unnerving to reflect that the author of the article never read the book can you imagine a literary agent who's writing a review never even read the book? That is unthinkable. That would never happen in today's day and age. <laughs> Joking. No one reads books anymore. Books are books are like so 20, 2019. No, like anyhow. Um so that's a good question. Why did he call the protagonist Siddhartha and confuse the hell out of all of us? Yeah, <laughs> that's me. I can type and read at the same time. I can multitask. Welcome to a man multitasking. Okay, next paragraph. The, uh, the original or primitive Buddhism specifically tended to save those who took poverty and became monks, renouncing all worldly ties, ignoring the gods, and included little in the way of worship. It has been called a philosophy or therapy rather than a religion. This is a true point. I mean, many people refuse to identify Buddhism, or at least early Buddhism, as a religion. Um, and see it more of a sort of an ideology or philosophy. That's a, that's a cool point. Much later, however, by the beginning of the Christian era, Buddhism developed in India into the Mahayana school. Mahayana literally means the great vehicle or the chariot. Mahayana, the chariot, Merkava, chariot, early mysticism is called chariots. That's interesting. Which became a religion for the masses. It went it went public. Um, with a extensive pantheon, lots of gods, a multiplicity of Buddhas, the possibility of instant salvation without effort. That always goes down well with the masses. And uh huh. We <laughs> apparently What? The fans are complaining they want me to drink right now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys are impetuous. I will say L'chaim and then we'll get back to the story. L'chaim. Salut. Cheers. Welcome. Okay. Um, hmm. Uh, Edward, it's a common misconception that Buddhism finds no value in life and seeks annihilation just as you said. Buddhism is not annihilation. Nirvana literally means to put out a flame. Correct, to extinguish. Um, it's 7 p.m. here. 
Um, yeah, okay. So, Edward, I appreciate that point. Uh, there is a difference, Lachaim, Karen. There is a difference between uh, annihilation and extinction. I am not right now voicing my own opinions about Buddhism and my own thoughts about the philosophy of Buddhism. I'm just reading the whoever authored this introduction. Um, but I appreciate your your point of critique. Um, hey, Haley, uh, Damien was one of your favorite. Well, you're about to have a new favorite because this beats Demian any day. I mean, for, I'm sorry for all the diehard fans of Demian. Don't come after me for that, but welcome to a great book. Okay. Now, um, so the new Buddhism had an extensive pantheon, uh, a multiplicity of Buddhas, uh, the possibility of, inst of instant salvation without great effort, and an active corpus of guardian angels, bodhisattvas. This is a something which is unique to Hayana. In this form, Buddhism, which was to disappear in India, conquered Tibet, China, Mongolia, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. A form of them closer to the original survives only in Sri Lanka, in uh, Myanmar, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. For the technical Indian terms in the novel, as well as a brief analysis of the names of the characters, see the glossary that follows this introduction. Cool. Hess was interested in Chinese philosophy as well, and even um, stated that Taoism was a greater influence on, Siddharth on Siddhartha than Indian philosophies were. Interesting. I want to see where we get some Chinese thought in here in addition to the Indian. Interesting. Um, some typical Taoist elements are the praise of quietism, seclusion, and an austerely simple lifestyle, and the belief that softness is stronger than hearts. Interesting. I mean, I also wonder, and feel free to comment and get involved in this conversation, I wonder how much um, Hess's own upbringing in North Germany influenced his philosophy. I mean, it must have. And these ideas of quietism, seclusion, simple lifestyle, austerity, um, these are ideas which were prevalent in, in, in sort of Northern German thought. If you think about even later German thinkers, someone like Heidegger, who's very into like the simplicity of being Dasein, to just be um, the idea of being connected with nature. There is very deep in romanticism in the Nazifia of Germany. Um, so yeah, but I could see where he, I could see like this German dude heading to Asia, India, China, and finding a lot of his own childhood beliefs that were in the blood of his own culture being confirmed in the East, which must've been a really cool experience to see that the, the East was not so different from the West. Okay. Cause we're all human, right? This whole East West distinction is kind of, kind of nonsense. Now, <sighs> almost all of Hess's, we're almost finished the introduction. All of you who are waiting for the main text. Hold, hold in. Um, can we pop open a window here? Is that possible? Thank you so much. Almost all of Hess's novels are philosophical and, are, and allegorical to some extent. Uh, they are not character studies, like Stendhal's, for instance, or depictions of society, like Balzac. So if anyone came for an analysis of society or for a character study, I'm sorry, it's not what you're going to get. Um, next... So next, Adam says next stream should be wine and Hebrew poetry, Andalusian edition. Bro, I am down for some wine and Andalusian poetry. <laughs> Thank you for the suggestion. Um, let's, let's do it. I mean, let's see how this one goes. I may be totally slushed by the end of this. And I may be like fired from YouTube for promoting reckless book reading and drinking. Um, hey, Oleg, welcome to the chat. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're just thick into the introduction, so you didn't miss anything. Um, like Balzac or vivid um, tableau of real people interacting with one another in their circumstances like Tolstoy. But, yo, no worries, man. It's cool if you're late. We are just, we haven't even got to the main text yet, so it's all good. Siddhartha is by far the most schematic, and incidents can readily put it on a graph. The characters have no more individuality than those in such medieval allegories as the Romance of the Roses, Siddhartha is a long um, preachment, quite literally offering us books in the running brooks, sermons in stones and everything, and good in everything. I have no idea what that line means. 
books in the running brooks, sermons in stones. Oh, and good and everything. I get it. That instead of reading books, you can head out into nature and find books inside the brooks and find sermons of moral um, inspiration in the in the in the stones and the brooks. Cool. The flow, however, is much more emotional and image and imagistic than systematic or readily thought out. Shimon, by the way, if you're still in here, have I lost you yet? Because I told you, Shimon, it's going to be an easy read. This is not. This is just an introduction. So he's getting a bit fancy, showing off how smart he is. But we'll get to the main text, Shim. Don't worry. I'm with you. <laughs> okay, the novel's vitality and connection to reality are due to its genuine sources in Hesse's own life. Siddhartha, minus perhaps some of the virtues he acquires at the end, such as unstinging love, is Hesse. Siddhartha is Hesse. The struggles of Siddhartha against his priestly father and those of his own son ref uh, against him reflect Hesse's defiance of authority as a child. Um, Siddhartha's, because oh, we know like from the introduction earlier that Siddhartha really had a rough time with his parents with uh, rebelling against authority. Um, and he expresses that in his book, as one does. Siddhartha's conclusion that teachings are useless reflects Hesse's interrupted schooling and his pride in his self-education. Aha, so this theme of rejecting teaching uh, and rejecting ideas give being given from others is uh, going to be an important theme. So I'm glad that we opened that up in the conversation. Siddhartha's self-doubt and, and attempts at suicide, yikes, have real echoes in Hesse's life. Uh, even small details are relevant. The draft that Siddhartha builds with uh, Vasendra may well refer to Hesse's rides on, log on loggers' rafts when a boy in Kalu, like Peter Kamazind, like Damien, like the Steppenwolf, like Magister Lugi, Siddhartha is an outsider choosing their own path, no matter how disturbing it may be to society. Although a fundamentally antisocial lifestyle, such as a criminal's, is rather, is rarely a choice for, for Hess's heroes. So he's not going to go full out and be like just some criminal who's totally giving the finger to society, but someone who's on their own path and trying to find their own truth and trying to reject, you know, teachings just that were given down to them. Um, aside from this, aside from it, aside from its verbal charm, the book also is also enlivened by a series of memorable, insightful touches with a ring of psychological veracity. As when the love-starved Siddhartha dreams, he's embracing his friend Govina, and the figure dissolves into that of a nurturing woman. That's sweet. The book was immediately successful in Germany and is still regarded by some as Hesse's greatest. Uh, there is a where I think I think we're going to find ourselves in that camp by the end of this reading. There is a vast body of critical literature in Germany concerning it. It was translated into Hungarian, Russian, French, Japanese, Dutch, Polish, Czech, and two dozen other languages, including a dozen spoken in India um, after World War II. It was Henry Miller, another kind of influential outsider, who, becoming enamored uh, with the novel, urged his publishers New Directions to commission an English translation. Um, although this pioneering effort first published in 1951 did not meet high standards of accuracy, completeness, fidelity to the tone of the original, or even proper English, shots fired, it did. Uh, I have no idea what this word is. Y-O-E-M-A-N? Is this a typo or... Do you guys see this? Ye ye man is, is that a word? Someone help me out here. Um, Oleg says, Hesse is one of my favorite writers. Nice. Good call. Uh, is this my first time reading him? This is not my first time reading him in general. I read some of Demian and The Glass Bead Game. And um, one more. I uh, can't remember which. Uh, this is my first time reading Siddhartha. So I'm very excited. I feel like I'm going to like this best out of all of his books. Okay, um, it did ye o man, that's the word here, uh, service, what could this word be? It did something service in introducing Siddhartha to the English speaking world. This novel has, re has remained Hesse's most popular of in the United States. It must 
remain a matter of personal opinion whether the best possible use uh, is made of the novel in the decades or two of translation. That is, whether Hess had ever envisioned the book as a side dish to LSD, <laughs> a hippie handbook, or a Bible for the dropout and draft dodger. Although, did Hess think that this book would be a good side dish to LSD? I don't think so. Um, although the unguarded and unqualified terms in which he sometimes praises the rejection of conventional wisdom and morality, inviting the reader to, quote, do their own thing, make him partly responsible for any results whatsoever, only a hastily superficial reading could have produced the most unfortunate results that did ensue. Wow. This book had some unfortunate societal results. <laughs> I take no responsibility. <laughs> I'm just reading it, guys. I'm dead. <laughs> today, in a substantially calmer period, um, today is not a calm period. When the author wrote the instructions of the calm period, we're not in a calm period. Uh, then, in a substantially calm period, we can, we, can, we can recognize that this outcry against oppressive social forces, this plea for settlement, despite the expectations of others, that was of a mature, responsible man, a friend of writers, composers, and artists, himself a violinist and painter as well, a highly educated and sophisticated intellectual aristocrat, and that it was intended for his peers. Okay, so according to this author, Hess was some kind of aristocratic snob writing for his aristocratic friends. I, I don't know who wrote this introduction. I don't buy it. Um, and now, my friends, we are at the... The Glossary of Indium Terms. <laughs> uh, let's see if we read this glossary. I don't think we need to read this glossary. We'll, we'll just read the introduction. There's something cool here. One second. Um, okay. Uh, so this is the preliminary remarks in the uh, Glossary of Indian Terms. Yeah, please. Um, the lore... <laughs> We're going to have a bit of a wardrobe situation here. It's all only, you guys only see this, so that's cool. The lore of, uh, lore, L-O-R-E. The lore of Buddhism in India has been chiefly handed down in two different languages. Sanskrit, um, a direct outgrow of the Vedic language, and the classical language uh, of Hindu India par excellence, like Latin for medieval and Renaissance Europe, it is mainly the latter Mahayana Buddhist writings that use a form of Sanskrit and Pali, a later but closely related language exhibiting significantly phonetic simplifications vis-a-vis -vis Sanskrit. Um, Pali is the chief language in which the oldest Buddhist texts uh, have come down to us and is the uh, sacred tongue of the conservative Theravadan sect of Buddhism still prevalent in Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. Um, okay. Hess, though a voracious reader, deeply imbued with Asian thought, was not a scholar. What? What's? What? He, what is a scholar, anyways? And in this novel, he indiscriminately mixed Sanskrit and Pali terms. Oh my gosh! I I don't know if we're gonna read this novel, guys. He indiscriminately mixes Pali and Sanskrit terms. We're gonna have to. We're just gonna have to read something new. <laughs> that's that's an atrocity. And us at Seekers of Unity, with our high level of scholastic integrity, will not read such a work, which is. Aggerently mixing up its linguist. No, we will. Okay. Uh, in fact, some commentators on Siddhartha have seen him as basically a name dropper. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Do you know who I met? <laughs> the Buddha. <laughs> Moreover, he never used any of the standard uh, diacritic marks, such as horizontal rule, or a circumflex. <laughs> Hold up. He does not use the di circumflex. <laughs> Are we reading a book for plebs here? <laughs> okay, I apologize. I apologize for you. I, I apologize to everyone that we chose a book with no diacritic circumflexes. <laughs> but we're already like so far into the book, so we're just getting here. <laughs> I'll let you know when there should have been a diacritic circumflex or a horizontal roll. Over vowels to indicate length, adopt beneath certain consonants to indicate their pronunciation with a tongue tip placed 
beneath the upper teeth ridge. He's telling us how to pronounce vowels when they have a dot to a tongue. What are we like? Apology declined. Yeah, you should be offended. He's also he's also questioning our intelligence by telling us how, where we should put the tip of our tongue behind the upper teeth ridge, etc. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? Quite naturally, a few words he uses uh, with the German spelling that has been become standard, just as we do, for example, with the Upanishads, Nirvana, Vishnu, Krishna, etc. Uh, in the present translation, to avoid confusion and pedantry, the English uses a Pali form, uh, um, where the German does, and a Sanskrit form, where the German does, at the request of the publisher. Blah 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 blah. This, the the oh, get this. This is rich. This is rich. Uh. The translation also omits diacritic marks, um, the ignorance of which, as well as general linguistic carelessness, general linguistic carelessness, where have we come to, has led to a few commenters of Siddhartha into ludicrous errors. Ludicrous, I tell you. Totally misreading the Sanskrit and the Pali. Here, in, it would have been foolish not to use a few standard English spellings analogous to the German ones mentioned at the end of the glossary paragraph. The glossary, however, does use a scholarly transliteration. Whew, few, including diacritic marks. Awesome. Where necessary, distinguishing Pali from Sanskrit terms, a, a deep sigh of relief. Uh, and the terms of proper names are historical, not invented by Hess, except those marked by an asterisk. Um, and something, something else. Uh, other things marked by a dagger. I'm not going to read the um, glossary because I am unlike Hess in his linguistic uh, ludicrous carelessness, I, I I know my Pali and my Sanskrit well, and I will just tell you when the Pali words need to be translated. If I get stuck, I'll turn back to the glossary. Okay. Yay! We're at part one. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to change my pants because it's getting warm in here. Um, and I, I'm not going to give you guys the uh, all the uh, all the all, all the joy of of having to, to to experience me changing my pants. I hope I can edit this out later when this goes published. Ah, okay. And I hope you guys are all ready. I'm like Superman, just popping in, popping out, changing pants. Um, okay, we're gonna read part one now, and we are here. L'chaim to part one. Uh, tell all your friends on social media that we're about to read part one of the greatest book of mysticism written in German. Here we go. Get comfy. Get your popcorn out. We about to begin. Wait, let's get, let's get a bit closer so you guys can... Ah, uh, all right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, a great start. Thank you. I, <laughs> thank you so much. That was a great start. I had fun. And that's what counts automatic, like at the end of the day, right? <laughs> uh, get them reading pants on people. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. Reading pants are on. Part one. The son of the Brahmin. In the shadow of the house. What is that background noise? Hello? It's the rice. Oh, we have a, okay, we're quick. <laughs> we really is gonna take a few hours, so I made some snacks for myself. We have some we have some rice going, we have some uh, drinks, we have some popcorns, we have some fun stuff. I hope you guys are ready um, for this. Um, Deep breath, deep breath. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. My live audience requests me to wait a minute while the... Uh... <laughs> oh, can I, can I get your guys' thoughts on the introduction? What do we think about the introduction? What do we think about uh, whoever wrote the introduction? Do we have a title? Do we have an author here? It's nameless. It's a nameless introduction. I mean... Come on. What do we think about the the uh, 
Hess's life story, do we resonate with that? Do we have some sorts of rebellion? Um, were any of us tried to be forced into the clergy and decided to go their own way? <laughs> no one here was forced into the clergy. Um, in your respective religions, was anyone even smicha that they did? Anyone made a priest given priestly ordination that they weren't interested in? Um, uh, I made a movie on this book, Siddhartha. Yeah. Wow. I'm I'm really glad that we're reading the book first. I'm sure I'm gonna hate the movie after watching the book. That's like, has anyone ever watched a movie after reading a book and be like, that was just as good? As, okay. Are we ready? Yalla, I want to start. We're at part one. Okay. Um, what if? Okay, I'm gonna. We're going to begin with the read the text, right here, right now. Um, let me actually just uh, <laughs> share a picture, and then we begin. La 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 la. Okie dokie. I'll guys for the camera. Okay, part one, the son of the Brahmin. In the shadow of the house. Uh, hating the movie after we read the book is like hating life after we read text. It is what it is and make the book of how and make the best of how this turns out. There's reason. That's a nice, that's a nice kind of Buddhist comment. Okay, here we go. In the shadow of the house, in the sunset of the riverbanks by the boats, in the shadow of the sal tree forest. I'm debating whether I should read the footnotes here at the bottom of the text. I don't think so. I must be allergic to the uh, sal tree forest. Um, sal tree is timber tree with wood as hard as teak. I don't think these footnotes are necessary. I don't need to know how hard sal is. No, I'm, I'm not reading footnotes. Thank you, Alec. In the shadow of the fig tree, Siddhartha grew up, the handsome son of the Brahmin. The young falcon, together with uh, Govinda, his friend, the Brahmin's son. Sunshine tanned his fair shoulders at the riverbank, where he bathed during holy abulations, during the holy sacrifices. Can everyone hear me well? Like, am I, am I reading too loud or too soft? Shadow floated into his dark eyes in the mango grove during his boys, while his mother sang during the holy sacrifices, when he was taught father, the learned man, where he conversed with the sages. For some time now, Siddhartha had taken part in the conversation of the sages, had participated, um, had practiced oracular contests with Govinda, they debated, had practiced with, with Govinda the art of contemplation, the duty of total concentration. He already understood how to utter the Om silently, that word of words, how to utter it silently into himself as he inhaled. How to utter it silently forth from himself as he exhaled. Um. His psychic power was concentrated, his brow encircled with the glow of the clear thinking mind. He already understood how to recognize Atman within his being, indestructible at one with the universe. That's a, that was a really nice first paragraph. Uh, Atman, all those that aren't familiar, is some sort of relative equivalent, not a perfect equivalent, a qualitative equivalent of what we would call the soul in Western theology. Feel free to disagree in the chat. Joy leaped to father's heart 
at that sun, so quick to learn, so eager for knowledge, he saw a great sage and priest developing in him, a priest amongst the Brahmins. Bliss leapt in his mother's bosom whenever she saw him. She had nachas, we would say. When she saw him walking, sitting down and standing up, Siddhartha, the strong, the handsome, walking on slender legs, greeting her with perfect propriety. Uh, thank you, Oleg. Atman is the self in Jungian, psych in Jungian philosophy as well. Nice. Love stirred in the hearts of the young Brahmin daughters whenever Siddhartha passed through the lanes of the town with his gleaming brow, his kingly eyes, his narrow hips. He was a ladies' man. <laughs> but more, I'll, I'll be serious. This is a serious text. <laughs> but more than all of these, he was loved by Govinda, his friend, the Brahmin's son. Some bromance. He loved his eyes and pleasant voice. He loved his gait and the perfect propriety of his movements. He loved everything Siddhartha did and said, and all above, he loved his intelligence, his lofty, his fiery thoughts, his burning will, his high vocation. Govinda knew this man will not become any ordinary Brahmin, no lazenary functionary at sacrifices, no avaricious merchant of magic charms, no vain, empty speech maker, no malicious, crafty priest, but also no kindly, stupid sheep of the flock of the multitude. No. And too, Govinda did not wish to become one of those. A Brahmin like 10,000 others. He wanted to follow Siddhartha, the loved one, the splendid one. And if Siddhartha should ever become a god, if he should ever enter the company of the radiant ones, then Govinda wished to follow him as his friend, his companion, his servant, as spear bearer, his shadow. Nice. Uh, we have a very likable character here. Uh, we have a very likable character by the name of Siddhartha. And we have close buddy um, Govinda. Nice. So far, so good. Thus did everyone love Siddhartha. He gave joy to all. He was a pleasure to all. But he, Siddhartha, did not give himself joy. Mm. He was no pleasure to himself. Strolling on the pinkish walks of the, fog, of the fig orchard, sitting in the shade of the grove of contemplation, walking his limbs in the daily expiatory bath, Sacrificing in the deep shade of the mango forest with gestures of, with gestures of perfect propriety. Loved by all, the joy of all. Nevertheless, he bore no joy in his heart. Poor dude. Everyone loves him besides himself. Everyone's happy when he's around besides himself. What a heartthrob. Oof. What a character. Dreams came to him. And uneasy thoughts flowed to him from the waters of the river. Sparkling from the night skies, molten in the rays of the sun, dreams came to him, and restlessness of the soul. Smoking to him out of the sacrifices, uttered from the verses of the Rig Veda, trickling from the teachings of the old Brahmins. <coughs> Ah, bless me. Siddhartha had begun. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I apologize, by the way. I have I have allergies, so um, it gets like triggered by all kinds of things. <sighs> Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Siddhartha had begun to, nat- to nurture dissatisfaction within himself. He had, begun to, he had begun to feel that his father's love and his mother's love, and also the love of his friend Govinda, were not always and for all were, were not always for all time making him happy, content, uh, content him, sate him, su- uh, su- suffice him. He felt like their their happiness in him wouldn't. <laughs> Thank you. Wouldn't keep him happy. He had begun to for he begun to foresee that his venerable father and his other teachers um, that the Brahmin sages had already imparted to him, the greater part and best part of their wisdom, that they had already poured their abundance into his expectant vessels, and the vessel was not full. His mind was not satisfied. His soul was not at ease. His heart was not contented. Contented. The abulations were good, but they were water and they did not wash away his sins. They did not heal the mind's thirst. They did not dispel the heart's anguish. Excellent were the sacrifices and the invocations of the gods. Was that everything? The sacrifices offer happiness? And what was all the talk about gods? Was it really... Prajapati, who had created the world? Was it not the Atman, he, the only one, the all one? Were not the gods beings that were formed, created as you and I, subject to time, mortal? And so, was it good? Was it correct? Was it a meaningful and supreme activity to sacrifice to the gods? To whom else should one sacrifice? To whom else was re- was reverence to be offered, but to him, the only one, the Atman. Where was Atman to be found? Where did he dwell? Where did his eternal heart beat? Where else but in one's own sleep, deep within oneself, in that indestructible something that each man bore inside? But where, where was this self, this innermost thing, this innermost thing? It was not flesh and bone. It was not thought or consciousness. Thus the sages taught, where, where was it? To reach that far, to attain the ego, the self, the Atman, was there another path that was profitable to be sought? Ah, but no one pointed out that path. No one knew it, not his father, not his teachers, nor the sages, not the holy sacrificial chants. They knew everything. The Brahmins, their sacred books, they knew everything. They had troubled their minds over everything, and more than any, and more than everything, the um, uh, the it's a hyphen word here. Sorry, the creation of the worlds, the ocean of speech, of food, of inhalation, of exhalation, the categories of the senses, the exploits they knew an infinite about, an infinite amount, but was any, but was it of any value to know all of this? when they did not know the one and only thing, the most important thing, the only important thing. A very like valid critique of like established religion that people just sort of to do practices and rituals and, and forget like the, 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 the and the core and the soul of religion. Lots of talk about sacrifice and, God and practice, but what about the thing is, I feel you. To be sure, many verses of the sacred books, especially in the Upanishads of the Samveda, spoke of this innermost ultimate thing, splendid verses. Your soul is the world was written there. And it was written there that in sleep, in deep sleep, men entered their innermost being and dwelt in the Brahman. Marvelous wisdom was contained in those verses. All the knowledge of the great sages was gathered there in magical works, pure as honey gathered by bees. No, one should not hold lightly the store of knowledge that had been gathered and preserved there by countless generations of Brahman sages. But where were those Brahmins? Where were those priests? 
where were those sages or penitents who had succeeded not merely in knowing this most profound knowledge, but in living it? Where was the expert who could, who could magically transfer his sojourn in the Atman from the sleeping to the waking state, to real life, to every step he took, to words and deeds? Siddhartha knew many venerable Brahmins, his father especially, a pure man, a learned man, a man most highly to be revered. His father was admirable. His demeanor was calm and noble. His life pure. His words wise, subtle and noble thoughts resided in his brow. But even he, who knew so much, did he then live in bliss? Was he at peace? Was not he too merely a seeker, a man of thirst? Was it not necessary for him, parched man, to drink again and again at sacred springs, at the sacrifices, at the books, at the dialogues of the Brahmins? Why was it necessary for him, the faultless one, to wash away his sins every day, to strive for purification every day, all over again every day? Was Brahman not in him then? Did the wellspring not flow then in his own heart? It had to be found, the wellspring of one's own self. It had to be securely possessed. All else was a mere quest, a detour, an aberration. <laughs> his dad, who was so perfect in his eyes, who was so noble and graceful and so wise, has he not found that place of inner serenity and peace, of inner redemption, nirvana, that he still is searching and seeking and... Thus ran Siddhartha's thoughts. This was his thirst. This was his sorrow. Often he recited to himself the words from the Chanda Yoga um, Upanishad. Sorry, one second. Often he would re recite to himself the words from the Chanda Yoga Upanishads. Yeah, allergies. It's, uh, I don't know, this time of the year or something. Verily, the name of Brahman is Satyam. Truly, he who enters... Hey, Nimitin. What's up, man? Thanks for joining. Um, we're just reading this great book. Come and, come and read with us. It's so cool. It's a really good book. And you actually will have some really great thoughts to contribute. Please, please like get involved in the conversation. Siddhartha, Siddhartha, thus ran Siddhartha's thoughts. This was his thirst. This was his sorrow. Oh, by the way, everyone here, Nimitin, who just commented, he has a really, really cool channel that's also covering a lot of topics in the mysticism, Kabbalah, esotericism. Go and check out and a friend. Thus ran Siddhartha's thoughts. This was his thirst. This was his sorrow. Often he recited to himself the words, from the Chan Doga Upanishads. Verily, the name of the Brahman is Satyam. Truly, he who knows this enters daily into the heavenly world. I think I might make in the glossary what Satyam means. Unless any of the commenters can tell us what Satyam means. Satyam is um, truth. Cool. Uh, very, the name of Brahman is Satyam. The name of Brahman is, is truth. Interestingly enough, in in tradition, we say Shmoi sometimes or Emes, that the name or the, the seal of God is truth. It's cool to see the literal, the name of Brahman is Satyam, is truth. Truly, he who knows this enters daily into the heavenly world. It seemed, it often seemed near. <laughs> That's it often seemed near that heavenly world, but he never fully attained it. He had never quenched his ultimate thirst. Although all the wise and wisest men who he knew and whose instruction he enjoyed, there was none of them who had fully attained it. That heavenly world who had fully quenched it, that eternal thirst. You know, I, I got to say, like, along with this Siddhartha fellow, when I began my own, like, exploration into mysticism and spirituality to I I often like often would hear about this idea of like the perfection of being the the, the 
omnipresence of, of God and goodness and the capacity to be in the eternal now and to be in heaven, wherever we are. And at the time, actually, I was like not in a very happy place. I was like very lonely and kind of depressed. Um, and I would often wonder to myself, like, what is, where is all of this bliss and happiness that's promised by the mystics? Why don't I feel it in, in my own now? My own now is filled with so much like darkness and, and loneliness. And, and um, so this is a very, very real, like, and I've like, I've learned things since then. And like, I've, I have no insights about that. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. But, um, but um, this is, um, yeah, I resonate with this. By the way, I have someone who's like helping me with my social media who's commenting while I'm talking. So while I'm talking about my deep pain and existential misery, they're talking about me taking shots. We're going to subscribe this. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Just setting that emotional tone. <laughs> Just the sad music in the background. Shots, 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 shots. Jeez. Okay. Back to the book. Govinda, Siddhartha said to his friend, My dear Govinda, come with me under the banyan tree. We shall practice concentration. They went to the banyan tree. They sat down. Siddhartha there. Uh, Govinda 20 paces further. As he was sitting down, ready to utter the Om, Siddhartha repeated in a mur, the verse, <laughs> Om. Om is the bow, the arrow is the The Brahman is the arrow's goal, which should be hit unswervingly. He wants to get to Brahman. He wants to hit his goal. When the customary period of the concentration practice had, had, had passed, Govinda arose. Evening had come. It was time to perform the abulation of the evening hour. Can we, um, can we get a translation of abulation from my uh, tech team? Abulation? Um, I, th I think it's some sort of like dipping in water. Is that what abulation is? Oh, I see. Um, we hit 900 and, and uh, 84 subscribers. I think we need to uh, have a l'chaim. <laughs> We're talking about the deep sadness and abulations of Siddhartha. This is no time to drink. Abulation, is that, is that a translation? Oh, nice. A, a spiritual bath. I thought so. Some sort of dipping in water. Um, okay, we're going to say L'chaim, as we promised, because we got a new subscriber. Welcome. We appreciate you. Welcome to the family of seekers. L'chaim. Catch? Whoa. Thanks. Okay. Um, I thought so. So he murmurs this verse. Om is the... <laughs> but these are pretty big. Like, that's that's a decently sized shell class. Uh, it, it's about to get messy up in here. Um, internet is unstable. I'm going to pause a second while the internet reconnects. Please wait while we try reconnecting. We're back. Okay. Om is the bow. The arrow is the soul. The Brahman is the arrow's goal, which should be hit unswervingly. When the customary period of the concentration practice had passed, Govinda arose. Evening had come. It was time to perform the abulation of the evening hour. He called Siddhartha to go dip in ritual water. He called Siddhartha's name. Siddhartha made no reply. He ghosted him. Siddhartha sat in concentration. They were fixed on a very distant goal. The tip of his tongue protruded slightly between his teeth. He seemed not to be breathing. Thus he sat, shrouded in concentration, thinking of Om. His soul had been shot like an arrow at the Brahman. Once um, Sasamans had passed, Sasamans, let's turn to the glossary. Uh, Sasaman. 
<laughs> this is the true marriage of the Ferengian and the symposium. Symposium in Greek, by the way, means to drink together. That's what it means. Symposia. Check it out. The Sassaman is a wandering ascetic. Uh, this is how the word is used through most of the novel. In Buddhism in particular, it refers to a mendicant monk. Hess uses it, Hess uses it in this way at various times. Uh, he goes into the etymology here, which is not important. Okay, so some sort of itiner itinerant mendicants, ascetics. Once some sons have passed through Siddhartha's town, itinerant ascetics. I could have just read the next three words. Nice. Three dried up, burnt out men, neither old nor young, with dusty and thirsty, sorry, with dusty and bloody shoulders, nearly nude, scorched by the sun, surrounded by solitude surrounded by solitude, strangers and enemies to the world, outsiders and emaciated jackals in the realm of human beings. Behind them wafted a hot smell of silent passion. Behind them wafted a hot smell of silent passion, of destructive duty, of pitiless liberation of the self. Uh, symposium, we are told by one of our friends here, is also... Uh, equals Iranos. I think Iranos means to uh, gather together in feast and symposium is gather together and drink. I may be wrong. That was a really poetic description. In the evening, after the hour of contemplation, Siddhartha said to Govinda, tomorrow morning, my friend, Siddhartha will go to this to these Samans. He will become a Saman. Siddhartha is going to become a Saman, to go live this life of itinerant asceticism, of bloody burnt out shoulders, of emaciated jackals, followed by the hot smell of Sashin's destructive duty. That was Siddhartha's decision. Govinda turned pale when he heard those words and read the resolve in his friend's motionless features. He resolved as impossible to, to deflect as an arrow loosened from a bow. Shot had been fired. It was done. Immediately at the first glance, Govinda realized now is the beginning. Now Siddhartha is going his way. Now his destiny is beginning to germinate and mine along with his. And he became pale as a dry plantation peel, as a dry banana peel. Oh, Siddhartha, he called. Will your father allow you to? Siddhartha glanced over at him like a man awakened. With the speed of an arrow, he read into Govinda's soul. He read the anguish there. He read the devotion. Oh, Govinda, he said softly. Let us not waste words. Tomorrow at daybreak, I shall begin the life of the summer, of the summer, summon us. Speak no more of it. Hush. Siddhartha stepped into the room where he's sitting on a palm fiber mat and stepped behind his father remained standing there until his father felt someone standing behind him. The Brahmin said, Is it you, Siddhartha? Et tu? If so, say what you have come to say. Siddhartha said, With your permission, father, I have come to tell you that I desire to leave your house tomorrow and go to the ascetics. To become a samana is my desire. I hope my father will not oppose this. The Brahmin was silent. And for so long, in that small window, the stars progressed and altered their configuration before the silence in the room came to an end. Nice. Mute and motionless stood the sun, S-O-N. With arms crossed, mute and motionless sat the father on his mat, and the stars moved across the sky. Then the father said, it is unseemly for a Brahmin to speak violence and angry words. But indignation stirs in my heart. I shall not like to hear that request from your lips this other, a second time. Don't you ever, ever mention that again, basically. Slowly the Brahmin rose, Siddhartha's father. Siddhartha stood mute, his arms crossed. What are you waiting for, asked the father. Siddhartha said, you know what for. Indignantly, the father left the room. Indignantly, he sought his bed and lay down. An hour later, with no sleep visiting his eyes, the Brahmin got up, paced to and fro, stepped out of the house, and looked in through the small window of the room 
where he saw Siddhartha standing with arms crossed on the same spot. His light-colored outer garments glimmered palely, glimmered palely, palely. Oh, damn! We hit 986 subscribers. Uh, that means oh, we hit two more subscribers, two shots right now. <laughs> Wait, let me just finish the sentence. <laughs> Uneasy at his heart, his father returned to his bed. At a high point in the novel. We are interrupted <laughs> with a commercial from our good friends, Glenn Murray. <laughs> Two more subscribers. Wow. Um, I think we are going to stop drinking when we hit a thousand or else we got to be in trouble. L'chaim, friends and family. L'chaim, seekers and searchers. Cheers. Salut. May we all find happiness, success, and meaning on our own paths, as hopefully our good friend Siddhartha does. L'chaim to Seeker 965. L'chaim to Seeker 906. Wow. All right, back to the book. An hour later. No, we already read that. He came back an hour later. And again, again, and back again two hours later, looked in through the small window, saw Siddhartha standing in the moonlight, in the starshine, in the darkness. And he came again from hour to hour in silence, looked into the room, saw his son standing motionless, filled his heart with anger, filled his heart with unrest, filled his heart with fearfulness, filled his heart with sorrow. Sad times. Uh, the last hour of the night, before the day began, he returned, stepped into the room, saw the young man standing there, looking, looking tall, and seemingly a stranger. Siddhartha, he said, what are you waiting for? Oh, what for? Guy stood there all night in the same spot, waiting. Will you keep on standing and waiting like this until it is day, noon, and evening? I will... I will stand and wait. You will grow weary, Siddhartha. I shall grow weary. You will fall asleep, Siddhartha. I shall not fall asleep. You will die, Siddhartha. I shall die. And would you rather die than obey your father? Siddhartha has always obeyed his father. And so will you give up your plans? Siddhartha will do what his father tells him to. The first light of day entered the room. The Brahmin saw that Siddhartha's knees were trembling slightly. Poor guy standing there, like, for like, who, like, I don't know, 24 hours. In Siddhartha's face, he saw no trembling. His eyes were looking into the distance. And his father realized that by now Siddhartha was no with him, and at home, he had already left. Siddhartha's father touched his soldier, touched his shoulder. He said, you will go to the forest to be a Samana. You will find salvation in the forest. Come and teach me salvation. Sorry, let me reread that. I read that wrong. You will go to the forest to be a Samana. If you find salvation in the forest, come and teach me salvation. If you find disappointment, then come back and let us know once more Sorry, and let us and let us once more sacrifice the gods together. Now go and kiss your mother. Tell her where you are going. Tell her where you are going. But for me, it is time to go to the river and to perform the first abulation. He lifted his hand from his son's shoulder and went out. Siddhartha stayed to one side when he tried to walk. He brought his limbs under control, bowed to his father and went to his mother, as his father had said. When, at the first daylight, he was slowly leaving the still, silent town on his stiff legs near the lost cottage, there arose a shadow that had been crouched there. It joined the wanderer. It was Govinda. You have come, said Siddhartha, and smiled. I have come, said Siddhartha, said Govinda. That was chapter one. Thoughts, reflections, or shall we continue? 
Strong start. I'm liking it. So much respect, so much dignity, so much resilience and vision determination. Once his arrow had been shot, that's where he was going and that's where he was going. With the Samanas, Samanas, with the ascetics. On the evening of that day, he overtook the ascetics, the dried out ascetics, and offered to accompany them, to accompany them and obey them. They were accepted. Siddhartha gave way his robe to a poor Brahmin on the road. All he still wore was a loincloth, an untailored earth colored wrap. He ate only once a day. The food was never cooked. He fasted for 15 days. He fasted for 28 days. The flesh wasted away from his tongue, from his, sorry, the flesh wasted away from his thighs. Dreams flickered hotly from his watered eyes. On his shriveled nails, on his shriveled fingers, the nails grew long, as did the dry, stubbly beard on his chin. His gaze became icy. He met women. His mouth twitched in contempt when he passed through a town with well-dressed people. Time out? What? Oh, the the feed is timing out? Yeah. I have to stop drinking. I was just going to write any junk. Yeah. (laughs) Are we back on? We're back? His gaze became icy when he met women. Now twitched in contempt when he passed through with well-dressed people. He saw mendicants doing business. Sorry, he saw merchants doing business, princes for the hunt, mourners lamenting their dead, whores offering their services, doctors busy with patients, priests determining the proper day to begin sowing, lovers in love, mothers nursing their children, and none of it was worth the trouble of a glance. It was all a lie. It all stank. It all stank of lies. It all gave the illusion of meaning and happiness and beauty. It was all unacknowledged decay. The world had a bitter taste. Life was torment. One goal was Siddhartha's and only one, to become empty. Empty of thirst. Empty of wishes. Empty of dreams. Empty of joy and sorrow to die away from himself, no longer to be I, to find repose with an emptied heart, to be ready for a miracle with thought liberated from ego. This was his goal. When all ego was overcome and dead, when every yearning and every impulse in the heart was silent, when the ultimate had to awaken, that innermost part of his being, which no longer, which is no longer the self, the great mystery really what all of mysticism strives for. The prosaic death of the ego. Silently, Siddhartha stood beneath the fierce vertical rays of the sun. Burning with pain, burning with thirst, he stood there until no longer, until he no longer felt pain or thirst. Silently, he stood in the rainy season. The water dripping from his hair onto his chilled shoulders, onto his chilled hips and legs. <sighs> And the penitent stood there until shoulders and legs no longer felt cold, till they were silent, until they were still. Silently, he crouched in the brambles, blood oozing from his prickled skin and pus from his abscesses. And Siddhartha remained there rigidly, remained there motionlessly, until no more blood flowed, until there was no more prickling, until there was no more burning. What a transformation! In so short time, from being this Adonis, from being this beauty, from being this thin-waisted, bronze, slender-legged dude who everyone's falling in love with, to being this blood oozing, unsightly, gainly. Give some thumbs up for the poetry, by the way. If you, if you dig the poetry, say what up. Siddhartha sat up straight and learnt to conserve his breath, learnt how to make do with just a little breath, learnt how to cut off his breath. He learnt how to slacken his heartbeat, beginning with the breath. He learnt how to diminish the number of his heartbeats until there were only a few and practically none. Basically to be as as dead as he possibly, possibly could be while he was alive. Instructed by the 
um, Samana Elder, Siddhartha practiced denial of self. He practiced concentration in accordance with new Samana rules. A heron flew over the bamboo forest, and Siddhartha absorbed the heron, a bird, into his soul. He flew over forest and mountain. He was the heron. Is that how you pronounce it, heron? He ate fish. He hungered with the heron's hunger. He spoke with a heron's croaking. He died a heron's death. A dead jackal lay on the sandy riverbank, and Siddhartha's soul slipped into the carcass. He was a dead jackal. He lay on the sand. He swelled up, bank, rotted, was torn apart by hyenas, was skinned by vultures, became a skeleton, turned to dust, blew away into the fields, and Siddhartha's soul returned. It had died. It had rotted. It had fallen into dust. It had tasted the dis- the dis- the dismal in intoxication. It had tasted the dismal intoxication of the cycle of existence. <laughs> it had tasted the dismal intoxication of the cycle of existence. Filled with fresh thirst, like a hunger, it was awaiting the gap through which it might escape the cycle, where causation would come to an end, where sorrowless entity began. He mortified his senses. He mortified his power to remember. He stole out of his ego and into a thousand unfamiliar forms of creation. He was an animal. He was a carcass. He was a stone. He was wood. He was water. And each time upon awakening, he found himself again. The sun or the moon was shining. He himself once again was moving through the cycle. He felt thirst, overcame his thirst. Fresh thirst. Felt fresh thirst. Let me reread that last line. Sorry, I got the <laughs> the cadence wrong. Wow, exciting. No, no, keep it open. It's good. I need to call it. Um, he, he was moving through the cycle. He felt thirst, overcame his thirst. He overcame his thirst. Fresh thirst. Many things did Siddhartha learn from these samanas. He learned how to take many paths away. Away from the self, away from the self. He took the path of liberation from self through. He took the path of liberation from self through pain, through voluntary suffering and conquest of. And conquest of the pain of hunger, thirst, fatigue. He took the path of liberation from self meditation. By consciously emptying his mind of all ideas. He learned to take these and other paths. And a thousand times he left himself behind. It's <laughs> a good line. For hours and days at a time, he remained in the state of non-self. But even though the paths led away from the self, at the end, they always led back to the self. Even though Siddhartha escaped himself a thousand times, sojourning in the void, sojourning as an animal, as a stone, the return was unavoidable, inescapable. The hour in which he found himself in sunlight or in moonlight, in shadow or in rain, and was once again I. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, the return was unavoidable. Inescapable the hour in which he found himself again, in sunlight or in moonlight, in shadow or in rain, and was once again I and Siddhartha. And once again, felt the torment of his cycle that was imposed upon him. So every time he escapes the self, he um, just winds back and never can really truly get away. Alongside him lives Govinda, his shadow, taking the same paths. Subjecting himself to the same efforts, seldom did they say to each other uh, any more than their duty and exercise required. At times, they walked through the villages together to beg for food for themselves and their teachers. What do you think, Govinda, Siddhartha said on one of these mendicant rounds? What do you think? Have we made progress? Have we reached any goals? Govinda answered... We have learnt and we continue to learn. You will be a great Samana, Siddhartha. You have learnt every exercise quickly. 
the old Samans have admired you often. Someday you will be a saint, O Siddhartha. Siddhartha said, it does not seem to me, my friend, what I've learned from this from the Samans up to this day, O Govinda, I could have learned more quickly or more simply. I could have learned it in any tavern, in a prostitute's district. My friend, amongst the teams, teamsters and dice players. Govinda said, Siddhartha is joking with me. How could you have learned concentration, retention of breath, insensibility to hunger and pain, there among miserable creatures? You must be kidding, bro. And Siddhartha said softly, as if speaking to himself, because who else is there? <laughs> What is concentration? What is the ability to leave one's body? What is fasting? What is retention of breath? It is a flight from the self. It is a brief escape torment of being I. It is a brief numbing of the mind to counter pain and the senselessness of life. The same escape, the same brief numbing is found by the ox drover in his inn when he drinks a few bowls of rice wine or fermented coconut milk. Then he no longer feels his self. He no longer feels the pain of life. Then he finds a brief numbing of the mind. Huh? <laughs> On that note, a brief numbing of the mind. We have hit 987 subscribers. Shots, 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 says orders. Can I finish the paragraph, guys? Can I? May I? No. Let me, let me, I'll, I promise, I promise I'll have the shot. Let me just finish the paragraph. I was in the middle of a good paragraph. <laughs> Yo, JJ. Okay, I'm going to say L'chaim now to JJ for joining us. Good to see you, man. Thanks for joining us. And uh, cheers, L'chaim. Aha. Nice. Where is Mendel Inglis? Mendel Inglis! <laughs> Yo, what up, man? So, so cool. <laughs> Yo, Mendel, I'm saying Lechaim just for you, bro. How many Lechaims have we said together? 97. Oh, yeah? You, did you just subscribe, Mendel, to my channel? Okay. Lechaim for something. Lechaim. <sighs> bro, we must have had like a thousand times together and I miss you so much. I miss you. I miss you guys so much. 988. <laughs> How do you guys even know this is going down? Did Menachem tell you? Menachem told you, right? Son of a gun. Okay. We're every subscriber, so we're going to be sloshed. Mendel, I want you to drink with me. All right. Back to the story. <laughs> Let's catch up after this. Um, okay. The same escape, the same brief numbing is found by the ox driver in the inn when he drinks a few bowls of rice, wine, or fermented coconut milk. Then he no longer feels himself. Then he, he no longer feels the pain of life. Then he finds a brief numbing of the mind. When he has dozed off over his bowl of rice wine, he finds the same thing that Siddhartha and Govinda find when, in lengthy exercises, they are released from their bodies and dwell in the non-self. It is thus, O Govinda. The story is getting better, right? <laughs> so Siddhartha is like, bro, all of your enlightenment, all of your getting out of yourself, the drunkard in the tavern is just as enlightened in you. He's just as out of his mind and out of himself as you are when he's like smashed on fermented coconut milk. Whoever has got smashed on fermented coconut milk, I want you to post up in the comments and tell us about that. Govinda said, you speak thus, O friend, and yet you know that Siddhartha is not an ox driver and Samana is not a drunkard. Yes, the drinker is numbed for a while. Yes, he finds a brief escape and rest, but he comes out of his and finds that everything is still the same. And I might add, and worse, because now you have a hangover. He has grown wiser. Sorry, he has not grown wiser. He has not gathered knowledge. He has not risen a few steps higher. 
What do we say? He hasn't had an experience of Ufhebenkeit in the German, in the Yiddish, when he just wakes up from his drunken stupor. Answered Arthur, said with a smile, I don't know, bro. I do not know. I've never been a drinker. <laughs> Who is to say? But that I, said Arthur, find only a brief numbing in my exercises and bouts of concentration, and that I am just as far removed from wisdom and salvation as a child in the womb, and this I know, Ogavinda, this I know, I am so far finding what I'm looking for. This guy's real. This guy, this guy is after what he's after, and he's not going to let go until he gets it. And on another occasion, when Siddhartha left the forest with Govinda to beg some food in the village for their brothers and teachers, Siddhartha began to speak. It's the only time they talk, by the way, is when they leave to beg, like when they're no longer under supervision of the, of the older uh, um, aesthetics. Siddhartha began to speak, saying, Well now, O Govinda, are we on the right path? Are we perhaps approaching knowledge? Are we perhaps approaching salvation? Are we not rather going around in a circle? Who, after all thought we could escape the cycle of existences who was so was so was so <laughs> uh impetuous who was so this is what i'm looking for like chutzpah who had the chutzpah who had the uh hubris to think that we could escape the cycle of existence Elissa siegel says arak is fermented coconut milk is that true? Is that is that true? <laughs> In that case, my friends, we've been there before. <laughs> we know what that uh, Asian innkeeper was getting toasted on. Shout out all those that have got a. This is this has not become a drink. This is not supposed to become a drinking fest. <laughs> I, I apologize. This was supposed to be out about mysticism and reflection and introspection and finding personal redemption and salvation. <laughs> <laughs> you drunkards. Drunkards, nice. Okay. Ha. Huh. Govinda said, so Siddhartha says, Govinda, bro, who, why were we being so arrogant? We think we could escape the circle of existence. To escape existence itself, who, who did we think we were? What's, what's, what's up with that? Govinda said, we have learnt much, Siddhartha, and much still remains to be learnt. I'm not going around <laughs> in a circle we are proceeding upward the circle is a spiral we have already climbed many a step Siddhartha so answered how old do you think our Samana elder is our venerable teacher Govinda said our elder is about 60 years old sounds sounds about right so, and Siddhartha he has become 60 years old and has never attained nirvana he will become 70 and 80 and you and I shall just be, shall become just as old and shall do exercises and fast and meditate that shall never attain nirvana. Not he, not we, O Govinda, I believe that of all these summons who existed, perhaps not one, not one will attain nirvana. We find constellations. We find ways to numb the mind. We, we learn technical skills for deceiving ourselves, but the essential, the path of paths we do not find. Govinda said, please, don't pronounce such terrifying words, Siddhartha. How could it be that amongst so many learned men, amongst so many Brahmins, so many severe and venerable Samans, amongst so many questioned men, so many assiduous men, so many holy men, no one will find path of paths? But Siddhartha said in a voice containing as much sadness as mockery in a soft, silent Sad, mocking voice. Soon, Govinda, your friend will abandon this path of the summons, which he has slowed with you for so long. I am not suffering from thirst, O Govinda, and on this long summon path, my thirst has not diminished one whit. I have always thirsted for knowledge. I've always been full of questions. I have always questioned Brahmins. Year after year, I've questioned the sacred Vedas. Year after year, perhaps, O Govinda, it would have been just as good if, if it would have been just as clever and just as beneficial if I had questioned the hornbill or the chimpanzee. 
I have needed a long time, and that time is not yet up. Oh, learn this, O Govinda, that no one can learn a thing. I believe firm. I believe firmly in reality, and the thing we call learning does not. That in reality, the thing we call learning. It's telling me my connection is. Oh, okay. I think we're back. Oh, friend, all there is is a knowledge which is everywhere, which is Atman, which is in me and in you and in every being. And so I am beginning to believe that this knowledge has no worse enemy than the desire to know, than learning itself. Hmm. Shalom says, Kairach wanted to escape reality. What's Kairach in English? Can we get a translation? He was punished for it. The irony is, ultimately, he was successful um, as he was killed. And in fact, he did escape reality. However, his mistake was not to transform our, uh, our reality. Rather, he abandoned it. Yeah, very astute comparison and observation to the biblical character of Kerach. Uh, I don't know what Kerach is in English. Um, yeah, this this theme of, of, of wanting to escape reality rather than engaging in it, I think is going to be a theme that's going to run through this whole. And I think mysticism at its finest is about engaging with reality. It's about uniting with reality, not escaping it. And this is part of, I think, the learning that Siddhartha is going to go through inevitably. Uh, Nimitin um, um, River says that we picked on a very beautiful portion of the text. Yeah, I, I'm really enjoying Siddhartha's writing style, and uh, the text is beautiful. And we're going to do the whole text, so we'll get to experience all of it. Ha! <laughs> River slash aka Nimitin says that Kurach in Hebrew is the same word as baldness or frost. That's true. You are a wise friend. At that point, Govinda stopped short of their path, raised his hands. Oh, by the way, I was asking what like the what like the English name of, of Kurach was, not with the translation. Avraham is Abraham. Hanoich is Enoch. I was asking, like, what's the Latinized uh, version of, of his name? Yo, Shimon! Shim Shim, what up? Um, just, yeah, is that, is that what he goes by? Interesting. I thought some sort of Latinized name. He stuck to his Hebraic roots. Good man. Korak. Oh, that makes sense because the, the ch is hard. It doesn't do that. Um, I want to give a, a shout out to my friend Shim Shim, Shimon Weinbach, a, a mystic, a messiah, an itinerant prophet himself, who, by the way, I did an epic interview with, and I have not finished editing and uploading, but it's going to hit the channel soon. We're going to get back to our interviews. Shimon, cheers to you, my friend. Good to have you here. We're in the middle of a great book, and I hope you have your text open with you. Shimmy, you could you could write a book like this yourself. You're a master of prose. Um, who said that Hess is a master of prose? Oleg. Yeah, this guy's this guy's this guy's killing it. It's like it's it's beautiful, and uh, I'm I'm enjoying it. I hope you guys are too. And Shim says that um, Kurach is also related to the Hebrew word beam. Um, yeah. What is, this, what is the significance of that, Shimon? Ooh, this is a hard text that Kurach's ideas were returned in the Messianic Age. Okay, should we, should, we take a, should we take a break from the book and talk about that? Okay, my live audience is saying yes. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be a very long live stream and, and I'm, I'm cool with that because I can go all night <laughs> um, Kairach is okay, the, the crowd says yes Kairach is a very interesting character in the Bible um, just for those that don't know to catch you guys up 
Karech is the person who comes to, we'll get back to the text, don't worry. Karech is the person who says to Moses, why are you placing yourself above all the people? All of them have the, the spirit of God in them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely like a se- we could do a separate video, a separate talk about this, an open discussion. But just to sort of open up the topic, um, Karech says, Lama tisnasu al why are you why are you raising yourself higher than the than the congregation of God where God finds themselves? And he's basically challenging the hierarchy of Moses and the um, nepotism that Moses is the prophet, other Aaron is the high priest, Aaron's children are the priesthood, and Karech is like, this ain't this ain't fair. We're all one with the divine. We all have the Atman, we all have soul inside us. Why why are you rubbing us of our capacity to be to be prophets, to be mystics, to be conduits of the divine. Who who needs a priest, a rabbi, an officiary? God is here and now, bro. That's curse. And, and that's a very messianic claim. The destruction of hierarchy, the return of the feminine, the um the the the, the divine, these are all. Does hierarchy have its place in history? So Kurach in the biblical story is wrong. The earth swallows him up. He's wrong at least. But Shalom pointed out that he actually gets what he wants. He wants to be annihilated. He wants to be consumed in the union of God. Like the children, the two children of Aaron um, are, are consumed in a, in a, in a, in a sacred fire. Um, what are the two children of Aaron? Um, um, Lazar and um, I'm blanking here. The, the, not even a view. That's the ones. Um, Shalom says, my belief is that all this is not correct. Since people see that there's what they experience, I will not deny. Should I just run the other ones? Not even a view. Thank you. You guys are great. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you guys are on fire. You guys are on the bowl. You guys are also on after, like, <laughs> a good few shots of whiskey, just in self-defense. <laughs> um, not even a view. Yeah. So this is this is a very interesting point I want to make here. Uh, Shimon, I like your point about, like, messianic characters throughout history. Um, <laughs> so so in Shira Shirman, the Song of Song, it says, Alta iru valta iru es Don't arouse and don't awaken the desire until the right time has come, which is the messianic moment. There's, there's a big danger in premature messianism, in like in the scholarship of, of, of Gnosticism, realized eschatology, that the eschaton, the end of days is now. And the mystics very much believe that because the mystics don't see any difference between, they break down the duality between exile and redemption, samsara and nirvana. It's a very popular idea. But to, to do that prematurely, when the world isn't ready, I actually want to read you a text that I just read this past week. Oh my gosh, it's it's so at this point. And then I want to tell you about this biblical idea of Nadav and Avio and how it relates to another biblical episode of Elder and Where is Cat's Cradle? Get get this. Um, Shalom says, I'm sober, I envy your current reality, but appreciating, but appreciate mine as well. Respect, respect. Um I want to I want to I want to read you, I want to read you something here um, from from Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle. Because it speaks directly to this point, and then I want to talk about the biblical story of another interview, and then of course we're gonna get back to the matter at hand, which is Siddhartha's Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. Um, I just want to find what page it is because I know I just wrote this down a second ago. Uh, books. If anyone hasn't read this book, highly, highly, highly worth reading, um, and it's it's just it's just it's such a brilliant analysis of messianism and utopianism and society and religion and science um and uh here page 226 bro guys we could do like uh a, an epic book club here we could just read great books together uh and and this is gonna be so cool like i'm seeing something very cool coming out of this um we're going so off script here, by the way. This is this is like totally unplanned. Um, we are in the cusp of early hours of the crack of dawn, ultimate light. Soon enough, there'll be even the blind will feel the warmth of the sun. Amen. Here, here. 
Nemesis says it's going to roll for now. We'll be back in 40 minutes. We will still be here. <laughs> Feels like we're going to be here for a while. Like, we're making headway, but we have time. Uh, Shimon says, what does it mean that the world isn't ready? There's a bunch of Midrashim saying that we had a certain 2000, that we had a certain two characters make peace, then the, then the Sheikh would have come. Yeah, I, I actually think that that Medrash that you're quoting actually answers the question itself. Um, think tank. I think everyone's input, input, input is valuable. Sorry for the tangents. No, yeah. No tangents here. This is all the conversation. We a think tank is is an epic idea, and we need to think together. And we need to we I like fish tanks, so tanks are not like military tanks. We're not down for those tanks. So Shimon, I think that um, when the major says that if only two people would have made peace, Mashiach would have come, it's talking about all of us. Like if we only can make peace with the person that we have like a beef with, and like we and each of us do that with the person who we're beefing with, Mashiach's here. Like that's it's that simple. So touche. Um, I, I want to read you this a bit of a text from uh, Cat's Cradle. Uh, it goes like this. So, just to give you the, the premise here, um, there's like there's like this there's this battle between yeah, I agree with you, Shalom, on that point. There's there's a there's this government which is um, like. Um, uh, dictates like the evil it's like the bad and then there's like this religion which is outlawed by the government which is called Bakono um, which is like the good that's represented <laughs> and uh, basically the, the author is right this person and he becomes in charge of the government and he wants to bring back Bakono and make it no longer outlawed and basically end this duality of good and evil and usher in a messianic utopian age as for Bakono who is the uh, fugitive leader of founder and leader of this outlawed religion. I pondered asking him to join my government, thus bringing about a sort of millenarium, which is a uh, messianic era for my people. And I thought of ordering that the awful hook outside the palace gate be amidst great re- amidst great rejoicing. The hook is where they were basically were found practicing Bakonism. But then, and get the paragraph, but then I understood that a millennium would have to offer something more than a holy man in position of power. Messianism would have been the, the Ayatollah Khomeini in, in Iran. What's, what's his position called? Do we have internet? It's something we have no internet. Um, that, that a millennium, a messianic age, would have to offer something more than just a holy man in a position of power. There would have to be a plenty of good things for all to eat, too. Nice places to live for all. Good schools, good health, good times for all, and work for all who wanted it. Things Bakona and, and I were no prison to provide. And get this next paragraph. Yeah, cat's cradle. Uh, get this next paragraph. So good and evil had to remain separate. Good in the jungle, evil in the palace. Where whatever entertainment there was in that, uh, that what, whatever entertainment there was in that was about all we had to give the people. So premature messianism means that we're not yet at a place where we're ready for the whole world to have uh, good food, good times, good health, good health care. Um, and and to, to, to prematurely say, yeah, 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 it's all good. Yeah, 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 there's no good. There's no evil, bro, we're all good. No, there's suffering there's evil there's discrimination there's inequality there's pain there's hunger there's starving children um and until then you can't bring bakona back into the palace there still has to be the differentiation between good and evil and i think that is the like a genius observation um and that's the problem with premature messianism that and, and i think you see that in like in in, in i don't want to open to a whole like political theology discussion but like in in forms of socialism and communism which are very messianic at their core but but lead to great pain and, and murder because there's a premature messianism. Um, fascinating idea. Uh, the only the point I want to make about, about Nadav and Avihu, uh, the children of Aaron, um, and Korach and Eldad and Medad. So and I, I, I want to get back to the book, so I'll, we'll just do this briefly. Um, Eldad and Medad, Shimon says, just as there is now, our age is no more messianic than any other age of messianic years. Right, which means that there's still, there's still, there's a dual reality, which is a reality of pain and suffering, a reality of, of messianism, and they, and they coexist. And 
Well, I, I feel like we do need to get back to the book because that's like what the title of this thumbnail of this video is. Does my live audience agree? Um, okay, but remind me after, text me, message me, whoever, like you guys mostly have my, my details. If you look at the text, the biblical text of Elder to Medad, who, who begin to prophesize under the leadership of Moses and get told off by Aaron, compare that with the text of Kur, who was asking for the people to have prophecy. The text literally has a verbatim quoting from one another. And the question is, what's the difference between Elder Damedon and what's the difference of Kerch? Then in the case of Elder Damedon, Moses, Moses says that let them prophesize. Kulam, like Halavai, like it would, wouldn't it be great if everyone was prophets, if everyone that Kulam Baseichachem Rechashem, they all have the spirit of God in them. And Kerch, he's like, no, burn them. Let the earth swallow them. What's the difference between the reaction that Moses has to Kerch and Elder Damedon? I have a theory about it. And it, it ties into this idea of of, of um, messianism and premature messianism, um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you the answer now. I'll just leave you with that question. Okay, uh, we have some comments to read before we get back to the text, which we want to get back to. Shimon says, um, "We need to awaken to the awareness that we are our own messiahs." Right. Uh, it should be in my bag. Nobody else. And certainly not to wait for an external savior. 100%. Dude, we got to do another interview. Yeah, bro. Uh, we got to do more than just another interview. Oleg says, Dostoevsky in the notes in the underground wrote that he thinks about utopian ideas. 100%. Yeah. The Russians were, were super utopian. Uh, Shalom says, Mashiach, Messianic days is when we have no need to teach any more. That's literally what the prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 31 um, that, that the Mashiach is when no man will teach his brother, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the greatest of them to the least of them. Um, for all humanity has an equal apprehension of apparition. That's, that's literally the words of the prophet. Uh, did you know that? Did you know that you were quoting the prophet? I'm guessing you did. Um, but that ties back to the book because the book is about not needing to teach people, but needing to experience messianism. You can't teach anyone nirvana. You can only experience nirvana. And Shalom, that brings us right back to the book. Thank you very much. I'm going to segue back right in. It's either in the black bag or the white bag. I'm just looking for my laptop charger so that this potty can go on. Okay. Back to the book. Are we ready? At that point... Govinda, I'm going to just read back the previous paragraph because it's been a while. Is it plugged into the wall? At that point, Govinda stopped short on their path, raised his hands and said, Siddhartha. Um, Shalom, my friend, can you literally open up a Bible and open up the prophet Yermio, Jeremiah chapter 31, and literally read the words you just said verbatim? That's freaky. If I mean, that's crazy. Uh, okay. Uh, at that point, Siddhartha stopped short on his path, raised his hands and said, sorry, at the point, Govinda, right here. Govinda stopped short on his path, raised his hands and said, Siddhartha, please do not allow my friend with such talk. Truly your words awaken anxiety in my heart. And just think, where would the sacredness of praise be? Where would the, vener the vulnerableness, the venerableness of the Brahmin class be? Or the holiness of the samanas, if things were as you say, if there is no such thing as learning, what, O Siddhartha, would then have become of everything on earth that is holy, valuable, venerable? So Govinda is like, Siddhartha, what do you mean there's no learning, there's no teaching? What about, what about all these holy, wise people? They, they learn nothing? They taught nothing? And Govinda murmured a verse, to himself, a verse from the Upanishads. You're at the gym? You, you were listening at the gym? <laughs> I'm not even going to ask, bro. <laughs> nice. And Govinda murmured a verse to himself, a verse from the Upanishads. He who in contemplation with purified mind immerses himself in Atman, inexpressible in words in his heart's bliss. I just realized something weird, which is that this recording is going to be on the internet 
forever for like our grandchildren to watch. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, <laughs> but it's the reality. Okay. Uh, Gov- Govinda moment of verse, verse from the Upanishads. He who is in, he who he who is in contemplation with a purified mind immerses himself in Atman, inexpressible in words in his heart's bliss. But Siddhartha was silent. True that. But Siddhartha was silent. He was thinking about the words Govinda had spoken to him, and through the words to their very end. Yes, he thought, standing there with lowered head, what would still be left of everything that seemed holy to us? What is left? What stands up to the test? He shook his head. On one occasion, when the two young men had lived about three years with the Samans, participating in their exercises, there came to them by many direct and indirect routes a notice, a rumor, a legend, that a man had appeared, Gotama by name. The sublime one, the Buddha, who had overcome the sorrow of the world within himself, bringing the wheel of rebirth to a halt. He said to be traveling through the land surrounded by disciples without possession, with a, with, without a home, without a wife, in the yellow mantle of an ascetic, but with a serene brow, a beautific man, before whom Brahmins and princes were bowing, becoming his pupils. This legend, this rumor, this tale made itself heard, rose upward like a fragrance here and there. In the towns where Brahmins were talking about it, in the forest, in the Samans. Again and again, the name of Gautama, the Buddha, reached the young man's ear. Good and for bad, in praise and in revelment. Word is getting around that Gutama is on the scene, trending, as we would say in today's day. Just then, when the plague, just when the plague reigns in the land, and the news arises that in this place or that there is a man, a sage, a knowledgeable one, whose mere word or insufflation. What is insufflation? I N S U F F L A T I O N. Can we get a definition from our live audience, please? Whose mere words or insufflation are able to, or from the commenters, if anyone knows what insufflate means, please insufflate me. <laughs> Whose mere words or insufflation are able to curve every victim? The act of blowing something? Insufflation? Like his breath? Gasp. Blowing it into the body cavity. Suff, suff, sufflation? Okay. Whose mere words or breath are able to curve every victim. That's a new word for us, insufflation. For me, at least. Uh, are able to curve... Okay. Let's, let's begin that sentence again. <clears throat> In this place or that, there is a man, a sage, a knowledgeable one, whose mere words... Events are happening in the 5th to 4th century BC in this book. Yeah, it's set in the historical period. Correct. Um, and that's why we're talking about the of Buddha. Um, I know that Shimon is a, is a big fan of Buddhism. Just as when the plague reigns in the land and the news arises that in this place or that there's a man, a sage, an elder one, whose mere word or insufflation are able to cure every victim of the epidemic, just as that news then spreads through the land and everyone talks about it, many believing, many doubting, but many immediately setting out to seek the sage, the helper, so did that legend spread through the land, the fragrant legend of Gautama the Buddha, the sage from the clan of the Sakyas. The believer, the believer said that he possessed the loftiest knowledge and he remembered his previous lies, came nirvana and would never return to the cycle of existence he would never again sink into the troubled current of created forms. Many splendid and unbelievable things were reported of him. He had performed miracles. He had conquered the devil. He had conversed with the gods. 
but his enemies and the unbelievers said that this Tama was a vain sister, that he spent his days in luxury, looked down on sacrifices, lacked scholarly attainments, and was unfamiliar with either ascetic exercises or castigation. There be haters and there be groupies, even in the 4th century BCE. Sweet-sounding was the legend of Buddha. A magical fragrance emerged reports from these reports. The world was indeed ill. The world was indeed ill. Like there was like an epidemic in the world. <laughs> Life was hard to bear. And behold, th there a spring seemed to be welling up. There a messenger's cold seemed to be sounded, consoling, mild, full of noble promises. Whenever the rumor about the Buddha was heard, throughout the Indian realms, the young man hearkened, felt a longing, felt a hope, and among the Brahmin sound and, and among the Brahmin sons of the towns and village, every wonder and stranger was welcome, as if he brought word of him, the sublime one, the Sukyanami. When? Hmm? Oh, dismiss it. To the uh, Sakamans in the forest as well, to Siddhartha as well, to Govinda as well, the legend had made its way slowly, drop by drop. Each drop laden with hope, each drop laden with doubt. They spoke of it little, for the elders, for the Saman elders were no friend of this legend. He had heard that alleged Buddha had formerly been an ascetic and had lived in the forest, but had returned to luxuries and secular pleasures and had a low opinion of this Gotama. Shimon, peace out. Uh, yeah, I'm in Jerusalem for Shabbat. Let's hang. Good luck with your studies. Bring those pearls back from your wit studies to the world that needs that wisdom. Oh, Siddhartha, Govinda said to his friend on one occasion, mm -hmm. today I was in the village and a Brahmin invited me to come into his house. And in his house there was a Brahmin, son from Magdaha, who has seen the Buddha with his own eyes and has heard him preaching. Truly, the breath in my chest ached me then, and I thought to myself, if only I too, if only both of us, Siddhartha and I, might live to see the hour in which we hear the doctrine from the very lips of that perfect one. Tell me, friend, shall we not go there, too, and listen to the doctrine from the Buddha's lips? We know who is a fan of the Buddha. Siddhartha said, Oh, Govinda. I had always thought that Govinda would stay with the Samans. I had always thought that his goal was to be... was to, <laughs> Shade right here. <laughs> Listen to this. I, as, I had always thought that your goal, Govinda, was to become 60 and 70 years old, continuing all the while to practice the arts and exercises that adorn a Samana. But see, I had known too little of Govinda. I had known too little about his heart. So, best friends, you now wish to make a journey and go where the Buddha is proclaiming his doctrine? I thought I knew you, bro, but apparently I did not. You want to hit up the Buddha? <laughs> Govinda said... <laughs> Uh, someone needs to translate this into like 2020 language. Govinda said, you are pleased to mock me. <laughs> you like taking the piss, bro. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll clean up my language here. Uh, <laughs> many go on. May, may you go on mocking all the same, Siddhartha. 
but has no desire, no inclination awakened in you as well to hear this teaching? Get real. You want to hear this dude too. And you did not once tell me you would not follow the path of, sorry. And did you not once tell me that you would not follow the path of, of Sama longer? Bro, you two were like, these summons ain't where it at. Then Siddhartha laughed after this matter. The tone of his voice taking on a shade of sadness and a shade of mockery. And he said, well, Govinda, you have spoken well. Your recollection was correct. But please also re uh, recollect that other thing you heard me say, that I, that I became dis distrustful and wary of teachings and learning. That I have little faith in words that come to us from teachers. But all right, my dear. But all right, my dear friend. I'm prepared to hear that doctrine, although I believe in my heart that what we have already that we have already tasted the finest fruits of that doctrine. Like, I, I don't think we're gonna learn much, but if you wanna go, I'll go with you. Govinda said. Your preparedness pleases my heart. That's, yeah. But tell me, how could that be possible? How could Gautama's doctrine, which we have not yet heard, already be disclosed, already have disclosed its finest fruits to us? You don't know what he's going to teach you. Siddhartha said, let us enjoy those fruits and wait for the rest, O Govinda. But these fruits, for which we are already obliged to Gautama, consist in his calling us away from the Salmons. Interesting. Whether he has other and better things to give us, our friend, let us wait with a calm. Let us wait and see with a calm heart. Interesting. So the very fact that Gautama is like going away from the Samans is already an aspect of his teaching. And according to Siddhartha, the finest of his teaching. But Govinda is like, he's like, he's like, Govinda is like Siddhartha, bro. We haven't heard nothing yet. Let's, let's just wait and see what this dude has to say. On that same day, Siddhartha informed the elder Salman of his decision to leave. He informed the elder of this with the courtesy and modesty befitting a younger man and pupil. Always the gentleman. But the Salman flew into rage as the two young men wished to leave him. He raised his voice and indulged in discourse. Sorry, he indulged in coarse insults. You... I don't know what he said. I don't know how they curse in Pali and Sanskrit. Govinda was frightened and became embarrassed. But Siddhartha inclined his lips to Govinda's ear and whispered to him, Now I have to show the old man that I have learned something from him. Placing himself right in front of the salmon. With concentrated psychic powers, he caught the old man's gaze with his own, spellbound him, reduced him to silence. Rubbing him of his will, subjecting him to his own will, and commanded him to perform in silence whatever he desired him. The old man became mute. His eyes grew rigid. His willless. He had succumbed to Siddhartha's enchantment. But Siddhartha's thoughts took control of the salmon who had to carry out their orders. And so the old man bowed several times, executing gestures of blessing and stammering out pious wishes for a good journey. And the young men bow the young men returned his bows, giving thanks, returned his good wishes, saying farewell. On that way, Govin on the way, Govinda said, O oh, Siddhartha, you learned more from him than I knew. It is difficult. It is very difficult to cast a spell on an old salmon. Truly, had you remained there, you would soon have learnt to run water. The synchronon of every mystic's practice. <laughs> that and invisibility. That's what we're all about. I do not desire to walk on water, said Siddhartha. Let old salmons contend themselves with arts of that kind. That's right. I'm just real here in a moment of self-consciousness that I would have been a very, you know, those people that work in like public libraries reading children's stories to like groups of children. 
I think that may have been my true calling all along. I'm really enjoying this book reading activity. <laughs> Maybe I'm in the wrong game after all. <laughs> Becoming a philosopher. A YouTuber. What a joke. I should have been a nursery school reader. That's where true happiness is. Okay, we're up to um, the next chapter here called Gotama. really like how this book is structured very cleanly. You can kind of get the chunk part as it comes, as it goes. It's like very nicely packaged. You can't see it. No, it's not. Okay, next uh, little chapter here. Gotama. In the town of Savathi, every child knew the name of the, uh, the sublime one. By the way, who, who here is still, like, I see that there are, like, a bunch of people watching. But give me a, like, say hi if you're still watching. Oh, we have some people still watching. Nice. Um, Shalom says, to me, true happiness results when we are able to make others happy. Yeah, I agree with them. And I hope... I, I feel happy right now doing this, and I hope I'm making you guys happy with this very beautiful drunkard reading of uh, Siddhartha. Um, yeah, I'm going to look into that career as as a child, as a story reader in libraries, as like a volunteer, because I don't think they pay, <laughs> at least not very well. Um, <laughs> just a, so a short intermission, interjection. Who here has watched um, Drunk History? I think it's like, Comedy Central, the channel called Drunk History, where like you get these different like comedians and actors to tell over like historical stories and they do it drunk. It's very funny. And I feel like by the end of this book, it's going to be like a drunk history reading. Uh, Shalom, thank you much. Thanks for telling you enjoy it. That gives me like the desire and happiness to continue. Um, Fernanda says, stoked. Enjoying your read uh, as much as me. I'm stoked that you're stoked, and I'm going to continue reading. Thank you. <laughs> you guys are the best. Go, Tama. Here we go. <sighs> Deep breath. We're reading a serious book. Okay. In the town of Savathi, every child knew the name of the Buddha, the sublime one, and every household was prepared to film the alms balls of Gautama's disciples who begged in silence. Just a bit of a, a cultural point here. So um, when you take like a vow of monkhood in Buddhism, you're not allowed to own anything. Like the, that's like that's like a big deal, which is very cool because like if there's no self, there's no self to own anything. Um, I really like that. And I think like there's space in today's minimalistic thinking and whatever, we could separate discussion. But so what they have is they have like this little bowl which they go around um, collecting food they would basically go around from house to house silently begging for food and people would give them food into their bowls um so that's what the reference here is um so every house in city was eager to fill up the bowls of the um of gotama's disciples who begged in silence just outside the town lay the place where gotama most liked to stay the uh jethavana grove which the wealthy merchant Anthapa in this is a long name. Anthapa an anathapindika. Anna anathapika indika. <laughs> I told him I'm pretty dyslexic. A devout worshipper of the sublime one uh had pr had printed as a gift to him and his followers. So this um wealthy man this wealthy dude whose name is very difficult to pronounce gave his grove to Budyanin. It was this neighborhood um if one truly owns, one cannot share. For what is one possession of? Yeah, bro, I'm with you. The physics of not owning, like we just, we just like can can enjoy things and them, and they're like they can be around this thing that we think is the self for a little while, but we don't really own things. That's that's the craziest thing. We gotta let go of this idea of ownership. We don't own. We don't own shit. Excuse my language, but. We need that's a new that's I think that's that's like a really important way of thinking that we need to start imbibing. Um when you're doing good for others, you are white mage, but when you're doing something for yourself, your ego, you're a black mage. So Shalom is 
is what to be the image. But the two of you talk here because I'm not sure what you're saying. Um, um, it was this neighborhood. What what tradition has this white and black mage? What 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 tradition are you talking about, Oleg? It was in this neighborhood that had been indicated in the stories and replies that communicated to the two young ascetics during their quest for the place where the Gotama abode. And when they arrived in Savathi at the very first house, whose door remained standing, whose door they remained standing in supplication, uh, and when they offered food, they accepted the food. And Siddhartha asked the woman who handed them the food, gladly, you charitable woman, would we learn where the Buddha abides, the most venerable one for who the two Samas from the forest have come to see him, the perfect one, and hear the doctrine from his own lips? The woman said, truly, you have stopped in the right place, you summons from the forest. Let me tell you that the sublime abides in uh, Jetavana, in, Ath in Anatha Paginda's garden. Can we give this guy a nickname? Can we if anyone has a nickname for Atha Panaginda, please suggest in the group, and that's what we're going to call him, because I can't read. This is a difficult name for me. There, the wonder is, uh, you can spend the night, for there is enough room there for countless people who, who flock to hear the doctrine from his lips. Thereupon, Govinda rejoiced, and full of joy, he called, Well then, so our goal is attained and our journey to an end, but tell us, mother of wonders, mother of wonders, do you know him, the Buddha? Have you seen him with thine own eyes? The woman said, Many times I've seen him, the sublime one. Many days I've seen him walking through the lanes, silently in his yellow robe, silently holding out his arms bowl at the house doors and bearing away the field bowls. Govinda listened in delight and wanted to ask and hear much more, but Siddhartha urged him to continue the journey. They gave thanks and left. And Hagen needed to ask the way because a large number of pilgrims and monks from Gautama's community were on their way to Jetavana, the grove where Buddha was hanging out with his homies. And when they reached it at night, there were constant new arrivals calling out and speaking as they sought and rejoiced and received. So there were many uh, new arrivals calling out and speaking as they received lodging. The two summons accustomed to life in the forest found shelter quietly and noisily and rested there until morning. At sunrise, they saw in amazement how great the throng of believers and the idly curious had spent the night there. On every path in the spent in the splendid grove, yellow hood robes, yellow hooded, yellow, there's no hoods here, sorry. Yellow robed monks were walking. They were sitting there under the trees, immersed in contemplation or in spiritual conversation. The shady gardens looked like a town full of people swarming like bees. Most of the monks set out with their arms, arms, A L M S, like charity bowls, to gather food in town for the midday meal. The only one of the day. The only one of the day, the only one meal a day. That's true. Even the Buddha himself, the enlightened one, used to make his mendicant rounds in the morning. The Buddha himself would go out begging for his food. That's legit. Siddhartha saw him and recognized him at once as if a god had pointed him out. He saw him, a simple man in yellow as monk's robe, carrying his arms bowl in his hands and walked around and walked calmly Look, said Siddhartha softly. Look, said Siddhartha softly to Govinda. This man is the Buddha. Govinda looked attentively at the monk in the yellow robe, who seemed to differ in no hundreds of other monks, and soon Govinda to realize this is the one. And they followed him and observed him. The Buddha went his way modestly and lost in thought. His calm face was neither merry nor sad but seemed to be gently smiling inwardly with a concealed smile, calmly, peacefully, not a healthy child, the Buddha walked. 
wore his... Let me reread that, sorry. Not unlike a healthy child, the Buddha walked, wore his robe, and planted his feet. Just like all his monks in accordance with precise rules. But his face and his step, his calm, lowered gaze, his hands held calmly at his side, and indeed every fur of his calmly held hands spoke of peace, spoke of perfection, sought nothing, imitated nothing, but breathed softly in unfading repose, in unfading light, in unassailable peace. Thus, Gautama walked towards the town to gather arms. And the two Samans recognized him solely by the perfection of his repose, by the calmness of his figure, in which there was no tr trace, in, in which there was no trace of seeking, desiring, imitating, or striving, only light and peace. Today we shall hear the doctrine from his lips, said Govinda. Siddhartha made no reply. He was not so curious about the doctrine. He did not believe it would teach him anything new. After all, both he and God had heard the contents of this Buddhist doctrine time and again, although only from second and third hand reports. But he looked attentively at Gautama's head, at his shoulders, his feet, at his hands held calmly by his side. And it seemed to him as if every joint of every finger of those hands were doctrine speaking and breathing truth, wafting it about like a fragrance, admitting it like light. I want to read that line again. It seemed to him as if every joint of every finger of those hands were done, speaking and breathing truth, wafting it about like a fragrance, admitting it like a light. This idea that you, that you, that you are the teaching, you embody the teaching in every point, there's, a, there's an expression in, in Hebrew called that every bone, every joint, every ligament speaks the doctrine. Beautiful. This man, this Buddha, was filled with truth down to the last movement of his smallest finger. This man was holy. Never had Siddhartha revered any person. Never had he loved any person as he did this man. Wow. Seeing the Buddha, seeing his beauty, seeing his, the being, the way he carried himself with serenity and peace. Every joint. I, I want to share an anecdote. I can't read. I have the mic here. <laughs> there was a, um, a story told in the early Hasidic movement with his like a, an 18th century Jewish mysticism of a very learned sage who went to, who was not part of this Hasidic uh, mystical movement. And he went to study with one of the sages. His friends asked him, why are you going to the sage to study? You know everything already. You know all the teachings, you know all the Talmud, you know all of the Tanakh. And he said, I'm going to watch how he ties his shoelaces. Um, and that truth that 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 in the very being, in the very bones, in the very simplest act of the sage speaks the truth deeper than all of the than all of the words, than all of Yeah, that's real. Okay. Thanks for indulging me in my tangents. The, the two followed the Buddha all the way to town and returned in silence. For they themselves intended to refrain from eating that day. Thanks, bro. Friends like Christ, they show signs of themselves. Yeah, 100%. 100%. The two followed the Buddha all the way to town and returned in silence, for they themselves intended to refrain from eating. I guess they went to fast when they were meeting their master, their rabbi, their guru, this person who they were now in love with. They saw Gautama returning. They saw him eat his meal in the circle of his disciples. What he ate filled the bird. And they saw him withdraw into the shade of the mango trees. But in the evening, when the heat abated and all those in the camp became lively and gathered together, they heard the Buddha preach. 
they heard his voice and it too was perfect. It too was perfectly calm. It was full of peace. Gautama preached the doctrine of suffering, the origin of suffering, the way to abolish suffering, tranquility and tranquilly and clearly his words tranquilly and clearly his calm words flowed. Life meant suffering. The world was full of sorrow, but deliverance from sorrow had to be found. He who followed the Buddha's path found deliverance. In a gentle but firm voice, the sublime one spoke. He taught the four basic truths. He taught the eightfold path. Patiently, he followed the path of the doctrine with, his, with its parables, with its repetitions. Brightly and calmly, his voice hovered over the listeners, like a light, like a starry sky. While the Buddha might have already, while the Buddha, sorry, when the Buddha and had already fallen, ended his speech. Many pilgrims stepped forward and requested admittance to the community, taking refuge in the law. And Gautama admitted them, saying, You have heard the teaching well. It is well proclaimed. Then step up and walk in holiness to prepare an end to all sorrow. There... Behold, thereupon Govinda to the Shire one looked forward, saying, I too take refuge in the sublime one and his law, and requested admittance to the band of his disciples, and was admitted. Immediately afterwards, when the Buddha had returned, sorry, when the Buddha had retired to his night's rest, Govinda turned to Siddhartha, saying earnestly, Siddhartha, it is not for me to reproach you. We have both listened to the sublime one. We have both heard the doctrine. Govinda had listened to the doctrine. He had taken refuge in it. But you, honor, will you not also walk the road to salvation? Will you hesitate? Will you still wait? Oh, 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 oh. I, sorry, I, I didn't pay attention here. Govinda stepped up to the Buddha and said, have me in, like count me in as, as one of your disciples. Uh, and Siddhartha, he asked, why, why didn't you say that too? Cool. Siddhartha awoke as if from a slumber when he heard Govinda's words. For a long while, he gazed at Govinda's face. Then he said softly in a deep voice, free of mockery. Govinda, my friend, now you have taken the step. Now you have chosen the path. Oh, Govinda, you have, already, you have always been my friend. You have always walked one step behind me. I've often thought, will not Govinda ever take a step on his own? Without me, from his own soul, behold, now you have become a man and you are choosing your path yourself. May you follow it to the end, O oh friend. May you find salvation. Govinda, who did not yet completely understand, repeated this question in an impatient tone. But speak, I beg of you. My dear friend, tell me, and it surely cannot be otherwise that you too, my learned friend, will take refuge in the sublime Buddha. Siddhartha laid his hand upon Govinda's shoulder. Have you failed to hear my words of benediction? Blessing? O oh, Govinda, I reckon, may you follow this path until the end. May you find salvation. At that moment, Govinda realized that his friend had taken leave of him and began to weep. Siddhartha, he called lamentedly. Siddhartha spoke to him like a friend. Do not forget, Govinda, that now you belong to the Samans of the Buddha. You have renounced home and parents, renounced ancestry and possession, renounced your own will, renounced friendship. This is what the doctrine desires. This is what the sublime one desires. You yourself desired it. Tomorrow, Govinda, I shall leave you. For a long still while, for a long while still, the friends walked through the grove. For a long while they lay down but could not fall asleep. And ever anew, Govinda urged his friend to tell him why he did not wish to take refuge in Gautama's doctrine. What flaw could he possibly find in that doctrine? But each time Siddhartha refused, saying, 
Be contented, Govinda. The sublime one's doctrine is very good. How shall I find a flaw in it? Very early in the morning, a follower of the Buddha, one of his oldest monks, walked through the garden, calling after all those who had taken refuge in the law as novices. So he could dress them in the yellow robe and instruct them in the rudimentary teachings and duties of their order. Thereupon, Govinda tore himself away, embracing the, the friend of youth once more, embraced the friend of his youth once more and joined the group of novices. But Siddhartha walked through the grove deep in thought. Then Govinda, the sublime one, came across him. And when he greeted him respectfully, the Buddha's eyes were so full of kindness and calm. The young man took heart and asked the venerable one permission to speak to him. Silently, the sublime one nodded his consent. Siddhartha said, Yesterday, O sublime one, I was privileged to hear your marvelous teachings. Together with my friend, I came here from far to hear the teachings. And now my friend will remain with your followers. He has taken refuge in you. But I am continuing my wanderings again. As you please, said the venerable one courteously. Courteously. My words are much too bold, said Siddhartha went on. But I would not like to depart this time without having told him honestly what I think. Will the Venerable One grant another moment's audience? Silently, the Buddha nodded his consent. Siddhartha said, One thing above all, O most Venerable One, I have admired in your teachings. Everything in your teachings is perfectly clear and fully proven. You show the world to be a perfect chain, never and nowhere interrupted. An eternal chain fashioned out of, cause, out of causes and effects. Never before has this been so clearly, never before has this been seen so clearly, never so eerily presented. Truly, every Brahmin's, every Brahmin's heart must beat more jubilantly in his breast when, through your teaching, he sees the world as being, perfect, as being perfectly interconnected without a gap. Clear as crystal. Dependent on chance, not on gods, whether it is good or evil, whether life it whether life in it is sorrow or joy, or is not the sorry. <clears throat> Shalom said that this sounds entanglement. Um it sounds like a lot of a lot of very cool mystical doctrines of the the interconnectivity of being in in, in Hinduism, correct me if I'm wrong, it's called Idra's web, where everything is is interconnected. In Neoplatonism, it's called the great chain of being, where everything is connected with, with one another. Um, let me just go back and, and, and get back into this into this paragraph. Never before has it been seen so clearly, never so irrefutably presented. Truly, every Brahmin's heart must beat more jubilantly in his breast, when through your teachings he sees the world as being perfectly interconnected, without a gap, clear as a crystal, not dependent on any chance, not dependent on gods. <laughs> nice, Ruva. The bit of Arch Ampin. You're actually going to have to tell me, bro. I am not familiar. I'm here to learn. I'm here to learn. Um, as far as I know, the bit is connected with Yudgimel Musarachim, with the 13 traits of mercy. And I'm curious to know how you're connecting that to this doctrine that we're talking about here. He sees the world as being perfectly interconnected without a gap, clear as a crystal, not dependent on chance, not dependent on gods. Whether it is good or evil, whether life in it is sorrow or joy is not the immediate question. Perhaps it is a question of no importance, but the unity of the world and the, in and the interconnectedness of all reality, the fact that all things great and small are bound by the same current, by the same law of causality, Becoming and dying, all shines brightly forth from your sublime teachings, O perfect one. And yet, according to your own doctrine, this unity and consequentiality of all things is interrupted in one place. Through a small gap, there flows into this unified world something strange to it, something new, 
something that did not previously exist and that cannot be shown or proven. It is your doctrine of overcoming the world of salvation. But by this small gap, by this small breach, the whole eternal and unified world law is once shattered and cancelled. Please forgive me for, po for pointing out this objection. Wow, this is really interesting. Uh, we have a comment from Nimitin. Uh, mazel Tov, because the light... Oh, sorry. Maz <laughs> sorry. Mazel Tov, um, because the light that extends from the face is extraneous light that extends out and flows. I'll send some quotations when I get home. Ha. Huh. Yes. Just to uh, expand on the point that that Nimitin uh, River is making here. Mazal, which typically in today's day and age means luck, uh, in, the, in the source actually means uh, mazalot, which is constellations, which is light, which flows from the, or, or influence, which flows from the stars. Um, I'm still curious to know how you're connecting that to this sort of doctrine of interconnectivity. Maybe you're saying things are governed by the I actually have to. I, my mind's blinking, but I think there, 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 there definitely is equivalent to this idea in the language of Kabbalah and Chassidut. Um, I just have to think. If any of my, if any, if any of you guys know, uh, I'm just blinking on on what that on what doctrine would be called in in, in Jewish mysticism. Anyhow, no shame in blinking. Um, Okay, so this is a very interesting paragraph. Something very interesting just happened here. And I'm not exactly clear on what just want to reread it. Because um, he's pointing out a flaw in the thinking of the Buddha. Um, and if anyone uh, if anyone picked up on the point here, please tell me in the comments. Because I have an intuition that this is a very, very insightful observation here. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna go back like halfway up the paragraph and reread this. But the unity of the world, the interconnectedness of all events, the fact of all things great and small, are bound by the same current, by the same law of causality, coming and dying, that shines brightly forth from your sublime teachings, a perfect one. And yet, according to your own doctrine, this unity and consequentiality is interrupted in one place. Through a small gap, there flows into this unified world something strange to it, something new, something that did not previously exist and cannot be shown and it cannot be shown or proven. It is your doctrine of overcoming the world's salvation. Okay, so we're saying that the very doctrine of overcoming the world of salvation is the gap in the system. Like the like the, the gnosis that there's a way out is is not is is it is a, does he mean that there's a lack of interconnectivity or that there's just some an, an escape from it? Let's see what you guys are saying here. Um, Mazel to me starts here. When we do good on Earth, it causes the reaction upstairs, which impounds and gets magnified and injected back into life. Butterfly effect, chaos theory. Shalom, I see you're digging, um, blending that mysticism in the science. Respect, bro. That's a that's a first field, but I think it needs to be done. Um, Esoterica says, I think he is arguing that the ego conflicts with the doctrine of <laughs> you got the fancy word here, bro. Pratyamasahana. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, that one cannot escape because there isn't anything to escape from or escape to give or escape escape from or escape to give the doctrine of. Okay. Okay, that's very cool. That's very, very cool. That That if everything is just a perfect loop and like... There's sort of this ambivalence between, um, how did you say it here? Between joy and sorrow, then why why need to escape at all? Thank you. You're so helpful, bro. Thank you so much. The mutual, the mutual interhang, the mutual, the mutual hanging togetherness of all things. Uh, if there is a flow from Arich Ampin, then everything is subject to it. Therefore, ultimately connected. I love how we're like talking Buddhist metaphysics here, like throwing in our Ampin and chaos theory. <laughs> oh, this is great. This is so much fun. Uh, no problem, bro. I'm glad that you're joining us from work. 
Um, it's probably middle of the day for you guys in the States. Um, cool. So the, the doctrine of the, of the capacity or need to escape from the closed loop of the system is a gap and flow in the system because you shouldn't need to escape. If, you, if okay, it's kind of like, like the, the, the dialectics of Nagarjuna, uh, the Mayana, the Mayana philosopher, where he's, where he like the whole idea of samsara is to deconstruct the distinction between nirvana and samsara. Is that what he's like bringing up here? Um, the trinity of the theist, atheist, and agnostic. Okay, uh, thank you guys for helping me. I, I, I think that might be what we're going here. Gutama had listened to him calmly, unruffled. It's a good word, unruffled. In his kindly, uh, courteous, and clear voice, he now said, he now said the perfect one. You have heard the doctrine, O Brahman son. You are fortunate in having meditated on it so profoundly. You have found a gap in it, a flaw. Call a kavod. Uh, yes. Combining science and theism. Uh, yeah, that's definitely a thing. Uh, I hope you will continue to meditate on it. But let me warn you. Um, you thirster. Let me warn you, you thirster after knowledge. Against the jungle of opinions and quills over mere words. Opinions are completely important. <laughs> opinions are completely unimportant. Whenever, whether they are beautiful or ugly, clever or foolish, anyone can inherit them or reject them. But the, but the doctrine you have heard from me is not an opinion of mine. Its goal is not to explain the world to thirsters after knowledge. Its goal is different. Its goal is deliverance from suffering. This is what Gautama preaches and nothing else. Damn straight. Um... River says, rejection, ejection from the cycle of suffering. There's a couple of ways to elaborate on it. Esoterica is going full metal. Uh, in Hinduism, people are living in some sour world of suffering, but Buddha, but the Buddha escaped from it. Correct. Um, Esoterica is going full metal. Hmm. Okay, so the Buddha just said something which is cool, which is that um, you for wisdom. I'm not familiar with the parable of the poisoned arrow. If you would be kind enough to share it here, uh, I would love to read it. Um, don't argue over the arrow, pull it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, so the point here, and I think this is going to be a central idea, that Siddhartha comes from wisdom. He comes from knowledge. He's a seeker after, after knowledge, after truth. And uh, the Buddha's like, bro, if you're here for knowledge, if you're here to be a scholar, sure, you'll find flaws, you'll find mistakes, you'll find inconsistencies and incongruities, and you'll find anomalies and, and anachronisms, and you'll find that, uh, what did we say here in the introduction? We'll find times when uh, the... Um, the the diacritic marks and circumflexes aren't put over the correct words, but we're not here about knowledge. We're not here about scholasticism. We're here about salvation. It's an entirely different cognitive perspective. Um, this is so gross that I'm gonna like quote my own video here. <laughs> but I made a video called um, "What Is Philo Why Philosophy?" Um, feel free to post it in the chat. <laughs> Where I said, yeah, basically the point of philosophy is not to like get smart or ask questions. The point is to find salvation and redemption. And this is the point of making. Please, O sublime one, do not be cross with me, the young man said. I did not speak to you that way in order to pick a quarrel with you, a quarrel over words. Truly, you are right. Opinions are quite unimportant. But let me say just one thing more. Not for a moment have I doubts about you. I have not doubted for a moment that you are the Buddha. You have attained the goal, the highest goal, which so many thousands of Brahmins and Brahmin sons are seeking. You have found deliverance from death. It has become yours through your own, your own path by means of thought, concentration, realization, enlightenment. 
It did not become yours through teachings. And this is my thought, O sublime one. And no one, no one will achieve salvation through teachings, O venerable one. You will not be able to inform and tell a single person in words by means of teaching what happened to you in the hour of your enlightenment. The doctrine of the enlightened Buddha contains a great deal. It teaches many to live righteously, to shun evil. But one thing this doctrine so clearly, so venerably does not contain, does not contain, it does not contain the secret of what the sublime one himself experienced. He alone amongst the hundreds of thousands, this is what I thought and realized when I heard the doctrine. This is why I'm continuing my wanderings, not to seek another better doctrine because I know there is none, but to leave behind all teachings, all teachers, and either to attain my goal alone or to die. But I shall often, but I shall often remember this day, O sublime one, and this hour in which my eyes beheld a saint. Um, yeah, solid quote. It is ironic given how Buddhism becomes so scholastic. There is no religion that likes lists more than Buddhism. Interesting. I wonder if, do you know what? I'm actually going to push back on that point there uh, with, with respect and humility because I don't know if lists necessarily imply scholasticism. I think lists may actually have the opposite connotation of practicality that we want to know how to, how to perform, how to function. And here's a list, like get on it, stop thinking, stop contrasting, stop analyzing, comparing. Here's a list. I'd be curious to hear, to hear your thoughts on that objection. Um, the point of knowledge to me is to exceed its reach, meaning nuance and application to go beyond knowledge is to go beyond knowledge. Yeah. That's a very Socratic uh, and, and many other teachers ideas. Uh, and there's our link <laughs> shameless self-promotion on my own channel. Wow. That was bad. Um, Nimitin, Bittal Yesh is the same conception as rejecting as rejecting from suffering. Yeah. We talked, I, I think, you know what I think he's doing here, actually? I think he's actually, like, taking key themes of mysticism, important, super important themes, and, like, kind of dissecting them one at a time and, and giving them their space and then going to probably turn back and reflect on them. And I think when we talked about the Salmons, I think they they best re represent the idea of Bitalyash. The way he described the Salmons was, like, textbook Bitalyash. Um, and, and, and now I think he's getting to a new idea, this, this need to get beyond teaching, to... Um, Anyway, so we just heard Siddhartha's speech to the Buddha, why he's not going to hang around and be a groupie. Um, okay. Let's go on. The Buddha's eyes were calmly fixed on the ground. His in school face beamed calmly in perfect equanimity. The list also have massive commentary tradition as well. I mean, the Buddhists opened the first universities like uh, Nahalana. Yo, um, respect, bro. I, I don't know as much about Buddhism, um, both philosophically and historically, as it seems you do. You have you seem to have quite a, an intimate knowledge, which is really, really epic. Um, I've found myself much more comfortable in, in Western mysticism, and I also know nothing, like really nothing. Um, so that's interesting. You know, th there is an interesting sociological trend in mysticism where the founders of the of the of the of the movement or school or field have a very deep um, sincerity and, and altruism and purism, and then unfortunately, all too often, and this is just human, you see it devolving into a ritual and establishment, and ego gets involved, and pride and nepotism and. Um, and you see that like in, in mysticism after mysticism. And I wonder if um, scholars of the history of mysticism comment on a, sig on a similar sort of devil degradation or, or loss of the purity of, of the original spirit of the Buddha. Because it's hard. I mean, it's hard to hang on to, to, to that real purity. But we, we always try and strive back to the, to, the, to the original. I'd be curious to know if that's the case. Okay, so we just hit 989 subscribers, which means it is high time for a drink. Um, and we're going to about to hear the Buddha's response. But before that, we're going to say L'chaim um, and celebrate every new subscriber. 
Because these are people, brothers and sisters, friends and family, who want to seek with us for unity. And that deserves celebrating. Um, nepotism is the only truth. We are all God's children. <laughs> That's when nepotism uh, is like shared across the board, not kept to, to one type family. Um, Nemeton says, I think informally, I think informality, rigidity can mess up spiritual exercise, can mess up spiritual experience. Oh, informational rigidity can mess up spiritual experience. Informational rigidity can mess up spiritual experience. That's a very interesting idea. Informational rigidity can mess up spiritual experience. That's a fascinating idea. And that, that touches into the whole interplay between doctrine and experience. Um, I actually want to ask you about that later in person. Esoterica says, also, I'm very pro-scholasticism. Of course, the Buddha refused... His teachings to be written down, but Ananda memorized and did so. Thank God for Ananda. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Uh, in some cases, um, Oleg says Buddhism is very different and divided. You can find Chinese Buddhism, Japanese, Indian. Everything is too complicated. <laughs> Every religion is highly divided, but only superficially. Okay. On that note, that, that division is only ever superficial. Ever. Okay. okay. The Buddha's eyes were, co were calmly fixed on the ground. He's in... The Buddha's eyes were firmly fixed on the ground. His inscrutable face calmly beamed in perfect equanimity. The Venerable One said slowly, may your thoughts not be errors, may you reach your goals, but tell me, have you seen the throng of my summons of your brothers who have taken refuge in the law? And do you believe, some and stranger, that it, would, that it would be better for all of them to abandon the law and return to the life of the world and its pleasures? You really think that all of the people here should just go home because teachings are pointless and no one can encapsulate the essence of the mystical experience and give that over in teaching, which is what you're asking me to do. Humor can transcend superficially and lust. 100p. Far from me is such a thought, Siddhartha cried. No, bro, I'm not telling you to stay home. May they all remain in the law. Law is, is a weird word to use, and I wonder what the German word here is. If there are any German speakers here, what is the word that's being translated as law? Um, I know that like in, in many other traditions, law is a word which is used to translate things that in English law. I guess it means like the way, the, the dharma, the path, the teachings. Okay. May they all remain in the law. I'll just use this word because that's what they translated it as. May they attain their goal. It is not for me to stand in judgment over another man's life. Solely for himself, sorry, solely for myself, for me alone, I must judge, I must choose, I must reject. O sublime one, we Samans seek deliverance from the self. Um, Shalom says it is uh, Geseth. I, I'm not familiar. Gazettes? 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 Translate to the Yiddish. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I must choose, I must reject, O sublime one. We salmon seek deliverance for self. Now, if I were one of your disciples, O venerable one, I fear it might. <laughs> Nicely done. Now, if I were one of your disciples or venerable one, I fear it might know that myself would find repose and be delivered only seemingly, only deceptively, but that it would actually live on and, and develop further because I would then have turned the law 
my adherence to it, my love for you, and the monastic community into my new self. This is a very astute observation that sometimes the, the path of spiritual seeking and mysticism itself becomes the new ego. And the, the, the entire job of getting rid of the old ego just slips seamlessly into the new ego, which is the e getting rid of the ego, and that becomes your ego. So Siddhartha is on the ball with a half smile and unshaped brightness and friendliness. Gotama looked the stranger in the eye and sent him on his way with a barely visible gesture. You are clever, Osaman, said the venerable one. You can speak cleverably, my friend. Beware of too much cleverness. The Buddha walked away. His gaze and heart smile remained engraved in Siddhartha's memory forever. I have never seen anyone gaze and smile, sit and walk that way, he thought. Truly, I wish I could also gaze and smile and sit and walk that way with such freedom, such venerableness, such concealment, such openness, such childless, such childless, such childlessness, such childlikeness and such mystery. <laughs> Truly, such a gaze and stride belong only to a person who has penetrated into his innermost self. Well, I too will strive to penetrate into my innermost self. I have seen such a person, Siddhartha's thoughts continued, a single person in whose presence I had to cast down my eyes. Never again will I cast down my eyes in anyone's presence, not anyone. From now on, no doctrine will entice me since this person's doctrine has not enticed me. The Buddha has robbed me, Siddhartha thoughts continued. He has robbed me, but he has bestowed even more on me. He has robbed me of my friend who used to, you, who used to believe in me and now believes in him, who used to be my shadow and is now Gautama's shadow, but he has bestowed on me, Siddhartha, myself. That's deep. That is deep, 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 deep. Okay. The next chapter is called Awakening. Um, if you don't mind me, I actually just want to text a friend who I love dearly, who I want to invite to join and read with us. Um, and we'll just take a really quick second. <sighs> What's up? No, no, no. You can respond to him. What do you say? One second. I apologize. Okay. Awakening. Thank you for waiting. Um... <laughs> I, I didn't thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but I didn't say anything too private. I was just telling a friend who I love dearly to, to come and, and, and be with us. Thanks though. Um, when Siddhartha left the grove in which the Buddha, the perfect one, okay, <clears throat> new chapter. Um, Troy says, nice topic. Have you heard of the enlightened channel here on your YouTube? I haven't, but I will check it out as soon as we're done with this reading. Thank you very much, Troy. When Siddhartha left the grove in which the Buddha, the perfect one, remained behind, in which Govinda remained behind, he felt that in that grove, his previous life too had remained behind him and had separated itself from him. As he walked on slowly, he pondered over that feeling which filled his mind completely. He thought it over profoundly as if sinking into deep waters. He let himself reach the bottom of that feeling all the way to where the causes reside. For it seemed to him that to, that to recognize causes is precisely what thinking means. That's a great line. 
for it seemed to him that to recognize causes is precisely what thinking means, and that only thereby do feelings become firm realizations, which are no longer lusts, but become substantial and begin to diffuse their contents. Which are no longer lusts, but become substantial and, and begin to diffuse their contents. As he walked on slowly, Siddhartha pondered. He uh, ascertained that he was no longer a youth, but he had become a man. He ascertained that something had left, had left him, that some, he ascertained that something had left him behind, just as a snake is left behind by its old skin. There was no longer present within him something that had accompanied him through his youth and had belonged to him. The wish to have teachers and to hear teachings, that is what left him. The last teacher who had appeared on his path, even him, the loftiest and the wisest teacher, the holiest, the Buddha, he had left behind. He had to part from him. He had been unable to accept his doctrine. So this is the idea here. Siddhartha meets the, the ultimate teacher. He meets the guru of all gurus. He meets the Buddha himself. And he realizes in his soul that even he, he can't sit and learn from. Even him can't give him that, that, that core that he's looking for. And once he realizes that, he realizes that, that he's, he's left behind that whole journey, that whole seeking for teachers, for, for teachings. Um, and that's, that's an interesting, that's, 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 a, that's a pivotal moment for him. Um, Yechiel Cohen says, the best in the game. Who and what is the best in the game? Is the Buddha the best in the game? Um, that's what Siddhartha is saying. Yeah, yeah, bro. Um, drop those quotes. Drop them. Drop them like they're hot. <laughs> Deep in thought, he walked on more slowly, asking himself, but what is it then that you wanted to learn from teachings and from teachers, but which they who knew a lot were nevertheless unable to teach? And he discovered. It was the self whose meaning and nature I wanted to learn. It was the self that I wanted to be free of and I wanted to overcome, but I could not overcome it. I could only deceive it. I could only run away from it. I could only hide from it. Truly, nothing in the world has occupied my thoughts as much as this self of mine, this riddle of my life, of my being one person sundered and separated from all the rest of my being, sed from all the rest of my being Siddhartha. And there is nothing in the world I know less about than, than myself, Siddhartha. Um, thank you for these quotes, River. I hopefully they'll be here in the chat later when I'm um, so I can go back and read them. Um, but that's really cool. Thank you. You're a G man. You're a G. He who had been pun he who had been pondering as he slowly walked on. Uh, now came to he who had been he who had been uh, pondering as he slowly um, walked on. Now came to a halt in the clutch of his thoughts, and at once there emanated from this thought yet another one, a new thought, formulated thus. That I know nothing of myself. That Siddhartha has remained so strange and so unfamiliar to me um, has one cause, just one. This that I've been so uh, unknown to myself has a single cause. I was afraid of myself. I was running away from myself. I was seeking Atman. I was seeking Brahman. I was determined to dismember myself and tear away its layers of, in order to find its unknown innermost recesses, the kernel at the heart of all those layers, the Atman, the divine principle, the ultimate. But in doing so, I was losing myself. That's so interesting that, that in, that in Siddhartha's quest for the true self, he was abandoning his actual self in his quest for the Atman. There was he was losing Siddhartha. There's there's an epic quote, by the way, from the Piazzetzner, who was a Hasidic rabbi. And I'm just gonna drop the quote now, um, because it's super relevant. Um keep by the no, Neverton, keep going. I don't know, I'm 
I can read them, but I'm like, I, I want to engage with you properly after this on that point. But the Pietasar says that that Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, the prophet, um, is known as the most humble person in all of history. The, the Bible calls him Anav Mikol Hadam, Apni Adama, the, the most humble man of any man who walks on the face of the earth. And the understanding is that when God, when Moses speaks the, the words out of his throat, it's really God speaking out of the throat of Moses because he's so humble. Um, and the expression that the Kabbalists used is Shechin Baras Mesech Rene. The Shechin speaks out of the throat of Moses because he's like a, a sinner. He's just a channel, a conduit that is free to flow the divine through him, the, the divine that he has that we all have inside of us. And the Piazzesser says, teasing, he says, when God speaks as Moses through his, it is not because Moses is totally absent. And there's no Moses left. When Moses is most Moses, it is then that God can speak through Moses. It's not when Siddhartha loses Siddhartha that he finds his Atman, but when Siddhartha is most Siddhartha. And this is, I think, the same point that Hermann Hesse, the same point that the Piazzetsner, the same point that all of these great mystics talk about. This is why I freaking love mysticism. Like, how did, how did Hermann Hesse and a fictional Siddhartha and the Piazzetsner and mystics from all over come to these same brilliantly deep, psychologically meaningful and existentially powerful lessons? How how do, how do how do like how do we not love mysticism? Jeez. Let's read some comments here. So this is still about Arach Ampin. I'm gonna skip that for now. Shalom says tension causes growth, speech is tension and condensation of energy going down, going up. I think this is still related to the comments of, of Nematon. By the way, says Nematon, did you bring up the foods of the heaven, Shalom, in reference to the mitzvahs doing good works? Okay, I think you guys are talking amongst yourselves, which is epic. But I'm going to continue reading. But continue talking. Um, the the uniting agent of spirituality goes beyond the rigidity of ideology, of theology, it is my idea of how so many fantastic mystics arise in various cultures. Uniting agent of spirituality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the real question is, what is, what is that? Bless you. The real question is, what is that? You, what is that? Or the unit of the element, and that's, I guess, what we're all here exploring in some way or the other. Okay. <whistles> Siddhartha opened his eyes. Ignorance is destroyed with education stemming from love. Yeah, yeah. There's a phrase in in Jewish text which is. That words which come from the heart can only, only words which come from that can penetrate another heart. Siddhartha. Yeah. Uh, Siddhartha opened his eyes and looked around him. A smile spread upon his face and a profound, and a profound sensation of awakening from lengthy dreams flowed through to his toes. And at once he was on his way again, walking swiftly, like a man who knows what he must do. Oh, he thought, drawing a deep breath of relief. Now I shall not allow Siddhartha to slip away from me again. No longer shall I begin to, no longer shall I begin my thinking and my life with Atman and the sorrow of the world. No longer shall I mortify and dismember myself in order to find a mystery in the back of the ruins. I shall no longer be instructed by the Yoga Veda or by the Artha or the Artha or the uh, uh, Atharva. Atharva Veda, or the ascetics, or any other dog ever, I shall learn from myself, be a pupil of myself. I shall get to know myself and the mystery of Siddhartha. He looked around as if he was seeing the world for the first time. A common description of people that have a mystical experience. The world was beautiful. The world was full of variety. The world was strange and puzzling. The world, there was blue, there was yellow, there was green. Sky flowered, the river, forest jutted upward, the mountains, everything beautiful, everything puzzling and magical. And in the midst of it all, he, Siddhartha, awakening on the path to himself. All this, 
all this yellow and blue river and forest passed into Siddhartha through his eyes for the first time, he was no longer the sorcerer of Mara. It was no longer the veil of Maya. It was no longer the meaningless, accidental multiplicity of the world of phenomena, contemptible to the philosophical Brahman, who scorns multiplicity and seeks unity. Blue was blue, river was river. And if the one, the divine principle, lay concealed even in the blueness of the river within Siddhartha, it was precisely the nature and meaning of that divine principle to be there yellow, here blue, there forest, there forest, there sky and there forest, and here Siddhartha. Nice. Meaning and existence were not somewhere or in back of things. They were in them in everything. Word. Oh, we have some action in the comments. Is this your own conversation or is this, should I read this out and get engaged here? Um, uh, beautiful scenery. It's like the revelation of the magnificence of being. Yeah, 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 absolutely. The revelation of the magnificence of being. I want to I wanna comment on that. Um, and then you said, BTW, if you're into that line, Veil of Maya, you might want to check out the 36 Thavas. They cover the topics of metaphysical scenes. Please a link to that. We're kind of jumping between each other and the vidlal. Uh, thank you for suggesting. Oh, cool. You were jumping between each other. Nice. You guys are epic. You guys are so cool. Um, okay, I I noticed something very interesting in this paragraph. It was it was uh, Herman Hesse's attempt to describe this um, quintessential mystical realization and nature mysticism, as we would call it in the study of mysticism. Um, but something interesting I noticed here is that he's flipping back and forth between um, the language of the time, um, sort of trying to be accurate to Siddhartha, talking about Maya, talking about Mara, talking about uh, things like that. And, but he's also using terms which are very German and philosophical and metaphysical, uh, which is interesting. He talks about phenomena, talks about essence. Um, and is he just translating terms from Buddhist philosophy or is he putting words of German philosophy into the story here? Interesting. I I'm curious to know what you guys think of that. How deaf and obstructive have I been, he thought as he walked on swiftly. When someone reads a piece of writing and wants to find out what it, what it means, he does not feel content. Do you know what, actually, maybe we shouldn't be asking whether his like notions of, of philosophy are Indian or German or this. Maybe we're missing the whole point. Maybe we're supposed to be expecting the beauty and the grandeur of the prose as much as he read, like in, enjoyed the beauty of the grandeur of the uh, of the nature. Maybe, maybe I just totally missed the point of the paragraph by asking where his linguistic influences were coming from. <laughs> Find the truth. Truth is a complicated topic. <laughs> okay. The independent experience of revelation and all. How deaf abstruse have I been, he thought as he walked on swiftly. When someone reads a piece of writing and wants to find out what it means, he does not feel contempt for the written signs and letters calling them... He does not... He does not feel contempt, hatred towards the written signs and letters, calling them illusions, chance, and valueless tusk. But he reads them and studies them and loves them. Letter by letter. But I, who wanted to read the book of the world and the book of my own nature, I have held the signs and letters in contempt. For the sake of a presumed interpretation, I call the world of phenomena and illusion. I called mine eyes and my tongue an accident, valueless phenomena. No, that is all over. I have awakened. I have really awakened and I have just been born today. Very, very interesting paragraph. I want to read your comments and then I want to tell you what I think about this paragraph. Um, okay. Uh, no comments. <laughs> okay. Oh, Oleg's back. Welcome back, brother. So... He, he makes a very interesting point here. There's an idea which which we probably probably like more recently expressed as the difference between the the map and the territory. Um, 
it's like a, an idea which is popular in semiotics. Who popularized this idea of map and territory? I always forget the name. If anyone can tell me the name of the thinker who who made this distinction, who said that the territory is the map is not the territory, please tell me. Um, and this is what he's saying. What he's saying, but he's going a step further here. What he's saying is that yes, there's map and territory, and the world of phenomena, as opposed to the German philosophical idea of noumena, of what stands behind the world of appearances, um, the world of form, beyond the world of matter, uh, is the true reality. But what he's saying now is that that quest after the numinous, after the, uh, the, the reality and, 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 and ignoring the, the map was wrong because the map itself can be cherished. And this actually breaking down the duality and dichotomy between map and territory, being able to see the noumena in the phenomena and the phenomena in the noumena, which is a very interesting point. I'm going to come back to this paragraph. Um, to, to take the husk, to take the clipper, as we would say in Kabbalah, and see it as, as indistinguishable or as essential or interdependent with the ur, with the essence, with the numinous. Fascinating idea. And I see you guys are commenting now. Um, someone just told me that. I forgot the source regarding the map. Thank you very much, Oleg. It is the Polish American scientist philosopher Alfred um, Korzybiski. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Thank you. That's the name. That is exactly the person I'm talking about. Thank you very much, Oleg. You are uh, you're right. And you are on the ball. Um, I free wrote an essay on this topic. I'll share it with you. Please do. We're going to the map. But, but this is a very interesting point. He's going beyond Alfred here where Alfred teaches us to distinguish the map and reality, which is super important, a super important point, psychologically, theologically, it's a super important point at many levels. But what he's saying here is that just this, the same way that we can cherish the letters of a book, even though we know the letters are just signifiers to the meaning behind them, we don't have to dismiss the letters. We can, we can find the beauty in the letters themselves. This is super, this is super deep, that, 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 the, that the soul is in the body, that, that, that the noumena is in the phenomena. You guys catch my drift? As Siddhartha was thinking that last thought, he came to a halt again, and all of a sudden, as if a snake lay on the path before him. For suddenly this too had become clear to him, since he was really like a man who had awakened or had just been born. He had to begin his life afresh from the very outset. When on that same morning, he had left the grove, the grove of that same one, already awakened, already on the path to himself. It had been his intention and had seemed a natural and obvious course to him to return home to his father after his years of ascetic life. But now, only at the moment when he stopped short as if a snake lay upon his path, did he waken to this insight as well. Now... I am no longer the man I was. I'm no longer an ascetic. I'm no longer a priest. I'm no longer a Brahmin. So what am I to do? So what am I to do at home with my father? Study? Perform sacrifices? Practice concentration? All that is past. All that no longer lies along my path. Ooh, so he has a real existential reckoning. Who am I now? Now that I'm being reborn entirely new. I'm, I'm not a Brahmin. I'm not a priest. What do I go back to? Miriam, to be undefined. <laughs> Don't go to any path. Just be undefined. Why, why, do, why go back to anything? Why go back home? Why go back to ritual and sacrifices and practice? Just stay in the undefined. Oh, you're advocating, Miriam? Is that what you're really advocating? <laughs> I'm so glad you're still here. Have you been here the whole time, Miriam, and not said anything? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Siddhartha. Uh, Shalom said, an approaching spiritual mental ejaculation. Gotta breathe. Oh, you're approaching it? Breathe, breathe, boy. Breathe, son. Take your time. <laughs> we got all night. You can breathe. I'm going to breathe. I'm, I'm, I've been breathing too, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> Dartha stood there motionless. And for the space of a moment, 
and a breath out grew chill. He felt it cold in his breast, like a little animal, a bird or a hare. When he saw how alone he was, for years he had been homeless, and he had not felt it. Homeless in the sense, not just of not physically having a home, but not having an identity, and he hadn't felt it. Now he felt it. Up to now, even when lost most fully in ritual concentration, um, the footnote says that there's an alternative translation here, that even, lost, even when he disappeared from sight in the remotest places, he had been his father's son. Even in the furthest depths of his ecstasy, in his dvekus, in his union mystica, in his, his baka, he was still his father's son. He had been a Brahmin, a man of high rank, an intellect. Now he was only Siddhartha, the man who had awakened, and nothing more. He drew a deep breath, and for a moment he was cold uttered. No one was so as he. There was no nobleman who could not belong. There was no nobleman who did not belong to the nobility, no artisan who did not belong amongst the artisans. And could, not re- and could not take refuge with them, sharing their way of life, speaking their language. There was no Brahmin who was not numbered amongst the Brahmins living with them, no ascetic, no ascetic who did not find refuge in his status as a Salmon, and even the most forlorn hermit in the forest was not solitary and alone. He too was sheltered by a sense of belonging. He too belonged to a group that meant home to him. To have identity, to have to have that deep. Govinda had become a monk, and a thousand monks were his brothers, wore the same garment, shared the same faith, spoke his language. But he, Siddhartha, where did he belong? Whose life would he share? Whose language would he speak? He's a man adrift in a cold, vast cosmos. From that moment in which the world stood away from him all around, in which he stood alone like a star in the sky, from that moment of chill and despondence, Siddhartha emerged, more himself than before, his powers more full pacted. He felt that this had been the final shudder of awakening, the final throw of birth, and at once he set out again beginning to walk swiftly and impatiently, no longer homeward, no longer to his father, no longer looking back. So we're up to part two. I'm going to ask you guys, if you have guys and girls, men and women, boys and children, if you've ever experienced this experience of of total uh, sort of cutting off of identity from every previous form of identification, this sort of, all of the ink in our identity that made us who we were, that we just sort of felt that we were no longer pinned or connected or attached to those. Um, I've definitely had intimations of that experience. I remember a specific moment. Um, I'll tell you about, um, but I want to hear your responses. And before we start ch- chapter two, I'm going to have a bathroom break. Um, and I'll be back in real quick. Like less than a minute, please. Um, just wait one second and tell me if you've such an experience.
Okay. Uh, and we're back. Uh, let's climb back into this comfy, comfy chair. Okay. Oh, cool. Pause, breathing time. Yeah, nice. You guys are super cool, super patient. I could do this with you all day. Um, okay. Um, just to remind everyone before we begin part two, and I think we're about, about halfway through the book, which is nice. Um, we're four hours in, which is super cool too. It feels like it's been two minutes. Um, the, the, uh, the, what's that? The wager, wager? The, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the drinking thing. The rules are still in place, which means your subscriber is another shot. And if you want to get this, if you want to see this reading get slushy, tell your friends to subscribe. <laughs> Part two. Um, the, the, the beginning chapter title of this is um, Kamala. Kamala. K-A-M-A-L-A. -A -A. Kamala. Are we ready for part two? Thumbs up. Are we ready? Okay. Siddhartha learned something new with every step journey. For the world was transformed and his and his heart was under <laughs> sorry. I promise I'm not drunk. For his world was transformed and his heart was under an enchantment. He saw the sun rise above the woodlands and set above the distant palm bordered beach. At night, he saw the stars patterned in the sky and the moon's sickle floating and the moon's sickle floating in the blue like a boat. He saw trees, stars, animal clouds, rainbows, cliffs, plants, flowers, brook and river, the flashing of dew on the bushes in the morning, distant, tall mountains, blue and pale, birds sang and bees buzzed. The wind blew silvery in the rock paddies. All this, multiple and diversified, had always been the sun and moon had always shone, rivers had always roared, and bees had buzzed. But in early days, all this had been nothing to Siddhartha, but a transitory, but a transitory, deceptive veil before his eyes. Looked upon him, sorry. Uh, but in early days, all this had been nothing to Siddhartha, but a transitory, deceptive veil before his eyes, looked upon with distrust, only existing in order to penetrate, and only existing in order to be penetrated and enlightened and annihilated by thought, since it was not essence, since es since essence lay beyond the visible on its far side. But now his liberated eyes tarried on the near side. Whoa, his liberated eyes tarried on the near side. He saw and appreciated the visible. He sought a home in this world. He did not seek essence or aim for any beyond. The world beautiful when looked at in this way. Without a quest for the transcendent, it was so simple, so childlike. The moon and stars were beautiful. Can I just make a, a technical comment to people here? Um, a, a request, if you need to go and do something or like need to go and leave in general, if you can, please leave your device, your computer, your phone, whatever you're doing, that's watching continue to run because I it to me it shows that there are still people watching and I feel nice that I'm reading to people and I get to clock up watch time helpful. So that's just a personal request. <laughs> Sorry, back to the story. Um, he did not seek for any essence or aim for any beyond. The world was beautiful when looked at in this way. Without a quest for the transcendent, it was so simple, so childlike. It was so childlike, it, like it wasn't even thinking about his statistics and <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I'm being self-conscious. Okay, the moon and stars were beautiful. The brook and its banks were beautiful. Forest and crag. What's crag? C-R-A-G? Does anyone know what crag means? C-R-A-G? Rock. Hmm? Rock. Rocks? Forest and rocks. Forest and crag. Goat and beetle. Flower and butterfly. 
It was beautiful and lovely to wander through this world, through the world this way, so like a child, so wide awake, so open to your surroundings, so free from mistrust. The sun burned down on your head in a different way. The shade, the forest shade cooled you in a different way. The brook and the cistern tasted different. As the the gap, the G O U R D, the gourd and the plantain, P L A T A N. The days were short. The nights were short. Every sped rapidly. Every hour sped rapidly by like a sail on the sea. And beneath that sail, a ship laden with treasures, laden with joys. Sir Arthur saw a tribe of monkeys moving through the lofty forest ceiling, high up in the branches, and heard a wild chant of desire. Sir Arthur saw a ram pursue an oo. Is that how you pronounce it? E W E oo you you male ram, and mate with her. In a reedy lake, he saw a pike hunting as hunger came over in the evening before it whole schools of young fish leapt out of the water fearful wriggling flashing power and passion arose like a penetrating scent from the rushing eddies and the violent hunter that, that the violent hunter create beautiful description of what's going on in nature nature is a place guys <laughs> hashtag nature this all this had always existed, but he had not seen it. He had not been present. Now he was present. He belonged to it all, though his eyes, through his eyes, sorry, through his eyes light, sorry, through his eyes light and shadow raced, through his heart stars and moon raced. As he journeyed, Sid Arthur also recalled all his experiences in the garden of uh, Jetavana, the grove. The teachings he had heard there, the Buddha, his leave-taking from Govinda, his conversation with the Sublime One. He recalled once more his own words that he had spoken to the Sublime One. Every word with amazement he realized that, that he had said things then were actually beyond his ken at the time. What he had said to Gautama, his tre that his, the Buddha's treasure, and secret were not his doctrine, but the ineffable, unteachable experience that had, that had once. Um, <clears throat> um, okay, what he had said to Gautama, that his te that his treasure and secrets were not his doctrine, but the ineffable, unteachable experience that that he had once in the hour of enlightenment. That he had once in the hour of enlightenment. It was this very thing which was now which was now setting out, which he was now setting out to experience. That he was now beginning to experience. He had. He now had to experience himself. Of course, he had already long known that. His self was Atman. Of the same eternal essence as Brahman, but, he had never really found that self, because. He had never tried to catch it with the net of thought. Sorry, 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 sorry. But he had never really found that self because he had tried to catch it with the net of thought. Thank you so much. Um, Shalom says, so and appreciate the visible and seeing and appreciate it in the invisible, the former must be accomplished first to realize the second. But for now, it seems impossible, but I have faith. Yeah, this 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 interplay between the visible and the invisible, and seeing one in the other, fascinating, fascinating topic. Um, yeah, and lots to talk about. Lots to talk about. I'm, I, I'd be, I'd love to hear you guys what your thoughts are from your own um, backgrounds and traditions and study. <laughs> Aha, uh -huh. back to where we were. He now had to experience himself. Of course, he had already known, he had already long known that his self was Atman, of the same eternal essence as Brahman, but he had never really found that self because he had tried to catch it with the net of thought. Even if the body was certainly not the self, and the play of the senses was not it, 
Nevertheless, thought was not the self. Neither, sir. Nevertheless, thought was not the self either, nor was the intellect, nor acquired wisdom, nor the acquired art of drawing conclusions and spinning new thoughts out of pre-existing ones. This is an interesting process of like of like a process of elimination of trying to find where did the self reside. And initially, he 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 knew it in the senses, and he was objecting that. And now he's like, okay, it's not in thought either. No. This world of thought was also terrestrial, and you arrived at no goal. Hmm. Interesting idea. That the self. So dis disassociating the self and, and the thinking self. I mean, it's a very common idea in, in Buddhism. Um, question unrelated to this. I mean, nothing's unrelated, but um, what bracha do you make on sushi? Do you make a shahakal or a mazonis? Or a adama? Rice. It's a complicated thing. Because um, a friend of mine made me sushi. And I'm, I mean... I kind of need snacks to do like a seven hour reading. So I'm going to make a shahako because that's a safe bet. But if anyone has any objection, <laughs> according to the altar, you're supposed to have a potato. <laughs> you're supposed to wash first. Exactly. You're supposed to have it. I don't know. Uh, wash first, says Sean. That's what, that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of what the altar of is. Okay. Like. What is that? Oh yeah, please. Bah, dinay. Just realized I already made a shahakal on the whiskey. For all of the non Jewish viewers right now, uh -oh. um, there's a blessing we make on food before we eat it. Yeah, and it's very complicated what we make on what. And, if you already made the blessing before and how long you have to wait between blessings, so <laughs> fun stuff. Okay. No. This world of thought was also terrestrial. And um actually you cannot say Amen through the phone. It's called an Amen Yasema. It's a it's a orphaned Amen. You can I mean you want but no. This world of thought was also uh, terrestrial, and you arrived at no goal when you killed the accidental eye of the senses and instead fattened the accidental eye of thinking. Great line. And of thinking and scholarship. Thoughts and senses were both fine things beyond which... Thoughts and senses were, were, both, fi were both fine things beyond which um, ultimate meaning lay concealed. Both should be listened to. Both should be played with. Neither of them should be condemned or overrated. By means of both, you should try to hear the secret voice of the innermost essence. Interesting. If you notice, uh, Hess just changed his like voice here, where he's like talking to us almost. But this should be Siddhartha talking to himself. <laughs> that was an interesting little uh, preaching going on there. Yo, thanks, Riva. Um, thanks for saying that. I appreciate that you appreciate it. This is a really which which line was a line? This line um, that both thoughts and both thoughts and senses were fine things. Um, yeah, this is a super super cool um, little little point going on here. Okay, neither of them should be condemned nor overrated. By means of both, you should try to hear the secret voices of the innermost essence. Cool idea. Like, yeah, don't bash on senses. Don't bash on intellect. Just they're both there to to let us get in touch with 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 good things, with innermost essence. Okay. He decided to strive solely for what the voice commanded him to strive for, to linger over nothing unless the voice advised him. What had what had Gotama what ha, why had Gotama once in the hour of hours sat down beneath the bow tree where he received enlightenment. What had, he had heard a voice, a voice in his heart, ordered, ordered him to seek repose beneath that tree and he had preferred neither investigation nor sacrifices, neither bath nor prayer, neither eating nor drinking, neither sleep nor dream, 
but had obeyed that voice. He followed that voice that led him to that tree where he found his enlightenment. To obey in that fashion, not a command from outside, but only that voice, to be thus prepared was good, was necessary. Nothing else was necessary but listening to that voice. This idea now of, of, of not, not, not neglecting, not, not abandoning the self, but listening deeply to the self and listening to where it, where it takes you. And he says to the Buddha that took him to the Bodhi tree, <clears throat> and he wants to do, he wants he wants to experience where the voice will take him. During the night, while sleeping in the straw hut of a ferryman by the river, Siddhartha had a dream. Yeah, in Jewish mysticism, we would refer to this as the uh, the Pintleid. The, uh, yeah, 100%. Um, during the night, while sleeping in the straw hut of a ferryman by the river, Siddhartha had a dream. Govinda stood, behind, Govinda stood before him in a yellow ascetic's robe. Govinda looked sad. Sad, he asked, why have you deserted me? Then he embraced Govinda, threw his arms around him as he drew him to his breast and kissed him. It was no longer Govinda, but a woman. And from the woman's robe, a milk-laden breast was exposed. Siddhartha lay down and drank from it. The milk from that breast tasted sweet and strong. It tasted of woman and man, of sun and forest, of animal and flower, of every fruit, of every... Of every. It made him drunk and unconscious. When Siddhartha awoke, the pale river was glimmering through the door of the hut. And in the forest, the dark cry of an owl resounded, deep and melodious. Interesting. When the day began, Siddhartha asked his host, the ferryman, to take him across the river. The ferryman took him across the river on his bamboo raft. The wide waters had a red glimmer in the red morning, in the, in the, in the morning light. This is a beautiful river, he said to his companion. Yes, ferryman. A very beautiful river. I love it above all other things. I have listened to it. I've often looked into its eyes. I've often learned from it. You can learn a lot from a river. Thank you, my benefactor, said Siddhartha as he climbed onto the other bank. I have no gift for you, my dear man, such as, one's, such as one gives to one's host, nor can I pay you. I am a homeless man, a Brahmin son, a Samana. I could see that, said the ferryman, and I did not expect any payment from you, nor a guest's gift. You'll re you will give me the gift another time. You think so, said Arthur, said merrily? Absolutely. Um, River said that, uh, we're talking about the drunkenness of spiritual immersion. It's similar, to, it's similar to the allegories of being drunk with the wines of spiritual mist and scriptural revelations. Yeah, so there's an interesting theme of, of drunkenness um, Song of Songs is uh, talk, bless you. He's talking about the drunkenness, the intoxication. He told him and your love, your closeness is, is better than wine. That to be drunken on, on, on things other than wine uh, is, a, is a common theme in mysticism. Um, the, the, the Sufi mystics were often called kids. Um, but, but it's interesting, actually. Spiritual drunkenness is greater than physical drunkenness. There's actually, Shalom, you might appreciate this. There's, there, there was a text, so in, in Jewish practice, and, and of course adopted by Jewish mysticism, um, on Purim, the festival of Purim, there's a custom to get drunk. That's what the Talmud recommends. Uh, until the point that one no longer knows the difference between, between um, one, no, one no longer can distinguish between Haman and Mardachai, between good and evil, which is very mystical, as you can, as, as you can surmise. And... Um, and there was there was a, a Jewish mystic and, and legal scholar. Um, his name was um, the Ramah, Ramesh Ishlis. And one Purim came upon him where there was no wine to be found and there was nothing to drink and he couldn't fulfill the religious obligations of the day. And he writes a book on that day called um, called something something Miyain, like a Matz. 
better than wine or sweeter than wine or replacing wine. I forget the exact Hebrew title. And this is the idea that, that the spiritual delights can replace and, and be better than physical drunkenness. Um, similar to allegories of being drunk with the wine, uh, but sometimes we need to physically get a bit drunk to get spiritually drunk. Sometimes it helps. I mean, there is a place for, for <laughs> physical drunkenness in, in mystical past. I mean, definitely in, in Jewish mysticism and I'll be curious about other mysticisms. Um, but, but, but actually I do think that something different is happening here because his intoxication is very much connected with, not with spirituality, but with materiality, with the, with the phenomena, with the presence of, of a woman best, with the physical, with the sensual and sexual. And it's almost, it seems, it seems he's actually saying the other point here. I'd be curious to know what you guys think that, that, um, one can be intoxicated by the physical, by nature, by, by another body, um, in a way that is akin or, or, can, or can, can sort of um, simulate a spiritual intoxication. Because, I mean, this paragraph was, was entirely physical in its, in its description, entirely human, um, away from the ascetic. I mean, the ascetic would never drink from the, the breast of a woman. That's like... I can't think of anything that's anti, more anti-ascetical. So I think this may be actually a very different point he's making here. Where are we up to? Uh, okay, so Siddhartha says to the host, uh, hey, bud, I'm sorry, I can't pay you. And the host is like, it's all good, man. I knew you weren't going to pay me anyways. You look like a hobo. I wasn't expecting anything, but sorry. But you give me a gift another time. You think so? Siddhartha said merrily. Absolutely. This too, I've learned from the river. Everything returns. You too, um, someone returned. Now I will. Let your friendship be my pay. Good man. May you think of me when you sacrifice to the gods. Both smiled as they parted. Siddhartha smiled as he rejoiced over the friendship and friendliness of the merry men. He is like Govinda, he thought with a smile. Everyone I meet on this journey is like Govinda. They are all grateful, even though they are the ones who deserve the thanks. They are all ready to serve me. They would all like to be my friends. They obey me, thinking hard about it. People are like children. Yeah. <laughs> We're eating sushi here. Let me show you. <laughs> Why not? Um, it's actually homemade sushi from the shuk, from the bazaar here in Machana Yehuda, whoever knows the, the outdoor market here. And my good friend here very kindly made me the sushi so that I would have some sustenance while reading to you guys. <laughs> what good fun. Um, L'chaim to you all. May we elevate the energy and the nutrients inside the sushi to do good things and to enjoy the beauty of existence. Okay, back to the story. About midday, he was walking through a village in front of the clay huts. Children were tumbling about in the streets. <laughs> is, um, is sushi and whiskey a very Chabad thing? Is that like only, I mean, that's, I know we do that in Chabad. I don't know if that's like the thing that other people do. It's like classic Chabad for bringing sushi and whiskey. <laughs> uh, good times. About midday, well, we never read Siddhartha at Chabad for bringing, so this is definitely new for me. About midday, he was about midday. He was walking through a village in front of the clay huts. Children were tumbling about in the streets, playing with grout, uh, seeds, and seashells, yelling and scuffling. But they all ran in fright from the strange salmon. At the end of the village, the path led across a brook. At the end of the brook, a young woman was kneeling and washing clothes. It's the same for the antiquity and sacrificial food offerings, I think. 
I mean, the mindset of elevating uh, the mindset of elevating the energies of food to do holy work. Um, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really cool idea. It's a really cool idea that there's energy in, in, in things, in plants, in, in reality, and that energy finds its way into our body and we can choose how we want to spend that energy and doing so we can either elevate that energy and sort of have it, allow it to, in this context, escape, you know, you know the cycle of samsara, um, or we can sort of send it back down into a re, to be reborn. I mean, this is like life, right? And inside the sushi, is either going to get elevated and used well, or it's going to get recycled and, and, and it will come back up and hope, it, hope for a chance again to be used for something good. It's a super cool idea. I love it. Um, super. Okay, so he, at the end of the village path, he sees a young woman that was kneeling and washing clothes. I have a intuition that things are about to get a bit risque here. If anyone is under 18, it's time to turn off your cameras. If you're an adult, then you can stay and be adult about what's about to happen. When Siddhartha greeted her, she raised her head and looked up at him with a smile. Uh, so that he saw the gleam from the whites of her eyes. He called out a blessing on her, as is customary with the travelers, and asked her how far it was to the big town. Classic pickup line. How far is it to the big town? <laughs> then she stood up and walked over to him. Her moist lips were beautiful glimmering in her young face. She exchanged um, joyceal words with him. Sorry. Uh, joy, joy, joyceler, G-O-C-U-L-R. Joyceler words with him. Uh, asking him if he had already eaten and if it was true that salmons slept alone at night in the forest and were not allowed to have any women with them. So she is flirting with him too. <laughs> I was right about this. At the same time, she placed her left foot on his right and moved her body like a woman inviting a man to the style of lovemaking that the manuals call climbing a tree. <laughs> that just went from being very subtle <laughs> to, to being very bizarre. Oh my God. <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm going to be adult about this, but this is too funny. Like, this was so funny. Um, there's a footnote here <laughs> um, that climbing a tree is a sex position described in the Kama Sutra, um, that the man stands upright while the woman stands on his feet, um, hoists herself up and rounds, wraps herself around him. See Kama Sutra in the glossary. Oh my is correct. <laughs> I might not read the footnotes. I might just stick to the text. <laughs> Siddhartha <laughs> alright guys let's be mature Chaim. Siddhartha felt his blood heat up and since he recalled his dream at that moment he stooped down slightly to the woman and with his lips kissed the brown top of one breast just one <laughs> looking up he saw, her he saw her face smiling filled with desire and her narrowed eyes beseeching him longingly. Siddhartha too felt a longing. This is the <laughs> try not to laugh loud challenge. This is, yeah. Okay, we'll see, we'll see how good we do with that. Siddhartha too, it's only because it's been so serious up until now, and then it's just like, um, so unsubtle that I'm laughing. I really am mature, trust me. Siddhartha too felt a longing. And the fountain of sex stirring, he had never yet touched a woman. He hesitated for a moment, though his hands were all set to reach out for her. This is the real mystical part. Yeah, I mean, are we connected to the internet? It's, it always tells me we're, like, we're disconnected. Um, eroticism and sexuality are very, very deeply intertwined with mysticism. Uh, so you can't escape it if you're looking for mysticism, and there's no escape. It's, uh, it's a beautiful part of life. Um, he hesitated for a moment, though his hands were all although his hands were already all set to reach out for her. And at that moment, sure, sure, and precise. And at that moment, with a shunder, he heard his inner voice. Oh, no. And the voice said, no. 
<laughs> this is what we call a buzzkill. <laughs> His voice is like, no. He's like, yeah. Thereupon, all the magic vanished from the young woman's smiling face. He no longer saw her there, but the more eyes of a female animal in heat. In a friendly way, he stroked her cheek, turned away from her, and with light steps disappeared from the disappointed woman's view into the bamboo. <laughs> he was friend zoned. <laughs> no, he friend zoned himself. Excuse me. He, he had the uh, inner determination to say no and to turn away from what he desired. Call it Um, Interesting. It's interesting because I was honestly expecting him. He's on this whole trip where he's like, following his sensuality and following nature and following just kind of it's it almost seemed a bit hedonistic in some sense of like not following teachings and not following the rituals and the paths um and i thought he was definitely going to continue this and experience the beauty and pleasure of the nature of another human being and the union involved um but i guess i guess i guess no i guess he's in a voice is like no that's not that's not what we're doing right now okay All right. Just out of curiosity, how many people have a text that they're reading now? And how many people are just listening to me read the text? I'm curious. I want to know if I can make things up. <laughs> if I don't call me out. Spice up the story as we go. Put my own touch in it. Okay. Before evening of that day, reached a big town. I was happy. Um, just listening. Don't have it so I can make whatever I want. Good. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm joking. I'll, I mean, you hope I'm joking. Yeah, before evening that day, he reached a big town, was happy for he desired to be among people. Uh, just by the way, if anyone wants a text of this online, I put a description. I put a link to a free text in the description. It's there if, if anyone wants to read it with me. For a long time, but you're also, of course, welcome to listen to my trustworthy and uh, my the fidelity of my reading. For a long time, he lived in the forest and the fairy menstrual hut in which he had slept the night before. Uh, had been the had been the first roof over his head in a long time. Just outside the town, near a beautiful grove, enclosed by a hedge, the wonder was met by a small train of male and female servants laden with baskets. In their midst, in a in their midst, in a decorated sedan chair carried by four men, a woman, their mistress, sat on red cushions, colorful canopy. Siddhartha remained standing at the entrance to the pleasure grove, watching the procession. He saw the servants, the maids, the baskets. He saw the sedan chair. He saw the lady in the chair. Or beneath the high piled black hair, a fair, very soft, clever face. Bright red lips like a recently, like a newly opened fig. Eyebrows well tended and painted in the form of high arches. Dark eyes, clever and alert. And a long neck. And a long fair neck emerging from the green and gold outer garment, fair hands at rest, long and narrow, with wide gold bracelets at the wrist. Bless you. Sir Arthur saw how beautiful she was, and his heart rejoiced. He low bowed when the chain came near him, and straightened up again. He looked at the fair, lovely face. For a moment, he read the clever eyes with the high arches above them inhaled a breath of fragrance that he did not recognize. The beautiful woman, smiling, nodded for a moment and then disappeared into the grove, her, her servants following. And so, Siddhartha thought, I'm entering this town with a favorable omen. He was tempted to walk right into the grove, over, and only then became aware of how the servants and maids looked at him at the entrance, how contemptuously, how distrustfully, how distantly. I am still a salmon, he thought, still an ascetic and a mendicant. I 
remain this way. This way I should be this way I shall be unable to enter the group. And he laughed. It's interesting that his journey goes from first being an ascetic to then now, I guess, transitioning into like normal everyday life, pleasures, roof over his head, food. It's usually like the other way. We usually talk about like people indulging and you know, I need to go the path of the ascetic. Here it's reversed, which is an interesting twist. Love that moment when I am reading accidentally using different accents. <laughs> yeah, touche. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really cool. I'm kind of getting lost in this reading. It's kind of nice from moment to moment. And then I zoom out to like reflect and chat. But it's nice to be in that like in that space. He asked the next name his way about the grove and that woman's name and learned that it was the grove of Kamala, which is the name of this chapter. The renowned courtesan, and that in addition to the grove, she owned a house in town. She be rolling. Then he entered the town. He now had an aim. He's a man with a mission. Pursuing his aim, he's let himself be engulfed by the... He floated on the current of the lanes... He remained standing on the squares. He rested on the stone steps by the river. Toward evening, he made friends with a barber's assistant, whom he had seen working in the shade of an archway, whom he ran across, who he ran across while praying in a temple of Vishnu, and whom he told stories concerning Vishnu and um, Lakshimu. That night, he slept near the boats by the river, and early in the morning, the first customer came to the shop. He had his assistant shave off his beard, cut his hair, and had his hair combed and anointed with fine oil. Next, he went to bathe in the river. My man is getting cleaned up. Late in the afternoon, when the beautiful Kamala approached her grove in the sedan chair. What is a sedan chair, by the way? S-E-D-A-N, like a carried chair. Siddhartha was standing at the entrance. He bowed and received the courtesan's greetings, but he beckoned to the servant who was lost in line, asking him to announce to his mistress that a young Brahmin wished to speak to her. After a while, the servant returned, inviting the, inv inviting the waiting man to follow him, silently led the man into a pavilion where Camellia lay on a daybed and left him alone with her. Were you not already standing there yesterday to greet me? asked Kamalia. Kamala. Uh, oh, thank you, River. An enclosed chair for conveying one person carried between horizontal poles by two or more porters. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Yeah, I get that. I get that image. The um, There's another word for it. I think it's called like a uh, a, a, a palladian or something. A litter. A litter? Yeah. Apirion is actually the, uh, the it's a word used in Shirashirim in the Bible. And I think it comes from the Greek Apirion? Does anybody know about uh, Apirion in Greek or in ancient Hebrew, biblical Hebrew? Uh, I think a sedan chair is one where one people carry on their backs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds about right. You want smooth boat yourself? Who's smooth boat? Smooth boat. Smooth boat. Do you have a name? Okay. Uh, so Kamala, this rich woman, says, uh, yes. I saw you and greeted you yesterday, but were you not wearing a beard yesterday and long hair and dust in your hair? You observed well. You saw everything. You saw Siddhartha, the Brahmin son who left his home to become a salmon and who was a salmon for three years. But now I have abandoned that path and I have come to this town. And the first person who met me even before I entered the town was you. And I've come to tell you, O oh, Kamala, you are the first woman to whom Siddhartha has spoken without standing with downcast eyes. Bit of a sexist. Never again shall I lower my eyes when a beautiful woman meets me. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, I take that back. He just is like not looking, like to be modest, to like not be tempted by the woman. Weird. I mean, we'll let that, we'll let that slide. Um, so he's like, you, Samala, the woman who I did not put my eyes down to, but whom I raised my eyes to, you should feel so flattered <laughs> yikes 
I have to remember this book was written in like the 1900s, in the 2000s. So it has not weird... Uh, oh, Kamal, you were the first one to whom Siddhartha spoke without standing with Dakas' eyes. Never again shall I lower my eyes when a beautiful woman meets me. Kamala smiled and played with her peacock feather fan. And she asked, And Siddhartha has visited Millie to tell me that? Feisty. Yeah, super old school. To tell you that and to thank you for being so beautiful. <laughs> that's a nice thing to... That's a nice touch. Thank you for being so beautiful. That's romantic. That's sweet. And... Um, if it does not displease you, I'm curious actually if there are any um, women in the audience. What is how is that a comp like? How would you take the compliment if someone said thank you for being so beautiful? Well, how would you feel about such a thing? Or if if someone came up to you and told you thanks for being so handsome, um, to tell you and thank you for being so beautiful. And if it does not displease you, Kamala, I would like to ask you to be my friend and in and in and in in struck in. Structuress, <laughs> my female instructor, for I still know nothing of the art in which you are an expert. What is she an expert on? Is she a is she a prostitute? She's a. We said she was a, a, a courtesan. Courti is that does that mean does that mean prostitute? At that point, Kamala laughed out loud. My friend, I have never had a salmon come to me from the forest to learn from me. Teach me your ways. <laughs> nice. That's cool. It's cool to blush. Um, I think I think people don't blush enough. I think we need to blush more. <laughs> you know, blush is like blood coming to our face. We need more blood in our face. <laughs> uh, I never had. I, I'm blushing just from you talking about blushing. Jeez. <laughs> we have a new subscriber. What number is it? 990? 990! Okay, guys, time to interrupt this romance between Kamala and Siddhartha to celebrate our 990th subscriber. My word is gold, people. Thank you. Cheers. Salut. L'chaim. Thanks for joining us. If you're going to join us in the stream. Yeah. What does that mean? We're 10 away? Yeah. That's the maths, right? 990 mm -hmm. to 1,000 is 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We have a little surprise when we get to 1,000. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not telling you because then it wouldn't be a surprise, right? Okay. So how's it going? How is he doing with um, with Kamala? Kamala is like pretty surprised. She's like, yo, I, I, I never had no salmon come here and be like, Teach me your ways. Uh, with long hair in an old torn loincloth, many men visit me, uh, and there are Brahmin songs amongst them, but they come to me in fine clothes and elegant shoes. They have perfumed hair and money in their purses. That someone is what the young men are like who visit me. You ain't like the people around here. Siddhartha said, I am already beginning to learn from you. Nice. Even yesterday, I learned something from you. I have already removed my beard, comb my hair, and put oil in my hair. There's only a little that I still lack. Excellent woman. Uh, is Sorry. It is only a little that I still lack, excellent woman. Elegant clothes, elegant shoes, money in my purse. Let me tell you, Siddhartha studies mind on things more difficult than such trifles. Trifles. Thank you. And has attained them. Siddhartha... Can, can can do things that he wants to do when he puts his mind to doing those things. I shall let you know, oh Kamala. How should I not attain um, what I set my mind on yesterday to be your friend and to learn the joys of love? You will find me to be a quick learner, Kamala. I have learned more difficult things than what you have, uh, than what you are to teach me. Yeah, I studied with the freaking Buddha. And so now, Siddhartha does not satisfy. And so now, Siddhartha does not satisfy you as he is with his hair, but without clothes, without money, uh, without shoes. Laughing, Kamala cried. Um, I don't. 
uh, Oleg, I don't get the reference of uh, Martin Eden of Jack London. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who is, who is Martin Eden? He's. It's interesting. Like, it's interesting. This like little play that's going on here. It's also interesting to to realize that obviously the author Herman Hesse is a, is a dude, is a male, and so it's like it's like a man's writing of like the way that a man would try to get with this pretty powerful woman. That's a that's an interesting little thing to remember. Um, yeah, the wording is strange. He's like, he's like, I can do things before. I've learned difficult things before. Don't be turned away by my by my disheveled appearance. Interesting tactic. <laughs> Let's see if it works for him. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm pulling down this book. Like, what? No, I mean I'm not. <laughs> am I? Am I not? The live audience says I'm not. I'm just. I'm just reacting genuinely to it. Cool. Okay. Don't be jealous, by the way. It's a live audience of one. So, <laughs> don't be like, oh my gosh, why are we in this crowd of audience? Okay, okay, okay. Laughing, Kamala cried. Oh my good man. He still does not satisfy me. He must have clothes, handsome clothes, shoes, good looking shoes. Boy, you better be dressed to the nines if you want to come up in here. And a lot of money in that purse. And gifts for Kamala. Now, do you know Samana from the forest? Have you played Coast Attention? Oh, now do you know some forest? Have you played Coast? You catch my drift? You don't come up here. Don't come up in here in your torn loincloth and your bare feet and your messy beard. Come back when you cleaned up. Come back when uh, when you unfleek. <laughs> this is just an entertaining, like it's an entertaining part of the story. I'm not. It doesn't take much effort. <laughs> it's funny actually. Like the like. I love, bro, like, I love philosophy, I love metaphysics, I love history, mysticism, and, like, that part, obviously, is, like, deeply intriguing, and like, to get rid of the ego, but, like, being human, like, the human parts of the book as well, like, super fascinating, these human interactions, and these human, like, desire, and lust, and loneliness, these are, like, super entertaining, and super, like, relevant, and relatable. Being human is great! We got to... Bless you. We got to talk with our mouths full. We got to eat sushi and drink whiskey. Fuck yeah. Okay, I can't swear, but sorry. I'm gonna get demonetized. Hell yeah. To being human. Being human to me. You know what? All human. <laughs> we all eat. All need to like... Use a bathroom when we're done eating. <laughs> we love. We all have. We're all afraid of things. We're all like lonely sometimes at night. Being human is cool. It's cool as hell. <laughs> and Siddhartha, by extension of Herman Hesse, is human too. Because Her Herman, a good old poor hum Herman, who was like made to be a priest and was put into sanatoriums and ran away to India. He's human too, and his character is so human. Love it. Bro, the chemical balance to appreciate life and the wisdom to transcend it. Yeah, man, appreciating life. It's actually interesting because right now, Siddhartha is not about transcending life. He's about like being in life. I wonder if you would like what you think about the distinction of transcending and being like present in it. Anyhow, back to this beautiful text. Yes, I have paid close attention, cried Siddhartha. How could I fail to pay attention to words from such lips? Sweet talker, your mouth is like a, this is the second time he uses this analogy. Your mouth is like a newly opened fig. This guy really likes figs. Kamala, um, my lips are red and fresh too. They will suit yours. You will see, oh my God. This is <laughs> that was some bad attempts, Herman, Mister Hess. Pick up your game. <laughs> let me read. Let me reread this line to you. This is his. This is his, this is a line. 
Your mouth is like a newly opened fig, Kamala. My lips are red and fresh, too. They will suit yours. You will see. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> that, needs some, that needs some brushing up. Okay. But tell me, beautiful Kamala, are you not... Are you not all afraid of these of the Samana in the forest who has come to learn love? Are you afraid of me? Ooh, he's introducing an element of fear into this erotic courting. Why then should I be afraid of a Samana? A stupid Samana from the forest who has come from the jackals and who does not know what women are. Me? Afraid of you? What? What's that? <laughs> What's that to be afraid of, bro? You, you out of the forest. You you don't know what women are. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. This is a woman here. Uh, Shalom says, in order to transcend what is present, one must first be present in the present. Very ambiguous and dreamlike goal. Hard and sometimes not possible. That's the point. To avoid, not to avoid failure and elevate it. Okay, on that note, we're all going to take a moment to be in the present, and then we're going to get back to reading. <laughs> Was everybody present for that moment? <laughs> okay. <sighs> we're going to continue. Oh, he is strong, this woman, and afraid of nothing. He could take you by force, pretty girl. He could rob you. He could hurt you. Wow, he's getting threatening here. Phew, that's not nice. He's like, I could hurt you. I could take you by force if I wanted to. Yikes. Uh, where are you from? I am from Australia, Sydney, Australia. But I'm currently in... The holy city of Jerusalem. Yeah, Mecca, awkward. Like, what is... This was this was very... I was I was expecting better from Brahm, from Siddhartha. But it's interesting, this element of fear, this, this element of, like, power, this element of, like, like, you're all powerful here because you're in your home... You're in your sort of home turf. You got your servants. You got your riches. You got your beauty. Just like a stranger or a vagabond. But... I have power too. I have force. I'm like I'm like something to be reckoned with. Don't just laugh at me. Uh, I, I can't obviously I can't condone his actions of like trying to intimidate her, but it's an interesting dynamic going down here. What does she say back? I haven't read this before. I have no idea what she's gonna say. It's so exciting. She says, "No, Salmon." She's using this word derisively. I'm not afraid of that. Has a Salman or a Brahmin ever been able, sorry, has a Salman or a Brahmin ever been afraid that someone might come grab him and rub him of his scholarship, his piety, his wisdom? Wow, good call. No, because they are his very own and he imparts only as much of them as he wishes and to whom he wishes. It is the same, exactly the same with Kamala too and with the joys of love, Kamala's lips are beautiful and red, but try to kiss, but try to kiss them against Kamala's will, and not a drop of sweetness will you have from them, although they are able to grant so much sweetness. You are a quick learner, Siddhartha, so learn this as well. <laughs> love can be won by begging. It can be bought, received as a gift, found on the street, but it cannot be stolen. Sub line, Kamala. You have hatched a useless plan there. No, it would be a pity if a handsome man like you would want to attack things in such a wrong way. Kamala, far from being intimidated, far from being flustered, she's like, no, son. You listen to me. You cannot steal what I have because it cannot be stolen. Just like no one can steal your wisdom as a Brahmin, as a Samana. You can come, you can, you can try and kiss these lips, but unless I'm interested, there ain't going to be no sweetness of coming out of these lips. Siddharth bowed with a smile. It would be a pity, Kamala. 
how right you are. But this is what she, she, she calls him like handsome at the end. And she's like, she's flirting with him. She's playing with him. S um, Siddhartha bowed with a smile. It would be a pity, Kamala. How right you are. It would be a terrible pity. Not a drop of sweetness shall I lose from your lips, nor you from mine. So this is how it stands. Siddhartha will return when he has now, when he has what he now lacks, clothes, shoes, money. But tell me, lovely Kamala, can you give me another small piece of advice? Advice? Why not? Who would not be glad to give advice to a poor, ignorant Samana who has come from the jackals in the forest, shots fired? Dear Kamala, then advise me. Where should I go to find those three things as quickly as possible? Where can a boy get dough in this town? My friend, many people like you want to know that. You must do what you have learnt and receive money from it. Clothes and shoes. There is no other way for a poor man to come into money. Well, what can you do? I can think. I can wait. I can fast. Bro, no one's paying you for fasting. Get real. Jeez. There ain't no market for that. Nothing else? Uh, nothing. Oh, yes. I can compose poetry. Will you give me a kiss for a poem? <sighs> what a what a heartthrob. Yes, I will, if I like your poem. How does it go? After reflecting for a moment, Siddhartha, uh, Siddhartha uttered these verses. Um, we're about to hear some poetry. And uh, in anticipation of that poetry, we're going to have a piece of sushi. Because sushi is so poetic. It's like fish wrapped in rice, wrapped in seaweed. <laughs> Are you all ready for this poetry? I better be good or else he ain't good. Okay. What do we, by the way, can we take a quick vote? Do we think this poem is going to get a kiss or not? Thumbs up or thumbs down? The live audience gives a thumbs up. What do you guys reckon? Um, River is concerned that this poem is not going to go down well. Okay. Anyone else? No, no more votes. What's my guess? Um, my guess is no. Yeah. Okay. Because I read the first line already and it, it, it ain't that popping. <laughs> um, River says, get kissed, but it's still weird. <laughs> like, she gives it to him, but like, bro, like, it didn't, like, you didn't deserve that. Okay. Sean, thumbs up for a kiss. Uh, thumbs down from Fernanda. Uh, Sean says, like, bro, see the beauty in it. Like, even if the poem, oh, nice. If, even if the poem is horrible, there's still beauty because it's like, everything has to be beautiful. Nice, cool. Okay, let's find out. Um, I what did, I, I said I said no. Yeah. If I'm wrong, I'll take a shot. Okay. Um, in her shady grove stepped Kamala. At the entrance of the grove stood the tanned Samana. That rhymes. Ooh. <laughs> Where he caught sight of the lotus blossom. He made a low bow. And Kamala thanked him with a smile. More lovely, thought the young man, than to sacrifice to the gods. More lovely is to sacrifice to the beautiful Kamala. So sweet. Kamala clapped her hands. He was a poet and he didn't even realize it. <laughs> Good call. Uh, Kamala clapped her hands loudly so that her golden arm rings clinged. Your verses are beautiful, Tan Samana. And truly, I'll lose nothing if I give you a kiss for them. Wait, wait, wait. Let's see if she actually follows through. <laughs> I will drink if she does. Um, oh, okay. It's about, yeah. She drew him over with her eyes. Yeah, okay. It's a, she's she's going to kiss him. I was wrong. I mean, to be honest, that poem was like... It started strong with that rhyme, but I mean, it was flattering for sure, but huh, here's to you, young uh, Siddhartha. 
and your first kiss. Woo! Cheers to first kisses. Okay. Your verses are beautiful, tan, semana, and truly I lose nothing if I give you a kiss for them. Because love is free, my friends. Love is free. Yeah, uh, Nemeton, you were right, bro. River was right. The beauty in things is not in it of themselves, rather the applicable truths we can take away from it. It applies to myths, in my honest opinion. Bro, you be dropping like truth bombs here. <laughs> I only met you today, man. This is so cool. I feel like I've known you for a while um, and I hope to get to know you. Where are you living, by the way? Are you in the States? Are you, where are you at? But guys and girls, love is free and we don't lose by giving up. She drew him over to her with her eyes. Her eyes had come hither. Um, he lowered his face to hers and placed his lips on those lips that were like newly opened fig. He needs to find a new metaphor. I've heard newly opened fig three times and it's lost its poetry. We're cruising right through now. We be cruising. Yeah, we'd be cruising. We're totally cruising. Uh, Los Angeles. Nice. Oh, bro. I think I know you. Or I think you know people that I know. I, I was I was in LA for a year. You know, you know, um, um, Menachem Shemtov, LA crowd? Oh, honey. I was in Yeshiva in LA. Okay, back to the story. Kamala gave him, yeah, for sure. Kamala gave him a long kiss. And in deep amazement, Siddhartha felt she was teaching him, that she was wise, that she dominated him, repulsed him and lured him, and that behind this first kiss, there was a long, well-organized, well-tested series of kisses, each one different, still waiting him. Breathing deeply, he stood there. At that moment, as astonished as a child, at the wealth of knowledge and things worth learning that revealed itself to his eyes. That was really beautiful. Oh, of course. Of course you're in Yoak, yeah. Um, yeah, Menachem's, I was I was in Yishim with Menachem and we were on Shlach together in Cape Town. We're still very good friends, thank God. Um, this was really beautiful for a few reasons. Firstly, because the idea that there's that there's wisdom and knowledge and teaching in, in a kiss, in, in love, uh is super that's super that's so cool um and true i think if you can like yeah um and i think that and what's what's really cool too here is that if we remember what we've been reading till now siddhartha was like i'm finished with teaching i'm finished with i'm finished with teachers and teaching no more no i i have nothing more to learn i've, I've learned it all i got the secret of the cosmos i heard the buddha himself i'd be i'm out 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 and now he gets a kiss and he's like, yo, I still have so much more to learn. I, I haven't even begun to scratch the surfaces. And I think that's such a cool realization when there are moments in life when we're like, yeah, we know everything. We learned it all. We read all the books and we blah, blah, blah. And then there comes a moment in life that grips us in a different way, like a kiss, a sunset, a river, a dream, um, a sensation. And we're like, wow, we, we know nothing. There's so much to learn. There, there's, how did he phrase this? That behind the first kiss, there was a long, well-organized, well-tested series, each one different, still awaiting him. Be like wisdom and beauty and love still awaiting him, well-organized, waiting for him to, 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 to embark and, and open up to it. The new nothing is the moment we think we know. Yeah, 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 that, that interaction between like, the, I think it's the Zohar which says talus idea should learn the the pinnacle of knowledge is to not know, and the, the but th this 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 capacity to <sighs> encounter wisdom and, and and knowledge in 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 the physical in the sensuous epic epic good man Herman um, your verses are very beautiful Kamala cried if I were rich. I would give you gold coins for them. She's a fan, but you will be hard to find. But but 
you'll find it hard to earn you'll find it hard to earn as much as you need with these verses you will need a lot of money if you wish to be Kamala's friend if you want to be my friend you bet to be rich and poetry ain't gonna make you rich son how true <laughs> uh The way you can kiss Kamala, Siddhartha stammered, yes, I am good at it. And so I have no lack of clothes, shoes, armbands. <laughs> you know who has no lack of armbands? Kamala has all the armbands. Oh yeah. And every beautiful thing. But what will become of you? Can you do nothing but think and fast and compose poems. What you got, son? Shalom says, I believe, uh, please don't put me in harem, that <laughs> in, in excommunication, that every, that even Hashem has that rule applied to, that even God has that rule applied to. If it's true that we are created in God's image, your paradox and nominee sounds like life to me. What rule does God have applied to him? That God, in the moment of knowing everything, knows nothing? That's a trippy thought. Listen, I ain't going to put you in excommunication. I'm done with those days of excommunicating people. <laughs> but uh, I like where you're going. And I, I like talking about God, like using these metaphors to reflect back on ourselves in a deep way. The interplay between theology and psychology is where I'm at. Okay. So Siddhartha is like, yo, I ain't just got poetry. I also know the sacrificial chants, said Siddhartha, but I shall not sing them anymore. I used to know magic charms, but I should not pronounce it anymore. I have read the scriptures. Stop there, Kamala interrupted him. You can read, son, and write? Of course I can. Many people can. Hopefully sooner. Hopefully sooner, man. Uh, most people cannot. It cannot either. It's a, very good thing. it's a very good thing that you can read and write. Very good. You will still be able to use the magic charms too what magic charms his own charming personality his magic he's i'm not sure at that moment a maid came running in and whispered a piece of news into her mistress's ear i am receiving a visit kamala cried vanish at once siddhartha no one must see you here mind that tomorrow i shall see you again yeah yeah he got the invite for tomorrow they always called me lame until I could read. Now he's cool. Um, I think lame means you can't walk. What's the technical term for not being able to? Oh, illiterate. That's the word. Did it take you a while to learn how to read, uh, River? <laughs> feel like joking. no, feel free. Oh, are you joking? <laughs> I know I, myself. I I was a very slow like reader. I honestly I'm like pretty dyslexic, um, and like all I read was picture books. And I would really just look at the pictures and make up my own story. <laughs> I'm serious. And I was in school. I had to learn two languages. I had to learn Hebrew and English, which is like totally two. Different. One's a Semitic language. One's a like, romantic language. Very difficult. Um, so I, I I feel with you. I like it took me a while. Reading is difficult. I mean it like I'm cool lol. Not at all. I'm, I'm making a joke of the scene. Okay. <laughs> I'm busy like here, like 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 empathizing with you, not being able to learn to read, and you're just joking the whole time. <laughs> I, I appreciate reading slowly. I appreciate being dyslexic. I appreciate like literally slowly and and like I, I think i process and read things differently than people who don't have difficulties reading i think i, I think like i think einstein was dyslexic and a lot of other like i'm not i'm not saying i'm like an einstein like let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves but no, i really think there's a different way of, of analyzing information i haven't looked up the, the studies on this but like a left right brain kind of thing Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I know there is like a five second delay or, or like more between the text and, and live stream. I mean, the live stream has to go all the way up to the satellite and come all the way back down to you. So we can give it like five seconds, right? 
Okay, Shalom. I don't agree with you, bro. Um, so left brain, left right brain lateralization um, was very popular in the sciences. It was then thought to be disproved and shown as, as myth. Now there's actually a resurgence in neuroscience, which is spearheaded by people like Gilbert Taylor and um, what's his name? The other guy he wrote. He wrote the right and left brain, the, the master and the emissary. Um, Ian McGilchrist. Read Ian McGilchrist. Um, and and uh, and there's actually been a resurgence. There's been a revival of the of of left and right brain theory in in, in neuroscience. Um, it's more sophisticated than it was initially, but it's it's not a myth. It's 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 it's. I mean, whatever. Like science changes all the time, but um, it's coming back. <laughs> that satellite is too slow. <laughs> Can't move satellite. Hurry up. Okay. Where where were we? Oh, this is the point I wanted to make. I wanted to make that in today's day and age, we're all really lucky that we can all read and write, basically. I mean, at least like the people who we're going to be meeting on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm sure there are many people who aren't literate, and that's tragic, and we need to help raise, late, raise rates of literacy all around the world, of course. But back in the day, like in the in 4th, 5th century BCE, bro, no one could read and write. Like, it was super rare. It was super talented. We're like geniuses. The average idiot today is like a genius compared to, like, people that day. It's, that's an interesting idea to think about. Uh, correct. It was a myth. Now it's called a lie. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't like this uh, association between myth and lie. I don't think myths are lies. I think myths are truths told in the form of story. But I get how myth is used. Um, no, but I don't think it's a lie. I think I think like neuro lateralization is actually found a place now in the sciences again. I'll send you a link to this book, uh, Emil Gilchrist, The Master and the Emissary. Super, super, super good research, um, and it's coming. I'm telling you, it's coming back up in the field. I'm no sci. I'm I'm not a scientist. I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm just a dude who reads books. But um, that's that's what I hear from the books I read. The books talk to me. Listen. <laughs> Okay, back to the story. Uh, so at the moment a maid come running, comes running, whispers a piece of news in her mistress's ear. I'm receiving a visit, Kamala cried. Vanish at once, said Arthur. Be gone. No one must see you here. Mind that. Tomorrow she'll see you again. Oh, Shalom, don't get so philosophical on this point. Like we're all right. This is just like, the science at one point was very for it. Then they were against it, and now they're back for it. You don't have to get too abstract about it. Uh, Nemeton says, "Yeah, I don't use I don't use that word that way either. I see myth and mythos as a means of expressing certain truths through elaborate parable stories." Yeah, yeah, that's that's how I prefer to use the word myth. Um, yeah, it should be fine. Um, yeah, I think whatever. I mean, there's always the way that words are used. And then the way they're used, you know what they mean? But anyhow, back to the story. She ordered the maid to give the uh, pious Brahmin a white outer garment. Without knowing what was happening to him, Siddhartha found himself being dragged away by the maid, taken to a garden house by roundabout paths, presented with an outer garment, led into the bushes, gently admonished to get out of the grove at once without being seen. Shoo. Uh, he contended as he was told, accustomed to the he made his way out of the grove and over the hedge noiselessly. And then he returned to the town, carrying the rolled up garment under his arm. In an inn where travels where travelers stayed, he took up a stand near the door, silently asked for food, and silently accepted a piece of rice cake. Perhaps as soon as tomorrow, he thought, I will no longer ask anyone for food. I am going to get rich. Real quick. Get rich quick schemes with Siddhartha. <laughs> um... Words suck, but life would suck more if we didn't use them. <laughs> here, here. Um, suddenly, pride fled up in him. We're at 16 viewers, by the way. I, I don't know if we've hit 16 so far. That's pretty cool. Hi, all 16 people that are watching. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Super cool of you. Suddenly, pride, suddenly, pride fled up in him. He was no longer a salmon. It was no longer fitting for him to beg. He gave the rice cake to a dog and remained without food. Better be hungry. Better starve in my own pride. 
be humiliated and humble and eat. Uh-oh, Tadath is going down a bad path. The life that led people in the world, the life that people led here in the world is simple, Siddhartha thought. It has no difficulties. Everything was difficult, toilsome, and when you come down to it, hopeless, while well, I was still a Samana. Now everything is easy, easy as the lesson in kissing that Kamala is, is giving me. I need clothes and money. I need that mullah, nothing else. Those are minor, nearby goals that you're not just ones to sleep. He's being sucked into that material reality. He had found out long before where Kamala's house was, and he showed up there on the following day. Things are going well, she called to him. You are expected at Kamaswami's. He is the wealthiest merchant in town. He's the big dog. If he likes you, he will take you into his service. Be clever, Tansamana. I have arranged it for other people to tell him about you. Be friendly to him. He is very powerful. But do not be too modest. I do not want you to become his servant. You are to become his equal. Or else I shall not be satisfied with you. Kamaswami is being old and comfort loving. If he likes you, he will entrust many things to you. But yeah, interesting turn in the story here, right? Siddhartha thanked her and laughed, and when he and when she heard that he had eaten that day or the day before, she had bread and fruit brought in and invited him to eat. Good woman. Have you been lucky, she said, while saying goodbye? Um, one door after the other is opening for you now. How bad? Do you possess some magic? It's like he had his points of mystical elevation and found it fruitless in the world in worldly things because he missed the real message of spiritual elevation. Um, I don't quite catch what you're saying there, River. With this standing, the challenge of his, of life expectation and the actions to meet our worldly desires, he is shifting into worldliness. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I feel like you're making a point which I'm missing. Um, I'll continue if you want to. If you want to type that out for me, I'm going to guess that he will uh, learn to fuse both the worldliness and its expectation with the spiritual shift. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, he'll he'll find a way to 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 um to marry the two, the material, the worldly, and the the spiritual. That's what we're all about, right? I mean, seekers of unity, like unity between the material and the spiritual. It's not about one or the other. It's about finding that perfect balance between the two. Um. But it's interesting to see how, how that happens for materialism in a place of, of want and lust. <laughs> nice call. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Okay. Um, how Now, how is that? Do you possess some magic? She asked Siddhartha. Siddhartha said, yesterday I told you that I knew how to think, to wait, and to fast. Kamala, um, but you thought... Stupid some that the stupid samanas in the forest learned many fine things that can do a lot that you cannot. The day before yesterday, I was still a disheveled beggar. Yesterday, I already kissed Kamara. And soon I'll be a merchant and have money and all those things you value. Now he is getting cocky. Well, yes, she admitted. But what would your situation be if not for me? What would you be if Kamala were not helping you? Don't get so cocky on me. Remember who was the one who helped you get to where you are now. Dear Kamala, Siddhartha said, rising to his full height. When I visited you in your grove, I took the first step. It was my intention to learn love from the most beautiful woman. From the moment that I formulated that intention, I also knew that I would carry it out. I knew that you would help me, already knew it, it when you gave me that first look at the entrance to the grove. Oh, Siddhartha is getting really cocky here. Look at that. He's like, huh, I played the shots. I knew. I called it from the beginning. Where is our humble Siddhartha gone? Spoiler alert. Ooh, I don't want to read spoilers, man. 
Um, the coming of Mashiach will be a modern day Big Bang with the Big Bang, the first Big Bang, which I believe is still happening, which is one time event is ever evolving to the ultimate Big Bang Mashiach. Just my wild dream. Uh, yes, I'm glad that wasn't a spoiler alert for the book. It's a spoiler alert for like all of reality and existence as a whole. <laughs> You've all been spoiled. But I'm glad we still have the book has not been spoiled yet. Shalom, man, you got some dope thoughts and uh, you need to start, you need to find a place to start sharing them and expressing them and formulating them. You need to write, you need to make video, you need to write. That's going to happen, all right? Tell him, River, tell this guy that he needs to get out there. He needs to start talking his thoughts out and not just letting them bounce around his mind. Love you. <laughs> okay, so Kamala says back to Siddhartha. But if I had not been willing, you were willing. Look, Kamala, if you throw a stone into the water, it hastens to the bottom by the cursed root. Uh, it is when Siddhartha has a goal and intention. Siddhartha does not act. He waits, he thinks, he fasts, but he pierces through the things of this world as a stone through the water. Without performing any action, without bestirring himself, he is drawn. He lets himself fall. His goal draws him towards it because he admits nothing into his soul that could oppose that goal. He admits nothing into his soul that could oppose that goal. That's tight. That is what Siddhartha learned from the Salmons. I, I want to read that one more time. His goal draws him towards it because he admits nothing into his soul that could oppose that goal. Admit nothing into your soul that will oppose your goal. Tight line. The, that is what Siddhartha learned from the Salmons. That is what fools call... That... <laughs> get this line, my friends. That is what fools call magic. Nice. In the belief that it is brought about by demons. It ain't demons. It's not letting anything that's not into your soul. It even rhymes, so it must be true. Nothing is brought about by demons. There are no demons. <sighs> Stupid. Superstitious. Anyone can work magic. Anyone can attain their goals if they think, if they wait, if they fast. That was a solid, solid paragraph. And now I'm going to look what you guys have been writing in the comments while I've been reading. Um, hmm. Uh, Fernanda says, second that. Um, what are we seconding, Fernanda? I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, Nemeton says, yeah, make content. It's really rewarding. It is freaking rewarding. It's so rewarding. It's so good. It's so important. I can't, I can't tell you how important and how good it is for you as a person and for the world at large to have people sharing their ideas that sharing their content sharing their thoughts and taking the time to really like polish them and think them through and present them in a way that's nice and beautiful and in a way that's palatable check out check out river's channel check out the nematon he's taking his ideas he's making brilliant content that's that's digestible it's so important it's so good it's so rewarding 100 I, i've become such an advocate of this since since i got on board Teaching is so fulfilling. Sharing is so fulfilling. Shalom says, I can, I can only express through discourse. I believe it applies to everyone. I'm not special, but I am. And so are you in mirror of what we can all be. And everyone is a mirror of what I can be. Uh, sorry if I came off as stealing these host spotlight. Bro, there ain't no host here. <laughs> I'm just hanging out together, man. <laughs> well, uh, there's no spotlight. There's no spotlight to steal. There's just like a, a floodlight on all of us because we're all here to shine together. It's so hippie, but it's true. I, I don't need no spotlight. <laughs> I'm just reading a good book and I get to read it with good people. Bro, <laughs> look how I am. Uh, also, the earlier you start, the better. 100p. Uh, I'll start the what are you planning to read? That's a good question. Um, and then Shalom said, uh, truth is the host is the one who caused all this wisdom to be discovered if not for this stream man i'm just a conduit i'm just i'm just like i'm just 
a child that is having fun and like telling people to come have fun with me and talk about God and goodness and love and unity and messianism. I really appreciate it. I, bro, I, I appreciate, I appreciate you saying that. I appreciate being able to, to like create space and facilitate conversation. L'chaim to that. Uh, and I'm going to try and answer your question, Oleg. Um, because of two, because we took, yeah, hello, absolutely, 100%. There's no, like, there's no, this is not, a, this could not, if, if it was just me, then it would just be me sitting here reading a book with no one. You guys came, you guys freaking showed up and wanted to read me and wanted to engage is and like explore and explore self and explore the world and explore each other. Congrats to you guys for taking time to do this. Okay. Um, comments are coming in. Uh, we're totally more responsive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the difference between men and boys is the size of this, but we will get back to being children, 100%. So Oleg wants to know, what are we going to read after Siddhartha? It's a great question. Um, and I'm open to you guys for suggestions because you guys are the people who showed up and read with me um, and discussed with me. Um, I have to think. I have to think. Something cool something that's engaging, something that has a narrative, like probably not any hardcore philosophy or, or academia. That's, that's usually, I, I don't often indulge in, in fiction, by the way. This is like, this is like a, a, a guilty pleasure for me, honestly. And I, I, I'm often reading boring, like, these are not my books, but this is a friend's bookshelf. This is the kind of stuff I'm reading. Like this is um, like the mysteries, the Uranus conferences, Joseph Campbell, um, Plotinus and the pre-Socratics. I'm reading like boring, dry stuff. And I, I don't think that will work very well for like a group read. Um, I picked up this recently, which is really cool. The Observing Self from uh, Arthur Duncan, Mysticism and Psychotherapy. Let me know. I mean, you guys tell me. You guys tell me if you want to do something more heavy and serious or something more like novelesque or whatever. Um, yo, bro, I'm glad you stayed for this. I'm glad... You all, like, you guys made this happen. Seriously. L'chaim, <sighs> l'chaim to you guys. Okay. Um, where are we at? Let's get back to the reading. Okay, so this is a cool idea. The cool idea that there are no demons. Get over your superstition. No one's going to make your dreams come true. If you set your soul to something and you don't allow anything to get into your soul besides for your dream, it's going to happen. And that's... That's what Siddhartha learned with the, while well, he was hanging out with the, um, what their names, what are their names? With the, uh, with the ascetics, with the, uh, I totally forgot what they, the, the, the Samans? Samans. Um, okay. L'chaim. Kamala, <clears throat> okay. Kamala listened to him. She loved his voice. Sweet. She loved the look in his eyes. Nice. It may be as you say, my friend. She said softly. It may also be that a good fortune comes to Dalta's way because he's a handsome man, because women like his eyes. Maybe your whole talk about being so driven and persuasive and committed. It's like, bro, you're just good looking fella. You got that going for you. Don't like it's not that. Hey, uh meditation mind is here. Christian is your name. Hi, welcome to the live chat. Thanks for saying hi. Thanks for joining us with this great book read. Another great channel um and great meditation resource is Meditation Mind. There's a podcast and a YouTube channel. Check it out. It's good stuff. Thanks for joining us and get involved in the book with us. It's been a great book so far. Siddhartha said goodbye with a kiss. Let it be so, my instructress. In in instructress. May you always be like, my, may you always like my eyes and may good fortune always come to me from you. Oh, that's a really sweet ending to that chapter. Okay. You guys know each other? That's so cool. Of course you know each other. This is a small freaking world. Yo, so cool. 
<laughs> I'm so glad that I get to be like friends with like you guys who are friends already. The next chapter is called uh, With the Children People. Siddhartha went to the merchant Kamaswami. He was, he was shown into a wealth. Servants led him past expensive tapestries into a room where he was to await for the master of the house. In came Kamaswami, a limber man with heavily graying hair, with very clever, prudent eyes, with lips that betokened desire. Host and guest greeted each other in friendly fashion. I have told you, the merchant began, that you are a Brahmin. Oh, sorry. I have been told, the merchant began, that you are a Brahmin, a learned man, but that you are taking advice with a merchant. Is it because you have fallen in hard times, Brahmin, that you are seeking service? No, said Siddhartha. I have not fallen in hard times, and I have never known hard times. Let me inform you that I have come from among the Samans, with whom I have lived for a long period. If you are coming from the Samans, how can you not be in need? Are not the Samans completely without possession? You guys are broke. I am without possessions, Siddhartha said. If that is what you mean, certainly I am without possessions, but I am so voluntarily. I'm a minimalist, bro. <laughs> and I and so I'm not in need. That is such a good point. The difference between being without possessions and need is about your own perception. You can be broke, but you can choose to be without possessions and therefore you're not in need. Or you can be like, oh my gosh, I wish I had all these things, but I don't have them. I'm in need. It's all up in here. I love that idea. Whether you're rich or poor, needy or not is a state of mind. Crazy idea. Okay, uh, but what do you expect to live on if you have no possessions? The great question that gets asked all things of mystics and seekers and minimalists. And <clears throat> I've never thought about it, sir. I've been without possessions for over three years, and I've never thought about what I would live on. Snarky replied that he's like, yeah, I. it's been three years, and I question has not dawned upon me, good sir. So, you live on the possessions of other people? You're uh, some sort of leech? Some sort of parasite? Relying on other people? Presumably so. Surely a merchant, too, lives on other people's wealth. Ooh! <laughs> it's not just the beggar who lives on other people's wealth. The merchant, too, is living on other people's wealth. Now that's a good comeback. Well said. But he does not take other people's money from them for nothing. He them his merchandise for it. Apparently, that is actually the case. Everyone takes, everyone gives, such is life, c'est la vie. But permit me, if you have no possessions, what do you expect to give? Everyone gives what he has. The warrior gives his strength. The merchant gives his wares. The teacher his teachings. The farmer his rice. The fisherman his fish. Very good. And now, what is that you have to give? How many new is that? Two new? Oh, gosh. Um, what is it you have to give? So, oh, we have a rule here that when we get new subscribers, we have to drink a shot. And we have a new subscriber. What, what is it? What's the number at? <laughs> what's the number at? 992. 992. That means we're going to have to drink to that. Cheers to you, our new subscriber. <laughs> okay, okay. To be fair, we just two new subscribers, and the and live audience is saying we have to drink twice because we're on 992. Um, and we will stick to our word, and we will drink twice. And by the end of the book, we're going to be done. <laughs> um, but don't lose track of the book with the drinking. This is a side. This is a side distraction. To seeker 991. To seek you in 992. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> I'll sip this one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> ridiculous. Who 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 thought of such a ridiculous idea? Honestly. Okay.
Very good. And now what is it you have to give? What is that you have what is that you have learned? What are you able to do? I can think, I can wait, I can fast. It's his trifter. He thinks he fasts. <laughs> That's on his like LinkedIn. <laughs> And that is all. I believe that is all. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and what good is that? For example, fasting, what, what good is that? It's very good, sir. If a person has nothing to eat, then to fast is the cleverest thing he could do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> For example, if Siddhartha had not learned how to fast, this very day, he would have to accept any position whatsoever, whether with you or anyone else, because hunger would compel him to. But this way, Siddhartha can wait calmly. He knows no impatience. He knows no distress. He can let himself be besieged by hunger for a long time and laugh at the situation. That, sir, is what fasting is good for. You are right, Samana. Wait a moment. Wait a minute. Uh, Kamala went out and returned with the scroll, which he handed to his guest, asking, can you read this? Do you even read, bro? Siddhartha looked at the scroll on which a sales contract was written and began to read its contents aloud. Very impressive. Excellent, said Karaswami. Do you mind reading something else on this sheet? He gave him a sheet and a stylus. Siddhartha, oh, do you mind writing something else on this sheet? He gave him a sheet and a stylus. Siddhartha wrote and gave back the sheet. Karaswami read, writing is good, thinking is better. Cleverness is good, patience is better. Writing is good, thinking is better. Cleverness is good, patience is better. Okay. You know how to write extremely well. The merchant said approvingly, you will have much more to say. We will have much more to say to each other. For today, I ask you to be my guest and take up residence in this house. Siddhartha thanked him at the position and thereafter lived in the merchant's house. He was bought clothes and shoes, and every day a servant prepared his bath. Twice a day, a copious meal was served, but Siddhartha only ate once a day. Moreover, he ate no meal. He, sorry, he ate no meat. He drank no wine. Karmaswami told him about his business, showed him his merchandise and storehouse, showed him ledgers. Siddhartha became acquainted with many new things, listened carefully, but saying little. And mindful of what Kamala had said, he never subordinated himself to the merchant, but compelled him to treat him as... Indeed, as more than an equal. Karaswami ran his business uh, conscientiously and often passionately, but Siddhartha regarded it as all a game, the rules of which he strove to learn accurately, but the substance of which did not touch his heart. That's a good way to go about things. Business as a game, which you can learn the rules, but get to you. Play the game. Don't let the game play you. <clears throat> Before he had been in Tommy's house very long, he was already taking part in the host's dealings. But every day at the time uh, she designated, he visited the beautiful Kamala. Wearing handsome clothes and elegant shoes, and soon he even brought along gifts for her. Clever red lips taught him so much. Her delicate, supple hands... Uh, way to the top. Yeah, bro, he's climbing that social stratification. He is gonna up and up. Her clever him much. Her delicate, subtle hands, <clears throat> supple hands, taught him much. still a boy when it came, still a boy when it came to love, and moreover inclined to plunge into his pleasure blindly and insatiably into a bottomless pit. He learned thoroughly from her that pleasure cannot be taken without pleasure in return. And that every gesture, every caress, every touch, every look, the inch of the body has its secret. The awakening of which affords happiness to the knowing person. She taught him that lovers should not part in after a love fest. <laughs> a love fest. That's great. <laughs> without admiring each other. Without feeling that they have conquered as much as they themselves. Without, without feeling that they have conquered as much as they themselves have conquered. So that, neither, so that neither one of them suffers from satiety, boredom, or the unpleasant sensation of having abused the other or having been abused. Wise words. He spent marvelous hours with the beautiful, clever, 
artiste. He became her pupil, her lover, her friend. Here with Kamala lay the value and meaning of his present life, not in Karaswami's commerce. The commerce was just was just a way to get into the palace of love, into the chamber of romance and passion and sensuousness. And he was learning these lessons about being a good lover. To be a good lover. L'chaim. Yeah, bro. This book is straight wine. I, I did not need, I agree, like I did not need the whiskey, although it has helped. The book just hits all the right places. He just has this way of like bringing you into his imagery and into his words and it's so beautiful, so it's delightful. The merchant entrusted him the writing of important letters and the contracts and became accustomed to discussing even important matters with him. He soon saw that Siddhartha understood little about rice or wool, ship transport or business, but he had a knack of doing, and that Siddhartha surpassed him, the merchant. In calmness and equanimity, and in the art of listening, and the accurate evaluation of strangers. The art of listening, that's, that is an art, my friends. This Brahmin, he said to a friend, is no real merchant and will never become one. He is never passionately involved in the business but he possesses the secret of those to whom success comes all on its own, whether because a lucky star was shining when they were born or through magic or through something he learned from the Samans. He always appears to be merely playing with business. It never completely occupies his mind, never dominates him. He's never afraid of failure and he never frets over loss. That's real. If you're not afraid to lose, then you play the game the best, and that applies to every game. Truth. The friend advised the merchant, give him a third of the profits from the deals he makes for you, but let him also lose the same percentage when the business suffers a loss. Give him capital and get him interested in the business itself. Don't let him be all cool and collected about this like it's some game. Get him skin in the game and then see how cool he is. That way you become more enthusiastic. As if enthusiasm is the way he's going to make more money. Bro, this guy's killing it just by being cool about it. The other guy's like, no, 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 no. Get him into it. Get him like involved. Get some buy-in. Get some purchase. Uh, Karma Swami followed the advice. But Siddhartha was not much concerned about it. If he made a profit, he accepted it with indifference. If he suffered a loss, he laughed saying, ha, huh, just look how badly this turned. It seemed, it really seemed as if business did not matter to him much. On one occasion, he traveled to a village to purchase a sizable rice crop there. When he arrived, however, the rice had already been sold to another dealer. Nevertheless, Siddhartha remained in that village for many days. He treated the farmers to meals. He gave their children copper coins. He was a guest at a wedding and returned from his trip highly satisfied. The guy had a good time, bro. He crushed a wedding. He hung with the kids. He had a good time. Karasoni reproached him for not having come back at once, for wasting time and money. You were on the payroll, bro. Siddhartha replied, Stop scolding, my dear friend. Nothing has ever been achieved by scolding. <laughs> what a great line. If there had been a loss, let me bear that loss. I'm very satisfied with this trip. I met all sorts of people. I made friends with the Brahmin. I, I, I dangled children on my knees. Strange, <laughs> strange, um, what's that word in English? Adjective. Farmers showed me their fields. No one took me for a businessman. I had a good time. It was... That is all very fine. Car saw me crying indignantly. But in reality, you are a businessman. I should think you are just taking a pleasure trip. On my expense. <laughs> um, Hess was one of the friends of Carl Jung. Jung taught him a lot of things. Hess before Jung and after different writer. Ha, huh, interesting. So is this book pre-Jung or post-Jung? Of course, Dr. Laugh. Of course, I was taking a pleasure trip. Why else would I travel? I got to know people and places. I enjoyed friendliness and trust. I found friendship. Look, dear friend, 
if I had been Kamaraswami, as soon as I saw that my deal was nullified, I would have come back again in, ha in haste, filled with vexation. And my time and money would have been really lost. But this way, I had a good time. I learned things. I tasted joy. I harmed neither myself nor others through, the, through vexation or through hasteness. And if ever we were back there again, perhaps to buy a future crop or for any other reason, friendly people will receive me in a friendly and cheerful way. And I shall applaud myself for not having exhibited haste or displeasure on the former occasion. So let it go, my friends. Do not do yourself harm by scolding. Then the day comes on which you see this Siddhartha is doing me damage. Then just say the word and Siddhartha will go his way. But till then, let us be satisfied with one another. Bro, if you got beef, if you got beef, if you got beef, if you got, if you got beef with, just tell me and I'll be out. We done. I don't need you. I'm having fun. I made friends there. I had a good time. <laughs> He's such a chiller. Okay, we got some comments. Um, <clears throat> I love Jung among others. Uh, yeah, Jung is a, Jung is a bro. Uh, this is after Jung, post Jung. Interesting. I wonder what influence Jung had on this text then. Esoteric says, totally agree about the content production. So many are so wise and are lucky to be able to share and receive it. Yeah, there are so many people that are so wise that have so much knowledge and information. We have like knowledge and information just stuffed into us and we just got to find a way to begin to express it. Esoterica is doing a great job doing that, guys. Go check out his channel where he's spitting some tight wisdom that the world needs right now amongst all my other good friends. Meditation Mind is here with us. Um, Nemeton is here with us. Get on that. Get on that. We're here together to share and learn together to spread good ideas. 100%. I'm, I'm going to be on this trip because I believe it. Uh, Oleg says, Demian too. Demian is, is a Jungian story. Interesting. 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 I read, I read Demian, at least. I, didn't, I don't think I finished it yet. It's a Jungian story. Okay, interesting. What up? Um, there's reason to believe that every person exists and is not, is not chance. Believe it. It's not chance. Everyone believes they're not chance. I don't get it. Yo, Tation Mind is here, Nemington is here, and Esoteric is here. You guys are bros, and we're doing this thing together. I really believe it. Thank you so much for being here with me. I love you guys. Should we get back to reading? What do you guys say? <laughs> Make babies? <laughs> that was so that filled, man. Make babies? Who's making babies? Are we talking about metaphorical babies? Are we talking about like astrological? Like, <laughs> what, what, what babies, man? <laughs> you guys are great. You guys are great. You got another baby coming in August? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> What's coming in August? <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys are too good. I love you guys. So much fun. <sighs> okay. So Siddhartha's so like, bro, chill out. If you don't like me, fire me. I don't need you. Peace. I had a good time there on the business trip. I had a good time. Sababa, next. Just as futile as the merchant's attempts to uh, convince Siddhartha that he was eating his Kamrasami's bread, Siddhartha was eating his own bread. Rather, both of them were eating each other's bread. <laughs> I did not get this metaphor. Okay, let's do that one more time. Sorry. <laughs> uh, just as futile were the merchant's attempt to convince Siddhartha that he was eating his Karaswami's bread, Siddhartha was eating his own bread, or rather, both of them were eating other people's bread. Everybody's bread. <laughs> we're all eating everybody's bread. Okay, there's a lot of action right now in the comments, and I'm going to finish this paragraph, and then I'm going to see what's up in the comments and respond. In the conversation, the chat, whatever it's called. Siddhartha never lent an ear to Karmaswami's worries. Way to go. And Karmaswama worried a lot. There was a lot to, to, to lend into, but he gave no ear. <laughs> Can I tell you guys a joke? <laughs> so in, I'm Australian. In Australia, we talk, there's this expression which is called no worries. No worries, mate. So there was this old, this is a true story. There was this old guy, he was like 99. And uh, he was being interviewed by like some Australian TV channel. 
And he's like, "How did? What's the secret to longevity? How did you live so long?" And the Australian guy is like, "Let me tell you, mate. The secret to longevity. I had a lot of worries, but I never let them worry me." <laughs> so Australian. So that's what Siddharth is doing. So like, bro, I mean, you, my friend, have a lot of worries, but they ain't worrying me. <laughs> like, water off a duck's back. Okay. Uh, Siddharth never lent an ear to come from his worries, and Siddharth worried a lot. If a business deal in progress uh, threatened to be unsuccessful, if a shipment seemed to be lost, if a debtor seemed unable to pay, Karaswami was never able to convince his associates that it was a useful thing to utter words of concern or anger, to knit one's brows or to lose sleep. Oh, his associate being Siddhartha. When Karaswami on one occasion rebuked him, saying that he had learned everything he knew from him, he replied, Please do not pull my leg with that sort of joke. I have learned from you how much a basket of fish costs and how much interest can be demanded on a loan of money. That is your corpus of knowledge. But I did not learn how to think from you, my dear Karasami. It would be better if you tried to learn from me. He's like, bro, you, you, you didn't teach me nothing. You taught me the price of fish in China. You told me interest rates. Let's not let's not pretend like you told me things. Um, what is happening in their comments, people? Um, congrats, Esoterica. <laughs> Wait, are we talking about an actual baby, Esoterica? You're having a child in August? Oh my god, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Mazel tov. Can we make a l'chaim for that right here, right now? Wait, I have to read all... I'm missing like all these comments. I feel like I'm coming late into a conversation. All babies, physical, spiritual, everything between. Yeah, 100%. Babies, physical, spiritual, all, we we dig all babies. Esther says, thanks. Babies are seeds and we depend on each other. We breathe oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide, which is what trees breathe. They expel oxygen, yin and yang, 100%. Panisha is great in this kind of way, in, in making babies kind of way. Okay, it's very late. Wish good night from Ukraine. Bro, you're from Ukraine. That's tight. Good night. Sleep well, sweet dreams. Catch you in the morning. We'll probably still be going. <laughs> um, ideas are like babies. 100% ideas are like babies. They just don't make as much noise at night when you're trying to sleep. <laughs> Unless they're good ideas and they keep you up at night. Meditation mind, you can nurture them and they can even continue to live on and have babies of their own. Yeah, babies can make babies too. <laughs> Hashtag baby lives <laughs> matter. <laughs> BTW, fun fact. You were my brother's counselor, twin in Who's your twin in Poxville? Yeah, his twin brother. I'm, I'm confused. You're going to have to explain that, Shalom. Uh, Esoterica, Oso Nimitin, just wanted to say thanks for your content. Love your channel. Be great to work together on something. Yes! Hell yeah! Nimitin's content is great. Esoterica, your content is great. You two guys should work together. Good call. Um, congrats, Esoterica. A Nemeton. You guys are typing so fast, it's hard to keep up. Don't know there was something, there was someone else who knew my stuff. Thanks for the comment. Bro, your stuff is great. Don't be humble. <laughs> be humble. Haha. -ha. No, I mean like ideas are like babies. Ideas are like babies. <laughs> you was Mendy and Yona Weiss. Mendy and Yona Weiss are your, are your brothers? Mendy's watch. Mendy Weiss is watching now. Oh my God. Hello. Oh, oh my gosh. I love Mendy and Yona Weiss. Okay, for all those that don't know what's happening right now, I was a camp counselor in Parksville, New York for two months. And I had a the, the California bunk that came to New York for camp. And in that bunk, there were the two most awesome, awesome kids. I think they were like 13 at the time. Uh, Mendy and Yona Weiss. They were such legends. They were so, so cool. Uh... I, I honestly had such a good time being their counselor and the rest bunk. I would love, love, love to know where that bunk is today. I can't believe Mendy is right now online watching. Yo, Mendy, <laughs> thanks for bringing a great camp back in Parksville. <laughs> this is like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> wow. We, hey, okay, okay. Right here, right now, committing to doing a Parksville reunion. We're going to get back together and we're going to... Myself and JJ Hecht, who was here earlier on stream, actually... Uh, we're the counselors and we're going to get back together and for good time's sake. That's so cool. Oh my gosh. 
I love the Weisses. You guys are dope. Wow. Uh, the theory of knowing everything through like seven or eight friends. Yeah, yeah. The, it's the, uh, the five degrees of separation. Okay. Yo, Mandy, thanks for being here with me. Thank you all for being here with me. Super cool. You guys are great. Where were we? <laughs> it's hard to reading after being like reunited with like long lost campers and counselors and friends. What a, what a trip. <laughs> I want to know what your favorite memory of that two month summer was. And I hope it was something to do with like your best counselors ever, me and JJ. Back to reading so we don't alienate the rest of the audience. <laughs> In truth, his heart was not in commerce. Business was good for money making that he could spend on Kamala. Mendy, are you over 18? Because this is not a story for children. Yep, whatever. <laughs> Mr. Weiss, take care of your younger brothers. Uh, and he made much more than of it than needed. Otherwise, Sadat's interest and curiosity were only about people whose business dealings artistry, worries, entertainments, and follies had previously been as far to him and as remote to him as the moon. No matter how easy it was for him to talk to everyone, to live with them, to learn from everyone, he was nevertheless fully aware that something that set him apart from them and that this alienating factor was his experience as a Svana. He saw people going through life like children or animals, and he both loved and looked down on that way of life. He saw them labor, suffering, and growing great for the sake of things that seemed to him not at all worth that price. For money, for petty pleasures, for petty honors. He saw them scold and insult one another. He saw them complain about pains that a Samana smiles at. And suffer from privations that a Samana fails to notice. That paragraph, boys and girls, is so relevant to 2020. We walk around the world and people, in the words of Herman Hesse, are laboring and suffering and growing with things that seem not to be worth anything at all. Money, petty pleasures, petty honors, scolding and insulting one another, complaining about pains that, that the Samana, the mystic, can smile at, and suffering from privations that the mystic fails to notice. This is so relevant. Uh, what is up in the comment section? Mendy is 18. <laughs> Firstly, okay, cool. <laughs> Secondly, teen? He was like 12 or bar mitzvah, 13 at the time. Mendy's 18, a man, an adult now? That is so... What are you up to, Mendy? What are you, what are you doing? I would love to... Sheesh, I want to catch up with you guys. That's crazy. Yeah. You guys, Esoterica and Nemeton, do that, do that email exchange. Okay, back to the book. He was open to everything those people could give him. He welcomed the merchant. Yo, um, Mr. Weiss, tell me what Mendy and Yon are up to, if you don't mind. He was open to everything these people could give him. He welcomed the merchant who offered to sell him linen. He welcomed the debtor who asked him for a loan. He welcomed the beggar who told him the history of his feet for a full hour. That's the art of listening, to listen to a pop, to listen to or talk about their poverty for a full hour. Respect. Freaking respect. Although he was not half as poor as any Samana, he treated wealthy foreign merchants just as he treated the servant who shaved him. Treat everyone equally, the same as the merchant, the same as the servant who shaved him. That's, that's, that's solid. Or the street vendor whom he allowed to cheat him out of small change when he bought bananas. That's that's cool. He he knows the guy's ripping off, but he's like, you know, man, you can rip me off. That's chill. When Kamaswami came to him to complain about his worries or reproach him over some business deals, he listened inquisitively and serenely, amazed at him, tried to understand him, let him have his own way to stand just as much as he can consider uh, indispensable, and then he turned away from him and on the next person who wanted him. Many people came to him, many to do business with him, many to cheat him, many to sound him out, many to call upon his... Sympathy, hear his advice. Many uh, give advice. He offered sympathy. He made gifts. He allowed himself to be cheated a little. 
<laughs> I can resonate with that living in Israel where people are really good at like <laughs> anyways <laughs> and this entire game the gods and the brahmins had occupied in the past that's a very interesting statement the the games of the people this like petty thing this advice this cheating people a shekel here a shekel here a dollar, a dollar there he that became his obsession that became his contemplation as, as he thought about the gods and the brahmins in the past interesting idea i mean does this mean I want to put this to you guys. Does this mean that he's losing his way and he's like thinking more or thinking equally now about the money and the little economic games he's involved in as much as he thought about the gods and the lofty philosophical ideas of the past? Or is he now actually for the first time encountering the real world, the, the phenomena like trying to and like finding meaning and entertainment and beauty in this ordinary day to day? Like where are we at right now in the story? I don't know. Um, Mendy uh, message re message me privately about Mendy for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't Mendy's privacy is his and uh, for sure, one hundred percent. Cheers to respecting privacy. That's I'm I'm all about that. What are your thoughts on that, by the way? What do you guys think about this? Like, is he is he going good? Is he is he losing his way? What are we, what are we feeling? There's kind of a delay here between me and you guys, like in like ten seconds. It's interesting. Okay, I'll continue reading. I'll hear your thoughts. The live audience says he's losing his way. I'm holding out judgment. Um, but I'll read the next two paragraphs or two, and I'll see what you guys have to say, guys and girls. I mean, when I say guys, I mean everyone. I I, it's not gender specific. Okay, let's continue. At times, he heard deep in his heart a very faint, still voice that quietly admonished him. Quietly lamented. So it could barely be perceived. At such times, he became aware for an hour or so that he was leading a strange life. That he was doing nothing but paying, but playing a mere game. That although he might be austere, sorry, that although he might be serene and might sometimes feel joy, true life was nevertheless passing him by without touching him. True life was nevertheless passing him by without touching him. The way a bull is with the bull. So did he play with his business, with the people around him, watching them, finding amusement in them. His, the wellspring of his being was not in it. The wellspring flowed elsewhere as if far from him. It flowed on and on, invisibly, and had nothing more to do with his life. And a few times he was alarmed at these thoughts and wished that it would be vouchsafed to him as well to take part in all the childlike activity of each day passionately and wholeheartedly, really to live, really to act, really to enjoy and live instead of merely standing by and in that way a spectator. Okay, I mean, this paragraph kind of answers my question that I posed to you, that he, he felt like he wasn't being true to himself. He was like, he was playing a game. He wasn't, he wasn't engaging deeply in life. He wasn't really being there. Like life was just passing him by. I mean, how we know this experience, we know what Siddhartha was feeling. This is real. This is not like this is a novel, but it's real talk. Uh, Shalom says, maybe we can do a Zoom conference sometime. Either way, continue what you're doing. You're killing it. Hashtag really saving it. <laughs> yeah, bro. Shalom, let's Zoom, bro. Let's let's do that. Um, I'm down I'm for sure. But he went on visiting the beautiful Kal uh, Kamala. He learned the art of love. He practiced the cult of pleasure in which more than anywhere else, giving and taking become one and the same. That's a tight line. He 
learned the art of love, he practiced the cult of pleasure in which more than anywhere else, giving and taking become one and the same. He chatted with her, learned from her, gave her advice, received advice. She understood him better than Govina had formerly understood him. Old friend who we've forgotten about already. Wow. She was more, she was more like him. On one occasion, he said to her, you are like me. You are different from most people. You are Camilla, nothing else. Within you, there is a tranquility and refuge in which you take shelter at any time and be at home with yourself, just as I too can. Just as I can too. Not many people have that, and yet everybody could have it. To take shelter in oneself. Can you take shelter in yourself? Let me know. Yes, no, maybe sometimes. You like Camilla, like Siddhartha. Not all people are clever, Camilla said. No, Siddhartha said, that is not the reason. Karaswami is just as clever, although they have the mind of little children. Most people, Kamala, are like a falling leaf, which drifts and turns in the air and sways and zigzags to the ground. But others, just a few, are like stars. They travel a fixed route. No wind reaches them. Their lore and their route lie within them. Along all the many learned men and samanas I have known, one man of this type has attained perfection. I can never forget him. I mean Gotama, the sublime one, who proclaims that doctrine. A thousand disciples hear his teaching each day and follow it and follow its regulations every day, but they are falling leaves. They do not possess the doctrine and the law within themselves. Kamala studied him, smiling. You are talking about him again, she said. Again, you are thinking like a samana. Back to your old ways. Siddhartha was silent. And they play a game of love. One of the 30 or 40 different varieties of the game Kamala knew. Her body was as leaf as a jaguar's, or as a hunter's bow. A man who had learnt love from her was acquainted with many pleasures, many secrets. For long she sported with Siddhartha, luring him on, repulsing him, forcing his will, encircling him, enjoying his mastery until he was vain and lay exhausted at her side. Nice. Um, this word, by the way, lith, L-I-T-H-E, lith as a jaguar, life as a jaguar, what does that mean? Agile? Cool. Uh, the heteria leaned over him. What's it? H-E-T-A-E-R-A? -E Thank you, Fernanda. Here's a new word I'm having trouble with. H-E-T-A-E-R-A? Uh, hate, hate, hate era. Uh, any help? H, H, E, T, A, E, R, A. Mistress. Mistress? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. These words are new to me. The Hetira, the mistress, leaned over him, taking a long look at his face, at his eyes that had grown weary. She said collectively, you are the best lover I have seen. You are stronger than others, more subtle, more willing. You have learned my art well, Siddhartha. Sometime when I am older, I want to, I want to bear your child. I want your baby. Wow. Baby Mama Kalama, Kamala. <laughs> that was a very sweet line right there. And yet, dear, you have remained a Samana. And yet, you do not love me. You do not love anyone. Am I not right? <sighs> Ooh, this is an interesting turn. So, Samala, sorry, Kamala, who is like this beautiful. Um, mistress who everyone is chasing after and Siddhartha himself chases after she's now like yo I really love you you're like a lover I've never had before I want to have your baby 
Um, and she's like, but, but you don't love me. You don't love me, do you? You don't love anyone. This is so real. Uh, shout out in the in the chat here if if this means anything to you, because this means something to me. I'll tell you that. Am I not right? Asks Kamala. And so, said Siddhartha wearily, "I am like you. You do not love anyone either. Otherwise, how could you practice love as an art?" Whoa! Let's do that again. It may be so, said Siddhartha wearily. I am like you. You do not love anyone either. Otherwise, how could you practice love as an art? Perhaps people of your kind are unable to love. The child people can. That is their secret. People who practice as a love... Sorry. People who practice love as an art are not actually capable of loving people only the children the child people can that's their secret oh okay i have thoughts on this on, on what this means um i'm gonna eat a piece and i want to hear your guys thoughts on what that means and we're about to start a new chapter called samsara so it's a perfect time for sushi break um and I want to know what you guys think about that last paragraph that we just read, that that this line, that you do not love anyone. Otherwise, perhaps, how could you practice love as an art? People of your kind aren't able to love. Hit me up in the, uh, in the chat. You can, you can message in the chat as well, by the way. Yeah, just from your own account. It's a girlfriend. What does that mean, hey? What does that mean that people who practice art as love can't really love, can't love people? Maybe she's a prostitute. She's not about it. That's right. What? Right. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's see what, let's see what you guys think. Smooth boat, which is the coolest like name ever, by the way, says they don't know that they're one soul. So that's like quite metaphysical, quite mystical. That love really means like, realizing that they're one soul. And people who practice it as an art don't don't realize that. Why? Why not? Maybe that's the art. Of, I, I don't follow. Okay. Shalom says one people, one race, one ultimate purpose, ultimate ultimate unity. Bro, you're being like quite enigmatic. I need you to answer questions <laughs> instead of dropping like quotes on me. <laughs> I love you, man. I'm just messing. Um, okay. Um, I'll give you my own like little take on this. It's not like any more valid than anyone else's take. Alyssa says, um, Biggie cements this idea. You can't turn a hoe into a housewife. <laughs> Yo, I love that <laughs> pop culture reference. You can't turn a hoe into a housewife. So Kamala is, I'm not going to, okay, I can't say those words. Kamala is a, a sex worker. <laughs> she's a prostitute. In pop culture, she's a hoe. It's a bad word, guys. Don't use those words. Don't slut shame. Um, and you can't, turn her, you can't turn her into a wife, into a lover. I don't know. Is, is Biggie's word gospel? Esoterica says, yep, Biggie's word is go. Biggie's, Biggie's word is go. Uh, Shalom says, that's only Messianic times. We have to do our best to make it really today. Following the love of all people. Shalom, man, I, I'm having trouble following your drift. <laughs> Wait, you're like deep into the Messianic age. We're just catching up to you. Slow down. My, my thoughts like this. I think that... I think like this, that... Is my internet connected? It is. When um when you practice something as an art, that it's like the development of that thing itself becomes the purpose of it. Like maybe find your way of self-expression in that art and find the the art the, the artisanness in that in that practice. But it, it it's lost its authenticity, right? 
love is about being vulnerable, about being about being honest, about being about being unpolished and being unartistic. Once you've brought art into it, there's no there isn't a capacity for a for a meeting, for a piggy for a for a for for intimacy between one human in all of their messed up complexity and beauty and another human in all of their messed up complexity and beauty. And it's like there's this there's this barrier of the, the, the art happens when there's like no game and there's no art involved. That's my thought. Um, agree, dis disagree. I don't know what you guys think. Next chapter. Hundred P. Next chapter is Sam Sara. For a long time, Siddhartha had the life of the world and its pleasures without really belonging to it. His senses, his senses, which he had modified in his um, at hurt. A R. This should know. A R D E N T. Oh, and he's ardent. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay. In his ardent our years had reawakened. He had tasted wealth. He had tasted sensual delights. He had tasted power. And yet for a long time, he still remained a, a Samana in his heart. Clever Kamala had realized that correctly. It was always the thinking, waiting, fasting that directed his life. The people of the world, the child people, had always still remained foreign to him, just as he was foreign to them. The years sped by. Cushioned by prosperity, Siddhartha barely felt their passing. He had become wealthy. For some time, he had a house of his own, his own servants, and a garden in the suburbs by the river. People liked him. They came to him when they needed money or advice, but no one was close to him except Kamala. That lofty, clear sensation of wakefulness he had once experienced in the prime of his youth, in the days after Gautama's preaching, after his separation from Govina, that tense feeling of expectancy, that proud independence from teaching, that pliant readiness to hear the divine voice in his own heart had gradually become just a memory. It had been transitory. A boy is lost, distantly and quietly murmuring the sacred wellsprings that had been that had once been nearby, that had once resounded within himself. To be sure, for a long time, he had retained much of what he had learned from the Samans, from Gautama, from his father, from the Brahmins, a moderate way of life, pleasure and thinking, hours of concentration, self-knowledge of, secret knowledge of the self, of the eternal I, that is neither body nor consciousness. He had retained much of that. But one thing after another had been submerged and had been covered with dust, just as a potter's wheel, once set in motion, still turns for a long time and only slowly slackens and comes to rest. Thus, in Siddhartha's soul, the wheel of asceticism, the wheel of thought, the wheel of discernment, had kept on turning for some time and was still turning, but turning slowly and hesitantly, and it was close to stopping slowly, the way the moisture penished Slowly, the way that moisture penished. Slowly, the way that moisture penetrates a deep. One more time. Slowly, the way that moisture penetrates a dying tree stump, slowly filling it and making it rot. What a metaphor. The world and indolence had penetrated Siddhartha's soul. Filled slowly, it filled his soul, making it heavy, making it weary, lulling it to sleep. In, compensa in, in compensation for that, his senses had alert. They had learned a great deal, experienced a great deal. Wow, what a paragraph. What a paragraph. What a paragraph. That metaphor, right there, that metaphor, that slowly the way that moisture penetrates a dying tree stump, slowly filling and making it right. The world and indolence that penetrated stuff the soul, filling his soul, making it healthy, making it wary, lulling it to sleep. Wow, that's tight. 
Um, Yeah, Adam, this is still going. Yeah, allow you can allow them. It's cool. That was that was that was an that was an immense paragraph. It it began with like rushing, like passing through years that like years sped by, and then it stopped to like reflect on the poetry of this passing years and how his soul slowly rotted away. That was such a paragraph. Wow. Uh, you allowing them? Yeah. Cool. There's two, right? Siddhartha had learned how to conduct business. Um, wait, we just got some, this is a long paragraph and we just got some interesting comments. I want to read these comments and respond and, uh, and then get back to this paragraph. So Joseph A, welcome. I haven't seen you, Joseph A, yet. Jo well, thanks for joining us. Said, I've missed more than half of this story. Oh, half of this, sorry. No worries, man. You're forgiven. Uh, quite interesting, I think so. I joined in anyways. Hi, by the way. Hi. <laughs> uh, about that quote from the book, about there being a whore, I suppose that the whore is a lover of the body. Usually, perhaps, lover of the soul is meant here. A lover who indulges the pleasure of the soul, the soul of her lover. So, Joseph, welcome in. Thanks for joining the conversation. I'm not sure what quote exactly you're talking about. Um, we, we we were speaking about the love of the body, the love of. Yeah, maybe if you catch me up on the point that you're referring to, um, and sort of take the conversation there. But meanwhile. I will continue reading, and I hope you enjoy the uh, the second half of this this very fun uh, inebriated event. Siddhartha had learned how to conduct business, how to exercise power over others, how to enjoy women. He had learned to wear beautiful clothes, to give orders to servants, to bathe in scented waters. He had learned to eat delicate, uh, delicately and carefully prepared dishes, even fish, even meat and poultry. Spices and sweets, and to drink wine, which makes you indolent and forgetful. He had learned to play dice and, to, and chess, to watch dancing girls, to be carried off in a sedan chair, to sleep on a soft bed. Still, he had always set himself apart from the rest, feeling superior to them. He had always watched them from a little, with a little mockery, with a little mocking contempt, with precisely that contempt which a Samana always feels for worldliness. Whenever Karaswami felt dull, whenever he was peevish, whenever he felt insulted, whenever he was plagued by his business worries, Siddhartha had always looked unmockingly, only slowly and imperceivably, imperceivably, with the passing harvest seasons and rainy seasons, had his mockery grown wary. Had his superiority become quieter, only slowly amid his growing riches, had Siddhartha himself taken on something of the nature of the child people, something of their childlikeness and of their anxiety, and yet he envied them. He envied them more, and the more he became like them. Interesting. He envied them for the one thing that they lacked and they had, for the importance which they were able to attach to their lives, for the... To their life for the passionate quality of their joys oh this is interesting he envied them for the one thing that he lacked and they had for the importance which they were able to attach to their life for the passionate quality of their pa of their joys and fears <clears throat> for the anxious but sweeping happiness of their perpetual loving these people were always in love and with themselves with themselves or with women, they loved their children, they loved honor or money, plans or hopes, but it was this, precisely, precisely that did not learn from them. 
But it was this precisely is this that he did not learn from them. This childlike joy, the childlike folly, which he did learn from them was precisely what he found unpleasant and had contempt for. It occurred more and more frequently that on the morning after an evening of pong, he lay in bed for a long time, feeling stupid and tired and probably hung over too. He would become peevish and impatient when Karaswami bored him with his worries. He would laugh too loud when he lost at dice. His face was still cleverer and more into people's, but it seldom laughed, and one by one it acquired those lines so frequently found in rich people's faces, those lines of dissatisfaction, sickliness, bad temper, innocence, lovelessness. Slowly, the mental malady of rich was taking hold of him. Da 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 da. <laughs> He's going down. He's going down that rabbit hole. That's for sure. Okay, what do you guys have to say about what we just read? Um, from the sushi break, I heard something about Kamala being a whore. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Kamala, uh, it seems like Kamala is a, uh, a prostitute, a sex worker, uh, a courtesan. Um, whore is like a value Latin word. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting interaction that he has with Kamala, them learning from one another, the sort of the power play, the, the, the force, the, the, the poverty, the pleasure, the wisdom, her representation, perhaps, uh, rep representing nature or, or earthliness, material, the things that he was running away from as a Samana. Um, yeah, she's definitely an interesting character, an interesting figure to, to explore. So Nemeton says, River says that this feels like the climax of the story so far. It's a very, it's actually a very, it feels like a very strangely built story. I mean, I would have expected the climax to be like his mystical experiences, his, his meeting with the Buddha, but we're coming to like his... Um, the lowliness of him, like losing his very soul in materiality, in materiality. And um, I guess Nina wants us to continue reading because this is feeling climactic. I'm not going to deprive a good friend of a climactic story. So let's continue. Like a veil, like a thin mist, weariness descended upon Siddhartha. Slowly, every day a little death, every month a little more, every year a little heavier. Just as a new garment becomes old with time, loses its beautiful color with time, gets stained, gets creased, gets frayed at the seams, begins to worn out threadbare places here and there. Thus had Siddhartha's roof, which he had begun after his separation from Govinda, become old. Thus, with the fleeting years, it was losing its color and brightness. Thus, creases and stains gathered on it, and concealed below, but already showing in their ugliness here and there, disappointing and disgusting, sorry, disappointment and disgust lay in wait. Siddhartha did not notice this. He only noticed that bright, confident voice within him that had, that had once awakened in him and had constantly directed him in his most brilliant days. He had become taciturn. What is uh, this word taciturn? I know the word, I'm not sure exactly what it means. Can we get some help with definitions? Taciturn, T-A-C-U-R-N. The world had entrapped him. Uh, Fernanda, you're good with definitions. <laughs> help us out, sister. The world had entrapped him. Pleasure, um, um, cuss, coveting, uh, indolence, and finally, even the vice. He despised and scorned most as being the most foolish. Um, Avarice. Is that how you pronounce it? Is it avarice or avarice? A V A R I C E. Avarice? No, avarice. Avarice, avarice. Taciturn means saying little, untalkative. Um, he had become taciturn. He 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 stopped talking. He stopped he stopped talking and saying, okay. Um, and avarice, avarice is that um something to do with? <laughs> Thanks. Is that something to do with um with like uh what is 
something to do with like uh help me out here guys <laughs> let's get a let's get a quick definition extreme greed for wealth extreme greed for wealth and material material need okay material gain and the correct pronunciation is Okay. Uh, the world had entrapped him. Pleasure, covetousness, indolence, and finally even the vice that he always despised and scorned most as being the most foolish, avarice. avarice. Property too, possessions and wealth had finally entrapped him. They were no longer a game or toy to him. They had become a chain and a burden. This is so true. How often do possessions become uh, a chain and Siddhartha had fallen into this ultimate vilest dependency by way of an unusual disciple path through dice playing. For from the time he had seized in his heart to be a summon, Siddhartha had begun to gamble for money and expensive things with increasing fury and passion. Whereas earlier he had only been participating smiley, smiling and unconcerned in a custom of the child people, he was a dreaded player. Not many people dared to oppose him. His stakes were so high and reckless. He played out his heart's desires to lose and squander. His wretched money gave him an angry joy. In no other way could he show more clearly and scornfully his contempt for wealth. The false idol of the merchant class. And so he played for high stakes. <clears throat> Ruthlessly, hating himself, scorning himself, he ranked in thousands, threw away thousands, lost money, lost jewelry, lost a country villa, won again, lost again. He loved the fear, the awful, oppressive fear that he felt during the dice game. While he was anxious over his high stakes, he strove to renew that fear again and again, to keep intensifying it, to keep titillating it. For only in this sensation did he still feel something like happiness, something like intoxication, something like a heightened form of life in the midst of his surified, tepid, dull existence. Yo, that's, that's some psychological insight into gambling right there. And even after big loss, he thought about new wealth. He pursued his business interestingly, more enthusiastically. He was firmer in forcing his debtors to pay him because he wanted to continue gambling. He wanted to continue squandering wealth, showing his contempt for it. Siddhartha lost his calmness when the dice went against him. He lost his patience with those slow to pay him. He lost his friendly feelings for beggars. He lost his pleasure in giving away or lending money to those who asked for it. Although he would lose 10,000 a single cast and laugh over it, he became stricter and pettier in his business dealings he sometimes dreamed. He sometimes dreamed of money at night. It it penetrated his subconscious, and every time he awoke from that hateful enchantment, every time he saw in the mirror on his bedroom wall how much his face had aged and grown uglier, every time he was seized by shame and disgust, he ran further away. He fled to new games of chance. He fled to mind-numbing sensual pleasures and wine. And from there back to the and back to the urge to accumulate again in this meaningless cycle, he ran himself weary, ran himself old, ran himself sick. This is devastating. This is Siddhartha at his lowest. The man who was a prince, who was so generous and so courteous and so Loving and humble and kind and, and compassionate. He's become a gambler with no care, with no compassion, no concern, no love, with no tenderness. Where, where art thou, O Siddhartha? This story is killing me. The story is killing me. And the way that we began with his like high metaphysical realizations of the death of the ego and pursuing the, the absence of self and the Buddha and friendship and love. And now a gambler at the bottom of the barrel lost in, uh, 
lost in his drinking. Uh, however, a word is a word, and I said I would take a shot for every subscriber. And we have hit 930. 930 what? 993. 993? Which means we have seven more to go until we get a thousand. Which is so cool. Mr. Nine or Mrs. 993, welcome on board. Another one? 994? <laughs> All right, a word is a a word is a freaking word. Um, and in the in the depths of the sorrow of Siddhartha, in his drinking, <laughs> we were going to commiserate, um, by drinking with our lost friend, and we hope that he finds his way back, back to the light, back to the unity, back to the bliss, back to the beauty. Oh, how easy it is to get lost! How we ourselves get lost so quickly, get pulled in by by greed. By jealousy, by pride, by stupid things. This is a story of us, me and you. Uh, L'chaim, cheers to number 933. You're not a number, you're a person. <laughs> I see pieces of sushi here, which is cool. What are you guys feeling with this with this low point? Are you guys broken? Or is this like still hopeful? Do you see a way out? L'chaim. We have a few more to go until we finally celebrate. <laughs> wow. Okay. Jo <sighs> Joseph says, <laughs> I think that the I think that material possessions and wealth become a burden to us. We forget that to, to provide us with mainly our vital needs and they will become the focus of our lives. Thus, forgetting our mental or spiritual needs, which are, if I am, which, which are, if I'm to follow Plato and Socrates of his dialogues, first and foremost of the prospect of our lives, that it may be well and worthy of being lived. Yeah. Truth. Yeah. I think it's so evident. Like I think I think it's truly true that our our emotional, our mental, our spiritual needs, love, acceptance, compassion, these things are clearly like the things in our life that are more important than material, clearly more important than economic. You know, as long as we're living comfortably, like, there's a certain you know you know like the studies that show that like past a certain point of income, like your happiness doesn't increase with, with your increase of wealth. So these are so true, and we know these to be true, but we kind of live sometimes in, in a way that's away from that truth, and we, and we give our time, we give our precious time, we're all going to die, guys, girls. And we give our precious time away to stupid things instead of, instead of following real things, love, beauty, compassion, the divine, the transcendent, the imminent. So, yeah, it, it's one thing to know those truth and this one live those truths and that's 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 the hard part Whew. okay um if one can utilize luxuries to achieve a better personal self part is about staying rich and humble humans most of them, I'm just gonna do so, yeah i yeah i don't i don't mean to say that wealth or money per se is is bad or evil it needs to be channeled. It needs to be. It needs to be done with perspective and 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 and, and the right idea in mind. I mean, in I mean, at least in, in Jewish theology and Jewish mysticism, the place of wealth is not a, is not something which is sort of looked down upon or disparaged. Wealth is seen as a tool, a gift given to to empower and to share and to 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 use to do good things with. Um, and I think that we, as long as we have perspective in that mindset, then 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 money is awesome and wealth is awesome and is beautiful and is, is a conduit for good things. But as soon as it becomes ends in itself, and it's no longer just a means to an end, then then we're at this point that Siddhartha is at, and that's that's game over. That's like, what does your life come to? Yeah. Let's continue. Then one night, a dream warned him. Perhaps it's easy to get swept up in because it's the way we mainly expect to focus on most. Yeah, I, I mean, society conditions us to in that direction, but 
I mean, we're, big, we're, we're stronger than that, right? We don't have to listen to society's conditioning. We can say, no, thank you. We can say, that we, we believe that there, we can listen to our own voice and say that there are things which are more important, more worth pursuing with our, with our limited time on this little planet, you know, floating in, in, in a vast cosmos and pursuing wealth. And like, we're, bi we're bigger than that. I, I really believe it. Uh, at the end of the day, every person is a king, king. Once humility reaches the potential and then it's good as the king, that doesn't have all power. King of the strength is people. Yeah, I agree with that. Then one night a dream warned him. He had spent the evening hours with Kamala in her beautiful pleasant. They had sat between the trees talking and Kamala had spoken thoughtful words, words behind which sadness and weariness lay concealed. She had asked him to tell she had asked him to tell her about Gautama, and she could not hear enough about him. How pure his eyes had been, how calm, how pure his eyes had been, how calm and beautiful his lips, his, how kindly his smile, how peaceful his walk. He had to give her a long account of the sublime Buddha, and Kamala sighed, saying, Someday, maybe soon, I too shall follow this Buddha, I shall make him a gift of my pleasure garden, and I shall take refuge in his law. But after that she had incited him and chained him to her in love play with painful adore, bites and with tears, as if she wanted just one just once more to squeeze the last drop of sweetness out of his vain transitory. Never had it become so unusually clear to Siddhartha how closely sex is related to death. Interesting. Um, quite a German idea, the relationship between Eros and Thanatos. Anyone who's familiar with Freud will know that. Afterwards, he had lain aside, and Kamala's face had been near him, and below her eyes and at the corners of her mouth, he had read more clearly than ever before an anxious message written in fine lines, in light wrinkles, a message reminding him of autumn and old age. It's nice. Of himself, who was only in his 40s, had noticed gray hairs among his black hair here and there. Weariness was written on Kamala's beautiful face, weariness from traveling long path with no happy goal, weariness and the onset of fading and an anxiety that was kept not yet un, not yet uttered, perhaps not yet even conscious. Fear of old age, fear of the autumn, fear of the necessity of dying. He gave of her with a sigh. His soul filled with filled with concealed and anxiety. The autumn comes. <clears throat> Rachel C. What up, Rachel? Are you new to this uh, live reading? I haven't seen you commenting before. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Um, the power of the of, is in the king is perceptible. It's a nice twist. Yes, we can listen to ourselves, but when we don't know how to, then we may perhaps only come to ourselves. After all, I don't think anyone with wisdom or knowledge, but we come to it through exercise and education. Yeah, you're new. Um, okay, firstly, Joseph's point is interesting. Joseph, I want to like point out that there's an interesting debate in, in the history of philosophy between the theories of like tabula rasa, that the mind is is empty and we have no ideas when we come into existence, which is um, Locke and Rousseau and like, those kind of thinkers. And then there's a different kind of more platonic, like, Plato, Aristotle, and more of their thinkers who are like, you no, know, the mind has ideas that are set into it in advance, and we can we educate about discovering what the mind has. But this isn't the time for questions of hist like history of epistemology. Sorry, I'm, I'm just being silly. Rachel, thanks for joining us. Nice to have you. We're only about seven hours into the read. You came at a perfect time because the story is about to get better. And nice to have you here. And please feel free to engage in conversation and ask questions and respond and disagree that's what we're here to do cool and um we continue 
Then Siddhartha had spent the night at a home with dancing girls and wine. He went to the club. He went out to the town for drinks. He had plot of a superior man vis-a-vis -vis his peers. Although he no longer, he was no longer superior amongst his peers because he had fallen down. He had stooped to their level. Can I get a recap? Ha! Are you for real? Um, wow. Okay. You know what? Um, I'm going to read the next paragraph. And if anyone else wants to recap into Rachel, let's do that. Otherwise, I'll try to give you a recap after I read this paragraph. Okay? <laughs> that is very, that's very ambitious of you to rock up seven hours into a live read and ask for a recap. Respect. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> He played the part of a superior man vis a vis his peers. Although he no longer was one, he had drunk much wine and in bed long after midnight. May I mention right now it is after midnight here as well. <laughs> Weary and well agitated, close to tears and despair, for a long time he tried in vain to fall asleep, his heart full of a misery that he thought he could no longer bear, full of a disgust that he felt penetrating him like the tepid, repellent taste of the wine like the oversweet, monotonous music, like the, like the two simpering smiles of the dancing girls and the oversweet fragrance of their hair and breasts. But more than anything else, he was disgusted with himself, with his scented hair, with the smell of wine from his mouth, with the flabby tired, tiredness and irritability of his skin. Just as someone who has eaten or drunk too much vomits it out again in great discomfort, but nevertheless is glad of the relief the insomniac wished he could rid himself of these pleasures, of these habits, of this whole pointless life, and of himself in one enormous surge of nausea. He had not dropped off to sleep until the morning, until the morning light and the first floor and the first flurry of activity on the street in front of his townhouse. For a few moments, he had achieved some conscious, a foretaste of sleep. During these moments, he had a dream. Well done. Beautiful paragraph. Okay, so no one gave Rachel a root crap while I was reading. So, Rachel, the story is like this. Um, there's this dude, Siddhartha. He's the son of the Brahmin, which is the priestly caste in this um, early um, Hindu moment of religion, like 400 BCE, at the birth of Buddhism. And he goes off on his own path to try and find his true self um, with his, hmm? what? Wait, I'm getting there. Relax. <sighs> he goes to find his own self and uh, he rebels against his parents and fathers. And he, um, he, he goes off to the desert to be an ascetic, denying all worldly pleasure, having no belongings. And he, he relinquishes his beauty, trying to get rid of trying to get rid of his identity, trying to get rid of his ego. And um, he he does that for a while, but he doesn't feel like he's finding that that real thing that he's looking for, that real essence of the soul, that real mystical experience. Uh, at the same time, Buddha is going around preaching, and him and a friend go to the Buddha, and he encounters the Buddha, and the Buddha's teaches teaching his friend stays with the Buddha, and he is tempted to stay, but he finds that he can't find the truth, the essence in the teachings of Buddha. He has to find it in himself. He goes off and he has this kind of mystical reawakening experience in nature. Also, I've been having a shot for every new subscriber that subscribed since we started this drink, uh, since we started this channel, since we started this, this live video. So excuse me if I'm not being totally coherent. He goes off into nature. He has this rebirth experience. And he's like, okay, it's no longer about just finding the self. It's about finding the me, Siddhartha, who am I? And not like about getting to what's beyond the present, but into the present. And then he winds up in a town. He falls in love with this woman uh, who's a prostitute, Kamala. And he gets involved in like earning money to try and win her over. Um, and he gets very stooped into his materialism. And now having a moment where he's kind of realizing that he's lost himself and he wants to come back to his old ways. Um, and hopefully we're going to see the story begin to turn and pivot now. And Poor guy. He's like really lost. If I missed anything in that recap, please uh, chuck a uh, comment in the chat so that Rachel can be up to scratch with where we're at in the story.
You're very, but Rachel, I haven't done recaps for everyone. You should feel very honored. <laughs> Not honored, I mean like grateful. Okay. Um, this feast conjures up a esoteric rite and the wine of that sacred love being drunk at twilight of the existence of the soul. Which feast are you talking about? <laughs> the feast that we just read in this last paragraph? Huh, interesting, 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 Joseph. Um, interesting. Okay, interesting. To me, it feels more like it's a moment of, like of realization, of reckoning, but you're seeing it as like part of the, I guess that is part of the journey itself, and that's part of like the spiritual, the, the sacred. Yeah, Rachel, it took seven hours because I've been like taking my jolly sweet time here and hanging out with people and responding to comments and just having fun and eating sushi and um, all kinds of cool things. It took an hour for us to do the introduction, so it's only been really like six hours on the actual text. I'm also dyslexic and I read slowly and I like to like kind of enjoy the poetry as we go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but you're welcome, Rachel. The point basically is, is that it's this journey of Siddhartha and he's trying to find himself and it's very honest and it's very real and he goes through love and loss and loneliness and anxiety and and feeling and and anhedonia and 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 being numb and it's a really great story it's a story it's, it's a story which is really the story of all of us it's just like i've very much been connecting to and relating to thanks rachel you just you just showed up and you just shot showering compliments you're a great you're a great participant thanks for joining us and but let us continue reading okay Kamala owned a small, rare bird song. <laughs> Kamala owned a small rare songbird kept in a golden cage. Okay, so this is the dream. Thank you. Kamala. This is the dream that uh, Siddhartha has when he like has trouble sleeping all night when he's been out clubbing and he feels really re really horrible about it. This is the dream that he has in the wee hours of the morning between consciousness and waking. Kamala, a small, rare sung bird that she kept in a golden cage. It was this bird he dreamt about. In this dream, the bird, which usually always sang at the morning hour, remained silent. Since this attracted his attention, he stepped up to the cave and looked in. The little bird was dead and lay rigid on the floor of the cage. He took it out, waited for a moment, and then threw it away out into the lane and at the same moment, he received a terrible fright, and his heart ached as if he had cast away something, as, he, as if he had cast away everything valuable and good from himself together with that dead bird. This dead bird chucks it away, and he feels like he threw away everything he had that was valuable. <sighs> Heavy dream. Starting up out of that dream, he felt hemmed in by profound sadness it appeared to him that he had been living his life in a world in a worthless way worthless and pointless nothing alive nothing in the least way valuable or worth keeping had remained in his hands he stood there alone and empty like a shipwrecked man on a shore this is the realization this is that moment when in the in when you hit rock bottom and it's like yeah my life is meaningless worthless like a shipwrecked man on the shore. What an apt description. Gloomily, Siddhartha went to a pleasure garden he owned, locked the gate, sat down beneath a mango tree. Reference back to the mango tree that he hung out with, with the Buddha. Felt death in his heart and terror in his bosom. He sat there and physically felt a dying, fading, and ending within him. Gradually, he collected his thoughts and mentally retraced the entire course of his life from the very first days he would recall. When had he experienced happiness, felt true bliss? Oh, yes, he had experienced it several times. As a boy, he had tasted it when he had elicited praise for Brahmins. When far, when far surpassing the others of his age, he had distinguished himself in reciting the holy verses in disputations with the learned men as an assistant of the sacrifices, 
At such, at, such time, at such times he had felt it in his heart. A path lies before you to which you are called. The gods are waiting for you. And then as a young man, when the ever elusive goal of all reflective thought had plucked him out of the mass of all other contenders had borne him upward, when he was painfully struggling for the meaning of Brahman, when every bit of knowledge he acquired merely kindled fresh thirst in him, there too, amid his thirst, amid his pain, he had the same feeling. Onward, onward, you have a calling. You have heard a voice when you have left home and chosen the Salman's life. And again, when he departed from the Salman's and gone to that perfect one. And then when he departed from him and gone into the unknown, how long it, how long it was now since he heard that voice, how long scaled any heights, how evenly and monotonously his journey had gone on, how many long years without a lofty goal, knowing no thirst or relation of spirit, contended with petty pleasures and yet never satisfied. For all without knowing it, he had labored and longed to become a human being like all these others, like these children and all the time his life had been much more wretched and poor. This whole world of common people that had been a game to him, a dance that you watch, a comedy. Only Kamala had been dear to him, had had value for him. But did she still, did she still, did he still need her or she him? Were they not playing a game that had no end? Was it necessary to go on living for that? No, it was not necessary. This game was called Samsara, a game for children, a game in a game it might be pleasant to play once, twice, ten times, but over and over again. <sighs> wow. Uh, Joseph says, indeed, that journey when the soul of Gautama at first was miserable and longed for something revelatory light, he thereafter drank that fiery wine of sacred love and also becoming drunk, also becoming enlightened. Then Siddhartha knew that the game was over, that he could not play it anymore. He shundered all over his body and inside him he felt that something had died. That whole day he sat beneath the mango tree, recalling his father, recalling Govina, recalling Gotama. Had it been necessary to abandon them in order to become a Karaswami? He still sat there when night fell. He looked up and caught sight of the stars. He thought, here I am sitting beneath my mango tree, my pleasure garden. He smiled slightly. Was it necessary then? Was it proper? Was it not just a foolish game for him to own a mango garden? He called it quits. And with that, as who died within him, he got up, said goodbye to the mango tree, said goodbye to the pleasure garden. Since he had spent the whole day without eating, he felt a ravenous hunger and recalled his house in town, his room in bed, the table lad accepted no more visits and kept her house locked up. After a while, she became aware that her last meeting with Siddhartha had left her pregnant. And that is the end of that chapter. The name of that chapter, by the way, was Samsara. For those who remember at the beginning of the chapter, Samsara means um, exile, suffering. Like the world of illusion in Buddhism. You see him really being deep in his samsara. And the imprint, the footprints that he leaves behind on those in that world. Particularly on Kamala. Wow. What a paragraph. What a, what a chapter. Are we ready for the next chapter? This chapter is By the River. By the rivers of Babylon, there I sat and there I cried. 
Okay. Let us truck on with this beautiful book. How you doing there, Alyssa? Yeah. Good? Good. Enjoying? Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, that was a that was a tight paragraph. That was a tight chapter. Okay. Off to the next. Siddhartha wandered through the forest, already far from the town. He knew only this, that he could not return. That the life he had now been leading for many years was over and done with. He, he had tasted and, and drained it to the um, surfer point. Dead was the songbird of which he had dreamed. Dead was the bird in his heart. He was tightly entangled in samsara. He had imbibed disgust and death from all sides. As a sponge soaks up water until it is full, he was full of distaste, full of misery, full of death. There was nothing more in the world that could entice him, gladden him, console him. Rock bottom. Samsara, says Joseph, means metapsychosis or transmigration of the soul. Could be a wordplay and similar sounding Sanskrit word. Okay, so yeah, so samsara um, is part of the is is part of this idea of the wheel of rebirth in Buddhism, um, that one keeps coming back into existence and needs to escape that cycle of rebirth. Samsara also generally connotes this idea of of exile and suffering and um, detachment from true reality. It's all kind of tied into that to that Sanskrit word. Yeah, exactly. He ardently wished to know nothing more about himself, to enjoy repose, to be dead. If only a lightning bolt would come and kill him. If only a tiger would come and devour him. If only there were, if only there were a wine, a poison that could bring him unconscious oblivion and sleep without any more awakening. For was there any kind of filth that he had not filthied himself with? Any sin and folly he had not committed, any bareness of the soul he had not burdened himself, he had not burdened himself with, was it possible to go on living? Was it possible to keep on constantly breathing in, breathing out, feeling hunger, eating again, sleeping again, lying with a woman again? Was not this cycle exhausted and terminated for him? Siddhartha reached the wide river in the forest, the same river over which a ferryman had once taken him when he was still a young man coming from Gautama's town. By that river he halted, lingered hesitantly on its banks. Fatigue and hunger had wearied him. And then, what reason had he to continue on, and where to? Towards what goal? No, there was no towards any goal. Nothing was left but the deep-seated sorrowful longing to shake off the entire chaotic dream, to spit out that flat wine, to make an end to that pathetic, shameful life. A tree, a tree leaned forward over the river bank, a coconut palm. Siddhartha rested his, soul, rested his shoulder against its trunk, placed his thumb against the trunk, and looked down in the green water that continued to flow below him. He looked down and discovered that it was totally imbued, that he was, to that he was totally imbued with the desire to let himself go and sink into that water. He saw a frightful void reflected in that water, corresponding to the terrible void in his soul. Yes. He had reached that end. There was nothing left for him but to obliterate himself, to shatter the abortive structure of himself, to throw the feet of the gods who would laugh in scorn. This was the great fit of vomiting he had longed for, the death, the shattering of the mold he had hated. Let the fish devour him, that dog, Siddhartha, that lunatic, that corrupt, decayed body, that flaccid misused soul. Let the fish and crocodiles devour him. Let the demons tear him apart. His features distorted. He stared into the water, seeing the reflection of his face spat at it. A cool inversion of the myth of Narcissus. In profound wariness, he detached his arm from the tree trunk and turned his body slightly so that he would fall vertically and finally perish. His eyes, he was dropping to his death. Just then, 
from remote regions of his soul, from past periods of his tired life. A sound rang through his mind like a It was a word, a syllable, that he spoke to himself involuntarily in a slurred voice. That old voice which begins and ends every Brahmist, every Brahminist prayer, the sacred Om, which is equivalent in meaning to perfection or the absolute. And at the moment that the sound Om touched Siddhartha's ears, is his intellect, which had full, suddenly awakened and realized the folly of what he was doing. Siddhartha was thoroughly frightened. So then, things were so bad for him. He was so lost, so far astray and abandoned by all knowledge that he had been able to seek death, that that wish, the childish wish, had been able to grow strong within him, to find peace by obliterating his body. With all the torment of those recent days, all his sober reflections, despair had not accomplished was accomplished by the moment when Om penetrated his consciousness. He understood himself in misery and his maze of error. Om, he said to himself, Om. And once more he knew about Brahman. He knew about the indestructible and wonderful vision are often preceded by suffering, misery, pain. 100%, shall I? Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that deep... That deep need to to really reach that lowest of lowest places, and there to find redemption, light. Yeah, it's definitely real. But this was only a moment, a flashing light. Siddhartha sank down at the foot of a palm, laid his head on the tree's roots, and sank into deep sleep. His sleep was deep and dreamless. For a long time, he had not known such sleep. When he awakened many hours later, he felt as if it was ten years that had gone by. He heard He heard the quiet of the river. He did not know where he was or what brought him there. He opened his eyes and he saw trees and sky and, and in surprise saw trees and skies to him. And he remembered where he was and how he had gotten there. But this took him a long time, and the past seemed to him to lie under a veil. To be infinitely distant, infinitely far away, infinitely unimportant. All he knew was that he had left his early life behind. In the first moment of his return to his senses, that early life resembled a previous incarnation in the remote past, a early prenatal state of his present self. He knew that, filled with disgust and misery, he had even wanted to throw away his life. But he had remained that but he had regained consciousness by a river under a coconut palm, that sacred om on his lips. He had fallen asleep and now awake again. He was looking like a new person. Softly he spoke the word om to himself, the word that has been in his thoughts when he fell asleep, and he felt as if all of his long sleep had been nothing but a long utterance of om, in a straight of concentration, a meditation on om. And immerse an immersion and total absorption um, into the nameless, the absolute. Really, what a marvelous sleep that had been. Never had sleep so freshened him, so renewed him, so rejuvenated him. Perhaps he had really died, had perished, and was now reborn in a new shape. But no, he recognized himself, his hands and feet. He recognized the place he was lying. He recognized that I, he recognized that I in his bosom. That Siddhartha, that willful, strange man, the Siddhartha was transformed. He was renewed. He was remarkably rested, remarkably awake, joyfully inquisitive. Siddhartha sat up, whereupon he saw someone sitting opposite him, a stranger, a monk in yellow robe, with a shaved head, in the pose of contemplation. He observed the man who had neither hair on his head nor a beard, but 
He had not been, but he had not been observing him very long when he recognized in that monk Govinda, the friend of his youth, Govinda, who had taken refuge in the sublime Buddha. Govinda had aged too, but his face still bore the same old features, betokening enthusiasm, loyalty, questing, anxiety. But now, <clears throat> when Govinda Feeling his eyes upon him, opened his own eyes and looked at him. Siddhartha saw that Govinda did not recognize him. Govinda was glad to find him awake. Obviously, he'd be sitting there for some time waiting for him to awaken, even though he did not know him. I have been sleeping, Siddhartha said. How did you get here? You have been sleeping, Govinda said. It is not good to sleep in a place like this. But there are often snakes, and when the forest animals have their trails, I, sir, am a disciple of the sublime Gautama, the Buddha, the Sakyamuni. And I was wandering this way with a group of my fellows when I saw you asleep in a place where it's dangerous to sleep. Therefore, I tried to awaken you, sir. And when I saw that your sleep was very deep, I remained behind while my friends went on, and I sat with you, and then it seems fell asleep myself. And I, who wanted to guard you while you slept, I have done my duty badly. Fatigue overpowered me, but now the. <coughs> Thank you. Let me go, so that so that I may overtake my brothers. Thank you, Samana, for watching over me while I slept. <coughs> Thank you, Siddhartha said. You, disciple of the sublime one, are friendly. Now you may go. I am going, sir. May you always enjoy good health, sir. Thank you, Samana. Sorry, let me just blow my nose one second. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going, sir. May you always enjoy good health, sir. Thank you, Samana. Govinda made the sign of of leave taking and said farewell. Farewell, Govinda. Siddhartha said. The monk stopped short. Pardon me, sir. How do you know my name? Thereupon Siddhartha smiled. I know you, O Govinda, from your father's cottage, from the Bra from the Brahmanic school, from the sacrifices from our journey to the shop from to the Samanas, from the hour when you took refuge Taiwan in the grove of Jet Jetavana. You are Siddhartha! Govinda shouted out loud, Now I recognize you, and I fail to understand how I did not recognize you at once. Welcome, Siddhartha. Great is my joy in seeing you once again. I am pleased to see you once again. You have been the guardian of my slumbers, for which I thank you again, even though I needed no guardian. Where are you heading, my friend? This dialogue is kind of a bit, like, it's a bit, it's a bit like rusty, you know? It's like not exactly two people that just yeah. like tight friends after years and years met one another. Needs, dialogue needs a bit of work, but I like this idea that he was watching over him while he, the whole time, like not just now under the palm tree, but in general, like his whole samsara was asleep and Govinda was like looking out for him like a bro. Um, okay, so where are you headed, my friends? Asked Siddhartha to, to Govinda. Nowhere in particular. Uh, we monks are always journeying, except in the rainy seasons. We're always proceeding from one place to another, living by our rules, proclaiming the doctrine, accepting alms, um, journeying further. It is always like that. But you, Siddhartha, where are you headed for? Siddhartha said, it's the same for me, friend. As with you, I'm going nowhere in particular. I'm merely journeying. I'm, I'm a wanderer. I'm wondering. 
Govinda said, you say you are wondering, and I believe you, but forgive me, Mr. Siddhartha. You do not look like a You are wearing a rich man's garment and wearing an aristocrat's shoes. And your hair and its fragrance of scented water, it's not the hair of a wanderer, not the hair of a samana. Yes, my dear friend, you have observed well. Your sharp eyes see everything. But I did not say I was a samana. I said I was a wanderer. And it is true, I am. Oh, I am wondering. You are wondering, Govinda said, but not so many people go wondering in such a garment, in such shoes, in such well, with such well-groomed hair. I, who have been wondering for many years now, have never run across a wonder of that sort. I believe you, my Govinda. But now today, I've run across such a wanderer in such shoes, in such a garment. Remember, my dear friend, the world of created forms is transitory. Transitory, extremely transitory are our garments, the way we do our hair and our hair and bodies themselves. I'm wearing a rich man's clothes and you have seen that. I'm wearing them because I have been a rich man and my hair is dressed like that of worldlings and um, voluptuaries because I have been one. Voluptuaries, that's such a good word. Oh my gosh. Like voluptuous? Voluptuaries. I love that word. Ugh. Add that to my... Uh... <sighs> to my vocabulary yeah thank you and now govinda where are you now ayeka where are you now that's that's the question <sighs> i do not know i know no more about it than you do i am journeying i was a rich man i no longer am and what shall i be tomorrow i do not know have you lost your wealth i have lost it or it has lost me i've gone away from it the wheel of created forms turns swiftly govinda where is Siddhartha, the Brahmin? Where is Siddhartha, the, where is Siddhartha, the rich man? Transitory things change swiftly. Govinda, as you know, Govinda took a long look at the friend of his youth with doubt in his eyes. Then he took leave of him as one of the aristocrats and went his way. With the smile of his face, Siddhartha watched him go. He still loved that loyal, anxious man. And how could he fail to love any person or anything at this moment? At the splendid hour following this miraculous sleep, he was paid with Om. This was the very nature of the enchantment that had befallen him while sleeping, that he loved everything. They had filled his happy love for everything he saw. It now appeared to him that it had been his, his inability to love anything or anyone that had previously made him ill. With a smile on his face, Sid Arthur watched the departing monk his sleep had greatly strengthened him, but he had severe hunger pains because he had not eaten for two days now, and that time was long past that he had been fortified against hunger. He remembered that time with sorrow, yet with a laugh too. Back then he recalled that he had boasted to Kamal of three things. He had mastered three noble, invincible arts, fasting, waiting, thinking. Those had been his possession, his power, his strength, his firm rod in the diligent, laborious, Years of his youth, he had learned those three arts and nothing else. And now he, they had deserted him. Now none of them were his any longer, neither fasting nor waiting nor thinking. He had given them up for the sake of the most wretched things, the most transitory things, for sensual pleasure, for luxury, for wealth. His experience had really been a strange one, and now it seems now he had truly become a child person. Hey, SS here. SS, by the way, has been a, I don't know who you are, but you've been dropping some really beautiful comments on the channel. So welcome to live read. Nice to have you. There's an interesting kind of tension here that's being played with this idea of the child person where he both resents and aspires to be like them. I haven't put my finger on what on what this child person idea means for Siddhartha and for Hess. Okay, let's continue. We're making good progress. Any thoughts, any questions, any reflections? 
feel free to, to write into the chat. Siddhartha reflected on his situation. It was hard for him to think he really had no claim to do so, but he forced himself. Now he thought, now all those, those most transitory things have been have been have slipped away from me again. I am standing once more in the sunshine as I stood once as a little child. Nothing belongs to me. There is nothing I know how to do. There's nothing I know how to do. Nothing I'm able to do. Nothing I've learned. How peculiar is it now when I'm no longer young? When my half when my strength is giving out now, I'm starting from the beginning again from childhood. Again, he had to smile. Yes, his destiny was strange. Things were going downhill for him. And once again, he stood in the world empty, naked and stupid. But he was unable to feel sorrow over it. No, he even felt a huge urge, a great urge to laugh, to laugh at himself, to laugh at the strange foolish world things are going downhill for me he said to himself laughing the while and as he said it he his glance fell over the river and he saw the river going downhill too moving constantly downstream but singing merrily as it went he was pleased with that and smiled at the river in a friendly way was it not the river in which he had wanted to drown a girl a hundred years ago or had he just dreamed that my life is truly peculiar, he thought. It's strange. It followed strange roundabout paths. As a boy, I only I was only occupied with gods and sacrifices. As a youth, I was only occupied with ascetic practices and thinking with concentration. I was questioning after Brahman, revering the eternal in the Atman. But as a young man, I followed the penitents, lived in the forest, suffered from heat and cold, learned to fast, taught my body to go dead, and then... In the great teachings of the great Buddha, realization came to me miraculously. I felt knowledge of the unity of the world circulating inside me like my own blood. I had to deliver from the Buddha and the great knowledge. I went and learned the pleasures of love from Kamala. I learned business from Kamaswami. I accumulated money. I squandered money. I learned to love my belly. I learned to flatter my senses. I learned to. I, I had to spend many years losing my intellectual powers on learning my ability to, to think, forgetting the principle of oneness. Is it not as if slowly and wandering far from the direct path, I've changed from a man to a child, from a thinker to a child person. And yet this journey has and yet this journey has been so good, and yet the bird in my heart has not died. But what a journey it was. I've had to pass through so much stupidity through so much vice, through so much error, through so much disgust and disappointment and misery, merely to become a child again, to be able to make a new start. But it all happened for the best. My heart tells me so, and my eye agrees laugh and my eyes agree laughingly. I had to experience despair. I had to descend to the foolish thought of all thought of suicide in order to experience grace, in order to hear Om. Um, Again, in order to be able to sleep and awaken properly again, I had to become a fool in order to f in order to find Atman within myself again. I had to sin so that I could live again. Where else may my path lead me? This path is foolish. It makes wide loops. Maybe it is going in circles. Let it go wherever it wishes. I shall follow it. What a, what a realization. Is anyone keeping the drinking game? <laughs> you are, hey. Ah, what a beautiful paragraph. So, um, as we know, every time we get a new subscriber, we drink a shot to celebrate. Because it's a time for celebration. And we're at 9.95 live, and my live audience insists that we continue to drink. Even in the deep awakening and melancholy and despair and, and passions, pathos of Siddhartha, we continue to drink.
Okay. He felt joy. Yes. Are we at 9.99? Yo, Nemeton, you're pulling a fossil to me here. We're at 9.95. <laughs> Don't get me excited prematurely. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> I love you, man. Okay. He felt joy surging miraculously in his heart. Where? Oh, this is a beautiful line. Get this. Where he asks his heart, where is where is your joyility? <laughs> I did not joyility. <laughs> where is your joyility coming from? <laughs> I'm gonna ask people in the street next tomorrow. Where is joy? Where is your joyility coming from? <laughs> I hope so, Sean. <laughs> Tell your friends on board, bro. If you want to see this reading get sloshed, <laughs> that's the only way. Before the day is up, the question: <laughs> How long is the day, River? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Huh. Uh, okay. Where he asked his heart, where is your joyility coming from? Is it coming from that long good sleep that did me so good? That did much good, or from the word, or or from the word om that I, or because I have escaped. By the way, is there ohm in the in the glossary here? Does that have a does that have an explanation? Because like I'm familiar with this idea of the word ohm. Do you guys know what ohm means? You guys want to help me out here? While I check the glossary. Ohm. Okay. The untranslatable syllable uttered before every recitation from the Vedas. This prominence led mystics in the Upanishads and elsewhere to elevate ohm to the greatest heights. Indeed, to the position of the supreme in the universe. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Ta -da 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 -da. Oh, all right. Is it or from the word om that I uttered? Chana Goda Upanishads. Send me a link, bro. I'll read it. Or because I've escaped, because my gateway is accomplished, because I'm finally free again and standing beneath the sky like a child. Oh, how good this escape and this liberation. Oh, how good escape and this liberation are. Are or is? <laughs> it says are. Huh? How fresh and beautiful the air is here. So good to breathe. In the place I escaped from, everything smelled of ointments, spices, wine, abundance, indolence. How I hated that world of rich people. I don't know what this word is. G-O-U-R-M-A-N-D-S. Gormans? Alyssa? Gamblers. How I hated myself for remaining so long in that frightful world. What? Gluttons? Hedonistic. Cool. Uh, remaining so in the world, fraud myself, myself, tortured myself. I made myself old and malevolent. No, never again will I take to my head as it once pleased me to do that Siddhartha is wise. But in this, I have acted well. I am glad and I give praise to it that. That hatred for myself, that foolish, dis uh, dismal life is over and with. I applaud you, Siddhartha. After so many years of folly, you have done once again. You have once again had an inspiration. You have something. You have you have done something. You have heard the bird in your heart singing, and you have followed it. Nice. Thanks, Joseph. Thus, he applauded himself. He took pleasure in himself, listened intuitively to his stomach, <laughs> nice, which was which was growling with hunger. He felt that in those last times and days he had now thoroughly tasted and spat out a piece of sorrow, a piece of misery. He had gobbled it up to the to the point of despair and death, and it was good so. 
How often do we listen to our own stomachs, by the way? Just a point to ponder. And, and it was good, so he might still have remained with Karaswami for a long time, earning, wasting money, fattening his belly, and letting his soul die of thirst. He might have dwelt for a long time in that soft, well-upholstered hell. Had that not arrived, that moment, the moment of absolute disconsolation and despair, that extreme moment when he was suspended above the rushing waters, ready to, anni to annihilate himself. Let me finish the paragraph. Because he had felt that despair, that most profound loathing, and had not succumbed to it, because the bird, the happy wellspring, and the voice within him were still alive after all, that is why he felt this joy, why he was laughing, why his face was beaming beneath his great hair. Samuel J. Clark, my friend, you have just subscribed to the channel, and that makes you a subscriber number... 996. Uh, this is an impressive feat. Thank you, Adam. And it's about to get a bit more impressive because I'm going to keep my word and say l'chaim, say cheers to Samuel J. Clark uh, because we're saying cheers with a shot in this drinking game and revelry. This back in eight-hour book reading that no one could have predicted. <laughs> Cheers, Samuel. Thanks for joining us. Looking forward to getting to know you. To life. L'chaim. Salut. Bottoms up. All right, let's continue. It is good, he thought, to taste for yourself everything you need to know. That worldly pleasures and wealth are not good things. I learned even as a child. I knew it for a long time. But only now I experienced it, and now I know it. I know it not because I remember hearing it, but with my eyes, with my heart, with my stomach, with my kishkas. And it is good for me to know it. He reflected for some time upon his transformation. He listened to the bird that was singing for joy. Had not that bird within him died? Had not he felt its death? No. Something else inside him had died. Something that had long been yearning to die. Something that had long been yearning to die. Yearning to die. Was it not the thing that he had once wanted to mortify? Mortify means to kill, by the way. Uh, like like uh, morbidity or mortality? Same word. Yeah, mortify means to kill. M-O-R-T-I-F-Y, yeah. What if I... During his ardent years as a penitent, was it not his self, his petty, timid, proud self? With which he had battled for so many years, which he had conquered, which which had conquered him time and again, which he had which had re-emerged after every modification, after every act of killing it just came back. Oh, get this line. Get this line, people. Which had re-emerged after every modification, forbidding him to be happy, experiencing fear. Before I even finish the paragraph, there is a part of us which, which forbids us to be happy, which doesn't allow us to be happy. Which, which causes us to experience fear. And we got to let it go. Was it not this that had finally met its death that day, there in the forest, beside that lovely river? Was it not because of that death that was now like a child, so full of thrust, so free of fear, so full of joy, in that moment of death, when that part of us which is holding us back, a part of us which forbids us from being happy, which, which, which tells us that we're not worthy of love and happiness. When that part of us is 
when we go, when we let it fly away, when we let it die, and we allow ourselves to be happy, to be loved, to love. What a moment. This is a great moment. I agree with you, River. Now, Siddhartha, oh so, now Siddhartha, oh so suspected why. As a Brahmin, as a penitent, he had battled in vain with that self. He had been hindered by too much knowledge. He had been hindered by too much knowledge. Too many sacred verses. Too many sacrificial rites. Too many castigations. Too much activity and ambition. He had been full of pride. Always the cleverest. Always the most eager. Always one step ahead of the others. Always the scholar and intellectual, always the priest or the sage. His self had wormed its way into that pre into that pridefulness, into that intellectuality. There it took a firm hold and grew while he thought he was killing it by fasting and doing penitence. Now he saw it and saw that the secret voice had been right and that no teacher would ever have been able to liberate him. For that... He had to go into the world. He had to lose himself to pleasure and power, to women and money. He had to become a merchant, a dice drinker, an avaricious man, until the priest and the samana within him, within him were dead. For that, he had to go and enduring these hateful years, enduring the disgust, the emptiness, the meaningfulness of a barren, lost life. To the very end, to the point of bitter despair, until Siddhartha, the voluptuary, and Siddhartha, the avaricious man, could also die. He had died. A new Siddhartha had awakened from sleep. He too would grow old. He too would have to die sometime. Siddhartha too was mortal. Every created thing was mortal, but today he was young. Today he was a child. This was a new Siddhartha. He was full of joy. These were the thoughts thinking as he listened smilingly to his stomach. These were the thoughts he was thinking as he listened smilingly to his stomach and gratefully paid attention to the buzzing of a bee. Ah. As he listened smilingly to his stomach and gratefully paid attention to the buzzing of a bee. You're killing me, Hamanasa. You're killing me. Serenity. Sorry. Serenely, he gazed into the flowing river. Not had any water pleased him as much as this did. Never had he perceived the voice and the allegory of the moving current so strongly and beautifully. He felt as if the river had something special to tell him, something he did not yet know but still awaited him. In this river, Siddhartha had wanted to drown. In it, the old, tired, despairing Siddhartha had drowned that day. But the new Siddhartha felt a profound love for that flowing water and resolved in his mind not to leave the bind for quite some time. And that is the end of that paragraph. <laughs> beautiful, 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 just beautiful, just beautiful. Yeah, yes, please. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay. The next paragraph is called The Fairy Man. Thank you so much. The water of the river that Siddhartha stood by and was reawakened, the water that we drink. Okay. <sighs> Are we ready for the next paragraph? Are you guys ready? What do you say? Here, let's hear from you guys if we're ready for the next paragraph. The fairy man. Hey, Joseph. Um, to be honest, 
I'm kind of drunk and <laughs> reading. And you said a lot of really cool things. If you remind me what which point exactly you were asking about, um, I would love to engage in conversation and respond. Just please tell me what, what it is that you were referring to. Funky stuff, yeah. Yeah, Fernanda. Funky chapter. Funky book. Funky moment. Funky moment to be alive, to be experiencing the beauty of life, to be connecting over technology. Funk, really funky stuff. Okay. Uh, I find it funny that journeys towards a blissful and wonderful visions are often saved by suffering, misery, pain. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. It's a really interesting idea that journeys. Blissful journeys are preceded by suffering and pain. I mean, I think there's like a couple ways to understand that and to like make sense of that. I think that like in a very basic metaphysical level, there's no bliss and wonderfulness and no light and no day unless we darkness and night and, and pain and suffering, right? These these ideas are, are codependent. Without without dark, there's no light, without night, there's no day, without pain, there's no bliss. So that maybe that's one sense of it that that there's a necessity to experience suffering, um, for then for us to then come through that suffering to an experience of, of bliss, on a, on a very base like logical and, and meta yeah there's a very like so my mind says um <laughs> there is a duality of, of existence for sure and that duality yeah that duality is assumed okay there's 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 a very complex metaphysical that needs to take place which is. Um, there's a term in Latin which is coincidente oppositorum, which is the which is the the uh, the coincidence of opposites, where the interdependency of opposites no longer become either or they become complementary opposites. It's like a it's an idea that runs through all of mysticism. Nicholas of Cusa, Taoism, it's it's really east and west, it's 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 a, it's a ubiquitous idea. Joseph says, uh, but why? Do you think that we just oversimplified it into a dichotomy, a, a duality? So have we simplified it into a dichotomy, into, into a duality? And does that like predic does that preclude us from ever experiencing bliss on its own away from pain and suffering? Can we ever experience good without bad? <sighs> um to so my I mean, I'm interested in all mysticism, like in all in all traditions. Um, thank God, but my my like my my home turf is Jewish mysticism, and in Jewish mysticism, there's a, a there's a very strong archetypal idea of the two trees in the Garden of Eden. There's the, there's the Garden of Knowledge, the Eitz Hadas, the Garden of Knowledge, which is the knowledge of good and evil, which is duality, duplicit, like that whole story, and then there's the Eitz Chaim, the, the Tree of Life, um, and the the idea of the Eitz Chaim is that in the Tree of Life, there we don't see, we don't make judgments about good and bad. It's just all life. It's all being. It's all. There's no. There's no good and bad. There's no suffering and evil. It's just all life. And I think in order to get beyond bad, we have to get beyond good too. As long as we're still striving for good, I'm saying this now. I could regret saying this, but I don't know if any like what talk my mind. We have to get beyond the the desire for good as well to, to let go of bad. We have to just embrace being as it is, like life as it is, with like beyond the categories of good and bad. Rumi, the poet, the Sufi poet, writes like, "Let me meet you in this fi in the field which is beyond good and evil," which is a very a dangerous idea if it's misapplied, but but a fascinating idea. Okay, now we have some comments. Um, meaning requires differentiation. So I think there's a point which is beyond differentiation, which is like just simply being. Anyhow, interesting. It's a very interesting concept. It's it's a it's it's a it's a concept which like we need to think a long, deep time about. Think like really, really think about. Mm. <clears throat> I'm gonna continue reading because that's what I promised you guys I would do. Should I, uh, I'm kind of, should I use the bathroom? Like I can probably hold down until after this chapter. Let's see how long the chapter is. 
No, you know what? I'm going to use the bathroom and then I'll, I'll get back to the chapter. And meanwhile, you can uh, converse amongst yourselves. <laughs> Thanks. Oof. Right. Yo, let's where's the popcorn? Let's have popcorn. Huh? Tell me when you want popcorn. Of course, we get to do popcorn. Did you finish your sushi? Yeah, yeah, I finished my sushi. <laughs> <laughs> I finished my dinner. Okay, <laughs> dessert. Dessert. <laughs> All right. Is it good? Huh. Uh, the sushi was delicious. It was amazing. Honestly, thank you so much. It was so good. Okay. Uh, what's up here? Um, yo, River, thanks for coming, bro. A thing isn't even a thing until it's discerned different from other th things. Yeah, for everything to be possessed of distinct reality, identity, and distinct, doesn't this definition imply conscious and opposition? Okay, so this is a very interesting point. Um, I want to. I mean, this is something which definitely needs its own reading, and we can. I can. I would love to choose a text, by the way, and, and get into this with you guys. But um, in philosophy of identity, identity is generally like defined as opposition to something else. Um, talking about sort of day, night, light, dark, good, bad. But there is an idea in in philosophy, um, both in like philosophical mysticism and Western philosophy which is known as identity indifference. Uh, not, not indifference as in not different, identity in difference. That, that the identity is not in, anyhow, Google that, Google that term, identity indifference. It's an idea which is very, which has become popular in postmodernism, but it's an idea which actually began, I think, with, with, like, with like mystical philosophers, people like Nicholas of Cusa, Meister Eckhart, uh, and others where we no longer need the differentiation to, to find identification, but we can find identification in, in uh, whatever. I'm a bit too drunk to explain it right now, but please do Google that idea. There's probably a Wikipedia page called Identity Indifference and, um, or Coincidentia Oppositorum is the Latin term, which is a coincidence of opposites. Um, but it's, it's, a super, it's, it's, like, it's a super critical point. Uh, many words pointed to this. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've 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 actually been very fascinated. I'm interested in philosophy and mysticism, as some of you might know. I'm really fascinated by this idea of of philosophy, identity, and the logic of mysticism, and and the sort of a non-Aristotelian logic. So Aristotelian logic is based on this idea of like the the law of, contra law of contradiction and the excluded middle and uh, and the mystics are like no um we have a different form of logic which can find identity and difference and it can find the coincidence of opposites where the opposites reconcile which is really the case in in reality where like the ends of things meet up again right like the extremes of anything becomes the its opposite i have popcorn popping in the background because i because i said we should bring popcorn to the event so Excuse the noise of the popcorn, um, and we're going to get back to reading because we're we're uh, we're making our way through the book. This is what we've read so far, and this is what we have left to read. Yeah, but but I I do want to dive into this like issue from a place of identity and philosophy, and uh, there's so much to explore. Yo, Joseph. I am so touched that you that you feel that way. Honestly, 
thank you so so much it's like it's something that i'm doing out of absolute love and absolute passion and i'm doing it because i i can't imagine doing anything else and um i'm just so chuffed and so happy that people out there and like yourself are finding it valuable and helpful and uh and cool thank you so so much that 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 honestly means so much to me and i to be to be very honest i spend like many many hours like in my own room alone and isolated just editing and researching and it's a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes that goes in like every video takes like days and days of editing oh my gosh and i'm i i don't i don't know how to, like, i have to learn all this stuff from scratch so the fact that like people appreciate it and the fact that like that that um yeah, that's so freaking much to me. Thank you so much. I'm not just saying that. I really mean that. Wow. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, River, you know what I mean. You know, like, how much freaking work goes into researching and editing and thinking and planning. And, yeah, it's, it's so much. And... Honestly, it's all, it's so worth it when people engage and people interact. And, and I, I actually don't think that, that viewers and subscribers realize how much they mean to creators and how much their engagement and how much their comments and how much they're like them being excited about the content that's being produced makes the creators continue to produce. There's an old idea in, uh, <laughs> in Jewish literature that, that the line goes that more than the cop, more than the cop, wants to suckle the, the the mother cow needs to milk and and the creators really like we want to share and we we want people to be like sh share with us anyhow it's a really it's a really interesting dynamic um and a really interesting relationship and yeah i i i'm not like the type to get emotional and stuff but i really <laughs> i really appreciate i really appreciate this whole journey this whole this whole like it's been a year actually now almost of me like creating content and putting online and it was a huge for me to get over to like wow i mean anyone who's put their face on the internet you know river you know this of like getting out there and like the, the vulnerability that that takes and it's like it's so scary it's so scary initially until you do it uh i'm so glad that people dig it but uh, <laughs> to be honest, I'm gonna make this whole conversation about like about like me being soppy and emotional. I'm gonna <laughs> finish the book. So let's get back to it. Am I throwing it at you? Throwing? No, you're letting me hear. <laughs> Yes, let's get back to the book. That's what the crowd, the people have spoken. And I have popcorn. <laughs> Thank you to Alyssa for being the best host ever. For being the best live audience. She makes me sushi and popcorn and thumbnails. Alyssa, you're the bomb. Thank you. Here's a popcorn. <laughs> okay. This is such a popcorn. What did you put on it? Hogs. Okay. Back to the book. I wish I could like pass this popcorn through the camera because it is so ridiculously good. I've never tasted such a good popcorn in my entire life. Is this even kosher? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> okay. I shall remain by this river, thought Siddhartha. It is the same one that I had walked across on my way to the child people. This river is very symbolic for him. It's the same river which he came back. At that time, a ferry riverman took me across. I shall go to him. From this hut, my path once led me to a new life, which has now grown old and has died. Let my present path to my present new life take its new start here. Yeah, bro. That's what we're doing, man. Show them we're, we're sifting the chaff and the wheat. That's what we're doing. He looked tenderly into the... He looked... Tenderly into the flowing river. Into the transparent green, into the crystalline lines of spirit's design. He saw bright pearls rising from its quiet air floating on the surface with the blue of the sky depicted in them. With a thousand eyes, the river looked at him with green ones, with white ones, with crystal ones, with blue, with sky blue ones. 
How he loved that water. How it delighted him. How grateful he was to it. In his heart, he heard the voice speak. The newly awakened one and said to it, love this water, remain by it, learn from it. Oh yes, he wanted to learn from it. He wanted to listen to it. Whoever understood the water and its secrets he felt would also understood much more. Many seek all secrets. I like this idea of him learning from new places, learning from, from Buddha, learning from lovers, learning from the water. Do you want popcorn, by the way, Alyssa? Mm -hmm. You have to. Take a ball. Like, don't the whole ball. I'll come back. All right. So but today, all of the secrets of the river. Shout out to River. <laughs> Nimitin, you have the coolest name, bro. River. The story's about you. But today, all the secrets of the river, he saw just one which gripped his soul. He saw his water fl um, flowed and flowed, and, and it kept on flowing, and yet it was always the same, and at all times the same. And yet at every moment, oh, if he could only grasp that, understand that, he did not understand or grasp it. He merely felt the stirrings of a premonition, a distant recollection, divine voices. Um... This is a shout out, I think, kind of to who was the Greek philosopher, Hercleides, who talked about the, the river, how it's always the same. You, every time you step in, you never step into the same river twice. Whatever. <laughs> Siddhartha rose. The pains of hunger in his body became unbearable. In its toils, he walked onwards up to the path along the river, upstream, listening to the current, listening to the growling hunger in his body. He didn't have popcorn like we have. When he reached the ferry, the boat was just in readiness. And the same ferryman who had once taken the young Samana Kriva was standing by the boat. Siddhartha recognized him. He too had aged greatly. Will you take me across? He asked. The ferryman, astonished to see such an elegant man alone and on foot, took him into the boat and shoved off. You have chosen a fine life. The passenger said, it must be beautiful, the passenger being Siddhartha, it must be beautiful to live by this water every day and to travel on it. The oarsman rocked to and fro, smiling. It, it is beautiful, sir. It is just as you say, but it is not every life. It is not every, but, oh, get this line right here now. I'm going to read, I'm going to back up a little. You have chosen a fine... We just hit the eight-hour mark. <laughs> Marathon. You have chosen a fine life. The passenger said, It must be beautiful life to live by this water every day and travel on it. The oarsman rocked to and fro, smiling. It is beautiful, sir, just as you say, but... Is not every life beautiful? And is not every, is not every occupation beautiful? Uh, is not every life beautiful? Is not every occupation beautiful, Alyssa? That may be, but I envy you for yours. Oh, you would soon lose your pleasure in it, for, for it is not in people in five clothes. You, bro, would get very bored of my line of work very quickly. Siddhartha laughed. Earlier today, I was also judged by my clothes and was looked on with disgust. Ferryman, will you accept as a gift from me these clothes, which are a burden to me? For you ought to know, I have no money to pay you for my voyage. You, son, know, I didn't pay you the first time. I'm not going to pay you the next time. Uh, I wonder if Siddhartha is Jewish. <laughs> I can make that joke, right? You... <laughs> <laughs> you are joking, sir, the ferryman laughed. I'm not joking, my friend. Look, once before you took me across the river in this boat with only God repaying you, then do it again today and accept my clothes in exchange. Can you imagine you got on a bus? <laughs> I have no money to pay you, oh, noble bus driver. But take my clothing instead and let me ride naked in your bus. And <laughs> get the next line in the book. I didn't read this. And do you intend to travel on without clothes, sir? <laughs> Classic. 
How many line? How many times have we had that line read to us? Oh, I would like best of all not to travel on. I would like it best of all ferrymen were to give me an old apron and keep me on as your assistant, as your apprentice. Smooth boat, are you still here? We're talking about you right now. For some time, the ferryman looked at the stranger, examining him. Now I recognize you. He finally said, once you slept in that. Long ago, it must have been over 20 years ago, and I took you across the river, and you said goodbye like good friends. Were you not a Samana? I can no longer remember your name. Awkward. <laughs> My name is Arthur. And I was a Samana when you last saw me. Then, welcome, Siddhartha. My name is Vasiduva. Vas Vasiduva. I hope you will be my guest today, too, and sleep in my hut. Tell me where you are coming from and why your beautiful clothes are such a burden to you. Word. Okay, let's read the comments. Joseph at Adam, it sounds contradictory to say uh, similar can be dissimilar. I don't think I get your meaning. Would you elucidate? We got some elucidation to do on the similarity of dissimilarity and similarity of dissimilarity. Okay, I don't know how many of you guys are into, uh, guys or girls are into like postmodernism, but there's a really cool postmodern scholar alive today. I would love to schmooze with him. His name is Elliot Wolfson. He, he talks a lot in the context of Jewish mysticism of like the similarity of dissimilarity and dissimilarity of similarity. Very trippy. He's written some cool works. I read one of Toby's books. Very difficult, but very fun. Uh, at Joseph, well, a chair is similar to a stool, but different from a stool. True. <laughs> Her Clytus. That's the man I was looking for. Thank you. An apple is different from a pear, but also similar to a pear. That's also true. And that, that about pairs was similar to the chair and stool statement, but also different from the chair and stool statement. But all of them are anatomical. Philosophers for thousands of years are pointing at apples. <laughs> you have to explain what you mean pointing at apples. I don't know any philosophers that have pointed at apples besides for Bishop Berkeley, who's very interested in apples and uh, the qualia of sound. And yes, Live audience. Adam says, not the mind. The mind is relative and constantly evolving entity. Cool. The object of the mind do not. Okay. Uh, I think I get your meaning. You mean that different things can be similar conceptually, but different in essence? Isaac Newton and the apple. True. He if he had an apple, for, never happened. Okay. I feel like this little conversation here, it's like, you guys are having your own conversation, having fun without me. So you guys, you do you, I'll do me. I'm going to continue reading and eating popcorn. Sababa. All right. I'm so good. I, can I, if you guys send me your mailing address, I will send you some of this popcorn because it is to die for. And not just in like the mystical, like Siddhartha, and, I mean, actually die for. Okay. Let's go on. Do we have any more subscribers? Are we still drinking or are we finished drinking? We need more subscribers. We need more drinking. Guys. Yala. Okay. Let's continue reading. Okay. They had reached the middle of the river. And Vasuveda began to row more rigorously. Oh, yeah. To cope with the current. He worked calmly. His eyes on the bow with powerful arms. Siddharth, Siddhartha sat and watched him, recalling that even in the past, on the last day of his life as a Samana, love for that man had stirred in his heart. He gracefully accepted Vasavu's invitation. When they reached the bank, he helped him pay the boat to the post. When the ferryman asked him to enter the hut and offer him bread and wine, Siddhartha ate with pleasure and also ate with pleasure the mangoes. Damn mangoes. Do we have any more mango? Yeah. We do? Yeah. Damn, can we get some? <laughs> that vi that Visnuda offered him. Um, also, um, can we make a thumbnail for this video so we can post it as soon as... What thumbnail? 
Oh yeah, for sure. we have a thumbnail already. Yo, you're you're ahead of the game. Afterwards, he sat down on a tree bank. It was getting on towards sunset, and Siddhartha told the ferryman about his family and his life as he had seen it before his eyes that very day in that hour of despair. His story lasted deep into the night, much like our reading of Siddhartha, which is going, it's right now 2 a.m., it's deep into the night by any estimation. But we're almost at the end. Fear not. Uh, Vas, I'm having trouble with this guy's name. Vas, Vas, Vasu, Vasu, Vasudeva? Vasudeva? V-A-S-U-D-E-V-A. Can I just call him Vas for short? Cool. Were you cool with that? Vas listened most intently. As he listened, he absorbed it all, family and childhood, all the learning, all the seeking, all the joy, all the distress. Among the ferryman's virtues was this one of the greatest. He knew how to listen as only few people do. Guys and girls, listening is a forgotten art. Learn to listen. Something which I'm working on. I'm trying to be a better listener. For real. Though Vass, that's his nickname because we're like on that like buddy buddy, you know, kind of relationship with him right now. Though Vass said not a word, the speaker felt that he was hearing that he was that he was talking in his words, quietly, openly, expectantly. He was not losing one of them. He was not. He was not awaiting them impatiently. He was not assigning praise or blame. He wasn't judging what he was hearing, but he was merely listening. I'm, I'm such a fan of this. I know people in my life that are, that, are, that are like superb listeners, and it's such a gift. It's such a gift. Wow. Siddhartha realized what a great good fortune it is to confess, to confess oneself to a listener like that. Yeah. If you know anyone in your life that's, that's a solid 10 as a listener, don't take them for, don't take them for granted. And, and yeah, super to confide one's own life into his heart, one's own questioning, his own suffering, to be able to express your suffering, your, your and to have someone really listen and really hear you. What a gift. What a blessing. I mean, people pay for that kind of stuff. A good friend, a good friend, someone who can actually just listen and not judge and not like need to interrupt. The live audience agrees. But towards the end of Siddhartha's narrative, when he spoke about the river by the tree and his deep plunge about the sacred Om, about how after his slumber he had felt such a great love for the river, the ferryman listened with redoubled attentiveness. With total and complete devotion, his eyes closed. That's a move. Close your eyes and just listen so deep. You know what? I heard I heard this line that someone told me he knew someone that would that knew how to listen so powerfully that their capacity of listening would make people cry. You couldn't imagine you were just talking and the person that you're talking to is listening so deeply that you just makes you cry. It's real. It's 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 like a psychic power and it's like you, we could do that if we just work on it. If we just really care about the other person and really open ourselves up to hear that deeply, presently. No judgment. No. I'm, I'm big on this. Okay. Uh, comments? Let's see. Um, my manager said for. Shots slashes comes away from thousands. So invite your friends. We're gonna hear the end of this book as slow as possible. <laughs> I second that. Uh, we're sixteen shot sixteen shots in. Wow, I'm doing well for sixteen shots in. Thank you. Um, live stream auto posts. Lol. Okay. Yep. That's gonna happen. Uh, not exactly. You asked why things have to be differentiated. Okay, that's a previous conversation. I think this means bright or I think this means bright or bef or bent finishing God. For my knowledge of Sanskrit. Which word means bright or beneficial? I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Hey. Oh, Vasudeva. Okay. Oh, Deva as in, as in, as deity, Vasu as in. Okay. So you're saying I shouldn't just call him a nickname. I should do, I should really call him his whole name. We got a love heart from Shalom. Return the love. I think it was a Picurious who said friendships always dance. Friendships goes dancing around the world, calling us to wake it up. 
up to happiness. That's a cool line. I feel like Rumi. It's like it's like a Rumi-ish thing to say. I cried during this stream multiple times, shamelessly. Bro, that is so that is so tight that you cried. Uh, respect. I'm like, to be honest, man. I'm like quite like detached from my emotions, and I don't cry that easily. It takes a lot to make me cry, and I cherish the moments I can cry, and I really appreciate that you were able to cry. Yo, thank you so much, and thanks for thanks for feeling like brave enough to share that. That's that's so freaking cool. That's really freaking cool. Wow, I'm I'm curious to know like what it was that made you cry during the stream. If you're if you want to share, please please do. That would be so epic. Um, attention is really a gift. Super super gift. Joseph says friendship goes dancing. Oh, <laughs> friendship goes dancing around the world, proclaiming to us to wake up to the praise of happiness. Tight. That's really tight. Yo, cheers to all you guys. I'm not an alcoholic, I promise. Okay. Where are we? He closed his eyes. Okay, back to where we are. Yeah, man. Take your time. Feel, feel comfortable. No pressure. But when Siddhartha ended and a long silence had ensued, Um, Vasu, Vasudeva, bless you, said, It is just as I thought. The river spoke to you. Tight. And it is a friend to you, too. It speaks to you, too. That is good. That is very good. Stay with me, Siddhartha, my friend. I once had a wife. Her bed was next to mine, but she died long ago, and I died, and I live, and I long lived alone. Now live with me. There is room and food for both. <sighs> so sweet. Thank you, said Siddhartha. I thank you and I accept. And I also thank you, um, Vasudeva, for listening to me so well. It is a rare person who knows how to listen. And I've never met anyone who could do it as well as you. There is another area in which I should learn from you. You will learn it, said Vasudeva, but not from me. The river taught me to listen. Oh my God. Oh my God, guys. The river taught me how to listen and you will learn from it too. It knows everything, the river. A person can learn everything from it. Look, you have already learned this too from the water. It is good to make your way downwards, to move lower, to seek the depths. Get low, seek the depths, move down. The wealthy aristocratic Siddhartha is becoming a hired oarsman. The learned Brahmin Siddhartha is becoming a ferryman. That too was told to you by the river. You will learn the rest from it as well. The river flows down. We got, got, we got to flow down. We can learn so much from a river. So much. When was the last time? Honestly, honestly, when was the last time either of us sat by a river? Any of us, you guys too, sat by a river and just listened to the river and, and, and asked... Teach us. What do we have to learn from you? When was the last time I was by your river? I was by the Canary. So I camped on the Canary. But it was ages ago. Let's go back to a river. Hey, let's go camping by a river. And, and like, just really listen to the freaking river. River. Oh. <laughs> just as... The Nematon, his name is River. His, his freaking name is River. <laughs> he did it when he was a kid. The River went down to the river to listen to the river, to learn what the river had to say, to teach River. You're a G, man. You're a freaking River. I want to sit by you, River, and learn the ways of the river. Let's all right now make a resolution. In Hebrew, we call it a hachlata, to go and sit by a river. Sit, sit for an hour, two hours, three hours, and just listen to the freaking river. And say, teach us. Teach me a river. Wash me clean. What's that song? How does it go? Take me to the river. Such a nice song. We'll play that soon. Um, 
Adam says, oh, you guys are still going at it. I'm not getting involved in this conversation. Okay, let's continue. Siddhartha said after a long pause, what is the rest, um, Vasuveda? Vasuveda arose. It has grown late, he said. Let us go to bed. I cannot tell you the rest, oh friend. I cannot tell you the rest, oh friend. You will learn it. Perhaps you already know it. Look, I am no scholar. I do not understand how to speak, nor do I understand how to think. All I know how to do is listen. Bro, you got, you got it in spades. Listen for days. And to be pious more than I've ever learned. If I could say it and teach it, perhaps I would be a sage. But as it is, I'm only a ferryman. And my task is to take people across the river. I've taken many across, thousands. And all of them, my river has meant... And for them, my river has meant nothing but an obstacle in their travels. My river. My river has meant nothing to them but an obstacle in their travels. They were traveling for money and on business to a wedding, a pilgrimage, and the river was in their way. And the ferryman only existed to take them past that obstacle quickly. For some amongst those thousands, however, not just a few four or five, the river ceased to be an obstacle. They heard its voice. They listened to it. And the river, and the river became holy for them. As it has become for me, let us now seek repose, Siddharth. There are so many like obstacles in our lives that like they're trying to just get over. And if we can pay attention to those obstacles and listen to them, those obstacles can become holy for us and they can teach us and they can nourish us if we can only listen to those obstacles in our lives. Wow, what an idea. What a Vishnu, you did it, bro. What a what a freaking idea. To listen to the obstacles in our lives, to treat them as holy, as teachers, to sit down, to lie down next to our obstacles and listen to them and say, teach me. My, oh, wow. Siddhartha remained with the ferryman and learned how to manipulate the boat. And, uh, and when there was no business at the ferry, he worked with um, Vasuveda, the rice paddy, gathered wood, and picked the fruit and the pisciang tree. The footnotes love explaining like all of these trees, <laughs> like what their exact scientific Latin <laughs> like we care. He it was probably a botanist who wrote these, yeah. He learned how to fashion an oar and learned how to repair the boat and weave baskets, and he was happy over everything he learned, and the days and months sped rapidly by, but more than Vasuveda could teach him, the river taught him. He never stopped learning from it. Above all, it taught him how to listen. To listen to a quiet heart with an open, expectant soul without passion, without, without judging, without forming an opinion. He lived along this like a friend, and at times they exchanged words with one. <laughs> at times they exchanged words with one another. They didn't need to speak the whole time. They could be in silence. And at times they exchanged words with one another. Few, words few in number, but maturely considered. Vasuveda was no... Get this line. Vasuva was no friend of words. Siddhartha rarely succeeded in inducing him to speech. He was no, he was no friend of words. <laughs> On one occasion, he asked him, have you too learnt the secret from the river? That there is no... Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Have you... Okay, it says on one occasion she asked him. I don't know who he is and who him is, but it doesn't matter. Do we just get a new subscriber? What number are we? Nine and seven. Nine and seven? Yeah. Oh my god, we're three away. <laughs> okay, shots to that and shots to this next line that we're about to read, which is a killer line. L'chaim to you all. I haven't read your comments yet. I apologize. I'll be with you in a second once I finish this paragraph. So, 
um, on one occasion, he asked him, who is he? Who's him? Who cares? Have you two learned that secret from the river? That there is no such thing as time. There's no such thing as time. Word. A bright smile appeared up Master Vader's face. Yes, Siddhartha, he said. Surely this is what you really mean. That the river is everywhere at once. At its source, at its mouth, at the waterfall, at the ferry, at the rapids, at the sea, in the mountains, everywhere. And it possesses only a present without any shadow of a future. That is it, says Siddhartha. Ah. Uh, uh, let's catch up with the comments here. Lots of good songs about rivers, yeah. Let's make, yo, let's make a river playlist and then share it with everyone that was in this group chat. Um, that's a tight move. Once I had the most beautiful vision of sparkling light on rippling flowing water, I sat there and in that moment it was the whole world. I was almost pulled into the wood because of its beauty to life. 997, Sean. Joseph, bro. Oh, that's 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 a beautiful moment and you experienced it like for all of us and i hope we all get to like share in that experience and and not just rivers mountains and valleys and people and cats and dogs and trees so much so i want to I, I actually want to like use a profane word to explain to like express how strong they feel about this but so much freaking beauty in all of those things just just waiting for us to come and appreciate it waiting for us to come and and and, and see and listen to its beauty what a gift what a freaking gift okay yes siddhartha he said did I take my shelf for 997? Yeah. We we did drink? You can take one if you want, but yeah, you drink. Okay, good. As long as as long as someone's keeping tabs. The wolves need to rest together with the lamb if they have the potential. So do we. Mm -hmm. Word. You know by the way, my name, Zevi. Zev means wolf. <laughs> the gematria of Zev is 10. Whatever. 10. Ten. It's a full number. It's, it's mushlam. It's complete. Mm -hmm. I don't feel complete, though. I feel like... <laughs> yeah. This is not like a therapy, therapy session. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> On the internet for the whole world. <laughs> Forever. Zabi's therapy. Mm -hmm. Life therapy. Tzvi. Tzvi. Zav. <laughs> okay. Yes, Siddhartha, he said. Surely, this is what you really mean, that the river is everywhere at once, at its source, at its mouth, at the waterfalls, at the ferries, at the eddies, at the rapids, at the river, at the sea, and the mountains. Everywhere at the same time, it possesses only a present without any shadow or future. There's no future, people. There is only the present. That is... Pardon me. That is it, said Siddhartha. Yeah. Joseph, I agree with you. And on that note, I want to take a moment to open up our ears the world around us. Wow. Okay. That is it, said Siddhartha. And when I heard that, I looked at my life and it... and. Ugh, ugh, get this paragraph, guys. Guys and girls. That is it, said Siddhartha. And when... Yeah, bro, the world, the world opens it, the world shows itself to us in silence. That is it, Siddhartha. And when I learned that, I looked at my life, and it too was a river. I looked at my life, and it too was a river. And Siddhartha the boy was separated from Siddhartha the man, and from Siddhartha the old man merely by shadows, not by anything real. No. But Siddhartha 
Siddhartha's prior Siddhartha's prior births did not constitute a past, and his death and his return to Brahman were not a future. There was nothing. There will be nothing. Everything is. Everything has substantiality and presence. Everything is like this piece of popcorn which I'm about to eat. Siddhartha spoke with rapture. This enlightenment had given him profound happiness. Oh, was not all suffering? T was oh my, oh my, Hessa, bro, you did it, man. Get, can you get this? Siddhartha's rapture. This enlightenment had given him profound happiness. Oh, was not all suffering time then? Were not all self were not all self torture and self fearing time? Was not was not everything difficult? Everything hostile done away with and conquered as soon as as soon as you had conquered time, as soon as you could think away time. Had spoken in rapture. Asaveda beamed and smiled at him, nodding in confirmation. He nodded silently, stroked Siddhartha's so shoulder, and turned back to his work. Should we read that paragraph again? Siddhartha spoke with rapture. His enlightenment had given him found happiness. Oh, was not all suffering time. Were not all self-torture and self-fearing time. Was not everything difficult, everything hostile in the world done away with and conquered as soon as you had conquered time? As soon as you could think away time, he had spoken in rapture. But Vasaveda beamed and smiled at him, nodding in confirmation. He nodded silently, stroked Sir, and turned back to his work. Do you think Shimon's still here? Is Shimon still here? Shimon left us hours ago. What kind of a friend are you, Shimon? I thought you'd stay with the long haul. <laughs> I'm, I'm messing. Shimon is a working man. He's up in the morning. He's painting houses. Respect. New comments. Don't we have a conception of linear time in Judaism, though? Adam, great question. I, okay. Judaism is a big beast. There isn't, there's like, Judaism is like, there's a lot. It's a complex thing. I, I think that, there, there are like thoughts in Judaism which have a perspective. I think there are conceptions of time within Judaism, classical, medieval, contemporary, which are cyclical, uh, which are which are spherical. Is that a word? Um, I I also have my own theory in Judaism that um, that Judaism actually has a theory of time, which totally negates past and future and there's only the present i think it's very well based in jewish classical sources the town for example says which in aramaic um the past is no longer the future is yet to come and the present is just a blink of an eye from whence arises um suffering and and worry and anxiety so which is even a, which is a very radical philosophy of time that that there's no past, present, or future. There's no time conquering, really conquering time. Very interesting idea. Um, and I think in Judaism, in general, we talk about creation as being as being present. That God continually created. Kabbalah is full of that. That the, that creation is now, 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 now is when God creates the world. And I think that's instantiated in contemporary physics and quantum physics. I'm not a scientist, so. Back that up, but that's my intuition. And and all, all mystical traditions believe that that's to be the case, that creation is perpetual and now in, in the moment, because there only is the eternal now and this and that revelation is also in the now, that that when the Torah is given to Mount Sinai, it is Hayom, it is today. And today means today, not today, two thousand years, it means today in twenty twenty, and today every day is today, the new day. And uh the, the Talmud says, for example, that that every single day we have to look, we have to see the redemption from Egypt. That 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 we left Egypt today. We got the Torah today, and it says not just not just like today, 
but mom khadashi mamish like literally today that today is when creation happens today is when revelation happens today is when redemption happens um so i don't think judaism strictly has a linear perspective of time how can anything proceed from a beginninglessness and an endlessness present wow we're getting really deep right here um Okay, so I think there's like two. I'll I'll try I'll try and briefly touch upon this question and then get back to the reading. Um, I think there's like two sort of paradigms of, of reality, and they, they have two different con conceptualizations of time. How many shall I be in Alyssa? Seventeen, and I'm still like talking about philosophy of time. Respect. <laughs> so wait. There's a new comment there, but let me let me answer the old one first. I think there's two conceptualizations of time. There's time where there is progression and that's important, and there's 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 progression, and there's development, as there's progression both ethically and, and morally and societally and culturally, and we move towards a better day. And that's one conception of time, which has a sense of direction and, and linearity to it in some sense which has a beginning and an end. And simultaneously, there's time as endless and, and as beginningless and endless. Like we talk about God as the ain't soft, the one with no end. Um, and that's, that's the real reality, of course. Um, and, and, and somewhere between the merger of those two, between reality in the transience and in progress and in the development and, and simultaneously uh, eternal moment, in that balance is where is where the truth resides. In Buddhism, we call this like a two a two truth doctrine. Uh, in Judaism, we talk about like the, the difference between uh, the weekday and Shabbat, where a weekday is about progress and about achieving and about fixing, and Shabbat is perfect. There's nothing to fix. There's nothing to to correct. It's like it's it is is perfect. There's no time. Shabbos is like is like is beyond time, literally, in in Jewish classical sources. And that constant, that constant like duality and struggle between the two is, is so fascinating between time and time, timeliness. We're going to have to do it. We're, we're definitely going to have to dedicate like a separate. You're in eight and a half hours. This is so epic. We could like talk eight and a half hours just about time. And like that dichotomy of, of, of time. But we have some news here. Um, do you think that um, Mitzvah's been on a very from Judaism applied to Jews and not Jews equally. Schellenberg, you're all over the place, man. You're like just shooting like here and there. Let me just translate for the non Jew audience because um, I don't think like everyone here is Jewish, which is totally cool. Um, mitzvahs ben Adam Lachaver means um, interpersonal commandments as opposed to ben Adam which is like between God and human. Do they apply to Jews and non Jews equally? Yeah, man. Like being Adam Lechavere is about like a human and his fellow, and fellow means Jew and non-Jew. Like I, I'm pretty. I think that's pretty easy. Yeah, we're talking about ethics, like basic ethics. That's what being Adam Lechavere means. But Sean, <laughs> let's have this conversation in a different way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. Where were we? Hello, where were we here? Okay. And on another occasion. Yeah, I'm with you, man. When the river ran high. Oh, uh, uh, oh, wow. People be commenting. Let's, let's, let's. Should I, should I read, then respond, or respond, then read? Respond, okay. Do you think if you played close attention, if you played close, you could perceive which tribe of Israel oh, oh, perceive which tribe of Israel a given Jew is like the Shvatim like the 12th tribe uh, okay that's Adam um, Joseph says but isn't everything in an endless and beginningless present forever held on, on this moment if so nothing could become nothing could become or could be conceived of in all our conceptions would be nullified whoa you guys are giving me a run for my money okay I just wanted to read a book, and you guys got all metaphysical on me. 
I'm totally messing. I, I, I love this talk. Okay, so numero uno, in terms of the 12 tribes, there is an idea that the, uh, the mess when he comes, we'll be able to smell out who belongs to which tribe and we'll identify people by the tribes, which is by perennial um, descent, not by maternal. Now, I have a very good sense of smell, but um, I have yet to refine my personal sense of smell to tribal affiliation. But this is a weird, there's a, there's a whole weird discussion in the Zohar about about the Messiah, about Mashiach, and about how Mashiach is an individual and yet is the collective. We, we're all the Mashiach, and somehow we can sense the Mashiach uh, in, inside of ourselves. <laughs> this is a weird conversation. I don't know how we got on to talking about 12 tribes and, and, and smelling out who's from whose tribe. Super random. Um, who even asked that? Adam, Adam bro. <laughs> um, bless you. Adam, I have another question back to you. Do you feel like you could smell out who's from the tribe of whose tribes? Okay, now next question. I, I, I don't mean to be rude and not answering questions, but these are very difficult questions. And I don't want to like come up here and like make pretentious claims that I could smell out tribes. Um, now, Joseph's question is an interesting question. In that boundless moment, so nothing could become conceived of. So, Joseph, like this. Um, from my brief study of mysticism, from my very scant exploration and reading, it seems to me that across the board in, in mystical traditions, and this gives it some sort of um, backing up and some sort of veracity. There seems to be a dual reality in mystical traditions where there's two truths. There's there's a truth, there's an upper truth and a lower truth, or an inner truth and an outer truth. Um, and and those and that represents in this context would be the eternal and the temporal, the being and becoming. And both of those are true, and neither of them impinges upon one another. So it takes true sanity, by the way, is being able to bear the paradox of these dual truths. Of on the one hand, everything is perfect. On the one hand, everything needs to become perfect. On the one hand, everything is eternal. On the other hand, it is temporal, and we're moving towards something. On the one hand, everything is being and only being, ever can be and will be and w being other hand we're becoming and we're evolving and we're like a chrysalis becoming a butterfly it's it's an, it's it's a paradox which makes no sense granted granted on class western logic it makes no sense but intuitively we know this to be true we know this to be true so deeply where things are so perfect and right in every moment and yet so flawed and so lacking and so need becoming so I think we have to step away from Western logic and embrace that intuitive feeling. Um, that's, I think, I think, yeah. Let's let's have a full conversation about this at, at another time. We have a new, maybe not smell out, but I feel as if one could possibly perceive such a thing if they were able to perceive it with enough intensity. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like negating that possibility. It's like for real humans, the the capacity of the human is endless. I'm a big fan of Russell Brand, a contemporary mystic. I think, <laughs> interesting dude, and uh, he has this famous like the human in terms of our all five senses are so limited. Like we we see vision between between like we don't see ultraviolet. We don't see all the other end of the spectrum. We just see a tiny little spectrum of the vision of light. We hear. We don't like dogs for more other animals hear less and we just hear like a tiny little fraction of that we're so limited in our perception and like say to say that oh no it would be impossible to smell someone's lineage it's so presumptuous and so arrogant like we have no idea what humans are capable of like let's 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 get real for a second we're, we're like okay and on that note we hit 999 subscribers 98 subscribers and Alyssa said drink and on that note, we will drink. It's your old shot. Alyssa's complaining, finishing my shots. So I will show you that the shot is finished. Yeah. 
Cheers. Chaim, Adam. Yo, Adam, do I... I know you from a straight from Melbourne, right? I'm not confusing with a different Adam. Is that right? Okay. While Adam responds, we will. What's that? What are you? What are you? What are you showing? We did a thousand. No. What? What are you showing? Nine ninety nine. We hit it. We got another subscriber. Nine ninety nine. I just drank for nine ninety eight. We got nine ninety nine ready. All right. Post up in the chat so people know what I'm doing. Thank you. And the official news is that we have hit 999. We never met. Huh. Wow. I feel like I met you. Um, yeah. To goodness, to lastness. To to listening to rivers to presence direction to peace to love okay. <laughs> you're killing me. Yeah, I'm glad we got a single malt. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yikes, okay. And on another occasion, when the river <laughs> when the river ran high, the rainy season, and roared mightily, Siddhartha said, Is it not true, O friend? The river has many voices, so many voices. Does it not have the voice of a king, and of a warrior, and of a bull? A bird? And of a woman in labor. Oh my gosh. We hit it? <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> huh? So the news is that we hit. The, the news is that we hit a thousand subscribers. Which is very cool. Which is very. Which is very cool. Yeah, go for it. Pop that. Yours? I don't know. Check it in. Good chuck. <laughs> I picked up this streamer thing for a thousand subscribers. <laughs> I've never done one of these things before. There's instructions. Yeah. You're supposed to rotate it by the arrow. Now you have to take something off the top first. No, I don't think so. You just. Yeah. You take this off? Yeah. Instructions. Step one remove the barrier paper on the top. We should have really read the instructions before this. <laughs> okay. Step two, hold tightly with with the left hand. Turn this part with the right hand. Are you ready? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh wow, that was so loud! Did you get a video of that? That was so cool. That was so freaking cool. Wow. Nice. I hope you guys saw that on the camera. That was so loud. Yo, let's get a video of that next time. <laughs> L'chaim to a thousand subscribers. I have confetti in my L'chaim. Look at that. Way to freaking go. Ha. Huh. At, at 3 a.m. <laughs> Eight, almost nine hours in. How much is left? Okay. What a moment. I'm covered in Betty now. Look at this. <laughs> Amazing. That was so loud. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Whew. Okay. Feel free to post up on socials about that. We should. How, how did you not get a video of that? <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to pop that again. Okay. Yo, Shmuel Ben Hashem is here. We haven't seen you yet in the vid. So welcome in. L'chaim, thanks for joining us for this uh, hot moment. <sighs> nice. Cool. 
And on another occasion, when the river ran high in the rainy season and roared mightily, Siddhartha said, isn't it true, or friend, the river has many voices, so very many voices. Does it not have the voice of a king and of a warrior and of a bull, bless you, and of a night bird and of a woman in labor, of a man singing and a thousand other voices as well? Is so, Vasudeva nodded, the, the voices of all creatures are in its voice. And do you know, um, Siddhartha continued, that word it speaks when you succeed in hearing it in its 10,000 voices at once. Visveda, Visveda's face laughed happily. He leaned over to Siddhartha and pronounced the sacred, and pronounced the sacred Om in his ear. And it was precisely that which Siddhartha had heard also. And from one occasion to another, his smile became more like the ferryman's, became nearly as radiant, nearly as glowing with happiness, just as just as beaming from a thousand little wrinkles, just as childlike. Just as similar to an old man, just as, just as just often in the evening, they sat together by the riverbank on the tree trunk in silence, both listening to the water, which was not water to them, but the voice of life, the voice of being, of eternal becoming. And it occurred at times that when hearing the river, both of them thought of the same thing and of a conversation they had two days earlier of one of their passengers whose face and destiny occupied their minds <sighs> of death of the childhood of such times when the river had told them something good they would look at each other simultaneously both thinking exactly the same thing both made happy by the identical answer to the identical question something emanated from the something emanated from the ferry and the two ferrymen that many of the passengers perceived it occurred at times that after a passenger had looked into the face of one of the ferrymen, he began to recount his life. He recounted his sorrows, confessed ill deeds, sought consolation and advice. It occurred at times that one of them asked permission to spread an, to spend an evening with them in order to listen to the river. It also occurred that curiosity that curiosity that that curiosity seeker showed up who had been told that two sages or sorcerers or saints lived at that ferry. These inquisitive people posed many questions but received no answers. And they found neither sorcerers nor sages, they found merely two friendly little old men who seemed to be mute and somewhat peculiar and simple-minded. And the inquisitive people laughed and amused themselves over the foolishness and the gullible ways of the common people spread across such rumors. The years went by, and no one counted them. Then one day, monks came wandering by. Adherents of Gautama the Buddha, they asked to be taken across the river, and from them the ferrymen learned that they were making an urgent journey back to their great ship because the spread that the sublime one was mortally ill and would soon die his final death in order to enter the state of salvation. Not, not long after that, another group of monks came by and then another, and the monks as well as the other travelers and wanderers spoke of nothing but Gautama and his impending death. And just as on the occasion of a military expedition or coronation people pour in from every direction and every side and swarm like ants in like fashion as if drawn by a magic spell they thronged the place where the great buddha awakened awaited his death there the tremendous event was to take place and the great perfect one of the age was to enter into glory At that time, Arthur frequently recalled the dying sage, the great teacher, whose voice had, had admonished nations and awakened hundreds of thousands, whose voice he too had once heard, whose holy countenance too he once looked upon with respect, 
He recalled him in a friendly way, saw his path before his eyes, and smiling, smilingly recollected the words that as a young man he had once addressed to him, the sublime one. It seemed now to him that they had been prideful and precocious words. He recollected them with a smile for some time. He had known that he was no longer separate from her. Even though he had been unable to accept his doctrine, no, the true one who truly wished to find, could accept no drug. No. But the man who was found, what he sought, such a man could approve of every doctrine. Each and every one, every path, every goal, nothing separated from him, nothing separated from him any longer from all those thousands of others who lived in eternal, who breathed the divine. Those days when so, when so many of so many were journeying to the dying Buddha, um, Kamala too journeyed this way. She, t she, who was formerly the most beautiful of courtesans, for some time she had retired in previous life. She had given her garden to Gautama's monks. She had taken refuge in the law and was one of the friends and and ben and beneficiaries benefactories of the journeying monks together with the boy Siddhartha her son upon hearing the news of Gautama's impending death she set, she set out in the simple dress on foot she and her young son which is Siddhartha were accompanying work were journeying upon the river the boy had soon grown tired he he wanted to go back home he wanted to rest he wanted to eat he became defeat and Quarrelous. Good word. Kumala had stopped, had to stop and rest with him frequently. He was accustomed to his way, and when she and and where she was concerned, she had to feed him, had to console him, had to scold him. He failed. Failed to understand why he and his mother had to undertake that laborious and sad journey to an unfamiliar place, to a man he did not know, to a man who was holy, who lay dying. Let him die. What, is, what was he to that boy? Let the Buddha die. <laughs> yeah, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? I'll be. I'm surprised if I get to the end of this book. I'm, I'm kind of. I'm. I'm kind of slashed. To be honest, I'm. I'm sixty pages out of out of eighty pages. Sixty out of eighty. I'm. I'm, I'm pretty slashed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this was a bad idea. <laughs> Whose idea was this? Yours. <laughs> it was my idea. <laughs> when the travelers were not far from Vasavedas Ferry. I, 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 I can't see these letters anymore. <laughs> these letters are all over the place. Little Siddhartha once more pleaded with his mother to take a rest. Little, hello, little, it's Siddhartha's baby boy. It's little, it's little Siddhartha. Oh my God. Okay, I have to read this. Okay. Once more pleased with his mother, to, once more pleaded with his mother to take a rest. She too, Kalama was tired. And while the boy chewed on a banana, I think that's what it means. Pl pl Plantain. Pla What's a plantain? It's like a banana. A banana, right? It's, it's, it's kind of like a banana. It's, it's close it's enough. It's do we have? You do, can I have some mango? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, are you, you going to be the one that gets the pit? She crouched on the sh Wait, she crouched on the ground, closed her eyes a little and rested. But suddenly she uttered a lamenting cry. The boy looked at her in alarm. And saw her face pale with horror. Out from under her dress escaped what? A little black snake by which Kalama had been bitten. 
Oh my god. <sighs> now they both run hardly along the path in order to reach other people. Okay, one second. <laughs> Sorry. I, I need to use the bottom. Give me a second. I'll be back. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. Listen, I'm finished. I can't. I can't anymore. Yeah. Fucking, I'm done. Let's finish. Yeah, I'm done. I'm finished. No, yeah, I can make it up. Listen, I'm fucking, I'm done. Yeah. Welcome to Travis. Oh, 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 I need, I need to listen to this. <laughs> No, yes, I'm finished. I'm finished. I'm shopping at Spadego for you. Well, you have to be professional. You have to have a subscriber. I have to be professional? Yeah. This is... So <laughs> um, okay. Who's still here? Okay. I okay. I have to be honest. I'm I'm so done. Like I, I've I've legit reached my limit. And oh, wow, if I can if I can sober up and continue reading, that would be a miracle. But I legit feel like I might just pass out and go to sleep right now. So. Okay, I'm gonna go and like go outside for a minute to get some fresh air, and then I'm gonna come back and continue reading. I'm gonna go outside and get fresh air. I need fresh air. Are you okay? What? Are you okay? No, I'm I can't drink anymore. Don't you don't need to drink anymore. Oh my gosh. Okay. There's the top of that. Okay, um I got some fresh air, that was really cool. <laughs> oh damn. So uh Fernanda says that a quitter is the least we expect from you. Yeah. Wow. Right. Yo, I, I ain't a quitter. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to finish this book. <sighs> okay, you know, you know, like that, you know, that, you know, that moment where like, you've, <laughs> you've drunk too much where like your, like your face and your, like the muscles in your face are like, you know, you know what I'm talking about? 
that's that's where I'm at. And I'm gonna eat some mango, and I'm gonna get back to reading like a boss. <laughs> Fernanda, you you've been here from the very beginning. You've been here for nine freaking hours and i'm gonna finish this for you it's gonna take 10 hours but fernanda i'm gonna finish it <laughs> i can't even eat mango <laughs> so slippery <laughs> yeah no rush man no i got some air it's good this this mango is not so good by the way it's a bit sour it's a bit sour, a bit sour yeah, yeah. It's not ripe. I mean, it's just the beginning of the season. Okay, just an update for all of you hardcore, diehard, loyal fans. <laughs> I love it. I'm eating mango now, and it's like kind of sour. It's kind of, it's actually a nice taste. I, I don't mind this. Like the sourness is nice. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a nice flavor. Rehydrate. Yo, Adam, thank you, bro. You got my back. Cheers. This is this is water. Wow, thank God. Salut. Okay. Okay. <sighs> Fernanda, we're gonna we're gonna finish this book. We got twenty pages left. Okay. Where, 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 where were we at? Okay. This is, this is, hello, this is, um, what's his name? Siddhartha's son. <laughs> I, I have no idea where I left off. I'm just going to start from the top of the page. Okay, where, where on earth are we? Okay. She had set out um, in simple dress on foot. She and her young son winged her along the road. The boy had soon grown tired. He wanted to go back. He wanted to go home. He wanted to rest. He wanted to eat. He became defiant and um, querulous. We read this, okay? He failed to understand why... He and his mother had to undertake the laborious and sad journey to a familiar place to a man he did not know, bless you, a man who was holy and, and who lay dying. Let him die. Let the Buddha die. You know what's kind of funny is that um, in, in Buddhism, there's, there's this idea that the Buddha says, if you meet the Buddha on your path, kill the Buddha. This idea of letting the Buddha die, yeah, because like basically the Buddha is like, it's, about, it's not about him himself, so kill the person. Take the teachings. Mm -hmm. Let let the Buddha die. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of morbid. morbid. Yeah. What was he to that boy? This boy, bro. This this boy's just a kid. What does he What does he know from Buddha? Like Mbatlo, you know what I mean? When the tra travelers were from um, Vasudeva's ferry, little Siddhartha. I love that name, little Siddhartha. He's, he's baby Siddhartha. He's so cute. So cute. <laughs> Can you imagine how good he is, by the way? Because Siddhartha is a hottie. Yeah. And his mom's mom a hottie. Yeah. <sighs> this kid's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Kamala. Uh, little Siddhartha would once more pleaded with his mother to take rest. She too. Kamala was tired out. And while the boy chewed on a banana and while I chewed on a mango. <laughs> <laughs> a mango? <laughs> Do you realize this recording is going to be available to my grandchildren? <laughs> Crazy. She. That's a little Siddhartha. Little Siddhartha. Little, <laughs> little Zervis. She crouched on the ground and closed her eyes a little and rested. But suddenly she uttered a lamenting cry. The boy looked at her and. Yeah, okay, I remember now. The boy looked at her in surprise and saw her face pale with horror. Out from under her dress escaped a little black snake. But. Kamala had been bitten. Yikes, she's gonna die now? <sighs> I really liked Kamala. I don't want her to die now. Now they both now they both now they both hurried along the path in which other people 
and arrived very close to the ferry where Kamala collapsed and was unable to continue on. But the boy raised a piteous cry from time to time, kissing and hugging his mother. Oh, this is sad. And she too aided her loud calls for help to his till the sounds reached the ears of Vasavada, who was standing at the ferry. He ran over quickly, took the woman in his arms and carried her into the boat and ran along with them. Soon they all reached the hut where Siddhartha was sitting by the, by the hearth, engaged in lighting a fire. He looked up and the first thing he saw was the, was the boy's face. Is this his son? Which actually drugged his memory, reminding him of things forgotten. Then he saw Kamala, whom he recognized at once. Although she was lying unconscious in the ferryman's arms, and though he knew that it was his own son whose face had been such a reminder to him, and his heart jumped in his bosom. Kamala's wound was washed, but it was already black, and her body had swelled. Oh, she's going to die. A medical... A medicinal potion was administered to her. She regained consciousness and lay on Siddhartha's bed in the hut. And, 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 and leaned over her stood Siddhartha, who had once loved her so much. It seemed like a dream to her. With a smile, she looked into her friend's face. Only gradually did she take in her situation, remembering the bite, and she recalled, and she called anxiously for, for the boy. He's here with you, don't worry, said Siddhartha. Kamala looked into his eyes. She spoke with a heavy tongue. Kamala looked into his eyes. She spoke heavy. She spoke with a heavy tongue, paralyzed by the poison. You have grown old, dear, he said. You have grown gray, but you look like the young Samana who once came into my garden without clothes, with dusty feet. You look much like him now than you did when you left me and Kamaswami. It is you. It is your eyes that resemble his, Siddhartha. Oh, I have grown old, too old. Did you still recognize me? Siddhartha smiled. I recognize you at once, Kamala, dear. Kamala pointed to her boy, saying, Do you recognize him, too? He's your son. Her eyes started to wander. Closed. Wait, 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 wait. We have someone, someone said something. Can't, why can't morality be a trail of... Mortality. Can you reach it out to me, please? Why can't mortality be a trait of brightest light? Why can't the intensity of the light of our existence be greatest in life? These fleeting moments are the limits of profoundest death to me. To me. Rejoicing now is rejoicing forever and ever to me. Yeah. Just rejoicing now is rejoicing forever. Rejoice. And close. The boy wept. Siddharth took him on his knees and let him weep. He stroked his hair and at the sight of the child's face, he recalled a Brahmanic prayer once low and he himself was a little boy. Slowly in a chanting voice, he began to say it and the words came rushing forth to him from the past and from his childhood. And as he chanted, the boy grew calm and gave just a few more sobs at moments and fell asleep. Siddhartha placed him on Vasuveda's bed. Vasuveda stood at the hearth cooking rice. Rice? For the show? <laughs> Siddhartha threw him a glance and he returned with a smile. She's going to die, Siddhartha said softly. Vasuveda nodded. The fire light from the heat flickered over his friendly face. Again, Kamala regained consciousness. Her face was distorted by pain. Siddhartha's eyes read the suffering on her lips and her pallid cheeks. He read it quietly, attentively, expecting. Absorbing in her suffering, Kamala felt it. Her eyes sought this. Her eyes sought his. Looking at him, she said, Now I see your eyes have changed, too. They have become entirely different. What is it, then, that makes me still reckon you as being Siddhartha? You are, and you are not. Siddhartha did not speak. 
Silently, his eyes looked into hers. You have retained, you have attained it, she said. Have you found, <clears throat> you attained it, she said. Have you found peace? He smiled and laid his hands on hers. Um, wait, 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 wait. Can you read the comments to me? I can't read them. Um, Sean says he has to digest your words and get back to you. Okay. Nematon says, it says one hey on your page. She does bless her that her being. 100%. Um, he said to make Miss Shot number 20 and now you create a narrator. Adam said to Joseph, eh, yes, she's a mystic, I think. Nematon said, ha. Sorry. Okay. This is a very inebriated enamor. That's the only thing. I <laughs> never <laughs> That's the only thing I've got to admit. I, I, we're almost there, guys. I say congratulations for your thousand. Yo, River. Thanks, bro. Um, here's, I'm going to choose you with a piece of pineapple. That's a mango. <laughs> what did I just say? A pineapple? <laughs> yeah. What you, can you read that to me? Uh, Shalom says something is too, anything if the vessel can't contain the energy completely and fully. I believe one day all the universe will encapsulate and realize that. And then the time says, LOL. You're a trip, bro. <laughs> Shalom, you're a trip. <laughs> to be honest, I can't read the comments. Okay, what's the next thing? Uh, Karen Lynn said, I'm shocked this is still going. Ha ha wow. One day. How are you still awake or alive? Uh, LOL. <laughs> Okay, Karen, I'm I'm neither awake nor alive. This is an illusion. Um this is nine hours and fifteen minutes. This is I'm I'm checked out. I'm just like on autopilot. I can't to be honest, if I if I try and lean in and read the comments, it's too much for me. I have someone reading the comments to me. What's the next comment? What did what did Nemitson say? Uh, Adam said Zed really needs to watch some Victoria Hannah. It's Victoria Hannah. <laughs> Nemeton says, I got to run for today. Really love being here for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. Yo, River, thanks for being here. I, I really appreciate you. You've been a champ this whole time. You supported me all along. I love you. Shout yeah, shout out to River. Go and f go and go on YouTube and find River's channel. It's called the Nemeton. It's called the Nemeton. It's epic. What did Adam say? It's not about me. It's, is, it, is it relevant to me? It's looking at, no, <laughs> I see, okay, I see it, she's, okay, I see it, she said, I see it, I too shall find peace. You have found it, said, said you have found, said Siddhartha in a whisper. Kamala looked into his eyes unflinchingly. That's a nice word. She thought about her intention to journey to Gautama to see the face of a, of a perfect man, to absorb his peace, and she reflected that she had now found Siddhartha instead. What? Karen wants to know if you're going to do the summary at the end. <laughs> Karen, you know what I'm going to do at the end? I'm going to crash so hard. <laughs> I'm going to leave the camera rolling so you guys can all watch me sleep. And I can get watch time while you watch me. <laughs> okay. I just realized something, Karen. Which is that um, the reason why uh, S the the protagonist of Siddhartha, his name is Siddhartha, is which is this Gautama, the Buddha, is because he really he he's the, he is the Buddha, he is the Messiah. Yeah, and 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 Kamala now looks into his eyes unflinchingly. She thought about her intense journey to Gautama, to see the face of a perfect of a perfected man, to absorb his peace, and she reflected that he had now found Siddhartha, Siddhartha instead. And, and it was good. As if she had now seen Gautama. She wanted to tell him that, but her tongue no longer obeyed her will. <laughs> I feel you, girl. She looked at him in silence and her, and saw, and he saw her, and he saw life fade away in her eyes. 
Oh, when the final stab of pain filled her eyes and ended, when the final shudder ran through her limbs, his fingers closed her eyelids. For a long while, he sat there looking at her dead face. For a long while, he contemplated her mouth, her always tired mouth, with the lips that had grown narrow. He remembered that once in the spring of his years, he had likened the mouth to a newly ripened fig. For a long while, he sat there reading the pale face, the weary wrinkles. He found himself with the sigh. He saw his own face lying in the same way, just as white, just as burnt out. And at the same time, he saw his face and her and her with red lips, with growing eyes, with glowing eyes. And he was completely permeated by the feeling of present time and, and simultaneity the feeling of the feeling of eternity at that moment he felt deeply more deep for the indestructibility of all life the eternity of every moment then he arose the Soveda had prepared rice for him but Siddhartha did not eat in the shed where he kept their, where they kept their goat, the two old men arranged a pallet of straw and Siddhartha lay down to sleep. But Siddhartha went outside and sat in front of the hut all night long, listening to the river. With the past washing all over him, touched and surrounded by all the phases of by all the phases of his life simultaneously, by every by every once in a while, but every once in a while he got up stepped over to the door of the hut and listened to hear whether the boy was sleeping. Early in the morning, even before the sun became visible, became visible Vasuveda stepped out of the shed and, became, and came over to his friend. You have not slept, he said. No, Vasuveda, I was sitting here listening to, live, to the river. It told me many things. It filled me full of, of healing thoughts with the concept of oneness. You have experienced sorrow, Siddhartha, but I see no sadness has entered your heart. No, my friend. Why should I be sad? I, who used to be rich and happy, have now become even richer and happier. My son has been given to me. Let my son be welcome to me also, but now, Siddhartha, let us go. Let your son be welcome to me also, but now, Siddhartha, let us go to work. There is much to be done. Kamala died in the same bed on which my wife once died. We shall build Kamala's pyre on the same hill which I once built a pyre. Pyre is like a, a a stack of wood where you burn a, a body. It's like a fall. It's like a weight. Yeah. It's um, what's it called when you do um cremation? cremation? Yeah. It's That's what they do? in India. It's very popular. It's very popular. Oh, It's, it's it's interesting. Yeah, it's good. It's, yeah, yeah. While the boy was asleep, they built the pyre. Kamala is dead. She was good. The sun. It's the second last chapter. I need, I need to, I'm gonna pee before we begin this chapter. Okay. There are nine people still watching this. I know. Yo, respect. Yeah. Big up, big up, big up to you guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna go um and relieve myself. And I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna read the final chapter. Oh final two chapters. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we never use the jumper. No? We never use the jumper. Oh. I should put it up at the end. The last chapter.
right, we're back. It's fine, it's, not, it's out of the shop again. All right, all right, all right, all right, okay. <coughs> Respect to you, made it to 1K, LOL, somehow both. Oh, okay. We have Mango. That's what's most important right now. What up, Mango? I'm gonna eat. <laughs> I'm gonna eat you. <laughs> yeah, mind with love. Elevates the meeting. Oh, my brother Mango. What up? <laughs> I have a considerable amount of mango left here. And uh, do you want some, Melissa? No, thank you. What are you doing? I'm you... just in this bit. <laughs> <laughs> when you saw speak to your mango. <laughs> Yo, that's so real. I ate mango skin. What happened? I ate the mango skin. Yo, you know what's up? <laughs> this mango is up, okay. Talk cheap. Mango is real. Hashtag thug life. <laughs> okay. I'm I don't did you give me mango bone? Yeah. Oh, you gave me freaking mango bone. Okay. Um okay, can I tell you something, guys, by the way? So, this mango is a little sour, but typically mango is pretty sweet. <laughs> mango shade. <laughs> Facts. Okay, here's, here's the part I wanted to say, which is like related to mysticism, like my channel and stuff. <laughs> um, there was a mystic. His name was, uh, I think it was Rebbe Yitzchak of He was a Hasidic mystic. He was a Jewish mystic. He says an amazing thing. He says that when we taste the sweetness of a fruit, we're tasting the sweetness of the divine. That's what's up. That's that's what's freaking up. So when I taste the sweetness of the mango and the soundness of the mango, I'm tasting the sweetness of God. And I, I want to make a bracha on this mango. Even though I've eaten lots of mango without a bracha, I'm going to make a new bracha. What bracha? Mango grows in a tree? Mm -hmm. It's how it eats? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to make a bracha. It's really slippery. It's hard to grab. <laughs> Mango mysticism. <laughs> Finish the book. I feel confident about this now. Baruch Ata Adinai Aliheinu Malach Eilam Bari Pirates. You're so sweet, God. Yeah, Karen, you're a sweet, you're a sweet, okay. Chapter, who knows what. Uh, it's called The Sun. S-O-M. Let's go. Oh, this is sad. The guy just, the guy's, the guy's mom just died. Hello, guys, this is sad. Mango, what did he say? Mango rushed? He said mango normativity. Mango normativity? And then Joseph said, tasting the sweetest of love it. Oh no, sorry, that was Karen. Joseph said, that's quite funny. Colin said, mango rest. Let's go. Timidly sweeping. Oh, sorry, sweeping. Timidly weeping. This is chapter called The Sun. Siddhartha's son. Siddhartha has a son. How crazy is that? We never expected a son. Said what? Her last encounter. She said, "I'm pregnant." She was pregnant. I mean, when we started the book, we never thought he'd have a son. Oh. Mango rest. <laughs> Man, no rest. Okay, Timothy weeping. The boy had attended his mother's funeral. You can read out the comments while they come. Oh. Between paragraphs, gloomily and timid, gloom, gloomy and timid, he had heard Tadatha greet him as his son. And to us, 
He sat pale for days on end on the death of his mother's hill. He refused to eat. He averted his gaze. He locked up his heart. He resisted and fought his destiny. That's really sad. What's what's happening in the comments, eh? Joseph says what happened to the screen. What do we know? I'm right here. <laughs> this is so sad, guys. Like there's there's nothing quite as sad as as a parent losing a as a child look, losing a parent. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I know this, like, I, okay, thank God I never lost a parent. My, my parents are alive, maybe they live long and well. I have, like, close friends who lost parents. And um, and this is so true that they, they lock themselves up and they avert their gaze. They resist them for their destiny. It's, it's so sad. A, a, child, a child loses their parent. And they just sit there and they don't. It's really sad. Siddhartha treated him considerably and let him have his way out of respect for his love, for his loss. Siddhartha understood that his son did not know him and that he could not love him as a father. Gradually, he also saw and understood that the 11 year old was a spoiled child and a mother's boy who had, who had grown up accustomed to riches, used to more delicate foods, and to a soft bed, and to the habit of ordering around servants. Siddhartha understood that a spoiled child was, was mourning a loss could not suddenly and voluntarily be contented with strange surroundings and poverty. He put no pressure on him. He, he performed many tasks for him. He always picked up the choicest pieces of food for him. He hoped he would gradually win him over through friendliness and patience. Thanks. But he had considered himself rich and fortunate when the boy had come to him. But since time had gone by since then, and the boy remained a gloomy stranger, since he gave signs of having a pride to find heart, refusing to do any work, showing no respect for the old man and stealing fruit from Vashaveda's trees, Siddhartha began to understand that his son had brought not happiness and peace, but sorrow and care. But he loved him, and the sorrow and care that came with love were dearer to him than happiness and joy that had been without the boy. Ever since young Siddhartha had been in the hut, the old man had de had decided on a division of labor. Siddhartha had once again taken over the duties of ferrymen of his own, and Siddhartha, to be near to his son, had taken over the work in the hut and the paddy. Over for a long time, for Siddhartha waited for his son to understand him, to accept his love, and perhaps reciprocate it. For long months, for Siddhartha waited, looked on, waited, and kept silent. One day when young Siddhartha had once again severely tormented his father with rebelliousness and moodiness, breaking both of his rice balls, Vasudeva took his friend aside in the evening and spoke to him. Thanks, Shalom. Thanks, friend. Thanks, Joseph. Excuse me, he said. I'm with you like a friend. I see that you are tormented yourself. I see you are grieving, my friend. Your son... Is is gre is giving you worries, and he's giving me worries too. This young is used to a different life, to a different nest. He did he did not like you run away from riches in the town out of disgust and 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 surfeit. Surfeit. He had to leave behind against his will. I I I qu I questioned the river, oh friend. He questioned, he questioned the river. I questioned the river, oh friend. Many times have I questioned it, but the river laughs. It laughs at me. It laughs at me and you, shaking its sides over our foolishness. Water seeks out water. The young seeks out young. Your son is not in a place where he can thrive. 
Question the river yourself. Listen to it yourself. Sadly, Siddhartha looked into his friendly face, into the many wrinkles of which unchanging serenity dwelt. But can I part with him? He asked softly, feeling ashamed. Give me more time, dear friend. Look, I'm fighting for him. I'm caught hard. I shall capture with love and friendly patience. Someday the river will speak to him too. He took occasion. But Shaveda's smile grew warmer blossoming out oh yes he took vocation too partakes of eternal life but do we know you and i where his vocation lies to what path to what deeds to what sorrows his call can lead him his suffering will not be small for his heart is, is prideful and hard people of that sort must suffer greatly go far astray to do do much injustice burden themselves in much sin tell me dear friend are you not bringing up your son? Do you, do, you put, do you put no pressure on him? Do you not hit him? Do you not punish him? No, Vasudeva, none of these things. I knew it. You put no Love is stronger than physical force. Very good. I applaud you. But mistake on your part to believe that you are not putting pressure on him or punishing him? Are you not are you not trying him hand and foot with your love? Are you not daily shaming him and making things even harder for him with your kindness and patience? Are you not compelling him proud and are you not compelling him proud and spoiled boy that he is to live in a hut with two banana plantation eaters for whom even rice is a delicacy whose thoughts cannot be his? whose hearts are old and settled and move at a different pace from his, does not all that constitute compulsion and punishment for him? Taken aback. Siddhartha looked at the ground. Quietly he asked, what do you think I should do? But Shuvedo said, take him to town. Take him to his mother's house. There will still be servants there. Hand him over to them. And if there are no more, take him to a teacher. Not for the sake of instruction, but so he can be among other boys and among girls and enter his own world. Have you never thought about that? You see into my heart, says Siddhartha, mournfully. I thought about it frequently, but look. How can I turn him over to that world, seeing that his heart is not tendered with? Will he not become presumptuous? Will he not give himself over to pleasure and power? Will he not repeat all his father's mistakes? Will he not, per will he not perhaps become totally loved in samsara? The ferryman flashed a bright smile. He touched Siddhartha's arm gently, saying, Question the river about it, friend. Hear it laugh over it. Do you really believe that you committed your follies in order to save your son from them? And can you protect your son against samsara? How? Through instruction, through prayer, through admonition? Dear friend, have you then completely forgotten that story? that instructive story of the brother's son, Siddhartha, that you once told me on this very spot, who saved the Samana Siddhartha from samsara, from sin, from avarice, from folly. Was his father's piety, were his teachings, were his teacher's admonitions, were his own knowledge and questioning able to save him? What father, what teacher was able to protect him from living his own life? sullying himself with life of his own account, burdening himself with guilt of his own, drinking the bitter, po the bitter potion himself, finding his own path. <laughs> Bless. You're welcome. Do you perhaps believe, dear friend, that anyone at all can be saved from that path? 
your young son because you love him, because you will gladly spare him sorrow and pain and disappointment. But even if you were to die for him ten times, you would not be able to obey even the tiniest bit of his destiny by doing so. Never before had Vashravana made such a long speech. These footnotes are so stupid. I have to glance at them. Wait, what happened in the comments? Oh, Shalom is going to fertility with some other legal entity. You were shocked. Shall I, shall I join the Tavern Zeb? Do you get the reference? I don't get the reference. What's Tavern Zeb? Yo, Joseph, what's that reference? Okay, can I tell you how stupid this footnote is? Never before had Vasavedam made such a long speech. Footnote 13 reads as such. It is only a few longer than one of his speeches in the preceding chapter. Maybe the footnote in that chapter is the longest speech. What a stupid footnote. <laughs> Who footnoted this book? Are you kidding me? Honestly, that's that's ridiculous. Okay, whatever. Back to the book. These footnotes are so stupid. Okay, thank God that's the last footnote of the book. They had to tell us that this was like a few words longer than the previous paragraph? <sighs> Way to kill like a... Huh? Okay. So that's the thing in, in a friendly way. I need a, I need a burp. <laughs> Tavern of love? It's Diamond of Venus? Yeah, I get you, bro. I get you. Um, okay. Let's continue. Shall we? <sighs> Siddhartha thanked him in a way. Entered the hut. Full of care. Well, I need a break. One second. I think... Water? I think I'm going to go pee again. Give me a second. How did I get on mute? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yo, Shalom, thanks for telling me I was on mute. I totally didn't realize. Okay. I was just explaining my beard and, and the, the story behind it. <laughs> Basically, I've never, ever, ever cut my beard, which is really trippy. 
because the way that that like beard hair follicles come out of the skin they come out pointed to break the surface and if you cut them they like get cut and you you miss that but basically if you look at any of the tips of my hair of my beard you'll see like the very original this is so irrelevant what am i saying i water it every time i shower i make sure to water my beard h2o no shampoo no conditioner just h2o yeah Beards are a weird thing. My mother really likes my beard. Yeah, beard lives matter. Esoteric, are you still here, bro? Did you just come back? You've been here this whole time? It's a plant, yeah. It's a living entity. It has its own personality. It has its own, it like, it like, it does photosynthesis. Do you, my beard turns red during the summer. You know that from sunlight? Like over here, it gets all red, which is really crazy. It's from my mother's jeans, not my dad's jeans. So crazy. In and out. I feel you. Me too. I'm in and out. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I think I'm going to, um, and then I'm going to continue reading. Could we do whiskey not beer and we pay all the Um, Smootho wants to know if you have any mystical powers thanks to having a beard. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we at? <clears throat> Yo, Hannah. That's cool. Indian Hannah, right? Like, it's like a... I, I haven't seen people do Hannah recently. Cool. Wait, Smoother deleted her message, his message, about mystical powers. We read it already, so they can't delete it. Right, they deleted it. So it was this, the question was, do I have mystical powers with my beard? The answer is yes. Okay. Wait, no, 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 no. I'll tell you. The power is I get to stroke my beard while I'm reading and contemplating things. Okay. Cognitive capacity and, like, attention and, like, capacity to absorb this information. Yeah, yeah, smooth boat. I, I, even when you delete them, and beard stroking is a real superpower. Science. This is this is science, girl. I'm just assuming you're a girl. I don't know why. Smooth boat. What's your What's your name? Okay. Where are we? Where? 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 Do, where? Do, what? Okay. Here we are. Adley. Yo, pace or tight? I would I would do it. I would go for it. It's not a Chabad thing, but I would do it. It's cool. It's really cool. Sadly. Siddhartha looked into what's that like being married by by the way, uh, Esoterica. Es what's oh my what's his name? It's my phone, my emails. Hold up, hold up.
Yeah, Jonathan's messaging me. He's like, where you at? Um, no. He messaged me at 2.30. Um, That's crazy. It sounds like the link. Like, no he would know that was still live. I mean, you could check the link. Oh, yo, you're a G, bro. Justin Mattel, sorry. I I totally forgot. Sorry, I'm I'm just blanking on names right now. That's your name. Alyssa, can you respond to my WhatsApp? I think Emma's texting me. You know my WhatsApp web? No. Okay. Do you guys mind if I just respond to like a message or two and then continue with this last 10 pages or so? I will, I will. I'll, I'll read it. I promise. <laughs> I once know how drunk I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right, all right, all right. Okay. Unless you text me on WhatsApp, I'm, I can't respond to you. I'm doing a live stream right now. So, uh, uh, Justin Batal says that being married is great. Live bachelor life until I was mid thirties. Yeah, I need some tips from you, bro. Cause I'm a bachelor, and uh, it's I'm kind of over it, you know. Okay. Sadly, Siddhartha looked into his friend's face, and the many wrinkles of the unchanging serene, of unchanging serenity dwelt. In the many wrinkles of which unchanging serenity dwelt. That's that's nice. <sighs> yes, you, you're good. Until the very end, you, you deliver. But can I part with him? He said softly, feeling ashamed. I feel you, bro. I feel you. I'm 26. I think I'm 26. I'm pretty sure. Or 25. 26, 25. I don't know. Give me more time, dear friend. Look, I'm fighting for him. I'm counting his heart. I'm courting his heart. I read this already. Someday the river will speak to him too. He too has a vocation. Uh, Vasaveda's smile grew warmer, blossoming out. Oh yes, he too has a vocation. He too partakes of eternal life. But do you know, you and I, where his vocation lies? To what path? <laughs> to what deeds? To what sorrow his calls will lead him? His suffering will not be small, for his heart is prideful and hard. People that so must suffer greatly, go far astray, do much injustice, but uh, burden themselves with much sin. Tell me, dear friend, are you willing? Are you not bringing up your son? Do you not put pressure on him? Do you not hit him? Do you not punish him? I read this already. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, Visaveda, I do none of these things. I knew it. You put no pressure on him. You do not hit him. You give him no orders because you know that softness is stronger than hardness. Wood is stronger than rock. Stronger than physical force. Very good. I applaud you. But is it not a misapart to believe that you are not putting pressure on him or punishing him? Are you not trying him hands and foot with your love? Are you not daily shaming him and making things even harder for him with your kindness and patience? Are you not compelling him, proud and spoiled boy, that he is to live in a hut with two banana eaters from whom even rice is a delicacy, whose thoughts cannot be his, whose hearts are old and settled and move at a different pace of his? Does not all that constitute compulsion and punishment for him Taking it back, Siddhartha looked at the ground. Quietly, he asked, what do you think I should do? Yo, Mazel Tov. I'm Kalkim al uh, Vasaveda said, take him to town. Take him to his mother's house. There'll be servants there. Hand him over to them. If they are no more, take him to the teacher for the sake of instruction. So he can other boys amongst girls and, and enter his own world have you ever thought about that? Have you thought about that? I mean, come on, I'm making three stars. <laughs> you see into my heart, said Siddhartha, mourning for me. I thought only, but look, how can I do to that world, seeing that his heart is not tender to begin with? Will he not become presumptuous? Will he not himself take over? Will he not himself, will he not give himself pleasure and power? Will he not repeat his father's mistakes? Will he not perhaps be too lost in himself? The ferryman flashed smile. He touched it on um, gently, saying, Question the river about it, friend. Hear it laugh over it. Hear it laugh over it. Do you really believe then that you can commit your follies in order to save your son from them? Can you protect your son against samsara? How? Through instruction, through prayer, through admonition, dear friend, have you then completely forgotten that story? 
that in struck the story of the Brahmin son Siddhartha that you once told me on this very spot who saved the Samana Siddhartha from samsara, from sin, from avarice, from folly was his father's piety where his teachers admonition where his knowledge and questioning able to save him. What father, what teacher was able to protect him from living his own? Ooh, 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 ooh. What father, what teacher was able to protect him from living his own life? Sullying himself. Sullying himself with life on his own account. Burdening himself with guilt on his own. Drinking the bitter potion himself. Finding his own path. Do you believe, dear friend, that anyone at all can be saved from that path? Your young son, perhaps, because you love him, because you would gladly spare him sorrow and pain and disappointment, but even if you were to die for him ten times, you would not be able to abate even the tiniest part of his destiny by doing so. Never before had Vasaveda had given such a long speech. We read this because that's where the footnote is. Me, I'm an idiot. <laughs> Siddhartha thanked him in a friendly way, he entered the full hut of care, able to sleep for some time. Um, Vasuveda uh, had told him nothing of himself, but had already, but had not already thought that, that he had already not already thought of. But it was a knowledge that he could not put that he could not put into action stronger than love, stronger than knowledge was his love for the boy. His goodness, his love, his fear of losing him were also stronger. For he had never before lost his heart to anything more completely. Had he ever so loved any human being so blindly, so painfully, so unsess so unsuccessfully, and yet so unhap and yet so unhappily. Siddhartha wasn't able to follow his friend's advice. He wasn't able to give up his son. He let the boy order him around. He let the boy show disrespect for him. He remained silent and waited. Daily he began all over again the unspoken battle of friendliness. The soundless war of patience. Vasuveda too was silent and worried, friendly, knowing from uh, forbearing when it came to patience. They were both they were both past masters. I don't know one name could be as many. I don't I don't know one name could be as many as you show me, huh? <laughs> uh. Yo, <laughs> good call, Joseph, bro. Honestly, I, I make up names. You know what? When I when I actually read books myself, not out loud, I actually never like pronounce the names out loud, and I just make up the names in my head. And then if you ask me later who's the main character, I can't actually tell you the names because they're I just make up. It's hard to explain. It's like a dyslexic thing. Anyhow, on one occasion when the boy's face. Reminded him strongly of Kam of Kamala. Siddhartha suddenly recalled something Kamala once told him. Long before in his youthful days, you cannot love, she told him. And he agreed with her, comparing himself to a star and the child people to falling leaves. And yet he had also sensed a reproach in those words. In truth, he had never been able to lose himself completely in another person. To leave himself completely uh, to forget himself. To commit loving follies for the sake of another. He had never been able to, and as it seemed to him at the time, that he had been the great that, that had been the great difference between him and the and the child and the child people. Setting him apart. But now, ever since his son had come, now he too, Siddhartha, had totally had totally become totally a child person. Suffering for someone else's sake, loving someone else. Lost through love, a fool for the sake of love. Now he too felt belated for once in his life that sh strongest and strangest of passions. He suffered from it, suffered pitifully, and yet he was blessed, and yet he was in some way renewed, in some way richer. Uh, what a, what a, Aspiration to love, to lose oneself in love. Yeah. To be sure, he sensed this love, this blind love for his son was a was a passion, something very human, that it was samsara. Wow. 
a muddied foundation, a dark water, nevertheless. He felt at the same time that it was not without value, it was needful. It proceeded from his own nature. This too had to be, these pains too had to be experienced, these follies too. Oh my God. Oh my God. This pleasure too had to be atoned for. These pains too had to be experienced. These follies too had to be committed. Meanwhile, his son allowed him to commit his follies, allowed him to, to sue for his love, allowed him to be humbled daily by his moods and caprices. There was nothing in his father that could not delight him. That, there was nothing that could delight him and nothing to cause him fear. He was a good man. His father, a good, kind gentleman, perhaps a very pious man, perhaps a saint. But none of these qualities could win over the boy. The father bored him, keeping him a prisoner there in this wretched hut. He bored him, and his way of responding to any misbehavior, uh, to any misbehavior with a smile, to any insult with friendly treatment, to any, to any uh, malice with kindness, that was precisely that was precisely the most hateful ruse of that old sneer. The boy would much have preferred for him to threaten and beat him. Then came in which young Siddhartha's feelings broke out and openly against his father. This this kid has no name, by the way. He's just like Siddhartha. He has like no identity for himself. His father has assigned him a chore, ordered to gather brushwood. But the boy did not leave the hut. He stood there in great, in defiant rage. It's 4 a.m. Oh my gosh. Whoa. Huh? 66. Whoa. Stamping his feet, clenching his fists in a mighty eruption, screaming out his hatred and contempt for his father. Get your brushwood, he cried, foaming at the mouth. I'm not your servant. I know that you do not me, you do not dare, for I know that you are constantly trying to punish me and belittle me with your piety and your considerate and your considerateness. You want me to become like you, just as pious, just as gentle, just as wise. We just hit the ten hour mark, by the way. But listen, spy you, I prefer to become a highway robber and murderer and go to hell rather than become like you. I hate you! And you are not my father. Even if you are my, even if you are my my mother's lover ten times over, his anger and grief overflowed, foaming into hostility to his father in a hundred chaotic, vicious expressions. Then the boy ran away, not returning until late in the evening. But the following morning he had disappeared. Also gone was the little basket woven out of palm fibers of two colors of which the ferryman kept the copper and silver coins which he received his fare. The boy had run away. I must follow, said Siddhartha, who had been trembling with sadness ever since the boy's insult the day before. A child cannot walk through the forest alone. He will perish. We must build a rough Vasuveda uh, to get across the river. We shall build a raft, said Vasubeda. We can recover our boat, which the boy commandeered. But as for him, we should let him go. Friend, he's no longer a child. He cannot help himself. He is seeking the way to town. He's right. Do not forget it. He's doing what you yourself of doing. He's watching out for himself. He's doing his own way. Oh, Siddhartha, I see your suffering. But you are suffering pains that are rather laughable. You are yourself will soon that you yourself will soon laugh over. Siddhartha Mainur held the axe in his hand and began to build a raft of bamboo, and Vasuveda helped him to tie this on the grass ropes. They sailed across, they carried far downstream to the car, they pulled the raft upstream towards the opposite bank. Why did you take along the axe? asked Siddhartha. Vasuveda said, It may be the oar of a boat is lost, but Siddhartha knew what his, what his friend was thinking. He was thinking that the boy would have thrown away or smashed the oar to take revenge or to hinder them in their pursuit. And indeed, there was no longer an oar in the boat. He pointed to the bottom of the boat and looked to Al as if to say, do you not see what, I, what your son is trying to tell you? Do you not see that he does not want to be followed? But he did not say it in words. He got busy fashioning a new oar. But Siddhartha took leave of him in the quest of the runaway 
but Shiveda did not stop him. Once Shabbat had already began walking through for some time, and thought the thought occurred to him that his quest was useless. Either as he thought the boy was far ahead of him and already in town, or else he was on his way and could keep and he could keep out of sight of his pursuer. As his thoughts evolved, he discovered that he himself was not worried about his son. He knew deep inside that he had neither parents threatened by danger in the forest, and yet he pushed on without stopping, no longer to rescue him, but merely out of longing, merely to the chance of seeing him again, and he proceeded onwards in the exits of town. When he came near to near town on the broad highway, he stopped short at the entrance of the beautiful pleasure garden he had once belonged to Kamala, where one day he had seen her for the first time in the seat down chair. The past loomed up in his soul. He saw himself standing in there again, young, a bearded, naked Saman, his hair full of dust. For a long while, Siddhartha stood looking upon the open gate into the garden and saw monks walking beneath the beautiful trees. For a long while, he stood there reflecting, seeing, seeing, listening to the stories of his life. For a long while, he stood there listening, looking at the monks, seeing instead of them the young Siddhartha, seeing the Mala walking beneath the tall trees. He saw himself distinctly being entertained by Kamala, received first kiss, looking back pridefully and contemptuously at his Brahmin days, pridefully and longingly uh, beginning his worldly life. He saw Kamaswami, he saw the servants, he saw the banquet, the dice plays, the musicians, he saw Kamala's songbird in his cage, he relived all this. He breathed the air of samsara again. He was old and tired. Again, he felt the disgust. Again, he felt the wish to obliterate himself. And again, he recovered thanks to the sacred Om. After he, foot, after he stood for some time at the golden at the garden gate, Siddhartha realized that it had been foolish all along. That it, that it had been foolishness all along that had driven him to that spot. That he could not help his son. That he ought not to attach himself to him. Deeply, he felt love for the runaway in his heart like a wound. And at the same time, he felt that this wound would not be given to him so that he would keep reopening it, but it must become a, a blossom and, 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 and emit radiance. <clears throat> at, at this time, the wound was not yet blossoming, not yet radiant, him sad. In place of the wistful goal had drawn him there, the pursuit of his runaway son, there was now emptiness. Sadly, he sat down. He felt something in his dying heart. He experienced emptiness. There was no more joy, no further goal. He sat in concentration and waited. This he had learnt at the river. This one thing, to wait, to be patient, to listen. He sat and listened in the dust of the highway. He listened to his heart beating warily and sadly. He waited for a voice. Many an hour he crouched there. He saw no more images. He was impressed in emptiness. He himself sank in, uh, into it without seeing a way out. And whenever he felt the marting, he silently spoke the Om, filling himself with Om. The monks in the garden saw him. And since he crouched there many hours with the dust settling in his gray hair, one of them came over and placed two pissang fruit on the ground in front of him. The old man did not see. What's pissang? P-I-S-A-N-G? He was awakened from that stoop by a hand touching his shoulder. Immediately he recognized that touch, gentle and shy, and came to his senses. He rose, greeted Vasuveda, who had followed him. And he, when he looked into Vasuveda's friendly face, he link into the little wrinkles that seemed to be filled with nothing but smiles, into the, rene, into the serene eyes, though he smiled. He saw the fruits lying in front of him, picked them up, gave one of them to the ferryman and ate the other one himself. Then he silently went back to the forest with Vasuveda, returning home to the ferry. Neither one mentioned the event of the day. Neither one mentioned the boy's name. Neither one mentioned he's running away. Neither one mentioned the wound. In the hut, Siddhartha lay down in his bed, and when Vasuveda up to him a while later, he offered him a bowl of coconut milk. He found him already asleep. That's the end Um, okay, the second last chapter is Om, and then the final chapter is Govinda. 
let us continue a chapter called um thank you all for hanging with me to the very end we're almost there i'm so i'm so tired honestly yikes <laughs> but we'll do it because we said we would the wound still smarted for a long time. Siddhartha had taken a, had had take had to take across the river. Many passages had a son and daughter with him. Oh, that's hard. And none of them did he see. And and none none of none and not one of them did he did he see whom he did envy. Thinking so many people, so many thousands possess the sweetest happiness. Why even wicked people, even thieves and highwaymen have children and love them and are loved by them. Only I do not. That was how uncomplicated and how unreasoning his thoughts now were. That was how much like the child people he had become. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, Joseph. Now He now looked on people differently, not more, but with less cleverness, less pride. Instead, he was warmer, more curious, more concerned. When he took passengers of the ordinary sort across the river, child people, businessmen, soldiers, women folk, the, the people he did not seem so far to him as in the past, he understood them. He understood and shared their life, guided as it was not by ideas or insights, but by solely by impulse and desire. He felt he was the same as they, although he was close to perfection and was suffering from his final wound, he nevertheless felt that these child people were his brothers their vanities, desires, and laughable qualities lost their laughable side. For him, becoming understandable, becoming lovable, even becoming worthy of respect for him. The blind love of a mother, the full blind pride taken by a conceited father in his only little boy, a vain young woman's blind while striving for jewelry and men's admiration and, and men's admirers. All these impulses, all these childish actions, all these simple, foolish, but enormously strong impulses and desires, powerfully alive, powerfully forcing their way to fruition, were now for Siddhartha no longer childish actions. He saw that people live for their for their sake. For their sake, he saw them accomplishing an infinity of things: traveling, waging war, suffering, suffering uh, infinitely, enduring infinite burdens burdens he was able to love them for that his life vanity and the indestructible brahman in each of their passions each of their deeds <sighs> full circle here these people were lovable alhamdulillah and admirable in their blind loyalty their blind strength and tenacity they lacked nothing the scholarly thinker was only superior to them in one, in one teeny way. He possessed the awareness, the conscious idea of the oneness of all life. And at many times, Siddhartha even doubted whether that knowledge, that idea would be so highly valued, whether it too might be, might not perhaps be a childish quality of, of thinking people, of the thinkers amongst the child people. In every other way, worldly people were equal to the sages and were often far superior to them, just as those in their dogged, relentless performance of necessary actions in moments appeared to be superior to man. Word. Gradually their blood, gradually they ripened within Siddhartha the realization, the knowledge of what wisdom really was, what the goal of his long quest was. It was nothing but a preparedness of the soul, a capacity, a secret art of conceiving the idea of oneness at every moment. Hmm. This blossoming within him slowly. This blossomed within him slowly. He saw it reflected in Vashveda's aged child face. Harmony, knowledge, the eternal perfection of the world, a smile, oneness. But the wound still smarted. Siddhartha recalled his son yearningly and bitterly. He nurtured his love and tenderness in his heart. He allowed the pain to gnaw at him. He committed all the follies of love. This flame would not go out by itself. And one day, when the wound was smarting violently, Siddhartha rode across the river, hounded by longing. He 
stepped out of the boat, intended to go into town to look for his son. The river was flowing gently and quietly. It was in the dry season, but his but its voice had a peculiar sound. It was laughing. It was definitely laughing. The river was laughing brightly and clearly. It was laughing at the old ferryman. Siddhartha stood still. He bent over the water to hear it even better, and in the calm, moving water, he saw his face reflected. And in that reflected face, he saw something that drew memory, something forgotten. He thought about it. He discovered what it was. That face resembled another. He had once known loved and also feared. Resembled the face of his father, the Brahmin. And he recollected how long ago as a youth he had compelled his father to let him join the penitents. How he had to leave of him. How he had left and never returned. Had not his father had the same sorrow over him that he was now suffering over his son? And let his father died long ago alone without ever seeing his son again. Did not he too have to expect that same destiny? Was it not a comedy, this strange and stupid thing, this repetition, this running around in a disastrous cycle? The river was laughing. Yes, it was so. Everything returned that had not been suffered through and untangled at the very end. The same stories were suffered over and over again. But Siddhartha stepped back into the boat and rode back to the hut, recalling his father and his son, laughing at the river. At chef with himself, inclined towards despair, but no less inclined to laugh along at himself and the whole world. Ah! The wound had not become a blossom. His heart still re re still resisted its destiny. Serenity and victory were not yet radiant from his sorrow, but he felt hope. And when he had reached the hut again, he sensed an unconquered desire to bear his mind to Vashuveda, to show him everything, to tell him everything, the master of listening. Vashuveda was sitting in the hut, weaving a basket. He no longer went out with his eyes were beginning to get weak. And not only his eyes, but his arms and hands as well. Only the joy and serene benevolence of his face were unchanged and blossoming, alhamdulillah. Siddhartha sat down beside the old man. Slowly he began to speak. He now told of things that had been that had never been discussed. He, he, his journey to town on that occasion, his smarting wound, his envy at the sight of happy fathers... His knowledge that such wishes were foolish, his futile struggle against them. He recounted everything. He was able to tell it all, even the most painful details became possible to say and show it all. He was able to relate it all. He openly displayed his wound. He recounted it that day as well. Now, how he had rode across the river like a child running away, intended to walk to town, and the river had laughed. And how the river had laughed. When he spoke, spoke for a long while, while Vishraveda listened with a calm face. Siddhartha perceived this listing of Vishuveda's more strongly than ever before. He sensed now his pains and anxieties flowed across, how his secret hope flowed across and now returned to him from the other side. He showed his listener his wound the same way as the same way as bathing it in the river until it became cool and at one with the river. While he still when I'm speaking still, is this the river Ganges, by the way? While he still went on speaking, he still went on making admissions, making confessions. Siddhartha felt more and more, it was no longer Vashraveda, no longer a human being who was listening to him. That his motionless listening was absorbing his confession as a tree absorbs rain. And his and this motionless and this motionlessness and this motionlessness one was the river itself, God Himself, the eternal itself. And his wound, this realization of Vashuveda's altered state took possession of him. And the more he felt and perceived this, the less strange it became, and the more he saw that everything was in order and natural, that Vashuveda had been so had had been so for some time had been so for some time now. In fact, he saw that that he himself was just barely different from Vashuveda. He perceived what he now saw, all Vashuveda, the common, the way that common people saw the gods, and this could not last. He began to take leave of Vashuveda in his heart. <laughs> Bless. And all this while he went on speaking. 
When he talked himself out, Vashavedo turned his friendly, somewhat weak eyes towards him, not speak, but suddenly radiated love and serenity in his direction, understanding and knowledge. He took Siddhartha's hand and led him to the seat of the river, sat down by him and laughed by the river and smiled by the river. You have heard it laugh, he said, but you have not heard everything. Listen, let us hear more. They listened. There we go. Um. <laughs> Yo, thanks for keeping track of all those names, bro. Dyslexia at its finest. They listened. The many-voiced song of the river resounded gently. Siddhartha looked into the river, and in the moving water, images appeared to him. His father appeared, lonely, lamenting for his son. He himself appeared, lonely. He, too, bounded to his faraway son with the longing. His son appeared. He, too, boy, the boy, lonely, raging with the desire and the fiery path of his, usual, of his youthful wishes. Each one had his own, had his goal in his, each one, had his eyes on his own goal. Each one was obsessed with the goal. Each one was suffering. <sighs> the river sang with a voice of suffering. It sang yearnfully. It, it flowed towards its goal longingly. Its voice had a lamenting sound. Do you hear? Asked Vashuveda's silent eyes. Vashuveda nodded. Listen harder, Vashuveda whispered. Siddhartha strove to listen harder. His father's image, his own image, his son's image dissolved into one another. Kamala's image too appeared and dissolved. Gov Govinda's image and the other images overflowed into one another. They all became part of the river. As the river, they all pressed towards their goal, yearningly, greedingly, and suffering. And the river's voice was full of longing, full of smarting pain, full of unquestionable desire. The river pressed towards its goal. Siddhartha saw it hastening. The river composed of himself. And his loved ones and all the people he ever seen, all the waves and the waters hastened in their in their suffering towards goals, many goals, the waterfall, the lake, the rapids, the sea, all the goals were attained, and each were followed by a new one, and the waters turned into vapor and rose into the sky. It turned into rain and poured from the sky. It turned into a fountain, into a brook, into a river. It pressed onward again, it flowed again. But the yearning voice had changed was still resounding, full of sorrow, searchingly, but other voices were joining it. Voices of joy and sorrow, good and evil voices, laughing and mournful voices, a hundred voices, a thousand voices. Page 73. Siddhartha listened. He was now all... We're almost there. Completely absorbed in his listening, Completely empty, completely receptive, he felt that he had now learned all that there was to learn about listening. As if he had often heard all this before, these many voices in the river, but today it sounded new. By this time, he no longer distinguished the many voices. He could not tell the gleeful ones from the weeping ones, the children's voices from the grown men's. They all belonged together, the lament of longing and the knowing man's laughter. The cry of anger and the moans of the dying, it was all one, it was all interwoven and, and knotted together, interconnected in a thousand ways, and all of this together, all the voices, all the goals, all the longing, all the suffering, all the pleasure, all the good, all the evil, all of this together was the world. All of this together was the river of events, the music of life. And whenever Siddhartha listened attentively to that river, that song of a thousand voices, when he lived, when he listened neither to the sorrow nor to the laughter, when he tied his soul nor not to any individual voice, entering into it with himself, but instead heard them all, perceiving the totality, the oneness, then the great song of a thousand voices, consisting of a single word, which was um the absolute. Nice. Do you hear? The Shavedas asked. Vishveda's eyes asked again. Vishveda's eyes beamed brightly. A glow hovered every, uh, over every wrinkle in his aged face. Just the om hovered over the river's water, over the river's voice. His smile beamed brightly as he looked at his friend, and now the same voice began to beam brightly on Siddhartha's face too. His wound was blossoming. 
His sorrow was admitting, his sorrow was admitting rays. His self had flowed into the oneness. In that hour, Siddhartha ceased to struggle with his destiny. He ceased to suffer. On his face, there blossomed the serenity of a knowledge that was no longer blessed by his will. A knowledge that knew perfection that was in accordance with the river of events, with the current of life, full of sympathy, full of shed pleasure, yielding to the current part of those. When Vashraveda rose from the seat of the riverbank, he looked into Siddhartha's eyes and saw the serenity of knowledge shining in them. He softly touched his shoulder with his hand. In his careful and gentle way, he said, I've waited for this hour, dear friend. Now that it has come, let me depart. Long have I waited this hour. Long have I... <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you yeah um thank you thank you thank you thank you my my reading is pretty good in english it's it's like with new words and with foreign languages my he like my reading my hebrew reading is, is poor um yeah A health review. <sighs> Random. Okay. Um. Long have I waited this hour. Long have I been the fisherman. Uh. <laughs> Vader. Now it is enough. Farewell, Hal River. Farewell, Siddhartha. Siddhartha made a low bow to the to the one. I knew it, he said quietly. Will you go into the forest? I go into the forest. I go into one, said Vishveda radiantly. What a boss. He goes into oneness. Clutch. Radiantly, he made his departure. Siddhartha watched him go. With profound joy, with profound gravity, he watched him go, seeing his steps full of peace, seeing his head full of brightness, seeing his figure full of light. He became luminescent. Yo, thank you all for blessing me. I appreciate it. We are now at the final chapter called Govinda with a mere four pages left. What's up? What? The sweatshirt? All right. We have a request from the audience to put on the pink sweatshirt of glory for the final chapter, which I wore in my very first video on the channel which was a book review of Walter Terence Stace's Philosophy of Mysticism. And we redone this pink sweater in remembrance of the Kabbalistic uh, adage, no, it's and Basafim, Basafim, it's Kalas, and the beginning is wedged in the end, and the end, and the end is wedged in the beginning. All that begins ends, and all that ends begins. And here we are. Represent. Black Lives Matter. Pink and Pink Lives Matter. Okay. For real though. Um, where are my tissues? Hello? What? You have, my, you have the roll? <laughs> and now it matches my kip. My kip is purple, my jumpers. Glorious jumper, thank you very much. I got it stained with some oil because I was like cooking and now... Alyssa managed to get all the stains out, um, which is cool. It's stain free. <sighs> Thanks. Okay. This is actually my sister's uh, sweater or jumper, as we call it, Khidam. On the back. Can you see? Oh, that's a good stretch. Yeah. Okay. What?
Gesundheit. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right Close enough. Okay. Chapter number uh, lost. Govinda. <sighs> You guys ready for the very last chapter? Uh, yo, I'm very proud of the people who have been here from the very beginning. I'm pretty sure Shalom has been here from the start. I've been in and out. Alyssa has been here from the beginning. Fernanda has been here from the beginning. That's 10 hours. You guys are champions. Jeez. I've been here. Yeah, I, I'm also a champion. What can I say? Humble brag. I've been here since the beginning. <laughs> Taking those shots. Reading those pages. Pouring out my poetry and prose. Yeah, we're legends. We are legends. Fernando, what country are you in? What? Mexico? Nice. Much love. Okay, let's leave. Let's read the final chapter. The home stretch. Here we go. In my pink jumper. On one occasion during a period of rest, Govinda was dwelling. Siddhartha's friend. Yep, yeah, was dwelling in with other monks in the pleasure grove that the courtesan, aka prostitute. Uh, Camilla, Kim, Kimalia had given to Gautama's disciples. He heard a report of a ferryman who lived a day's journey away by the river and whom many people regard, regarded as a sage. When Govinda continued his journey, he chose the path to the ferry, desired to see that ferryman, for even though he had lived by the Buddhist rule all his life and was looked on with respect by the younger monks because of his age and his modesty, Nevertheless, he felt restless and seeking had never been extinguished in his heart. He came to the river. He asked the old man to take him across. And when they were getting out of the river to the other side, he said to the old man, You are a great benefactor to us monks and pilgrims. You have already taken many of us across the river. Are you not too, ferryman, one who seeks after the true path? Siddhartha said with a smile on his old eyes, do you call yourself one who seeks a venerable one? Although you are already well advanced in years and, and you wear the robe of Gautama's monks, to be sure I am old, said Govinda, but I never cease to seek. Do they not recognize one another? What's happening? I shall never cease to seek. That seems to be my, de my destiny. Seekers of unity. <laughs> you too. You too, I believe, have sought. Will you tell me anything about it, honored sir? Yo! That that name that I can't pronounce means rose-colored. And I'm wearing rose-pink color. And I have some tissue in my beard. How many etymologies and definitions of this name are you going to find, Joseph? <laughs> it's like an endless river. <laughs> hmm? About what? Kamala's name. Oh, Kamala. Oh, I thought the other dude's name. Kamala Rose Colored. What's Kamala got to do with Rose Colored? Imagine me, Joseph. Unity is North? I don't get it. To be sure, I am all Ted Govinda, but I have never ceased to seek. I shall never, I shall never cease to seek. That seems to be my destiny. You too, I believe, have sought. You will tell me any will you tell me anything about it on it, sir? Siddhartha said, How can I possibly tell you, Venerable Sir, uh, Venerable One? Perhaps you're doing too much seeking? What? Get this line, get this get this line right here. That your seeking prevents you from finding. You're doing too much seeking. Your seeking prevents you from finding. Wow, that's such an epic line. North is a guiding force, not something we can attain yet, perhaps. Yeah, right. We always forward to the north. We can't get it. 
Kamala. Yeah, it's this, it's the first spelling. K A M A L A. No I. That's such a good line. Hello, guys. You hear this? Perhaps you're doing too much seeking. That your seeking prevents you from finding. I love that. I love that. I love that. Wow. Seekers of unity. Too much seeking. Ten and a half hours of seeking. How is that, Govinda asked. When someone seeks, Siddhartha said. It is all too easy for his eyes to see nothing but the thing he seeks. So that he is unable to find anything or absorb anything. He's always, because he's always thinking exclusively about what he seeks. Because he has a goal. Because he was obsessed with that goal. Seeking means having a goal. Wow, this is so cool. But finding means being free. Finders of unity. Yeah, this sounds very re-esque. Um, finding means being free, remaining accessible, having no goal. You, venerable one, are perhaps really one who seeks because pressing after your goal, you fail to see me that is right before your own eyes. I still do not understand completely, said Vinda, and asked, what do you mean? How do you mean that? Siddhartha said, once before, O Venerable One, many years ago, you were at this river. And by the river you found a man asleep and sat down near him to guard him while he slept. But O Govinda, you did not recognize the sleeper. But how can one find that which, not, which has not been sought? Yo, that's that's a serious question, man. We we've answered we've opened a new like paradox can of worms here between seeking and finding. Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Adam, your humor is, like, is not being appreciated at four thirty in the morning. We must first seek, in other words, find, or is it the other way? Okay, that's a great question. Seeking and finding, like, uh, your Gaia Matsasa. I mean, obviously, like, the, the, the base understanding is that seeking precedes finding, right? But, but they're co-determinants, which means that... The, too much excess of seeking yeah. is too much. But I think, I think they're simultaneous. Like, like, finding has to be co-terminus has to be like simultaneous with seeking and vice versa anyhow let's finish but you a govinda did not recognize the sleeper astonished like a man under a spell the monk looked to the ferryman's eyes are you siddhartha he asked timidly I would not have recognized you at this time either. I greet you warmly. Here comes bad dialogue. I greet you warmly, Siddhartha. I am sincerely glad to see you again. Such clunky dialogue. You have changed. You have changed a great deal, friend. And so you have now become a ferryman? Question mark. Yeah, bro. We are reading this book like a river. Spot on. Siddhartha gave a friendly laugh. Oh, ferryman, yes. Govinda, many people must change a great deal and must wear all sorts of garments. I am one of those, my dear friend. Welcome, Govinda. Please spend the night in my hut. The bromance is rekindled. Yay. Govinda spent the night in the hut, sleeping in the bed that, his, that once had been Vashravada's bed. He asked many questions of the friend of his youth. Siddhartha had to tell him his many events of his life. On the following morning, when it was time to set out on his day's journey, Govinda said, not without hesitation, before I continue, Siddhartha, permit me 
you one more question. Do you have a doctrine? Do you have a faith or a body of knowledge that you follow that helps you live and act uh, properly? Siddhartha said, you know, my dear friend, that even as a young man at the time we were living with dependence in the forest, I arrived at the point of distrusting teachers and teachings and of turning my back on them. I've retained that attitude, and yet since then I have many teachers. For a long time, a beautiful courtesan was my teacher and a well nurtured was my teacher and a few dice players and once a wandering disciple of the Buddha was also my teacher. Uh, he sat with me. Govinda, he's talking about Govinda. <laughs> Cute. He sat with me when I fallen asleep in the forest. In the course of hearing, I learned from him too. I'm grateful to him. Very grateful. But I've learned the most here from this river and from my predecessor, the ferryman, Vishwaveda. He was a very simple man, uh, was Vishwaveda. He was no thinker, but he knew what was necessary as well as Gautama did. He was a perfect man, a saint. Govinda said, Oh, Siddhartha, it seems to me you still enjoy a little fun of people. I believe you, and I know that you do not follow any particular teacher, but have you not found yourself? Have you not uh, e have you not found yourself even if not a doctrine, at least certain realizations are that are your own that help you to live? If you wish to tell me anything about them, uh, would gladden my heart. On occasion, for an hour or a day, I've felt knowledge in myself, just as a man feels in his just just as a man feels loud. Those thoughts were numerous, but it would be hard for me to communicate them to you. Look, my dear Govinda, here is one of the thoughts I've discovered and cannot be imparted. Wisdom that a wisdom that a wise that a wise man attempts to impart always sounds like foolishness. Are you joking? Govinda said, I'm not joking. I'm telling you what I discovered. Knowledge can be imparted, but not wisdom. You can discover it. It can guide your life. It can bear you up. It can do miracles with it. You, you can do miracles with it, but you cannot tell it to, you cannot tell it to teach it. This was what I had. This is, this was what I had several premonitions of, even as a youngster. This was what drove me to, from my teachers. I discovered an idea, Govinda, that you once again consider to be a joke or foolishness, but which is my best idea, namely the opposite of every truth is equally true. Wow. What I mean is without fail, the truth can only be un the truth can only be uttered and colored if it is one sided. Everything is one sided. The mind can conceive it and words can express it. All of that is one sided, all of that is half truth, all of that lacks completeness roundedness, oneness. Whenever the Sangatama spoke about the world in his sermons, he had divided into samsara and nirvana, into illusion and truth, into suffering and salvation. You had no alternative. There was no method for man who wants to teach, but the world itself, that ex which w what exists around us and inside us is never one-sided. A person or an action is never totally samsara or totally nirvana. A person or totally saintly or totally sinful because we are subject to illusion. It does act look as if time were something real. Time is not real. Govinda, I have learned that over and over again. And if time is not real, the span that seems to exist between the world and eternity, between sorrow and bliss, between evil and good is also an illusion. Wow. Non-duality. How so? asked Govinda nervously. How so? Govinda asked nervously. Pay close attention, dear friend. Pay close, att pay, pay close attention. The sinner, Sadhu and I, are is a sinner, but someday he will be a Brahmin again. One day he will attain Nirvana, we a Buddha. And now see 
that someday is an illusion. It is only a metaphor. The sinner is not journeying towards Buddhahood. He is not caught up in an evolutionary, in an evolution. Even though our thought processes are unable to imagine things differently, no, the sinner contains the future Buddha. Now and today, he already is that Buddha. His future is already completely there. You must revere the becoming, the possible, the concealed Buddha in him. In yourself, in everyone. The world's friend, Govinda, is not imperfect or on a slow journey towards perfection. No, it is perfect at every moment. All sin already bears its forgiveness within itself. Every little boy already bears the old man within himself. Every infant bears death. Every dying man bears eternal life. No one is able to look at someone else and know where on his journey he is. In the highwayman, the dice player looks a Buddha. In the Brahman looks a highwayman. In the profound meditation, there is the possibility of abolishing time and seeing all past, present, future life as being simultaneous. And there, everything is good. Everything is perfect. Everything is Brahman. Therefore, whatever seem, what, whatever exists seems good to me. Death is like life to me. Sin like sanctity. Cleverness like folly. Everything must be as it is. Everything needs only my consent, my willingness, my loving comprehension. And then it is good in my eyes and can never hurt me. I learned from my body and my soul that I was in great need of sin. I needed sensual pleasures, the ambition of possessions, vanity, vanity, and I needed the most humiliating despair in order to learn how to give up my resistance, in order to learn how to love the world, in order to seize, comparing with some worlds of my wishes or my imagination with the perfection that I had concocted, but to leave it the way it was to love it, to be a part of it gladly. These, O Govinda, are a few of the ideas which have come into my mind. Wow. That's a paragraph worth rereading, I tell you. Mm. Heraclitus says, mortals are immortal, immortals more near death and die now. Wow. Siddhartha stooped down, picked up picked up a stone from the ground, and weighed it in his hands. This he said effortlessly, as if at play is a stone. And with a certain time it will perhaps be earth, and from earth it will become a plant or an animal, or a person. Now in the past, I would have said, this stone is merely a stone, it is worthless, it belongs to the world of Maya, illusion. But because in the cycle of transformations, it may become a person and an intelligence, I assign some value to it. This is how I might have once reasoned, but today I think this stone is a stone. It is also an animal, it is also a god, it is also a Buddha. I do not revere and love it because... It may someday become one thing or another, but because it has for a long time always been everything. And it is precisely the fact of it being a stone, of its appearing to me as a stone now and today, that makes me love it and see value and meaning in each of its veins and cavities, in the yellow and the gray, in the hardness and the rings. It emits when I strike it, in the dryness or moistness of its surface. There are stones it feel like oil or soap to the touch, and others like leaves, others like sand, and each one special and praise Om in its own way. Each one is Brahman, God. But at the same time, and just as much, it is a stone, it is, it is oily or sappy, and that is precisely what I like and find marvelous and worthy of adoration. But do not let, but do not let me say any more about... This will do good to the secret meaning. Everything always immediately becomes a little different when you express it, a little falsified. 
a little foolish, yes, and that too is very good and pleases me greatly. <laughs> I am also perfectly contented that one's that one person's treasure of wisdom always sounds like foolishness to someone else. Govinda listened in silence. <laughs> Patience is the strength of the weak and weak and patience is the strength. Mm. Why did you tell me about that stone? He asked hesitantly after a pause. I did it unintentionally. Or perhaps it was to show that I love the stone and the river and all the things we look at and can learn from. I can love a stone, Govinda, and also a tree or a piece of bark. These are physical things and things can be loved. But words I can't cannot love. Therefore, teachings mean nothing to me. They possess neither hardness nor softness, nor color, nor edges, nor, nor odor, nor taste. They possess nothing but words. Perhaps this is what prevents you from finding peace. Perhaps it is all these words. Forever salvation and virtue, ever, even samsara and nirvana are mere words. Govinda, there is no thing that is nirvana, there is no thing that it that is nirvana. Govinda said, my friend, nirvana is not merely a word, it is a concept. What's the title of this book? Siddhartha. Siddhartha continued. A concept may be so, I... Uh, I must confess to you, dear friend, I do not make a great distinction between concepts. <laughs> concept, cool. To put it frankly, I have no high regard for concepts either. Uh, I have I have no high regard for concepts either. I have a high regard. I have a high regard for physical things. Very German. Is that the first yawn? That's the first time I yawned all night. 11 hours in. She's 5 a.m. We're almost there, by the way. Like, this is the last page. Well done. Here on this, here, I'm gonna have to read, but I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna reread this book again, like, in my own time. Like, I could just sit and, like, think and just. Here on this ferry boat, for example, a man was my predecessor and teacher, a saintly man. For many years, he simply believed in the river and nothing else. He observed that the river's voice spoke to him. He learned from that voice. It educated and instructed him. The river was like a god to him. For many years, he did not know that every wind, every cloud, every bird, every beetle just a god, is just a god like knows much and can teach as in the river he venerated. But when that saintly man left the forest, he knew everything. He knew more than you and I, without teachers, without books, merely because he believed in the river. Govinda said, but is that what you call physical things? Something real, something substantial? Is that not merely a ruse of Maya? Illusion? Merely an image, an illusion? Your stone, your tree, or river, are they realities? Yeah, 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 super. It has a super German romantic element, for sure, 100%. Please read the book again tonight, Adam said. Are you kidding me, bro, Adam? I've been I've been reading since 6 a.m., 20 shots of whiskey, yeah. later, 6 p.m. It's now four, it's now almost 5 a.m., 11 hours later. Bro, I'm not reading this book again tonight. <laughs> Get real, banana pill. Sheesh. Adam, you're killing me. Siddhartha said, that does not trouble me very much either. The things may be illusory or not. If they are, I too... Oh! Get this line, guys. Get this Get this line right here. That does not trouble me very much either. The things may be illusory or not. If they are, I too am illusory. And so they continue to be of the same nature as myself. I don't care if they're illusory. I'm illusory too. And we're on the same playing field. 
what a, that's a genius observation. Ah, wow. Uh, that wow, that's like that's that's tight. Uh, that is what makes them so dear and worthy of reverence to me. They share my nature. Therefore, I can love them. And this is, and this now is a doctrine that you will laugh at me. Uh, love, O oh Govinda, appears to me to be the chief things of all. Hess is just going to slip love into the last pager. To penetrate the world's secrets, to explain its workings, and to despise it. May, the, may be the proper occupation of great thinkers. But my sole concern is to be able of the world not to despise it, not to hate it or myself, to be able to look at it as self and all beings with love and admiration and respect. Word. I understand that, said Govinda, but it was just this, but it was, it, but it was just this that he, the sublime one, recognized as illusion. He requires of us benevolence, consideration, sympathy, forbearance, but not love. He forbade us to tie our hearts and love to earthly things. Yo, remember, we, we, this was the very first thing we said about love, about love attachment. Where do we read that? Yeah, we finally come to that, to that theme, which I waited for all book long. 11 hours I waited for that theme. Concerning mysticism books, do you know Novalis's book, Henrich von Offenrechenberger, or the Crimson Intellect from the Illuminationists? Yo, Joseph, bro, get up in there. I am like a fan of Novalis. I haven't read any of his works, but I want to. Can you hit me up, Joseph, after we're finished with this reading? I want to know more about that. And the Illuminationists, as in like the Islamic mystics that are on Sufi, like Mullah Sadra? Bro, yo, that's really cool. It's really, really cool. Nervalis to Illuminationists? Tight, bro, yeah. <laughs> Dope. Please hit me up the, uh, after this read and after I sleep for who knows how long. Okay. Is it going to be fair? How do I hit you up? Um, yeah, email. You try, I'll I'll put my email here now. It's um, seekers of you. Whatever. What's the email? Seekers of you at Gmail. I'll I'll drop it here. Okay. I also I respond to like comments on the channel. You can always comment on like any of the videos and I'll respond. Pretty much. Okay. Where are we? Oh, okay. This this issue of love. Okay, so tell them not to love. Wait, wait, wait. Where did we? Wait, 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 one second. Okay. Right. I understand that said uh, Govinda, but just but but it was just that, and he. The sublime one recognizes his illusion. He, he requires of benevolence, considerate sympathy for burns, but not love. He forbade us to tie our hearts and love to earthly things. I know, said Siddhartha. His smile was like golden beams. I know, Govinda. And behold, here we are amid the jungle of opinions, quarreling over words, for I cannot deny it. My words about love contradict or apparently contradict Gautama's words. For that very reason, I distrust words so much. For I know that contradiction is illusory. I know that I agree with Gautama. How then could he, of all people, fail? Uh, let me just finish this. Fail. Where, where, where? where? Uh, fail to be a club. He who recognized the transitoriness and nothingness of all human existence and yet loved people so much, he spent a long, laborious life doing nothing but helping them. 
teaching them, even in his case, even in the case of our great teacher, the fact is dearer to me than words. His activities in life more important than his sermons. The gestures of his hands more important than his opinions. I see his greatness not in his sermons or his thoughts, but only in his actions and in his life. Yes. Um, before I said you can't own physical things. Well, oh, we just hit eleven hours. It's right now five a.m. Was it the book? Oh, I'm about to. Okay. We're legit about to finish. For a while, the two old men were silent. Then Govinda said, as he bowed in farewell, thank you, Siddharth, for telling me some of your ideas. They are partly strange ideas. I was not able to understand all of them immediately. Be that as it may, I thank you and I wish you peaceful days. <laughs> This is the clunk dialogue ever. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, this is in brackets. In parentheses. But secretly, he thought to himself, <laughs> this is, I can't believe this. This Siddhartha is a peculiar fellow. He expresses peculiar ideas. His doctrines sound foolish. Not so the pure doctrines of the sublime one, which are clearer, purer, more comprehensible, and which contain... Nothing strange, foolish, or unlawful, but, but Siddhartha's ideas seem to be unlike his hands, his feet, his eyes, his forehead, his breathing, his smile, his greetings, his way of walking. Never since our sublime Gautama entered Nirvana, never since then have I come across a person who I felt this. This is a saint, him alone. This Siddhartha I found to be so. Even if his doctrine is strange, even if his words sound foolish, nevertheless, his hands, his eyes, his skin, his hair, everything about him radiates a purity, radiates a, radiates a peace, radiates a serenity and mildness and sanctity that I've not seen in any other person since the final death of our sublime teacher. That was all in brackets. What are weird brackets? Bro, the mood, yeah. Straight up. While Govinda was thinking this and there were a there was a contradiction in his heart, he bowed to Siddhartha again. Attracted by love, he long bow, long bow to the one who sat there calmly. Siddhartha, he said, we have become old men. We shall hardly meet again in our present forms. I see, beloved friend, that you have found peace. I confess I have not. Tell me, honored one, one thing, or let me take away with, you, with me something I can grasp, that I can understand. Give me something to accompany me on my way. My path is often worse and often gloomy, Siddhartha. Darth, Siddhartha remained, looked at him with that unchanging, quiet smile. Govinda stared into his face with anguish, with long sorrow and eternal seeking were written in his gaze. Sorrow and eternal seeking were written in his, in his gaze. Eternal inability to, to find what he sought. Siddhartha soared and smiled. Lean over me, he said softly in Govinda's ear. Lean over me, lean over here to me, like that, even closer, very close. Kiss me on the forehead, Govinda. But while Govinda amazed, but impelled by great love and, and um, obeyed his words, leans over close to him and touched his forehead with his lips, something miraculous happened to him. While he was still... Uh, futilely and reluctantly struggling to, th to think away time and imagine Nirvana and Sarasara as one and the same thing, while a certain contempt for his friend's words were even fighting with him against a tremendous love and respect, this is what happened to him. He no longer... <laughs> he no longer saw his friend... His fa he, he, no he no longer saw his friend Siddhartha's face... <laughs> In his face, he saw other faces, many of them, a long series, a flowing river of faces. Hundreds, thousands, all of them arrived and dissolving, and yet seemed to be there at the same time. They all 
can't change and renew themselves, and yet they were all Siddhartha. He saw the face of a, a carp, its mouth opened in infinite pain, a dying fish with eyes glazed over. He saw the face of a newborn child, red and full of wrinkles, distorted and weeping. He saw the face of a murderer, saw him plunging a knife into somebody's body. Wow. In the same second, he saw that criminal bound and kneeling with his head being cut off by the executioner with the stroke of a sword. He saw the bodies of men and women naked in the positions and, and battles of, of furious love. He saw corpses, he saw corpses, he saw corpses stretched out, quiet, cold, empty. He saw heads of animals, of boars, of crocodiles, of elephants, of bulls, of birds. He saw gods, saw Krishna, saw Agni. He saw all these forms and faces interrelated in a thousand ways. Each form helping the other, loving it, hating it, violating it, giving birth to it. Each one was a death. Each one was each one was a death wish. Uh, passionately, painfully confessing of, moral, of morality. And none of them died. Each one was merely transformed and constantly reborn, constantly received a new face, but without any time elapsing between one face and the next. All these forms and faces were in repose, flowed, uh, engendered themselves, drifted away and, and poured into one another. And all of them were constantly covered by something thin, insubstantial, yet existent like a thin layer of glass or ice, like a transparent skin, a shell or mold or mask of water. This mask smiled, and this mask was Siddhartha's face, which he, Govinda, was touching with his lips at that very moment. And Govinda saw smile on the mask, the smile of oneness upon, over the flowing shapes, the smile of the smile of simultaneously over the thousands, both in death, the smile of, Sidd of Siddhartha's was exactly the same, was exactly the same, quiet, subtle, impenetrable, perhaps kindly, perhaps mockingly wise, thousand-fold smile of Gautama, the Buddha, which he had seen with respect a hundred times. Thus, Govinda knew, do the perfect one's smile. Second last paragraph. No longer... <laughs> and then there's the prologue. <laughs> there's no prologue. No longer knowing whether time existed, whether the vision had lasted a second or a thousand years, no, no longer knowing whether Siddhartha or a Gut whether a Sudama, sorry, whether a Siddhartha, a Gautama, an I or you existed, wounded in his innermost recesses, as if by a divine arrow, the room, the wound from which tastes sweet, the wound from which tastes sweet, enchanted and dissolved in his innermost being. Govinda stood there a little while longer, leaning over Siddhartha's quiet face, which he had just kissed, which had just been the theater of all formations, of all becoming, of all being. The countenance was unchanged. Now, that the depths of multiplicity beneath its surface had been shut away again. It was quietly smiling, softly and gently smiling, perhaps in a very kindly way, perhaps in a very mocking way, exactly as he had smiled, the sublime one. Govinda made a low bow, final paragraph, of which he knew nothing. Ran down his aged face, the sensation of the warmest love, of the most humble veneration, burnt like a fire in his heart. He made a low bow down to the earth before the man sitting motionless there, whose smile reminded him of everything he had ever loved in his life, everything that had ever been valuable and sacred to him in his life. That's all, folks. Bye -bye. <sighs> Congratulations for the 10 viewers who stayed all the way to the very end. There's so much to reflect on this book, so much to think about, so much to ponder. I'm looking forward to rereading it, is all I could say. 
and uh, that was that was quite the marathon 11 hours I, I i thought this would take tops like four hours but uh yeah you guys shalom joseph adam fernanda you guys are champions straight up champions what can i say <laughs> And now I'm going to take some well-deserved sleep. <sighs> I love you guys. Should I end this live stream? Yes. <laughs> Uh okay. <laughs> Let's do this again sometime. <laughs> we'll break a book up into chapters. <sighs> we got popcorn. <laughs> Why are you throwing at me? Okay. Okay. Peace out, guys. <laughs> Yo guys <laughs> Go to sleep, we're done We're finished Finito You guys be crazy You guys are What's that with her? What for another ring? She much loved by Vessels. No, this is 20 shots on you, and you delivered with your hands. Well, 20 shots on you. I get it. Audience girl, thank you. Okay. Mm. <laughs> I went to the camera on while I sleep. You guys can watch no. me sleep. <laughs>